Kreml hair tonic and Kreml shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once again, it's time to call on our old friend, that incomparable host and storyteller, Dr. Watson. He's waiting for us in his familiar study. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. I won't get up, if you don't mind. This change in the weather has given me a twinge or two of rheumatism, I'm afraid. No, I'm sorry to hear that, Dr. Watson. Uh, we old fossils can't expect to be as hale and hearty as you young fellows, you know. Uh, I don't know that I feel so young today, Dr. Watson. I stopped by the military academy this afternoon and saw my cousin there. He's 13 years old, and after an hour with him, I realized I'm really quite ancient. 13 years old. Oh, a fine age. He's happy at the school, Mr. Bell? Crazy about it. Yes, I'm sure that in this day and age, a boy almost looks forward to going to school. Conditions were far different in certain parts of England just before the turn of the century, I'm afraid. I'm thinking in particular of a school that Holmes and I had occasion to visit and of the frightened, unhappy youngsters who lived there in mortal terror of their lives. Oh, this has all the hallmarks of the beginning of a Sherlock Holmes adventure. It is, my boy. It's a story I call The Singular Affair of the Dying Schoolboys. But before I begin, haven't you a message for our listeners? Yes, I have. Folks, it looks as if we're in for plenty of excitement tonight with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. And men, I'll bet you'll be plenty excited about the great improvement in the appearance of your hair once you use Kreml hair tonic. Frankly, I've tried any number of hairdressings, but it took Kreml to really convince me that my hair can always be neat without having to plaster it down with grease or those sticky, gooey concoctions. And Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking attractive. It makes hair so much easier to comb and actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer, easier to manage. At the same time, Kreml removes embarrassing dandruff flakes. It relieves itching due to dry scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so clean, so alive. Man, what a treat. Now be sure to buy a bottle at any drug counter spelled K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the singular affair of the dying schoolboys? Well, Mr. Bell, that strange adventure began on a stormy September evening in Baker Street many, many years ago. All day long the wind had screamed and the rain had beaten against our windows. Shortly after dinner, there was the old familiar jangle on our front doorbell. And a few moments later, Mrs. Hudson ushered a distinguished visitor into the room. As he stood there in front of the flickering firelight, I could see that he was a good-looking man and also that he was in a state of considerable excitement. Now, Lord Manders, if you will just give us the facts. Well, Mr. Holmes, three years ago... I was a passenger on that ill-fitted ship, the Sophie Anderson. She was wrecked in a gale, and I was the only survivor. I clung to a piece of broken spar and was washed ashore, and after that, for over two years, I lived alone on an island in the Indian Ocean. Naturally, when the Sophie Anderson foundered, I was believed to be dead. My young brother, Eric, who was next in line, inherited the estate and the guardianship of our uncle. There must have been quite a lot of confusion when you arrived home this year, Lord Manders. There was, Dr. Watson but not for the reason you suppose. I landed in England to find that my brother had died last December. Oh, indeed, I'm very sorry. He died under very peculiar circumstances. That's why I've come to you, Mr. Holmes. What were those circumstances? My uncle sent Eric to a school on the Welsh Moors, not far from Cardiff, a school known as Punsonby Hall. He died in the school infirmary there, supposedly of pneumonia. And you have some reason to believe it was not pneumonia? Nothing definite. I've been down to the school, but Dr. Punson, the owner, was too ill to see me. However, I did talk to a frightening woman there, who's the matron of the place, a Mrs. Arkwright. I became suspicious. So I stayed on and, for a few days, made some local inquiries. With what results? Punsonby Hall has a black name with the villagers, Mr. Holmes. Five boys have died there in the last two years under circumstances similar to my brother's. Good gracious me. I presume that you immediately had an accounting with your uncle? My uncle had settled another account before my return, Mr. Holmes. He died of a heart attack last February. But I am certain he was responsible for Eric's death. You see, he stood to inherit the estate. It may sound incredible, but I believe Eric was murdered at Punsonby Hall. Murdered in a boy's school? Oh, come, 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 sir. 
Such things can't happen in this 19th century of ours. But they can, Watson, and do, unfortunately. You don't mean it. I do. A private school situated in a desolate spot and operated by an unprincipled scoundrel could provide excellent and profitable opportunities for removing unwanted relatives. What a ghastly thought. Mr. Holmes, I know that Eric's dead and nothing can bring him to life again. But I can try and avenge his death and bring his murderer to justice. You will help me, won't you? Yes, Lord Manders, I will. If these shocking occurrences have been taking place, we may be able at least to prevent further tragedies. Watson, suppose we join Lord Manders on the West of England Express tonight and tomorrow see what can be done to penetrate the black clouds that surround Punsonby Hall. Walking in the wrong direction, Mr. Holmes. The school's behind us. And before going there, I thought we might profitably pay a visit here in the village to Llewellyn Coffin. Well, who's he? The local undertaker. An undertaker named Coffin? <laughs> That's very funny, isn't it? Coffin, undertaker. <laughs> Quite. <laughs> but try and control your amusement, will you, Watson? Oh, sorry, Albert. Here's his establishment now. Good day, gentlemen. Mr. Coffin? Yes, sir. That's my name, Coffin. We're strangers in these parts, and we're in search of information. I'm hoping, Mr. Coffin, that you'll be able to help us. What I can do, sir, I will, and do it gladly. I understand that you've had an unusually large proportion of business from Punsonby Hall in the past two years. Five boys died, didn't they? Five boys it was. Mr. Coffin, we've heard some strange stories in the village. Yes, stories that make us wonder if those deaths were from natural causes. Gentlemen, I'm a simple man, look you. A man who plies his trade but cannot afford to ask questions. What goes on at Punsonby Hall, and I'll not say strange things haven't happened there, is none of my business. Then let me appeal to your sympathies. My young brother died at Punsonby Hall last December. You must have buried him. Your brother? Well, now look you, that makes it different. But you'll not say anything up at the hall, sir. Dr. Punsonby's a savage man. Don't worry on that score, Mr. Coffin. What do you have to know, sir? All the five boys were supposed to have had pneumonia, I understand. That's what the medical report said. Who signed those reports? Dr. Punsonby himself. He's a regular medical doctor, look you. How very convenient. No questions had to be asked. Mr. Coffin, when you prepared those bodies for burial, did you notice anything unusual about them? Anything to make you think their deaths were possibly not caused by pneumonia? No, sir. Think now. Think, uh... Uh, well... Now that you mention it, there was one thing I was after noticing. Oh, what was that, my good man? The boys had a strange look on their faces as they lay there, as if something had frightened the wits out of them just before they died. That's very odd. The face of anyone dying from pneumonia would be in repose. Did you notice anything else, Mr. Coffin? Any other peculiarity? Well, there was one thing, sir, that gave me to thinking. All the boys had marks on them. Mm, stretch marks they were on their necks or shoulders. Perhaps they were bites. Rem remember Dr. Rylett of Stoke Moran, Holmes? Uh, did these marks look like the bites of a snake, Mr. Coffin? No, that they weren't, look you. I know a snake bite when I see one. Didn't these marks make you suspicious? That they did, sir. And when I saw them on the boys, I took my courage in my hands and asked Dr. Ponsonby. And what did he say? Inoculation marks. He said that he had tried to save them with some newfangled medicine. No autopsy was held on the boys? No, sir. Dr. Punsonby is the only doctor in these parts, look you. He gave the certificates. Who was to ask any questions? Exactly. Come on, Watson, Lord Manders. This has been a very promising start. Thank you, Mr. Coffin. You've been most helpful. It was a pleasure to talk to you, gentlemen. But please don't be after repeating what I said. Well, Mr. Holmes, I think you'll agree my suspicions were well-grounded. Yes, and we'll lose no time investigating this matter. I think we may work faster if we divide our forces. I shall return to the inn and compose a telegram that I shall ask you to send for me, Lord Manders. Of course, Mr. Holmes. Aren't you going to Punsonby Hall, Holmes? Not immediately. However, you, my dear Watson, can be my advance guard. Me? Yes. I think that your open countenance, combined with that delightful Scottish accent you sometimes assume, plus an appropriate name, should lull Dr. Punsonby into believing that he has another wealthy customer who needs his very specialized services. Well, Holmes, I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Just the same, I'll be very relieved when you get on the scene.
I'm Mrs. Arkwright, the school matron. Whom did you wish to see? I want to have a word with Dr. Ponsonby. My name is Angus McLaughlin, and I'm most anxious to send my young cousin here. Oh? Aye, he needs discipline. And I'm told that you dinner pamper a young lad here. Please come in. I'm sure Dr. Ponsonby will see you. Thank you, Mrs. Arkwright. Come in. Go in, please. Dr. Punsonby? Yes, uh, please sit down, won't you? Uh, thank you, sir. My name is Angus McLaughlin. I've travelled all the way from Aberdeen to see you. I was told that at your school you at least know how to uh, discipline a lad. Well, Mr. McLaughlin, <laughs> in our modest way, we endeavour to inculcate our students with a sense of responsibility. Aye, aye, aye. I was about to have a glass of wine. Perhaps you'd care to join me? That's very kind of you, Dr. Bunsen. I'd like to. You uh, wish to send a relative here, Mr. McLaughlin? Aye, sir. Uh, a young cousin of mine, if you'll, if you'll take him. Uh, here's your wine, Mr. McLaughlin. Uh, thank you, sir. And to your very good health. Ah, that's very good. <laughs> Tell me more about your cousin, sir. Before I accept a new student, I like to know as much about him as possible. Well, I'll be quite frank with you. He's 13 years old and he's a young devil. And an inconvenient young devil, too. You see, Dr. Punsonby, I'm his guardian. You, you follow me? No, sir. I don't think I do. <laughs> well, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm not a poor man. And I'd be a very wealthy one if... Uh, if it weren't for that boy, the whippersnapper is the only person who stands between me and uh, my dead brother's fortune. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be sorry if, <laughs> if anything were to happen to him. Uh, am I making myself quite uh, clear, Doctor? Much clearer, Mr. McLaughlin. <laughs> Another glass of wine? Thank you. Well, it's, it's very good. Mr. McLaughlin, why not put all your cards on the table? So much simpler that way. Very well. Does £10,000 mean anything to you, Dr. Punsonby? You did me, yes. The scholastic profession is notoriously unremunerative. If my young cousin were to be taken ill, perhaps, shall we say, uh, with pneumonia, if he, uh, if he were to, to die here at your school... Uh, oh, what was I saying? Oh, I'd pay you £10,000. And uh, now, sir, I, I can't be more expensive. Was it than that? No, 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 can I? I don't think so. <laughs> By the way, Mr. McLaughlin, your Scottish accent is beginning to disappear. Such a pity. It was quite colourful. This wine's drugged. You, you haven't touched your wine's drugged. I'm a most abstemious man. <laughs> Particularly on occasions like this. Dr. Watson? Dr. Watson, uh, how, how did you know my name? Even in this remote spot, I've seen photographs of you and your friend, the famous Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> I'm just a little hurt that you both thought I was stupid enough to be fooled so easily. Oh, you seem dreadfully sleepy, Dr. Watson. Sleep, yes, I've got to go to sleep. And sleep well, my friend. <laughs> I only hope that you don't have too much trouble waking up. In just a moment, we'll find out just how much trouble Dr. Watson does have in waking up. But first, have you noticed how men are taking a greater interest in their appearance lately? Competition today is keener than ever. And I'm sure you'll agree one of the greatest assets to a man's appearance is well-groomed hair. So, men, let me give you this tip about Kremel hair tonic and why it's preferred by so many of America's most successful and prosperous executives. Kremel, K-R-E-M-L, keeps dry, ruffled hair neatly in place all day long. It gives it such a handsome, healthy-looking luster, too. Yet Kremel never leaves hair with that offensive, cheap, greasy look. It never leaves hair and scalp full of sticky goo, which feels so dirty. Kremel always looks and smells so clean on both hair and scalp. It gives hair that attractive, natural, he-man look, which certainly hits the jackpot with the ladies. 
And don't forget, Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Let me repeat, Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. It makes hair feel softer, easier to manage. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes and makes the scalp feel so clean and invigorated. Men, use Cremel hair tonic daily. And see if you don't say, my hair never looked better. My scalp never felt cleaner. Well, Dr. Watson, you certainly left me teetering on the edge of my chair. We left you drugged in the schoolmaster's study. What happened next? Well, my first conscious recollection was to find myself with a violent pounding in my head, lying in a small clearing between some trees. Bending over me with a look of deep concern on his face was my old friend Sherlock Holmes. Watson. Uh -huh. What's an old chap? Uh, Are you all right? Yes, yes, I, I got a frightful headache, Holmes. What are you doing there in those, those clothes with that droopy moustache? It proved a good enough passport to secure me employment at the stables here. Well, how did you get me out of Punsonby's study? And the stables command an excellent view of the school building. Your long absence worried me. And when Dr. Punsonby finally appeared, alone, I became suspicious. So I took advantage of his absence, slipped through the study window and rescued you. Well, thank heavens you did. He gave me drugged wine. It's a funny thing, Holmes. I was probably delirious, but I swear that I saw a woman's handbag on the table. A pink and black beaded bag, and it was alive and moved. Great heavens! That confirms my worst suspicions. Did you see it too? No, it wasn't there when I came in. Somebody, probably Mrs. Arkwright, removed it. Watson, you were never closer to death. I blame myself for having allowed you to tackle Dr. Punsonby alone. Oh, don't reproach yourself, Holmes. Where, where is Lord Manders? Waiting at the inn for an answer to my telegram. He is to meet us later behind the lodge gates. What's our next move? To go to the stables, dirty you up a bit and get you a change of clothes. Then we'll return to the attack. There's desperate work ahead of us. Here, this way, sir. What, my man? <laughs> Don't look so alarmed, Lord Manners. Dr. Watson, I, I wouldn't have recognized you. What's happened? Trouble. I had to assume a disguise, too. You brought an answer to Holmes's telegram? Yes, in my pocket. Where is he? He went over to the main school building and asked me to... Other things that the second cook, an acidulated woman of dubious charms, is most susceptible to flattery. Over a glass of stout, she quite inadvertently gave me three vital clues. What were they? Firstly, that all five of the unfortunate boys died in the same small room. Secondly, that that fatal room is directly under the room of Mrs. Arkwright. And she's capable of anything, if you ask me. The third clue makes our next step an urgent one. A boy by the name of Carruthers Minor was moved into that room yesterday. He's supposed to have an extremely bad cold. Dr. Punsonby is afraid it might turn into pneumonia. Good heavens! Exactly, Watson. I suggest we lose no time in visiting Carruthers Minor. Though I'm sure Dr. Punsonby would consider it unethical, this is one occasion when another doctor's opinion is absolutely vital. <laughs> there, there, Carruthers. This is Dr. Watson. He's come to make you well. You can't make me well. Dr. Punsonby says I've got pneumonia. Oh, nonsense, my dear boy. You've got a slight cold, that's all. If Dr. Punsonby says I've got pneumonia, pneumonia's what I've got. Nothing of the kind, my boy. Nothing of the kind. Watson, you notice this bed is anchored to the floor? It can't be moved. What does that suggest to you? Well, again, it reminds me of Stoke Moran and Dr. Rylett. But I don't see any bell pull. No, Watson. No bell rope is needed. Because no murderous snake is involved in this plot. But look up there, directly above the bed. A small trap door. Leading from Mrs. Arkwright's room. Now the whole picture is clear. The trap door, the strange marks on the dead boys, the beaded bag that you saw. What was that? I don't know. Lord Manders is standing guard in the hallway. It's Dr. Ponsonby. He's come to look at my pneumonia. Mrs. Arkwright. I know you were expecting Lord Manders. He's lying in the hallway. He was looking in the wrong direction, unfortunately for him. Don't let Mrs. Arkwright come near me. Don't let her. Mrs. Arkwright, I'd put that revolver away if I were you. I doubt if you know how to handle it. I assure you that I do. 
Having used the butt end of it on your friends so successfully should prove that fact. Grab her, Watson. Right, you are. Get away from Drop me. Drop that revolver, Mrs. Archite. That's right. Let the old girl oh. have it. Drop that revolver, do you hear me? Ah, that's better. I say, Holmes, she's fainted. Good. Help me carry her up to a room. Well, what about young Carruthers and Lord Manders? We must remove them to a place of safety. And then, Watson, all that remains is to call on the giggling Dr. Punsonby. <laughs> very dark in here, Holmes. Uh, I don't like this at all. Quiet. Somebody's coming. Good evening, Dr. Punsonby. Well, well, Let well, me well, light your desk lamp for you. You startled me. Who are you? Uh, what are you doing in my study? My name is Sherlock Holmes. Dr. Watson, you've already met. Yes, we've met you, scoundrel. Oh, yes. Uh, my friend, the uh, Scotsman. I was expecting you both. Uh, by the way, please put that revolver away. <laughs> Firearms make me nervous. Uh, Dr. Punsonby, I know how those five boys were murdered. I would venture the opinion that you once spent some time for the sake of your health in America. In Arizona Territory, I'd say. I wonder what makes you think that, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> I've never been in America in my life. And yet I'm certain that someone here spent some time in the vicinity of the Gila River. Well, I understand that uh, Mrs. Arkwright was in America a few years ago. Mrs. Arkwright? Dr. Punsonby, is it possible you're hoping to transfer our suspicions to your accomplice? My accomplice? You talk in riddles, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> it's most confusing. Then shall we be more specific? You consider Carruthers Minor to be quite ill, I understand. Oh, yes, I'm dreadfully worried about him. Well, then let me tell you, Dr. Punsonby, that I examined the boy only a few minutes ago, and as a medical man, I say that he only has a slight cold. Then obviously we disagree in our diagnosis, Dr. Watson. After all, you're just a general practitioner, whereas I specialize... Yes, we know what you specialize in. Gentlemen, I suggest the three of us go over to Carruthers' room and hold a consultation. It's just possible that his health has taken a sudden turn for the better. The bed's empty. Carruthers Minor has gone. Yes, Dr. Punsonby. And suppose you take his place. Leave me alone. What are you going to do? Lash you to this bed and see if you can stomach your own filthy medicine. This is outrageous. Of course. I thought that if we were to reconstruct your crimes with you as the victim, we might persuade you to confess. Mrs. Arkwright! Mrs. Arkwright, help! I'm afraid she can't help you. She's in her room with the door locked from the outside. Uh, there we are, Holmes. He's lashed up so that he can't move. But you don't understand. Mrs. Arkwright has his instructions. You're... Great heavens. What was that? Mrs. Arkwright. It came from the room above. Come on, Watson. Quick, up the stairs. She's fainted again. Feel her pulse. I was just going to... Holmes, there is no pulse. She's dead. The poison works fast. Observe those marks on her wrist. Looks as if some animal had bitten it. It has. And that means the animal's loose in this room. Great heavens. Somehow it must have escaped from its cage and turned on her. Guard the door, Watson. Our lives are not safe until we've found this monster. I don't understand. Look. Look. Under that washstand there. Good heavens, it's that, it's that beaded handbag again. And it's moving. Give me your walking stick, Watson. Here. There. This diabolical creature has done enough damage for one lifetime. It's dead, Holmes. But what in thunder is it? It looks like some sort of lizard. It's all pink and covered all over with black scales. That's what made me think it was a handbag. But I've never seen a lizard as large as that. Of course you haven't. So let me introduce you to the peculiar villain of this piece... His name is Heloderma Suspectum, better known as the Gila Monster, indigenous to the Gila River in America. I've never seen anything like that before. How on earth did you recognize it, Holmes? When Mr. Coffin, the undertaker, mentioned those strange marks on the dead boys, I was reminded of an article I'd read recently on venomous lizards. So that telegram you sent was to the... to the Museum of Natural History. Their answer confirmed my suspicions. The Gila Monster's bite produces almost instantaneous death, and yet it's a poison that would be extremely hard to identify. The fixed bed in the room below us, the trap door directly above it in this room, 
and the help of an unscrupulous accomplice like Mrs. Arkwright makes the rest of the picture very clear. And now that the monster's dead, how are you going to frighten Dr. Punsonby into a confession? Uh, Dr. Punsonby need not know the animal's dead. Examine the floor, Watson. See if you can find that trap door. Right, Joe. Meanwhile, I'll see if I can find some cord or string. Uh Uh-huh. Here's a ball of twine on the dressing table. Placed there for use in the intended murder of Carruthers Minor, no doubt. Uh, Found the trap, Holmes. There's a ring here in the floor and a section of the carpet's been cut out. Good. And now to attach the twine to the body of the healer monster. So. All right, Watson. Open the trap door. Very well, Holmes. Well, Dr. Punsonby, have you changed your mind? Mrs. Arkwright! Mrs. Arkwright! She is dead, Dr. Punsonby. Your healer monster turned on her. No! No! I'm going to lower the animal, Watson. There we are. Oh, get away from me! A few more feet will do the trick, Holmes. Yes. There. Take it away! I'll tell you anything! Everything! You will sign a confession? Yes, Mr. Holmes, yes, I will! Just take that beast away and I'll sign anything! We'll be down, Dr. Punsonby. Well, Holmes, thank heavens that's done with. What a shocking affair. Yes, Watson, but not without a note of poetic justice. What do you mean? Well, isn't it poetic justice that a dead reptile should be instrumental in bringing a live one to the gallows? Quite a gruesome finale, Dr. Watson. It certainly was, Mr. Bell. All in all, one of the most unpleasant adventures that Holmes and I ever encountered. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Girls, how would you like a thrilling new experience? Then just listen to how beautiful Powers models glamour bathe their hair. We certainly were thrilled to discover the amazing, beautifying action of cremel shampoo. It actually glamour bays each tiny strand of hair and leaves hair sparkling for days with natural glossy luster. And cremel shampoo is so mild and gentle. It positively contains no harsh caustics or chemicals. Instead, it has a beneficial oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Oh, and don't forget how its luxurious active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, why not follow the advice of these million-dollar powers models and glamour bathe your hair with beautifying cremel shampoo? It takes only ten minutes right at home. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, how about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week. Next week, I think I'll tell you the adventure of the genuine Garnerius, in which Holmes solved the mystery of Drenko a famous violinist who was found dead in a locked room touching a suicide note, but who nevertheless had been murdered. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Speckled Band. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the genuine Garnerius. This is ABC... The American Broadcasting Company. The Adventures of the Scarlet Cloak, starring Wendell Niles. This is a story of the Golden West, as it was more than a hundred years ago. A land of mystery and intrigue. A romantic paradise where the dons and senoritas held their ancient customs while rubbing elbows with rugged American frontiersmen and pioneers. Where lace-trimmed handkerchiefs from Barcelona were carried next to the heart under crude buckskin jackets. The territory was a melting pot, quiet on the surface like the Pacific, but torn with undercurrents and riptides. 
was a restless and growing land where the strong made their own laws and the weak obeyed or perished. This is the saga of Brad Carver, a fabulous man in a fabulous land. Some called him an angel. Some called him a devil, and many claimed that he never lived at all. But the story of Brad Carver is as colorful and exciting as were his roaring guns and flashing rapier as he cut a flaming swath through this glorious land. Our story starts in October of 1842. As a dusty and battered wagon train at the end of the Santa Fe Trail paused within sight of a settlement of 200 people. Oh, hold your teams, hold them! Well, we made it, Carver. Los Angeles dead ahead. So that's Los Angeles. Doesn't look like much, McKeever. Well, I guess it ain't Boston, Carver. But it's going to be a mighty big city one day. And it looks good to me right now after 3,000 miles of prairie and engines and mountains and desert. It still doesn't look like much to me. Well, this is where you and I park, McKeever. Where are you striking for? North. Monterey. I'm heading north myself, San Francisco. As soon as I get these folks in and settled, I'll ride along with you if you're willing. Sure, McKeever. Thought maybe you'd had enough of me. Look, Carver, when we started out, you was just another Boston tea drinker to me. But back there on the trail, you proved I was wrong when the going got rough, and I'm admitting it. So do we ride together, or don't we? We ride together, McKeever. Good. We'll hit the trail as soon as we get the train into town. Come on! We're moving! Get up, everybody! Get up! I ain't one for asking a man questions, Carver. But you're in a powerful hurry to get to Monterey. I haven't been there in 20 years. I've got an old score to settle. Old score? You couldn't have been more than a kid 20 years ago. I was old enough to remember my home on fire. My mother and father murdered. I'm sorry, Carver. It can be a bad country. You're lucky they didn't get you. They would have, except for the loyalty of a Mexican named Sancho who worked for my family. I don't know what happened to him afterwards, but he got me to San Francisco and put me on a ship that took me to my father's people in Boston. You know who murdered your folks? No. They rode in at night with their faces covered. My father wounded a leader through the shoulder with a rapier, and one of the mobs stabbed him in the back. I've got to find the leader. Well, it won't be easy. He may be dead by now. He may be. But if he isn't, he'll carry a rapier mark on his shoulder. If that man is alive, McKeever, I'm going to find him and kill him. Now I know why we've been knocking on these ponies. We'll switch mounts at the next station. I want to stay on the trail all night and make Monterey by dawn. All right. Get up there, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. The house? In that grove of trees? Yes. What's left of it? My uh, mother and father are buried in the grove down there. That's the only news of them I ever had. Well, goodbye, McKeever. If, uh, if I thought I could help. Thanks. Uh... It's my fight. I want to go down into the grove and. Uh... Be alone for a while. If you if you ever come up to San Francisco... I'll look you up. I promise. Goodbye. And good luck. Goodbye, McKeever. Yep, there, boy. Take care of yourself, Carver. J. Carver. 1785... 1822. Priscilla Carver. 1795. 1822. Dear Lord, blessed be their memory. Senor, 
What are you doing here? I, I, I just come to place the flowers on the graves, senor. The, the, these people, they were my friends. Sancho. You you must be Sancho. Si, si, senor. I am Sancho. But I, I, I do not recall ever seeing this senor before. Sancho, you remember me. I'm Brad Carver. Bradito? You, you are the little Brad Carver? Oh, senor Brad. Don't call me senor. Not you, Sancho. I knew I'd find you. Oh, I, I, I prayed this would happen. I have been living in the ruins of the old house, uh, but you should not be near the house. You must go away from here for a long time. They tried to find you. The men used to come at night. But that was years ago. They wouldn't know me now. Seeing you near the old house, they might suspect. A stranger come from nowhere. A stranger of your age. No, 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 Bradito. You must go. They would kill you as they killed your father. That's why I'm back, Sancho. Because they killed my father. And I'm going to stay. Then you must go into town like any other stranger. Hey, there is an inn. The inn of San Bonaventuri. Hey, you must also change your name. You cannot use the name of Carver in Monterey. You're right. At the inn, I'll be Senor Bradford. Bueno, bueno, but we must not stand here talking. A rider might pass. Come, Bradito. I lead your horse, eh? But you said being near the house is dangerous. No, we do not go to the house. I will show you something that you never saw before. <laughs> Even when you were a little boy. Hey, through the grove from behind these bushes, huh? But, but this is the base of a cliff. It's solid rock. No, no, not solid, Bradito. Here, you help me push this big rock here, huh? All right. It's a cave. See, si, see, si, but even without the rock, the bushes hide the entrance. Hey, it's best now to leave it open in case you should need shelter, Sally. Let's go in. Uh, wait, I strike a light for you. Now you take the torch from the wall. Sancho, these... These things... I remember them from the house. <laughs> si, si, bradito. I say what I could so that one day you could have them. Here, look over here. The portraits of your mother and your father. I never knew this cave existed. Nobody ever told me. Uh, your father wished it so. Only he and I knew. Ah, see. I see now by the portrait your resemblance to him. My father. See. You know, Sancho, I never believed that anything had happened to him. He was strong, and that gave me faith. And you gave me more faith with your fairy tales. Oh, I never told you fairy tales, Bradito. You don't remember. The stories about El Diablo, the devil himself, and the scarlet cloak who came riding at night to punish the wicked. Too bad your El Diablo wasn't around the night my father was killed, Sancho. A child builds up a lot of hope in a legend. Bradito, El Diablo was not a legend. He defended the good against the bad. Perhaps you're right. When stories are told often enough, people begin to believe them. Well, they were not just stories. I did not deceive you. Ah, turn and look at the wall behind you. Masks. Masks in the image of the devil. See, and beneath the masks, a trunk. Open it. Sancho. Open it, Bradito. I know the truth. A scarlet cloak, a black sombrero, and a rapier. And do you remember, Bradito, when you were a little child? Bad men who did bad things in this land. Then one morning they would be found dead wearing the mask of the devil who had come to claim them. That was the work of El Diablo. And he lived in Monterey while your father lived. Because, Bradito, your father was El Diablo. El Diablo? Si. And that's why he was killed. Because they found out that he stood in the way of their robbing and plundering. And they were strong enough to destroy him and they will also destroy you. Bradito, you must go away, please. No, Sancho. This cave is mine now. And so is my father's rapier. But you have been raised in Boston. What do you know of such a weapon? I lived in Europe, too, Sancho. I fenced with the greatest swordsmen in the world. Fenced with them until I could beat them. Because I knew that someday I must come back here to kill a man with a rapier. Now I have to find that man. Sancho, if I need you, I'll come here. 
But if you ever need me, ask for Senor Bradford at the Inn of St. Bonaventure. You slept well, Senor Bradford? Yes, very well. Say, uh, what is that mob doing outside? Some kind of celebration? No, senor, there is much trouble. American gunboats from your country, they are in the harbor of Monterey. They have taken down the Mexican flag and put up the American colors. Oh, I don't believe it. Not unless there's war. We have heard nothing of a war, but they say other nations would like to seize California. Oh, that's no secret. Half the world is after this territory. I am Mexican, senor. But Mexico is weak, and his land is too big. Many of us would welcome the American flag. It is our hope for peace. That mob outside doesn't seem to agree with you. That mob outside is not led by Mexicans, senor. It is led by American. Oh, really? See. Si. Say, at times I don't return for the night, think nothing of it. But if I'm ever gone for more than two nights, there's a note for one of your countrymen under my pillow. Please deliver it. See, si, senor. Oh, muchas gracias. They say they brought them gunboats in to protect the country. Protect it from what? I don't see nobody else trying to grab it. Damn it, boy! I need to get more than they bargained for. I got men riding in from all over the countryside. Men with guts and guns. Are you going to join them? Here comes some of them now. Go across the road. Look out there. I'll get her. That was fast moving, stranger. She's fainted. Somebody get some water from the... Thank you, Charlie. Right. That gal's Maria Alvarez. There'll be the devil to pay for this. There's always the devil to pay when a mob like this cuts loose. Yeah, but this just isn't a girl, stranger. This is the niece of Don Raymond de la Torres, the richest man in California. Thanks. Come on, miss. Drink this. Oh, que me... Que paso? A horseman almost ran you down. Yes, would have, too, if this fella hadn't grabbed you. Oh, gracias. I will be all right now. Let my horse through. Let me through. What here? Maria, what has happened? I was almost trampled, but this gentleman has saved me. My uncle, Don Ramon de la Torres. Senor? Bradford. I am most grateful, Senor Bradford. Who were the horsemen? It isn't the horsemen you want. Some madman named Daggard has been inciting this mob or it wouldn't have happened. Daggard! I'm here, Don Ramon. I'm here. Right, sir, I'm here. Stand back! Clear that path from our horse. Who gave you the right to endanger the lives of the people of Monterey? Have you appointed yourself governor of this territory? They changed the flag at the customs house and went And you will let the officials determine what action is to be taken. Disperse this crowd at once, or I shall ask the governor to place you under arrest. All right. I guess we made a mistake, man. The governor's job. If you cannot stay in town peacefully, get out. Now move on. Move on, all of you. You should not have come into town, my dear. Daggett is an impetuous fool. I am all right, thanks to Senor Bradford. I have invited him to visit with us this evening. By all means, you will be most welcome, Senor. And we shall try to erase this sad impression of Monterey. It's not Monterey I'm worried about, Don Ramon. It's that man Daggett. He was planning to lead an attack on the customs house tonight. Well, please, do not be so concerned. The mob has scattered. They will drink and gamble. And by night, they will have forgotten. Now, come, Maria. I will take you home. Adios, Senor Bradford. Adios, Senor. Until tonight? Until tonight. I am here, Brady. There's trouble in town. I know, I know. I was there this morning. Senor Doggett finds their anger. He was stopped by Don Ramon de la Torres. But I think he still plans to go through with an attack. I do not think there will be an attack. Not in the town. If there is one, it will be out here in the country. In the country? See? Si. I don't understand. Well, the American ships have cannon. They have also taken the cannon in the customs house. And Doggett knows that. An attack would be hopeless. But why is he bringing in armed men from all over the countryside? Well, perhaps to leave the countryside itself unprotected. 
Uh, do you remember Don Castillo and the senor, your father's old friends and neighbors? Oh, of course I do. They have been receiving threats. Somebody wishes to drive them from their land. There has been no open attack against them because they have more than 30 men working on their place. But tonight, Bradito, Daggett will have those men in town. The old couple will be alone. You're right, Sancho. But they won't be alone. Oh, Bradito, you are only one man. It will take the devil himself. That's what I mean. El Diablo, the devil himself. Tonight I wear my father's scarlet cloak, black sombrero, and his rapier. If the Castillo Hacienda is attacked, it will be protected, just as it would have been 20 years ago, by El Diablo. Let's take just a minute now to mention one or two of the many advantages this program provides for an astute advertiser. It's a Western-type story, utilizing the basic success pattern of galloping horses, gunfights, and high adventure. However, through its authenticity, believability, and imaginative presentation, we have widened its appeal to attract the young and the adult audience. The locale of Monterey a hundred years ago, which will be kept historically accurate, revives the romantic flavor of beautiful senoritas, colorful habits and costumes, old-world weapons such as the rapier, and interesting characters of Spanish, English, Mexican, and American origin. It gives you a dramatic, exciting radio program, but is even more suited to a filmed television series. The performers have been selected for their ability and experience, and also for their appearance, so that the television picture will bring you most of the same people you are hearing on this record. Our star for both the radio and television programs probably has talked to more people more often than any man who ever lived. The name of Wendell Niles is familiar to everyone. For 20 years, he has announced and performed several times a week on the highest-rated radio shows. The name is already universally associated with a pleasant, sincere, convincing voice. Through these programs, we now associate that familiar name with a likable, virile, adventurous personality who will quickly spring to life in the hearts of millions of Americans. As you listen to the second act, imagine, if you will, a television screen where you can watch this believable, exciting, romantic man of action, the wearer of the scarlet cloak and rapier, as he rides against the evil to bring hope to the oppressed. Returning to Monterey after a 20-year absence, Brad Carver has learned that his murdered father was the legendary El Diablo, protector of the weak and helpless. Through his father's old friend and servant, Sancho, he also learns that an attack by night riders is planned against the neighboring hacienda. Donning the scarlet cloak, black sombrero, and rapier that his father wore, Brad and Sancho ride to a hill overlooking the threatened hacienda. The lamps of the hacienda are out for some time now. And still no signs of a raid. They would wait for sleep to come in the house. I hope you're right. Oh, Bradito, I bless myself. Here in the moonlight with your father's cloak and sombrero, I feel that once again I ride with El Diablo. Let's hope the raiders feel the same, Sancho. Uh, there may be many of them. We'll have help. Come on. Where do we go? Down to the corrals to release the livestock. You have a plan? Yes. If they expect no resistance, they'll take the easy approach to the hacienda. That means they'll ride in on the road from town and across the bridge that forged the stream down there. See, si, see, si, that is the way they should come. Now, we'll herd the oxen and cattle and horses into that blind pass between the hills, just this side of the bridge. When they approach from the other side, I'll charge the bridge. From there on, it's up to you. Bueno, just tell me what to do. I want you to stampede the herd behind me. Drive them toward the bridge. In this light, with the sound of the stampede, they won't know what's coming at them. They'll scatter and run. Uh, here is the main corral. Uh, move them out as quietly as possible. I'll get the horses from the stables. You drive them into the blind pass, and I'll meet you there. Oh, 
horsemen, about ten of them. Look, coming over the hills. They're carrying torches. Good. They're on the road to the bridge. Just as they approach the far side, I'll make my ride. Turn the stock toward the bridge and stampede them behind me. Then keep after them and keep them moving. See, si, I understand. And luck ride with you. El Diablo. Here they come. When you get across the bridge, cut into the hills. I'll double back and meet you near the old missions. Si, be careful, Pradipo. Now's the time, Sancho. Adios. Yeah! Oh, boy. Sancho? Here, Pratito. I am here. Are you all right? See, si. All but my leg. I was caught for a little while in the stampede. It was just squeezed a little, that's all. I told you to stay behind the herd. See, si, I know, but I wanted to be closer to you in case they made a fight. Oh, but you were just like your father. Just like him. They were frightened. I'll help you back to the cave. No, no, no. You must not go there. Tonight you must be in the company of others, so they will not suspect but I can't leave you while you're injured. Pratito, you have taken your father's place. El Diablo returns on the same day a stranger comes to the town. They could make much of this unless you spend the evening with others. Yes. Senorita Maria, the niece of Don Ramon de la Torres, invited me to call. Ah, bueno, then you must go there. He is known and respected. It will be perfect. I will take the cloak and sombrero. I'm the rapier. Ah, now you are once again Senor Bradford. A stranger who stops at the inn of San Bonaventure. My niece plays that music box incessantly, Senor Bradford. I am afraid we are poor competition. It is so new and exciting, and has come all the way from Paris. Yes, I know. I've seen them there. You have been to Paris? Our Senor Bradford seems to have seen a great deal of the world. I was in Europe about two years ago. I thought I noted traces of European culture. Do you fence, Senor? A little. It's part of a gentleman's training. Excellent. I enjoy the sport. We must try it someday. It is fortunate for me I have the music box to entertain me. Oh, forgive me, my dear. I have been monopolizing the conversation. Now I have some work in my study. I will leave you alone. Why don't you show Senor Bradford the gardens? Perhaps the Senor wouldn't care for... I'd them. like to see the gardens. They are very lovely. Adios, Senor Bradford. You must honor us again. My pleasure, sir. You must find Monterey different from your native Boston, Senor. Different in many ways. Do you plan to stay here for a time? Do you think I should? I'm sure my wishes would not influence a man who has seen so much of the world. Are you... Will your family join you here? No, and aunt and uncle in Boston are the only family I have. Oh, I have not known many Americans. The man I am engaged to marry is an official of the Mexican government. Our families arranged it when we were both children. Oh, I see. I hope he isn't riding the horse that's headed this way. No, he's in Mexico. That is probably some friend of my uncle's coming to play chase. Good, because I want to stay here a while longer, Maria. I'm very much taken with this, this garden. That is nice to know, senor. Why do you come here? Let me in. I had to see you right away. Did something go wrong at the Castillo Hacienda? Did something go wrong? Everything went wrong. We were driven off by El Diablo. He's back. Taggart. 
Have you been drinking? El Diablo has been dead for 20 years. Well, he wasn't dead tonight. I saw him as clearly as I'm seeing you. You let yourself be frightened by an apparition? I tell you, the man is dead. You saw him die. Yeah? Well, maybe we were wrong. Maybe we killed the wrong man, or... Maybe somebody's taking his place. Ah, that's impossible. Is it? How about the fellow who tried to make trouble for us in town today? Uh, don't be an idiot. His name is Bradford. He comes from Boston, and he is stopping at the inn. Besides, he is here in the garden with my niece at this moment. And he must not find you here when they come in. Now go. I talk to you tomorrow. I ain't waiting till tomorrow. I'm going to see what I can find out tonight. Sancho. Is that you, Bradito? Is something wrong? Were you in town looking for me? I have been waiting here in the cave. I left De La Torres and rode to the inn. My room had been searched. A note I'd left for you was missing. A note with money for you to get out of California if I were discovered. Oh, then somebody knows about you now, Bradito. Yeah, I'm afraid so, Sancho. Uh, yeah. Got to do something about that leg of yours. Uh, it will be all right in a few days. We haven't got a few days. We've got to get you away from here to a safer place. No, no. You are the one who must go. Someday when the Americans really come, then the land will be safe and to my return. The Americans are here now, Sancho. No, no. I met men returning from town after I left you at the mission. The raising of the flag was a mistake. The command of the ships had a false report of a war. Mexico again controls California. Shh. Quiet, somebody calls. Quickly, Sancho. Get down behind that trunk. All right, Bradford, don't move. Well, this is quite a layout, ain't it? So this was El Diablo's hideout, and you took it over. How did you find this place? I had to look through your room at the inn. And I stayed around until you came. I figured you'd run for cover when you found that note was missing, and I was right. So the devil had a son. Might have figured you'd come back, only you're not going to last as long as your father did. You can what? drop your gun, Senor Dagger. All right, Dagger, I'll take that. Pretty tricky, ain't you? Throwing down on me behind my back. Brave, when you got an unarmed man. Yeah, it didn't bother you when I was unarmed. Take this gun, Sancho. Throw it outside. Why? And throw your own out, too. What, well, brother? Do as I say. There's still two of you against one, you know. No, Dagger, just you and me. Sancho won't interfere. Can you use a rapier, Dagger? Yeah. I can use one. There's one on the wall behind you. Under the devil masks. Take it. You've seen those masks in the past, haven't you, Dagger? My father's mark for men like you. Yes, I've seen them. But you'll never put one on me. He's right, El Diablo. This is your last mistake. And you are good, aren't you, Dagger? Yeah. Next one, you you won't be talking. I had the pleasure of killing your father. And this blade will do for you. I'm glad you know that, Dagger. Because that's going to cost you your life. This is your finish. You know what they do. Yes. There's a chance nobody else has seen it. I want to look at his shoulder. There must be a rapier mark there. See, si, Bradito, see. Si. No mark, Sancho. Dagger was one of the mob that killed my father, but he wasn't the leader. And so from now on, you play a game of death in the dark with a, a man whose face you do not know? Yes. But at least I know that the man responsible for the death of my family is still alive. Bradito Daggett's men will search for him tomorrow. We must bury him. No, Sancho, he must be found. With a mark of El Diablo, the mask of the devil. I'll put the mask on him and strap his body to his horse and leave him near the town. They, they will put a price on your head. There's already a price on my head, Sancho. The price of a life for a life. Because men like Daggett must die for every innocent and helpless person they kill. My father could carry that price on his head and pay it, then so can I. As long as there's injustice, as long as the good people of this country are at the mercy of the lawless, they'll have El Diablo to protect them. You have just heard An Adventure of the Scarlet Cloak, starring Wendell Niles. Music by Lynn Murray, story by Joel Murcott. 
Produced by Vic Hunter and directed by D. Engelbach. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now suppose we begin by calling on Mr. Holmes' biographer and friend, the genial Dr. Watson. We find him in his comfortable, firelit study, leaning back in his easy chair, ready to begin his story. The fire feels good tonight, doesn't it, Dr. Watson? Indeed it does, but sit down, Mr. Bell, sit down and let's get on with the story. You are in a hurry, aren't you? Well, I suppose I am. As a matter of fact, the adventure I'm going to relate was one of the most gruesome experiences I ever hoped to encounter. Perhaps I'd better not tell it after all. It brings up memories Oh, that, uh... come now, Dr. Watson. You're not going back on us now. You promised last week to tell us... Uh, what was the name of the story? The Adventure of the Devil's Foot. Oh, the Cornish horror. The very thought of it makes my blood run cold. I can hardly wait, Dr. Watson. But first, men, I'd like to remind you about this famous modern trend in hair grooming, which is preferred among top-flight executives and America's most successful men. It's called Cremel Hair Tonic. One of the many reasons Cremel has become such a nationwide favorite is that it never plasters the hair down with sticky goo, which makes your hair and scalp feel so dirty. It never gives hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look. You see, Kreml is a very highly specialized hair tonic. It contains a unique and utterly different combination of hair grooming ingredients, which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why Kreml keeps unruly hair so neatly in place longer, with such a handsome, healthy-looking luster. What I especially like about Kreml is that after you use it, you can run your hand back over your hair and your hair never feels sticky or dirty. No greasy film comes off on your hand. Yet Kreml hair keeps hair in perfect order throughout the busiest day. Always looking so handsome and well-groomed. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the devil's foot or the Cornish horror? It was the spring of the year 1897. Holmes's iron constitution had shown some signs of giving way due to a particularly arduous and nerve-wracking winter. In March of that year, Dr. Moore Agar of Harley Street gave positive injunctions that Holmes get out into the country for a protracted rest. Well, the third week in March found us settled in a small cottage near Poldu Bay at the further extremity of the Cornish Peninsula. Isn't that rather a bleak country for convalescent, Dr. Watson? Bleak is putting it mildly. I've never known such grim surroundings, but it suited Holmes admirably. He seemed to blossom in that weird and foreboding fog-swept district. Just as natural perversion as I suppose. Oh, I dare say. Our little whitewashed cottage stood on a grassy headland. From its windows, we looked down upon the whole sinister semicircle of Mounts Bay, that old death trap, with its fringe of black cliffs and surge-swept reefs. In every direction, there were traces of some vanished race which had left as its sole record strange monuments of stone. Holmes spent most of his time pottering round these weird ruins. Everything was going along peacefully until one morning our simple and healthy routine was violently interrupted and we were precipitated into the middle of a series of gruesome and nerve-shattering events. Quite a surf this morning, eh, Watson? You can see the spray flung up against our windows and we're a good hundred feet above sea level. I don't think I shall venture out today. Hmm. Bad weather. Old boy is certainly lashing himself into a fine frenzy. What do you mean, the old boy, Holmes? The devil, Watson. The devil himself. What are you raving about? Didn't I tell you that the natives hereabouts refer to that seething death trap down there as the devil's cauldron? They think the old gentleman himself lives there. How unsettling. Yes, a very interesting superstition. You know, Watson... This locality is supposed to have been the last resort of devil worship in England. Oh, really? Really? Many scientists believe that those huge prehistoric monuments of stone were part of a temple given over to the Prince of Darkness. Preposterous. Oh, I don't know. It's as logical as most of the theories that endeavor to explain their existence. The superstition goes on to say that when the devil was finally driven from his temple, he took refuge in the bay down there. Yes, 
They claim that on stormy nights you can hear his hoofbeats as he races up and down the rocks. Holmes, what are you trying to do? Give me a case of nerves. Hello, what's this? What's this? Someone is running up our path, his cloak flapping about like a giant bat. Why, it's that Tregenis fellow, the one who boards with the vicar. Mortimer Tregenis, eh? I wonder what's happened. Face as white as a sheet. Couldn't look more upset if he'd seen Beals above himself. Open the door, Watson. Mr. Holmes, thank heaven I find you at home. The most terrible thing has happened. I can scarcely believe it. Oh, sit down, my dear fellow, sit down. That's better. Now, perhaps you can tell us what has happened. My family, my, my sister, we were playing cards. Oh, slowly I... now, take your time. My family, my sister and my two brothers. It's too terrible. Why, just last night I was with them at the house. Tredanic warfare, it's called. All well and happy. We played cards. And now, without warning, I can't believe Easy, it. Easy, easy, there's a good fellow. I... I left them last night. My sister Brenda... My two brothers, Owen and George. What time was that? The, the, the clock in the church steeple over at Polo was chiming ten o'clock as I closed the front door behind me. I'd left them all in the card room, laughing and in good spirits. And? This morning, being an early riser, I was out taking a walk before breakfast when Dr. Richards overtook me in his carriage with the news that he'd been sent for and the most urgent call from Tredanic Warfare. Something terrible had happened to my family. I jumped in beside him and he whipped up the horses... And what did you find? Oh, Mr. Holmes, it was terrible, ghastly. My two brothers and my sister, there in the card room, just as I'd left them. But what a change. What a ghastly change. Yes? Brenda lay back stone dead in her chair. And my two brothers sat on each side of her, laughing and shouting and singing. The senses stricken clean out of them. And all three of them, my poor dead sister and my two demented brothers... Retained upon their faces an expression of ghastly horror, a, a convulsion of terror. How terrible. Yes. Dr. Richard was so overcome at the sight that he fell fainting into a chair. Hmm. Anyone else in the house besides your sister and brothers? Only Mrs. Porter, the old housekeeper. I presume it was she who found them this morning. Yes. She always goes through the house in the mornings, adding it out before the family comes down. When she reached the card room, the shock was too much for her. She's had a nervous collapse. We had to put it to bed. No, no wonder. An exceptional case. Most exceptional. That's what we thought. We could find no traces of strangers in or around the house. Nothing was stolen. Nothing touched. The vicar believes you are the only one who can solve the case, Mr. Holmes. He insisted I come to you. I shall be only too glad to handle the matter, of course. But uh, first I must ask you a few questions. Anything, Mr. Holmes, anything. To begin with, Mr. Tregenis, why do you live with a vicar separated from your family? Well, as a matter of fact, we had a slight argument a few years ago about some property it was. But that was all settled long ago. We were on the best of terms. Now, Mr. Tregenis, about last night, uh, do you recall anything, anything at all, that was out of the ordinary? There was one thing that occurs to me. As we sat at the card table, my back was to the window. George was facing me. Suddenly, I saw him look hard over my shoulder out of the window. I turned quickly... And just for a moment, I thought I caught a glimpse of something, something moving. Man or animal? I don't quite know. My brother said he had the same feeling. It's uncanny, that's what it is. Something came into that room, and that something killed my sister and dashed the light of reason from my brother's mind. Something devilish it was. If that should prove to be the case, I fear I shall be of very little assistance, Mr. Trekennis. But short of wrestling with his satanic majesty, I think perhaps we can solve your problem. Come, Watson. We'd best go down to Tredanic Water at once. This is the house, Mr. Holmes. Whose carriage is this coming down the drive with the blinds down? There's somebody in it. Listen. <laughs> My brothers. My poor brothers. It's Dr. Richard's carriage. He's taking them to Helston Asylum. It's too awful. My poor brother. Easy, Tregenis, easy. Pull yourself together. I, I'll do my best. Good man. Which are the windows of the card room? Uh, this one here. Oh, look out, Holmes. You've upset the washing can. Dear, dear, how clumsy of me. Sorry, Tregenis. I'm afraid I've drenched your boots. Uh, no matter, Mr. Holmes, no matter. Shall we go in? Yes. 
I have seen all I need to see out here. This way. The card room is over here. Do you notice anything, Watson? No, I can't say that I do. This is the card room. Hmm. I see the window's still open. The housekeeper left it that way, I presume? Yes, she says it was locked on the inside when she came in. Quite so. I think we may close it now. Well, I'll do it, Holmes. No, let me. Candles quite gutted out. Yes, uh, cards still on the table. They had not risen from their chairs, I take it, and you left at ten. That sets the hour of death at some time before eleven. Mm. Fire burned out. Why fire? Had they always a fire in this small room on a spring evening? It was cold and damp last night, Mr. Holmes. The fire was lit shortly after my arrival. I see. Well, that seems to be about all. No disturbance of any kind. Strange. Oh, come along, Holmes. Come along. The room gives me the jumps. There's something about the atmosphere. As though death was still hovering in the air. I wonder. Come, Watson. We will return to our cottage. Should uh, anything occur to me, Mr. Tregenis, I shall communicate with you. It won't do, Watson. It won't do. All the facts are negative. Well, do you think Mr. Tregenis' account of his actions last night was truthful? Quite, Watson. Quite. You remember the incident of this spilt watering can? I did that to obtain an impression of his foot. I take it you succeeded? I did. With that print as a sample, I was able to trace his movements last night. His story is correct. He left the house at about ten, went straight back to the vicarage and did not return. Nor did anyone else enter or leave that house. Then it uh, must have been the man or, or animal they, they thought they saw in the bushes. He must have returned and frightened them to death. There was no such man or animal, Watson. Last night was a dark night. Anyone who had the wish to frighten these people would be compelled to put his face against the glass before he could be seen. Well? There is a three-foot flower border outside the cardroom window. But there are absolutely no footprints there. Yes, but, but, but that means... It means, means that... Mr. Tregenis' sister and her two brothers were alone when death struck the sister down and drove the brothers insane. But, Holmes, that would be supernatural. I hope not, Watson. Look, look, here I comes another not. visitor up our path. Stranger this time. Big, savage-looking fellow. That, my dear Watson, is none other than the famous Dr. Leon Sterndale. Sterndale, the lion hunter and explorer? Exactly. Oh, that's what he doing in this neighborhood. Oh, I've heard he owns a little cottage about five miles down the coast. They tell me he lives there absolutely by himself when he isn't off on one of his expeditions. Never mind, Watson. I'll do the honors myself. Come in, Dr. Sterndale, come in. Mr. Holmes? Yes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Holmes, I've come to you about the tragedy to Danick Walther. The police are utterly at a loss. You have a keener brain. Pardon me, Dr. Sterndale, but why are you so concerned in this affair? Well, you see, during my many residences in this locality, I've come to know the family of Tregenis very well. I see. Their, their horrible fate has been a great shock to me, Mr. Holmes. I'm so sorry. As a matter of fact, I was on my way to Africa. I got as far as Plymouth when the news reached me this morning. I came straight back to help in the inquiry. But uh, that would make you lose your ship. One sailed for Africa this afternoon, if I'm not mistaken. I can take the next. When did you last see the Tregenis family, Dr. Sterndale? I saw Brenda, uh, Miss Tregenis, three days ago. Just as I was leaving for Plymouth. Oh. So you have been in Plymouth for the last three days? Yes, in Plymouth. But how did you get the news so quickly? Surely the Plymouth papers didn't carry an account of the matter in this morning's edition? I received a telegram. A telegram? Might I ask from whom? You're very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business, Dr. Sterndale. Very well. The telegram was sent by the vicar, Mr. Roundkey. I see. And now, Mr. Holmes... Have you reached any conclusions? Conclusions? No. That would be a trifle premature. But I have every hope of bringing this matter to a satisfactory termination. Satisfactory to me, that is. Would you mind telling me if your suspicions point in any particular direction? I, uh... 
I do not feel that this is the moment to answer that question, Dr. Sterndale. Oh, and I see that I've been wasting my time. I need not prolong this visit. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hmm. Close mouth fellow, Dr. Sterndale, eh, isn't he, Holmes? He told me more than he realized, Watson. But he knows even more. How could he if he was in Plymouth? But was he, Watson? That statement is something for us to look into. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes as he endeavors to solve the strange mystery of Titanic water. But first, men... Remember, if you want to keep your hair handsome and healthy looking, one of the first requisites is a hygienic scalp. So why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of a highly specialized hair tonic like Cremel? Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why it keeps unruly hair neatly in place longer with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kreml never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. It never leaves hair feeling sticky, gummy, or dirty. Your hair and scalp always look and feel so clean with Kreml. And if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, start using Kreml at once. Let it make your hair feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. Kreml is also fine to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes. A quick massage with Kreml helps stimulate the cutaneous circulation of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated your scalp feels. So for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp, change to Kreml at once. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. <laughs> I say, Holmes, must you go on smoking that foul pipe? The atmosphere's so thick I can hardly see across the room as it is. Oh, dear, I feel depressed. Who knows what evil thing is stalking abroad in, in this neighborhood? Light the lamp, Watson. It's the gathering twilight that makes it gloomy. Rubbish. Look here, Holmes, what about that Dr. Sterndale? Do you think he did it? No, Watson. I've been in communication with his Plymouth Hotel. His story was correct. He had been there for the past three days, and he did receive a telegram from the vicar this morning. Oh, and he couldn't possibly have had anything to do with the Tugenis tragedy last night. Quite. I didn't think he had a connection with the tragedy. But there is a connection with... Now what? Mr. Holmes! Oh, Mr. Holmes! Open the door, Watson. Ah, my dear vicar, come in, come in. Dear me, you look as though you'd seen a ghost. It's tracked him down. The curse of the family. He's dead. Dead with that same look of terror on his face. Who's dead? Mortimer Trigenis. In his study at the vicarage. Great Scott. My servant found him there. Sitting beside his table. His face turned toward the window. And distorted with that same convulsion of fear that marked the features of his sister. Oh, my poor parish. Satan himself is loose among us. We are devil ridden, Mr. Holmes. Devil ridden. <laughs> This was his study, Mr. Holmes. Mm, depressing atmosphere. It was worse. I had the servant open the window. He's quite ill from shock, poor fellow. What a terrible look on Tregenis' face, Holmes. As the whole body is contorted and convulsed in a very paroxysm of fear. You've never seen death in this form before, Watson? No, never. You know of no poison that would have this effect? Good heavens, no. Hmm. Lamp is lit... It's burning over an hour. Notes the oil consumed. Yet darkness has just set in. Did anyone call at the vicarage this afternoon? No. I was out myself, but my servant says he let no one in. Then Tregenis was alone when he... I wonder. The window was shut at the time of his death, but the lamp was lit. Curious. The window. Let's see. The window. Yes, by Jove, I think I found something. What's that you're putting in your pocket, Holmes? And the lamp. Of course, the lamp. Notice this powder which has been spilled on the base of the lamp? Red brown powder. Give me an envelope, Watson. I must have these specks of powder. Why are you so excited about the powder, Holmes? Because it contains the solution of our mystery, Watson. It is the source and the solution. <laughs> Oh, 
comes, you haven't touched your supper. Mm. What a foul night. The wind's rising again. Oh, have another cup of tea and be quiet. I don't want to be quiet. I want to talk. I'm tired of waiting here listening to that blasted wind and the roar of the water down there below. Why did you send for Dr. Sterndale? Because he is an authority on obscure African poisons. Poisons? Why are you interested in poisons? Watson, there are two striking points in common in both cases under observation. Yes? In both cases, the atmosphere of the room had a curious effect on the persons who first entered it. The housekeeper and the vicar's servant were both overcome, as was the doctor who was called in. That's right. I hadn't thought of that. The room was still stuffy when we entered it. Right. And in each case, there was combustion going on in the room. The fire in the first case, the lamp in the second, and the lamp was not necessary. It was still daylight when it was lit. Yes, but I still don't see what... Something was burned in each case which produced an atmosphere causing strange toxic effects. An unknown poison. Good heavens. I believe we have a sample of that poison in the brown powder spilled on the base of the lamp. How are you going to prove it? I'm going to burn some of that powder and notice its effect. Just a small pinch of powder. Yes, uh, perhaps you'd better leave the room, Watson. And leave you alone in here? Certainly not. I warn you, it's risky. Confound that wind. Come along, come along. Let's get it on with it and get it over. Very well. Uh, place your chair opposite mine. Then we can watch each other for developments. If anything alarming happens, we can end the experiment. All right. Come on. I'm ready. Good. I put a pinch of the powder into our lamp. Oh, Say, what a... what a filthy smell. Hmm. Musky, subtle, nauseous. Listen to the wind, Holmes. I'm afraid. I don't know why. That wind. I can feel my hair rising. Holmes, do you see it? That cloud bank, whirling, black and sinister. It's monstrous. It's concealing something, something too wicked to imagine. Holmes, it's coming nearer and nearer. Can't you smell it? Sulfur and brimstone. You hear that, Holmes? It's hoofbeats. Hoofbeats. I know what it is. I can see it. I can't stand this. It's too terrible. Holmes! Watch it for the love of heaven. Don't give in. Don't breathe. I'll smash the window. I'll smash... There. That's better. Oh. Breathe in, oh. Watson. Breathe it in. It's good, clean air. Oh. Why, Joe, what a narrow escape. I had no idea it was so powerful. I thought I, I, thought I saw... I thought. I know. I, uh... It's a poison that affects the nerve centers of the imagination. The strain is enough to kill a man or drive him crazy. Hello, that's someone knocking at the door. Oh, so, so that's what I heard. It seems cleared out. Good thing there was a high wind. I'll close the shutters oh, and draw the curtains. Watson, can you open the door now? Yes, I think so. Phew, my, my knees are still shaking. Good evening, Mr. Holmes. You sent for me? Yes. Come in, Dr. Sterndale. Come in. Oh, you, you look rather pale, both of you. Yes. We've uh, just been conducting a little experiment with the poison that killed Tregenis. You? Have... Yes, Dr. Sterndale. Perhaps you'd like to tell us why you killed Mortimer Tregenis. I? Preposterous. You can't prove it? No. Let me tell you how you did it. You came over to the vicarage late this afternoon. You didn't want anyone to know you'd visited Dragenis. He was to let you in himself, but how could you attract his attention? You brought some pebbles with you, pink pebbles, from a heap beside your house. You threw these at the study window, where you knew Dragenis was working. I found some of these pebbles on the windowsill. Dragenis came downstairs, let you in himself. You had a talk with him, made him light his lamp, placed a pinch of the poison powder in the flame, and left... You're... You're right, Mr. Holmes. I did kill Mortimer Tregenis. But I'm not guilty of the other atrocity. I swear I'm not. I believe you, Dr. Sterndale. But you know who did it. Perhaps you'd better tell us about it. Very well. It was Mortimer Tregenis. What? He admitted it before I... Before he died. Mr. Holmes... I've been in love with Brenda Trigenis for many years. We were to have been married when my work in Africa was finished. I've lived so long in places where man is a law unto himself. He, he killed Brenda in cold blood. He killed her. I have nothing else to live for. By heaven, I'd do it again. 
How did Mortimer Tregenis get hold of the poison? It was something unusual, almost unknown. Yes, it was powdered pes diable. Pes diable? Devil's foot, eh? Yes, a root found in Africa. Shaped like a foot, half human, half goat-like. I have the only specimen in England. And you showed it to Tregenis? Yes, he came over the other afternoon when I was packing. He was interested in my African curiosities, particularly this powder. How he took it, I can't say. I thought no more of the matter until I had received the vicar's telegram and learned how they died. I returned at once. I, looking into the tragedy, I was convinced Mortimer Tregenis was the murderer, that he'd done it to gain control of the family fortune. There was the crime, but what was to be his punishment? What jury would believe such a fantastic story? No, I decided to take the law into my own hands. Perhaps if you ever loved anyone, you know how I felt. Hmm. Dr. Sterndale, what were your plans when you set out for Plymouth? I had intended to bury myself in Central Africa. My work is only half finished. Go and finish the other half, Dr. Sterndale. I do not feel called upon to prevent you. What a gruesome story, Dr. Watson. Yes, next to the famous Hound of the Basketball Adventure, that was the most gruesome experience that we ever had. There's just one thing I'd like to know. What did you think you saw in that cloud of smoke? Mr. Bell, you will have to believe me when I tell you it was too horrible to mention. Just to think of it is enough to make my blood run cold. Ladies and gentlemen, in a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Girls, Powers models are famous for their beauty and charm. And one of their most outstanding characteristics is their glorious, shining, bright hair. Now, here's how they keep it so shining. Powers models use Cremel Shampoo. This amazing, beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair, revealing all its natural, glossy luster. Yes, and don't forget, Cremel Shampoo is wonderful for washing children's hair, too. Of course it is, because there are no harsh caustics or chemicals in Cremel Shampoo, and its luxurious, active foam thoroughly cleanses scalp and hair of all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, if you could only see how Powers Models' hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights, I'm sure you'd want to try Cremel Shampoo right away. You can get a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week. Next week, I think I'll tell you about the adventure... Of the unfortunate brides. Well, it sounds intriguing, Dr. White. It was, Mr. Bell. It was indeed <laughs> intriguing. It concerned a honeymoon in Scotland and a bridegroom who turned out to be a cold-blooded and ruthless killer. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was adapted by Edith Miser from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Devil's Foot. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the case of the unfortunate brides. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The American Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Annie Oakley and Tag. Yes, boys and girls, the American Broadcasting Company presents once again the transcribed adventures of Annie Oakley, crack shot of the range country, and Tag.
A Story of the West. A story of a young 17-year-old orphan girl named Annie and her 10-year-old brother Tag who came west to find a home with their uncle Luke McTavish, sheriff in the small mining and ranching town of Diablo. A story filled with all the thrills and excitement of the old west. The adventures of Annie Oakley and Tag. Time is early evening. Tag has gone to bed. In the front room of Sheriff Luke McTavish's small ranch house, a checker game is in progress between the good sheriff and a neighboring rancher, Senor Felipe Gonzalez. Annie watches. <laughs> Looks like three in a row for me, Felipe. Uh, I'm afraid, Senor Sheriff Luke, that my mind is not on the game of checkers this evening. <sighs> you see, I'm most worried. Yeah, I'm afraid you ain't the only one around these parts that's worried. I should say not, Mr. Felipe. All the ranchers are. And no wonder. It's serious trouble, Annie, when a rancher starts losing his cattle. Yes, yes. They will give us food and money to buy things. they what we live and work for. How many head have you lost so far, Senor Felipe? Hey, almost 50, Annie. Senor Craig has lost about the same. Some of the other ranchers more, some less. I know. Simpson and Clements was in to see me this morning. They've each lost ten head in the last two days. Yes, si, yes. Si. And yet we have not been able to do anything about it. Why, just this afternoon on my eastern pasture, I find six more of my best steers dead. There they were, lying stretched out in the green grass, just like the others, but with no life in them. But why? That's the irritating part. That's the part I can't figure out. What about the doctor from Silver City, Uncle Luke? Well, we've sent for him, Annie. He ought to be here in a day or so. I figure he'll be able to tell us why the cattle died. But then doing something about it's another thing. Uh, well, Senor Luke, muchacha, if you will excuse me, I think I go back to my rancho. <laughs> I'm afraid I have not been very pleasant company this evening. Well, don't worry. We understand, Felipe. Maybe soon, old oh, things will be better. <laughs> then I'll try to skin you again at checkers. <laughs> <laughs> I should be most happy to lose a few more games, senor, if it would mean the end of the death of my cattle. Adios. Gee, Uncle Luke, I never saw Mr. Felipe so worried. Eh, me either, Annie. But now let me tell you he's got something to worry about. Him and all the rest of the ranchers around here. And what's more, as sheriff... I gotta figure out what this is all about. And figure it out fast, or I'm liable to be out of a job. And so, kids, that was that. But, bright and early the following morning, Annie and Tag decided to do a little checking around on their own. Well, sir. They'd been out in the hot sun nearly five hours, I guess, when Annie pulled up her horse. Oh, boy. Oh, oh, Target. Oh, I'm dry as a bone, Tag. What say we get ourselves and the horses a little water? Good idea, sis. There's whistling spring up ahead. Come on, I'll race it. Okay. On your mark. Get set. Go! Go on, Dixie! Come on, Go! 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 Come on, you can go on, Pretty close. Let's call it a tie. Nothing to it. I won and you know it. Okay, okay, you won. I'm too hot to argue. Come on, let's get off and give the horses a drink. Right. Sure, I know you're a thirsty target. Go ahead and drink, boy. Drink all you want. What's the matter with them, sis? Neither of them seem to want to drink. Beats me, Tag, but I sure do. Maybe they'll have changed their minds in a minute. Well, here goes. Target! Pixie! What's the matter with you two? I've never seen you act like this before. I just want to take a drink. My sis, as I can figure out, they don't want us to drink from the spring. Wait a minute, Tag. I wonder if they're trying to tell us this water's no good. Is that what you're trying to say, Target? That's it, Tag, that's it. This water must be poison. Well, kids, Annie knew that the water from Whistlin' Springs ran through all the ranches around Diablo. 
and that if it was poisonous, it would explain a lot of things. So if she filled up her canteen with a sample of the water, then came back to the Bullseye Ranch to tell Uncle Luke about it. He, in turn, decided the best thing to do was for the three of them to ride into town and have Mr. Stang, the pharmacist, analyze the water. And you say this water came from Whistling Springs, Sheriff? That's right, Mr. Stang. Annie here brought it straight home to me. Target wouldn't drink it, Mr. Stang, or let me drink it, so it must be poisonous. Well, we'll know in just a second if you're right, Annie. Yeah. There. What's your test show? This water's absolutely normal, Sheriff. No poison in it whatsoever. But, Mr. Stang, Target wouldn't make a mistake like that. Mightn't have been a mistake, Annie. Maybe just wasn't thirsty. Anyways, if I were you, I'd just forget about the whole thing. There's nothing poisonous about that water, you can be sure. Hey, look, let me show you something. What are you going to do, Mr. Stang? I'm going to drink some of it right in front of all the three of you, son. Yeah. Now, would I be drinking that water if it was poisonous? Eh, he's right, all right, Annie. Sure, I'm right. Don't look like I've had any ill effects from it, does it? No. Well, there you are. Frankly, Annie, I think it was just your imagination running away with you. Yeah, I guess so. Well, thanks anyway, Mr. Stang. We'll see you later. All right, Sheriff. So long. Hello, boss. Stang. Yeah, that nosy sheriff was just in here with them two adopted kids of his. Seems them brats are up snooping around Whistling Spring this morning. Got an idea the water's being poisoned. Yeah, that's right. He just brought in a sample to have it analyzed. No, no, didn't tell him anything. <laughs> in fact, they even spilled out a sample of it, switched it to plain water, then drank it right in front of their eyes. Well, sure they fell for it. <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker. I'll see who it is, Annie. Uh, Senor Sheriff, I'm so glad that you're home. Well, hi there, Felipe. Come on in. Gracias. Look, have you seen this? What is it? In the paper, this advertisement there. What's it say, Uncle Luke? Uh, says, uh, Ranchers of Rainbow Bend, money for your land. And Eastern send, uh, Kate is prepared to pay you fair prices in cash. Watch this space for further announcements. See, si, see, si. I just talked to some of the other ranchers, Senor Craig, Harper, Lang... Uh, they're planning a big meeting at Senor Craig's Rancho this afternoon. Uh, they asked me to tell you they would like you to attend. Well, you tell them I'll be there, Felipe. See. Si. Yes, sir, I sure will. You know, there's something funny going on around here, and I aim to find out what it is. Meet. Now then, we've all seen the ad in the newspaper about the Eastern Syndicate wanting to buy up our land. We all know the troubles we've been having with our cattle dying. So as far as the Ranchers Association, of which I am the head, is concerned, I figure what we need now is some positive action. Yes, yeah, yeah. uh, what do you think, Sheriff? I think you're absolutely right, Walt. Excuse me, son, your Sheriff, but may I say something? Why, sure thing, Felipe. Speak up. That's what the meeting's for. Uh, gracias. Thank you. Senor Craig, fellow ranchers, for many years I have worked my rancho with my own hands to make something of it. But, well, now I've been hit so hard by my cat losses that, well, I am afraid I would be forced to sell my land. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Gonzalez. You don't mean you'd sell out to that syndicate, do you? Well, I'm afraid, Senor Craig, that I may have to. But, Felipe, what we need now is a solid block. No sellouts at all, no matter what. All they need is just one crack. Uh, sis, I, I know, Senor Look, Gonzalez, 
Are you sure you're playing this straight with us? Uh, what do you mean by that? You know darn well what I mean. Whose side are you on? Ours or the other one? Now, hold on just a second there now, Walt. I don't want Felipe to sell his land any more than you do. But that's no reason to think that he might be working against us. Yeah. Hey, now, listen to me. Quiet to all of you. Just a minute now. Here, here. We got enough troubles right now without arguing amongst ourselves. We're all nervous and upset and accusing each other of things that we don't really believe. Maybe, Luke, and maybe not. But all the rest of us have decided to stick together, to fight this thing to the finish. That is, all of us except Philippe. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know, Walt. I know. Well, Philippe, what about it? Well, I'm sorry, Senor Sheriff. Okay. In that case, Felipe, I'm warning you. If we find out what I suspect about you is true, sheriff or no sheriff, there's going to be a party around here. A necktie party. In just a few seconds, we'll return to the adventures of Annie Oakley and Tag. Right now, though, boys and girls, here's something I want you all to hear. So listen. And now back to the adventures of Annie Oakley and Tag. The ranchers around Diablo have all been losing cattle in a very mysterious way. Annie and Tag have reason to believe it's because the water in Whistling Springs is somehow being poisoned. What's more, due to his willingness to sell out in spite of the other ranchers' objections, Senor Felipe Gonzalez is strongly suspected of having thrown in with an eastern syndicate intent on forcing the other ranchers to sell. What Annie, Tag, and Sheriff McTavish don't know, though, is that the druggist... Mr. Stang found out the water is poisoned, but won't tell them for fear of tipping the syndicate's plan of which he is a part. Now it's the next day. Annie, Tag, and their Uncle Luke are riding out near Whistling Springs when all of a sudden the young girl pulls her horse up short. Oh, Charlie. Oh, hold it, Uncle Luke. Yeah, what's the matter, Annie? What are you stopping for? Shh, quiet. Look up ahead, Uncle Luke. Up by that clump of trees. Uh huh. Where? Well, I'll be doggone. Looks like a man. Yeah, and it's dismounting and walking toward the spring. Can you make out who it is, Annie? No, Uncle Luke, but if I'm not mistaken, he's bending over the spring right now and pouring something into it. Annie, you don't reckon that's the same guy as I don't know, but it sure looks my. Shh, quiet. He's leaving the spring now, going back to his horse and mounting up. There he goes. Come on, Uncle Luke, let's follow him and see if we can find out who he is. Well, sir, Annie Tag and Sheriff McTavish followed the rider all right. And you know where he led them? Right out to Felipe Gonzalez Ranch. And then he disappeared into the barn. They waited a couple of minutes, hid their horses in a clump of trees, then moved down toward the barn after him. Yeah, quiet now, kids. We don't want to be spotted. Come on, there's a barn. Now let's sneak in. Quick, duck in before we're seen. Gosh, it's dark. Can't see a thing. Yeah, look here. I'll strike a match. There. I don't see much, Uncle Luke. Harnesses, saddles, some gardening equipment. Yeah, I'll keep going towards the back. All right. Look, Uncle Luke. There's a bench over there with a lot of paper draped over it. Yeah, I see it, Annie. Here. <laughs> Better strike another match. This one's sort of warming up my fingertips. All right now, honey. Lift the paper. Uncle Luke, look, bottles and jars and, and different sorts of chemicals and, hey, look at this one. 
Uh-huh. A skull and crossbones. The sign of poison tagged. Yes, sir. This is it, all right. This is the stuff that's been poisoning Whistling Springs and killing the cattle. And here it is right here in Felipe's. Quiet, Uncle Luke. Huh? What's the matter? I just heard a noise outside. Somebody's coming. Oh, quick. Duck into the shadows there. Keep down. Who's there? Come on, step out. I got a gun, so you better do as I say. Mr. Stang, the druggist, Uncle Luke. I said come on out. Yeah, uh, we better do as he says, kids. Okay, Mr. Stang, we're coming. Oh, so it's you three. What are you doing out here in Felipe's barn? Well, as a sheriff, I might ask the same of you. Okay, and I don't mind telling you. I'm doing a little investigating. Once more, Sheriff, I think I found out all I wanted to know. Huh? What do you mean? Annie, that water you brought me was poisoned. But you said... I know. I said it wasn't because it didn't want to alarm anybody else and I had a chance to do a little checking on my own. But now these chemicals over here tell me all I need to know. Gonzalez is a guilty one and he's going to have to pay. Yeah, I guess you're right, Mr. Stang. I'll tell you what. Why don't you go into town and wait for me at my office? I'll bring Felipe in there within an hour. Okay. But just be sure that you do. Or else there's liable to be a new sheriff in the morning. But, Senor Sheriff, where are you taking me? To your barn, Felipe. To my barn? But I do not understand what... Okay, Felipe. I suppose I'll get right to the point. I hate to say this, because we've always been friends. But it looks now as though you've turned again us. Again the ranchers around here, and again me personal. But as I have said before, I have no choice... I got to sell. Uncle Luke's talking about something else, Mr. Felipe. You... something else? Come on in here. I'll show you. Okay, Felipe. Lift that paper and look under. Madre de Dios. What is that? Bottles, jars? It... Poison, Felipe. The stuff that's been poisoning the water of Whistling Spring. But... What is he doing here? That's what I'd like to know. Amigo, surely you don't think that these, these poisonous chemicals are mine? Well, I, I swear by all that's holy, I, I never seen them before. And how do you think they got here, Felipe? Well, I, I do not know. All I know is that they are not mine. Why, why should I wish to kill cattle, eh? Senor Felipe, have you been out this morning at all? Maybe riding up around Whistling Spring? No, no. No, muchacha. I, I've been home all the time. You know, kids, I might be wrong, but if you ask me, I think Stang set this whole thing up. I think he's a writer we saw up there at Whistling Springs. In fact, I think he led us down here deliberately and had those poisons planted in Mr. Felipe's barn to make him look suspicious. I was just thinking the same thing, Uncle Luke. Yeah. Question is, what do we do now? Stang's waiting in my office for me to bring you in, Felipe. I've got it, Uncle Luke. Why don't we take Senor Felipe up to that secret cave in back of Bullseye Ranch? Hey, that's a good idea, Andy. He'll be safe there. Or at least till we can figure out what to do next. Come on. But why should they want to hide me, Senor Sherry? Why? Look, Felipe... Don't think too harshly of the ranchers. These are hard times for them. That no good varmint stang egged them on. Sure, we know that you didn't poison the spring water, but the ranchers don't. And the way we helped you escape, I got a feeling they're liable to think that we're tied up in this dirty mess, too. What are we going to do, Uncle Luke? Yeah, I don't know for sure yet, Tag. Wish I did. Good. You think, then, that uh, Stein himself is poisoning this war? I sure do. But why? What has he to gain if he is not a rancher? I know that. I think he's working for someone. Someone connected with that eastern syndicate that's trying to buy up all this land around Diablo. Ah, comprendo. I, I see, I see. Dad, blame it. 
If them sidewinders can scheme, so can we. You got a plan, Uncle Luke? Well, I think so, Annie. At least I got a scheme to work on staying. It'll be kind of risky, but I think it might give us a chance to crack him. Bueno, bueno. What is it? What? Well, now, it may sound a little peculiar, Felipe, but here's what we're going to do. Annie, what are you doing here? Hello, Mr. Stang. I, I've got something to tell you. You got some? Uh, okay, come on in. I I don't know exactly where to go. Well, begin. whatever it is, you better talk fast. You know, you and your uncle are in a lot of trouble helping that cattle killer Felipe escape. I know. Look, Mr. Stang, Uncle Luke helped Felipe escape because he thought he was innocent. And it wasn't right to string a man up without a fair hearing. The stringing up was a rancher's idea, young lady. They're sore. They're sore because they lost a lot of cattle or in danger of losing their land. I know, Mr. Stang, and that's why I'm here. You see, Uncle Luke sent me to tell you that, well, that he thinks we did wrong last night in helping Felipe escape. Oh, I see. What am I supposed to do? Come with me. I'll take you to Senor Felipe's hiding place. Maybe if you talk to him, with what you know about chemicals and poisons and stuff, you can make him confess. You, uh, say you know his hiding place, Annie. Uh Uh-huh. You're willing to take me to him, eh? That's what Uncle Luke said for me to do. Oh, all right, Annie. Uh, tell you what, why don't you just go on outside for a minute and let me gather up some things here, and uh, I'll be right with you. All right, Mr. Stang. I'll be waiting outside. Hello, boss. Uh, Stang. We got a break. Yeah, listen. The sheriff and those two kids have gotten squeamish about helping Felipe escape. Yeah, that's right. And the girl's here now. Yeah, and get this. She wants to take me to Felipe's hiding place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, why don't you follow us out? Uh, don't worry. I'll keep the kid occupied. All right. Are you sure you know where you're going, Annie? I'm positive, Mr. Stang. Why didn't you tell me you were going out in the desert? That sun's hot. I would have brought along canteen of water. You won't need it. We don't have far to go. Yeah, good. Sure wouldn't want to get stuck out here without any water. Yeah. Sure would be bad, wouldn't it? How much further, kid? Just a little ways. You've been saying that for the last 40 minutes. I'm getting thirsty. There'll be some water at Felipe's hiding place. I sure hope so. There will be all right. Don't you worry none about that. Look, kid, we've been riding for an hour and a half. I think you've been taking me around circles. Why would I do that, Mr. Stang? I don't know. But you better not have any tricks up your sleeve. It won't be much longer now. How much longer? i got to have a drink. I promised you there'd be water when we get to Felipe's hiding place. And don't worry, Mr. Stang. I won't go back on my promise. There's Felipe's hiding place, Mr. Stang, over in that shack. Oh, at last. About time. Come on, hurry up. I want a drink. Oh, hold oh. it up, Target. Hold it. Mr. Stang, <laughs> I was wondering when you'd get here. Hi, Uncle Luke. Where's some water, Sheriff? Eh, you can get that in just a minute, Mr. Stang. Hey, uh, Felipe's in the next room. We got him tied up so he wouldn't make a break. Never mind him. Where's the water? That's what I want right now. Okay, I'll get you some. i got a canteen back here someplace. I'll come with you, Uncle Luke. Well, hurry it up, Gosh, sis, you really must have given Stang a ride. I sure did, Tag. I got him as thirsty as I could, just like we all planned. Good, good. Now, here, here's a canteen. Now, remember, after he drinks, we're going to tell him. Boy, I sure hope it works. And so do I, Annie. So do I. Well, here goes. 
Oh, at last. Here, let me take a swig. <laughs> oh, boy, that really tastes good. You know, a guy can sure get a hankering for this stuff. Yeah, sure. Right there, Mr. Stang. Yeah. And I guess that water from Whistling Springs is just about the best in the world. Yeah. What'd you say? I just said the uh, uh, water from Whistling Springs is the best there is, that's all. Why? Yeah. Is that where this water come from? That's right. What's the matter, Mr. Stang? Well, that water's poison, you know that. What are you trying to do to me? You tricked me. You got me thirsty on purpose, so I drink this poison water. Something like that, Stang. Yeah, get me to town. Get me to town quick. I gotta fix an antidote. Wait just a minute. How are you gonna make an antidote unless you know exactly what the poison is? But I know. I know what the poison is. How do you know? I know because... Uh, because I analyzed it. Yeah, that's it. I analyzed it when Annie first brought in that sample. Oh, no, you didn't, Stang. You didn't have to. You knew exactly what poison was in it because you put it in it. <laughs> All right. All right, I did it, I did it, but hurry up, get me to town, I'll die if you don't. Yeah, we get you to town all right, Stang. After you tell us one more thing. Who put you up to this? Yeah, yeah. Who tried to kill the cattle around Diablo so that yeah. Eastern Syndicate could buy up land cheap? Yeah, yeah. Who are you working for? I can't tell you, I can't tell you. In that case, then, I don't see how we could possibly take you to town. Yeah. All right. All right, I know when I'm licked. I'm working for... Oh! Hey, he, he shot! He shot! Somebody shot him! That's right. Don't move anyway. You're wearing a mask. Who are you? <laughs> You'll never know, none of you. Because you're all three going to be too dead to see anything. Turn around. Uh, uh, uh look, mister, uh, whoever you are, uh, shoot me if you want to, but please don't hurt these kids. Don't worry, Uncle Luke, he won't. <laughs> yeah, kid? What makes you think so? This! <laughs> Oh, my hand. My hand. Nice shooting, sis. Get his gun, Uncle Luke. Yeah, I got it, got it. Yeah. All right, you no good polecat. I've got you covered. Now stand up. Uh, uh, take off your mask. Yeah. Okay, if you won't take it off, I'll take it off oh, first. Yeah. Uncle Luke, look. It's Mr. Craig. Well, I'll be. So it was you all the time, Craig. You, head of the Cattlemen's Association... You're the real one who's been trying to buy up all our land. Yeah. And I'd have gotten away with it if it hadn't have been for that kid. Yeah, maybe you would, Craig. <laughs> maybe you would. Right now, though, get up. But... Because where you're going, you won't be getting away with anything for a long, long time. <laughs> Well, boys and girls, guess that sort of winds things up for this time. But Annie, Tag, and the whole gang will be back next Thursday at this very same time and over these same stations for another thrill-packed story of the West in The Adventures of Annie Oakley and Tag. Adventures of Annie Oakley and Tag is directed by William N. Birch. This is Charles Lyon. America is sold on ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Bold Venture. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring... Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean Bold Venture Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. Now, that doesn't do it 
either, sailor. That was a two-motored plane. Your boy is two hours late. Oh, Carrie will get here. You don't have to worry about him. I'll tell you a secret. I spend my whole life not worrying about Carrie. You like him. Where do you meet him? Blonde, wavy hair and wears a white silk scarf. Is his mustache blonde, too? No mustache. I showed you his picture. Well, there was a mustache in that picture someplace. Uh-uh. Just Carrie Martin in his plane. Here, look. I brought it along. Hey, you drew a mustache on him. <laughs> yeah, and a beard, too. Uh, does it bother you because I knew a man named Carrie Martin before I knew you? Because he sent you a wire from Miami to meet you at a crummy airstrip outside of Havana. Because I had to get up too early and drive you too far. I told you last night you didn't have to come along. But this morning there was a jeep waiting for me, and you were in it. Because the last time you drove the jeep, you came home with the wrong jeep. The time before that... Hey, you two there. What are you doing here? Hello? I asked you a question. What are you doing here? Believe it or not, we're waiting for an airplane. What are you waiting for? Get out of here. We like it here. We'll have to settle down right here. I don't know who you are, but my company has leased this airstrip, and I have full authority. Here comes a plane, Slate. That's four-motored. Your friend's is a single-engine job. I can't understand it. Something must have happened. I don't want to have to talk to you two again. Now, take it easy, mister. We're going, not because you say so. Sailor's worried. She might want to cry. She doesn't like anyone to watch. Spot him yet, Mickey? No. Take her up another thousand. We can use that cloud for a blanket. Yeah. Like the gay old times, huh, Mickey? Better. That was for glory. This is for getting rich. <laughs> a half million buck payroll floating in the sky like a little bird. Just waiting for us to knock it off. And Anderson promised us the drumsticks. Twenty grand's worth. A man could get fat chewing on a thing like... Haze off your wing, Joe. Ten o'clock. Uh-huh. Make a pass. Scare him. I'll signal we want him to land on that island. Uh-huh. Hey, he won't play. Kerry Martin's a hero. I've got some for heroes. In the wing, Joe. We don't want to kill him. Just keep him and his plane on ice. You left out the part about the half million bucks. Like you asked, in the wing. Ah, the boy's good to us, Joe. He's going to belly land her on the beach. Hip, hip, and a hooray. The hero made it. Now we go to Havana, boy, and report to Anderson. Roger Wilco and stuff like that there. You think anyone will find him, Mickey? Before not we... anyone, kid. Just us. That scrap of beats is not even on the charts. It's our secret. Goody. Hey, look at that ocean below us, Mickey. Gorgeous, huh? Hey, what's the matter, kid? Motor gone sour? Both of them. Must be out of gas. They're coking out on me. It's a... Hey, Mickey, what... Oh, we had it in our hands and we're gonna... Come here, sailor. Keep your hands on the wheel. I'm tired of it. We've been running around in circles for half a day. Just because a sailor on a passing steamer reported he saw a plane crash in this vicinity. Harry Martin means this much to you, huh? I met him in Europe, Slate. He was shot down. I helped him. He needed me once. A woman doesn't have many opportunities like that. Okay, we'll keep looking. Thanks. Slate, look over there to starboard. Is that a wave crest in the sun, that, that thing shining? Uh... I don't know. That's metal. It's a wing. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. It's a wing, Slate. Let's take a closer look, huh? Hey, wait. What? Carrie flew his own plane when he left Miami, and it's a single engine. That's what the telegram said. I don't understand what you're trying to say. But this wing has an cell where it housed an engine. That means it was a two-engine job. It can't be Carrie's plane. Maybe it's an old wreck. Uh-uh. Wrecked planes don't float that long. Maybe Carrie's alive. 
Well, can't look any more, sailor. Our fuel is low. You've got to let the authorities know about this wreck. A little while longer. Something's wrong here, but I'll promise you this. If Carrie's alive, we'll find him. Got your motor, sailor. Slip her in easy. Aye, aye. And now throw me a line. I'll make her fast. Line. All secure. Bring the chart I drew, sailor. You didn't find him, did you? Huh? No. Ah, look what's here to welcome us home, sailor. The man who orders people off his airstrip. Look, Buster. Uh Uh-uh, this one's on me, Slate. You, get your feet off our pier and take your mustache with them. You must forgive me for my behavior at the landing field. I was the victim of a grave concern. I didn't know then, Miss Duval, how intimate you were with Carrie Martin. You know, you've got a talent for saying the wrong thing. Not intimate. Just a boy I knew once. I give you that to make the goodbye easier. You're getting off cheap. And now, goodbye. Now, please, you must hear me out. I am John Anderson, resident manager for the Toledo Canneries. That boy was flying in a half-million-dollar payroll. You hear? Half a million. Was he now? Go cry on your insurance agent, then both your stomachs can flutter together. Toledo Canneries is ready to pay any price you ask to find Martin, within reason, of course. You want the boy or the money? And why do I ask a stupid question when I know the answer? Oh, you underestimate our humanity, Miss Duval. We want Kerry Martin. He was a loyal employee, intrepid, a man of know-how. You finally think of the right answer, and then you go and spoil it. Intrepid know-how. We learned from the authorities the plane you found wasn't Martin's. Continue your search, find him, and we will show our gratitude in any manner you wish, within reason. We'll search for him. We'll find him, but not for any reason you'd understand. Take that back to your company. Maybe they can put it up in cans. I would have preferred that, uh... Well, just notify me when you do, please. Goodbye, you two. Take me home, Slate. Sure, I'll have King fix you something special. It'll make you feel better. Over here, Anderson. The two suckers bite. (laughs) It's a mission with them, Matt. A grail. Huh? Talk down to me because I'm stupid. Oh, they'll find him for me. For nothing. All you do is go where they go. I'll arrange it. And put a half million bucks in your lap, huh? For that, you do something for me, huh? I've already told you. Two thousand. Not a penny more. Nah, not money, stupid. Just a word that says I can kill them when I'm through with them. Hmm. I like you, Matt. You can kill them. Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. Miss Sailor, she had a friend so true, a man who went in the yonder so blue. In a flying machine, he had no fears. On account of this, drove Miss Sailor to tears. This man he swooped from Miami To see Miss Sailor flying Romeo he But he didn't arrive, I hasn't done it yet Now Miss Sailor she worry and fret Now that about sums it up, King Where's Miss Sailor now, Mr. Slate? On the patio, worrying and fretting You go look some more for this Kerry Martin? Yeah, one of Bold Ventures motors has reverse gear trouble as soon as it's fixed why don't you go put an arm around Miss Sailor and say, there, there. I tried it. She didn't even know I was standing beside her. Oh, she got company now. Huh? Well, yeah, I wonder where she found him. Slate, 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 look who I found. This is Carrie Martin? This is Pablo. Tell him, Pablo. I am Pablo. I find a man. He said the name Carrie Martin belonged to him. Yeah, well, where'd you find him? I have a chart of Tortuga's key. I will put a pencil mark where I find him. It's so small it is. Okay, okay. Tell me how it happened. I am Pablo. I am fisher. I take boat to place in Tortugas where I fish. There is airship on beach, standing on nose. Carrie must have crash landed. He's all right. It's not so. He have in him great hurt. Hard to talk. He is too big for small me to carry. Say his name. Say name of Sailor Duval. This name I know because all of Havana know name Sailor Duval. I come. Why didn't you go to the police? I am Pablo. Once I talk to police, I am in jail for two years after that. 
I am Pablo who does not talk to police. You go to man in Tortuga's key, senor? Yeah, we go. Hurry, Slate. Easy, baby. We know where he is now. I'm taking it to him as fast as I know how. I'm sorry. I just can't. I know. He needed you once. He needs you again. Pablo said he was badly hurt. I'll do what I can, sailor. He'll be all right. He'll see you again, and it'll help make him all right. Look, Slate, I told you. Carrie was just a guy who... Here, I'll, I'll give you a hand aboard. Thanks. Just a nice guy who wanted to be friends. Now tell me about it later. Right now, we got company. You, Anderson, and your friend off my boat, I won't ask you again. No, just a minute, Mr. Shannon. Uh, this is Matt, one of our employees, and he's at your disposal. That means I'll help, Mr. Shannon. I and Carrie Martin work for the same company. If you're so anxious, Anderson, why don't you go hire your own searching party? Leave us alone. If I did that, the Caribbean would swarm with fortune hunters. Their palms itching for all that money. Martin's flight was a secret. And we'd like to keep the finding of him that way, too. Uh, I see what you mean. They might kill Martin. Take Exactly. Matt could be of great help in preventing that. And for nothing. Well, I could use an extra hand. Okay with you, sailor? The more the merrier. Let him come, Slate. Okay, Matt, just take my orders and we'll get along real good. Gee, thanks. You'll see, Mr. Shannon. I'm going to help you like anything. The way I do it, you'll never get over it. Our stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren McCall, and the second act of our story. How deep now, sailor? Six feet. Steady. Now four. Cut the motor, Slate. Okay. It's just the other side of the cove. I'll go on ahead. Sure, sailor. I understand. It's not that. It's just I the... said I understand. So don't explain it to me. Go on. Jump. I told you before, sailor. I gave you a chance to hold his hand for a minute alone. You blew it. Get the medicine kit, Matt. Aye, aye, skipper. I got it, skipper. Hey, I glum on the lingo good, don't I, Mr. Shannon? You're a good seaman, Matt. Let's go. After you, sailor. The plane didn't look too banged up. Maybe Carrie's not as badly hurt as that fisherman said. We'll know in a little while. And maybe the half million come out of it all right, too. I crossed my fingers. Huh? What do you say, Matt? Oh, you know how it is, Mr. Shannon. A guy works for a cannery. He tries to think the way he thinks a cannery wants him to think. In my heart, I pray Mr. Martin's in good health. I pray that... Forget it. You better run, Mr. Shannon. I wouldn't want to think that I was the... Just boy. run. And don't drop that kit. Carrie, Carrie, it's all right. Carrie. Now, don't call him anymore, sailor, because he's not here. He has to be. If he was hurt, how, how could he get away? Maybe he crawled to the other side of the island, thought he'd find help. Maybe someone picked him up. And took the dough, because that's not here, too. Uh, you know that, because that's the first thing you looked for, wasn't it, Matt? It was a short prayer, huh? Oh, Skipper, you said to yourself you wanted the girl to be alone with him for a minute... We've got to find him, Slate. He, he could be dying. Now, don't cry till you know what for, sailor. Oh, tide washed his footprints away. It's a small island. We could split up. Stop picking my brain. We'll split up. You go that way, Matt, the south end of the island. My favorite direction. You got a preference, sailor? East. That leaves me north. If we don't find him, we meet here. Oh, uh, don't forget the way back, sailor. <laughs> Can you hear me? Martin. That you, Shannon? 
You get lost, kid? Not me. You're supposed to be casing the south end of this island. Well, I started that way, then I got worried. Maybe you'd find that dough and I'd be far away. Things like that. That money really bothers you, doesn't it? Ever since Pop taught me how to beat the pay telephones, he used to bring them home by the dozens. And you work for a big outfit like Toledo Canneries, huh? Well, I'll tell you. A guy works for a place, troubleshoots, makes a salary. Gets to sniffing a half million, he gets downright disloyal. I guess I'm what you'd call disgusted. You trying to sell me something? You bought it, baby. You won too many on this island. Look, I take out a knife, then I point knife upward for ripping and rip. Yeah. Next time, hold it close to your body. You're breaking my arm. Drop it. Drop it. Now, dream about what I told you. I couldn't bother with you, Matt. On second thought, I'll need your shirt to tie you up. And I'll find Carrie. A guy gets hurt, sailor. He tries to dream his pain away. Let me touch you again. Don't try to move, Carrie. I'll come closer to you. See? I'm really here. How did you come? On downy wings? Slate and I have a boat. A fisherman told us... Slate? He's my guardian, Slate Shannon. There was a shadow in the dream. Now I know his name. Slate's at the other end of the island looking for you. May he never find me. There are three of us. Slate, a man from the company... Anderson? Someone named Matt. Good old Matt. Never heard of him, but good old Matt. What happened to you, Carrie... What went wrong? Bandits. You mean bandits like... I mean like in the war. They shot holes in my wing. Shot up my rudder. Forced me down. I crash landed. I was very happy till something in my chest told me my chest was caved in. Why did they do that to you? Shh. Big top secret. Half a million dollar payroll. But it wasn't a secret. Carrie, all this time with that hurt. The money, I, I buried it under the plane. Take it away. Give it to somebody. Carrie. Shh, I, I sleep now. Gotta sleep. <sighs> Carrie, it's beginning to rain. We, we've got to get you. Martin! Martin! Over here, Slate. Over here. How is he, sailor? He's asleep. We've got to move him, Slate. The rain... We can't move him. He's hurt too bad. Here, cover him with my coat. He leaves. Don't crack up on me, sailor. We'll get help. A doctor. He'll be all right. Okay? Let's go. Can you lift it, Slate? Yeah, the box is not that heavy. (laughs) If you could weave, Sally, you could make us a couple of raincoats. I've never had one made out of $20 bills. You sure were underprivileged, weren't you? All the other kids in my block had them. Come on. Let's get the bold venture moving and get some help for Carrie. What about Matt? I left him in a hollow. If it rains hard, the hollow's liable to fill up. Maybe he can drink himself out of it. Yeah, give you a hand up. Okay. Let's take off, Slate. Now what? I don't know. I'll take a look. Hey, sailor. What? Both carburetors gone, probably on the bottom of the ocean. Matt must have done it before he caught up with me. And this is turning out to be a gay afternoon. Well, let's get back ashore. Grab that flashlight. It's getting dark. I'll take the money. Okay. Why didn't you leave the money aboard? In case we have callers. In case people who don't have... Wait a minute. Listen. You hear it? Yeah, sure. It's a plane. 
Wave the flash. Maybe we'll get home faster than we think. He sees us. He's landing. That guy can handle that ship. Look at him. He'll be able to take Carrie back. That's you, Shannon? Hey, it's Mr. Anderson. Yeah, it's me with Mr. Val. Oh, good. Start running, sailor. There he is, Slate. Martin. Martin, are you awake? You don't have to talk, yeah. Carrie. That's right. Now, just listen. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. John Anderson just landed a plane. He'll help. No, he won't. If he finds you, he'll kill you. But Anderson... Don't talk, Carrie. We'll explain it to you later. He's looking for all of us. If he comes close to you, don't move. If he calls to you, don't answer. Make out you're dead. Do you understand? Yes. Understand. We'll come back for you. Sure, sure. I don't worry about anything. It'll be all right. Let's go, sailor. Where are we going? Get rid of this money. We going to bury it? Uh Uh-huh. We're going to give it away. There's a hollow, sailor. There's something in it. That would be Matt. I brought you something, Matt. Do good die. That's no way to talk. We brought you half a million dollars. It's soggy from the rain, Matt, but you won't mind. Your hot breath will dry it out. Hey. That's right. Anderson landed a little while ago. This knife says don't answer him. Talk soft. Anderson made it, huh? You two pigeons are in trouble. How'd he find this island? In Havana, when you were getting your boat ready for this haul, you stepped ashore for coffee, remember? That's when we come aboard and nuzzled your charts. Anderson flies a plane accurate. He's got a loud voice, too. I don't blame you, Matt. If that knife was sticking me, I'd go out, too. Okay, okay. What's with the money? What are you trying to say? You want to look at it? Yeah. Yeah, I do. All right. Open it, sailor. The man on that $20 bill winked at you, Matt. Oh, pretty, pretty. It's all yours. What about him? He'll find you in a few seconds, then you can chat about the money. Me tied up like this? He'll kill me. I know him. He's double-crossed his company. He'll do it to me. I'll put this knife in your hands. You can saw your way out. Matt! Let's get out of here, Slate. Yeah. Here I am, Anderson. Got the money right here. Help me get out. In cold blood, Slate. Shannon! Can you hear me, Shannon? I'm going to be on your back in a second. You rot here, Shannon. You and your... Not me, John boy. Uh, You made a mistake, Slate. Pardon me. Uh, You won't get out alive. You betting? (laughs) Come out from behind that tree, sailor. I haven't got time to pat your cheek. Let's get help for Carrie. Sure, with this gun in back of Anderson's head, that plane will get help here in an hour. I'll say it again, Slate. It's been a gay day. It's almost over. Let's go take a ride in an airplane. Slate. Uh huh. Carrie just called me again from the hospital. He says he feels great. Oh, I'm glad. He had a message for you. He wanted to know if it was all right for me to have a date with him when he gets well. What have I got to do with it? Well, I told him you were, uh, like a daddy to me. Oh. Sailor. Uh huh. Come here, little girl. Sit on my knee. Like this? That's fine. What do you want, Daddy? What do little girls do before they run along to play? This. Do I have to run along and play? I feel so grown up. And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. 
May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in Bold Venture. Revere, the makers of America's finest motion picture cameras and projectors presents Adventure Incorporated with Frank Graham, Happy Boyington, and Pat McGeehan. Thrilling tales of adventure, mystery, and folklore. Strange tales that have been gathered in the far corners of the world. These are the stories you will hear when you listen to the members of that unique organization, Adventure Incorporated. Three of them, Jason Grimm, Frank Fletcher, and Greg Devlin, are seated now in the lounge of an ocean liner, bound for one of their assignments in... Danger! And now, for Revere, Pappy Boyington. Say, do you want to know how to really enjoy that vacation you're about to take? Okay. Just be sure you take with you a Revere 8mm or 16mm movie camera. Now suppose you're out on a ranch, dude or otherwise. You want to get some good action shots of the cowboys breaking a bronc or opening a cab. You're standing by with your magazine load camera all set. A kick and a click, and both cowboy and camera in action. You want to get the complete scene, though, but you're running out of film. All is not lost. Not with a Revere magazine load. Listen. Just as easy as that. That's how quickly you can change magazines, get your camera back into action. In a few fleeting seconds, you've captured forever a beautiful picture to review, along with your other pleasant memories. Now, aren't you glad you took the Revere camera? Remember, you're bound to cheer if you use Revere. And now, back to... Adventure Incorporated. Did you gentlemen notice that emerald ring that girl was wearing? Who was noticing the ring? I was noticing the girl. (laughs) (laughs) I did, Jason. It looks like a melee and emerald. I bought one in Singapore when I was there on that porcelain goddess case. Uh, Speaking of emeralds and oriental goddesses, did you ever hear of the curse of the emerald Buddha? Uh, Don't tell me Adventure Incorporated sent you over there to investigate a curse. No, I got this story several years ago while I was visiting the commander of a French foreign legion post in the Cambodian jungle. The doctor of the post told it to me. Three men sat before a campfire in the heart of the Cambodian jungle. Two of them were white, dressed in soil traffic suits and sun helmets. The third was a dark-skinned Cambodian. His name was Gengai. He was clothed only in a loincloth. In the morning, this Gengai, native fisherman from a nearby lake, would lead the two hunters on a trail of a giant man-killing tiger that was terrorizing the countryside. For five days now, they had followed the spoor, and their hopes were high. Sitting with his back against a palm tree, staring impassively into the fire, this native told his companion stories of other days, of his home on the shores of the great jungle-bordered lake the magnificent deserted city that lay virtually on the edge of their camp. A strange legend had been handed down the ages about this mysterious city, and this native Gengai told it to his employers. And in the great capital of the Khmer people, which was the finest city in all Asia, there is a statue of the Lord Buddha sitting upon a coil cobra, which is the emblem of that race. And this statue is fashioned out of emeralds so cunningly matched and cemented together that the whole work seems as one solid stone. It shines with a green light so bright that none but the faithful may look upon it. Whoever finds this idol is doomed to certain and horrible death. Jim Sanders and his companion Lester Grove listened with rapt attention as the descendant of the ancient Khmer told the story of the great treasure that lay beneath the bayon of Angkor Wat. Somewhere under this great central tower of the temple lay the treasure of a vanished race. The golden emblems of Shiva, the golden throne, and the emerald Buddha. Sanders grabbed his heavy rifle and peered into the jungle night expectantly. Gengai turned to him. Tiger! Sanders anticipated the sight of two burning points of light that would be the eyes of the great striped beast. 
He wondered if he would be ready for the spring of this Lord of the Jungle. And then, after what seemed an eternity, the three men relaxed their vigil. The crash in the underbrush was farther away. The tiger had passed them by, had gone to do his hunting elsewhere. Sanders recalled the story Genga had told them. That story Genga has been telling us about that treasure and the curse of the Emerald Buddha has got me quite curious. Let's poke around in those ruins for a while before we take up that tiger's trail. Who knows? Maybe we'll find that hidden treasure room. Oh, matey, I'm with you. But this here hunting tigers for a lot of blinking natives is not to me like him. If we find that treasure, it's back to Blighty for me. <laughs> The next morning, the white men visited the ruins of Angkor Wat. Gingai, who guided them to the massive pile of masonry, refused to enter the dead city. He still feared the spirits of the snake people that guarded the place. But even greater was his fear of the terrible curse of the Emerald Buddha. Hour after hour, the adventurers explored the ruins, led on by the fascinating call of hidden treasure. They pulled aside the vines and peered into dark recesses between the stone walls. They climbed the long flights of stone steps and methodically searched each crypt and cloister. Normie, but this is a big place. I hope we don't get lost in these alleyways. The little cockney groped his way forward in the semi-darkness of the passage. As they progressed farther in the maze of passageways beneath the central pyramid of the temple, it became so dark that Sanders had to light the lantern he had brought along. And finally, in one of the subterranean rooms, the men found something that made their hearts beat fast in excited expectation. Say, go. Look at this. We found something. This stone doesn't match the others. It's a slab instead of squared like the rest of them. Aye, aye. You suppose it hides an opening? We'll find out in quick short order. Get this century old collection of dust and rubble out of the way so we can get to it. Aye. Aye. After digging with their hands till their fingers were numb, they found a deep crack between the slab and the adjoining stones. Look. They put their shoulders to the panel and pushed. The stone moved. There was a sound of rusty metal as the door pressed back against the concealed leaf spring. The treasure seekers stared at each other in astonishment. This must be the door to the treasure room that Gengai had described in his story. The door that had not been opened for centuries. Again, the men put their weight against the stone panel. The crack widened just enough for them to creep into the vault beyond. In the far end of the room, the lantern light caught and held a metallic gleam. The men were awestruck as they took in the sight. Before them were piled the treasures of Angkor. Gold and silver ornaments and vessels. Precious jewels and gem-encrusted robes. Wealth beyond measure. And on the table overlooking these treasures, like a silent guardian, sat the Emerald Buddha. No, me. We found it. We found it. The men sobered quickly. The hollow echo of the room seemed to make their voices a desecration of the silence of centuries. Reverently, they approached the forbidden treasure. As they moved, the whole room seemed to fill with the scents of bitter almonds. The men drew back. This strange odor could mean but one thing. Somewhere in the darkness lurked a terror of the jungle, a king cobra. Then, as if some invisible hand had touched it, a golden goblet fell from its place atop the treasure pile and rolled almost to the feet of the startled men. They looked up quickly. Before them reared a giant milk-white cobra poised to strike. The beady ears glared malevolently at the humans who had disturbed his lair. Oh, Blimey, let's get out of here. The lantern crashed against the wall and fell to the floor in a flaming mass. As Sanders slid through the small opening, the other hunter, white with fear, began to push through behind him. (laughs) Sanders looked back. The flickering light from the broken lantern fell on a sight that made his nerves crisp. The slab that had formed the door of the hidden room had sprung back into place, crushing his companion against the wall. Sanders saw in that one fleeting glance that there was nothing he could do to help. His friend was dead. The curse of the Emerald Buddha had taken the victim. Then he saw something that sent stark terror ripping down his spine. The giant cobra 
was crawling over the dead man's body into the corridor. Completely unnerved now, he turned and ran along the corridor in wild, headlong flight. Behind him raced a huge snake. After what seemed hours, Sanders stumbled from the ancient corridor into daylight. But even as he emerged from the temple, an unseen hand seemed to reach out and snatch at his ankle. <coughs> a thick loop of sprawling vine caught his foot and threw him full upon his face. Before he could stagger to his feet, the whole temple seemed to crumble about him. The vine upon which he had tripped had dislodged loose stones and rubble that came crashing down upon him in an avalanche of doom. Was his also the fate that had been foretold in the legend of the Emerald Buddha? When Gengai at last dared to approach the ruined temple of Angkor Vat to call for his masters, he found Sanders unconscious, half buried in a heap of debris near the ancient walls of the Bayon. Beside the injured man stretched the smashed body of a large albino cobra. Gengai could find no trace of the other white hunter who had entered the ruins. A week later, a white man and a brown man approached a jungle outpost of the French Foreign Legion. The exhausted native was carrying the half-dead white man. The company surgeon, who was called in a vain hope of saving the crushed hunter, pieced together a very strange tale. The white man dropped into a coma, from which he never emerged. Still muttering about a forbidden temple, a beautiful emerald Buddha, a white cobra, and a terrible oriental curse. At this point, we pause for a 30-second commercial, after which we return to... Adventure Incorporated. You know, Jason, tales about these oriental curses fascinate me. I even had a ringside seat while one of them went to work. Uh, where was that, Greg? Right in the middle of the Kalahari Desert. Africa, huh? Yeah, southwestern part, not far from Johannesburg. Mm, it's a hot spot, all right. Tell us about it, Greg. This Captain Von Schuler sat in his chair in the shade of a tree and surveyed the ragged African before him. The Germans had driven most of the natives out of the rich territory that had once been their home for centuries. Now the few that still lived here were about to face the ordeal of crossing and burning trackless expanse of the Kalahari Desert to seek a new home. The native bowed slightly before the German officer. I have a message for you from my chief. The officer stirred slightly in his chair and regarded the old man with contempt. What message, Spinehorn? Speak quickly and get out. It is time for my nap. My chief bids me tell you that since this land is no longer ours, a tribe must leave. The only water this side of desert is here in your camp. We wish to fill our water vessels for many days must pass before we reach water. So, does your pig of a chief think I am in this accursed country to provide him and his people with water? Get out! Get your water in the Kalahari! The native listened with an impassive face to the captain's words. Then he looked straight into the face of the German. The old man raised his hands and pointed toward the border of the Kalahari. You have denied my people water. So now, all but the strongest must die of thirst. You, who are sending us to our death, will die in the desert. Not for lack of water, but by it. The officer rose, and in a sudden impassioned rage, struck the native across the face with his riding crop. The old man did not flinch from the insulting blow but pointed his hand at his attacker. You shall die. By water in the desert, you shall die. I pronounce against you the curse of the Kalahari. About a week later, Captain Von Schuler received orders to take a scouting party into the desert. The Germans, led by native guides, set out upon the long, hard march. On the third day, the last known water hole had been passed, and the trip across the wilderness was beginning to tell upon both men and horses. But on they went, till at last the party entered a small canyon. Now nestled in the bottom of the rocky defile were two clear pools of water. There, Von Schuler called a halt. 
You men dismount here. You will drink and water your horses at the larger pool. I'm going to have a nice bath in this one. Then von Schuler removed his uniform and waded into the water. The weary soldiers drank their fill, watered their horses, then sat back to enjoy the shade of the surrounding boulders. Suddenly, a strangled cry brought them to their feet. The men ran toward the smaller pool. Von Schuler stood in the center, his arms thrashing madly. Before the men realized what had happened, the officer had sank to his chin, and another wild scream burst from his lips. Suddenly, the plight of their leader became clear. Quicksand. One of the orderlies reached the edge of the pool on the run and snapped the end of a long bullwhip toward the struggling man. It fell short. In a despairing effort to reach it, Von Schuler overbalanced and plunged forward beneath the water. There was a short struggle, and Von Schuler disappeared, dying as the old witch doctor had prophesied, by water in the desert, by the dread curse of the Kalahari. At this point, we have another 30-second commercial, after which back to... Adventure Incorporated. You know, Greg... I'll bet the dregs out of my next cup of tea that we're going to have a story from Frank here about China. Well, Jason, that's a bet I'd like to see you win. I want to hear it. (laughs) Thanks, fellas. I I had no idea you were so anxious to get me started. (laughs) But we are. (laughs) But no kidding. Adventure Incorporated sent me to China to a spot where you can get your hip pocket just crammed full of valuable valuables if you'll just uh, changey-changey for one certain item. I'll bet a down payment on my right arm I know what you mean. What's that, Greg? You're referring to guns. Right. You named it. (laughs) Captain Lance Corbin watched impatiently as the last slingloads of cargo were hoisted aboard the rusty little cargo steamer, Taiping. It was hot and smelly at the Hankow dock, and he was also on the verge of being behind schedule. The outgoing tide of the muddy Yangtze River tugged at the mooring lines, seemingly as anxious to get the steamer into the stream as was her skipper. At last, all was finished, and the army of Cooley Stevedores scrambled ashore. The mate had gone forward to let go the lines when a volley of gunfire came from one of the narrow streets, and a small, heavy-set Chinese rushed up the gangway, followed by four other Orientals in army uniforms. He made his way to the bridge and confronted Captain Corvin. I am Wang Lo Chi, merchant of Chongqing. You are carrying a cargo of mine upriver. My comprador failed to inform you that I was to take passage on your ship with uh, these men who are my bodyguards. Uh, What about those shots ashore? Are you sure they aren't the reason you decided to make this trip? You seem to be in a mighty big hurry to get aboard. Oh, think nothing of them, my friend. There are enemies of mine here in Hankow, agents of other merchants who are my rivals in the silk trade. They will use any means to get the best of a competitor. But none of their men will attack you. And I am safe from them now. Okay, Wang, I'm too busy now to check your story, so I'll have to take your word for it. I'll have the steward fix up a cabin for you. But your men will have to sleep on deck. All the rest of the rooms are taken. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll get this tub underway. We have a scheduled time to hit the rapids, and I can't afford any delays. Corvin watched the Chinese climb clumsily down the ladder to the main deck. And then turned to shout orders for getting underway. The Taiping churned the muddy waters of the upper Yangtze. Ichang was left behind at last, and Captain Corbin was glad to see the massive mud-built houses slip quietly astern, even though it meant the trials and dangers of the walled-in rapids where the least mistake in handling meant disaster. One after the other, Ta Tung, the Kung Ling, the Fa Po and the May Sun Rapids were negotiated with the aid of a skillful pilot and the thousands of river coolies. At last, Captain Corvin steamed out into a long, sluggish stretch of pea-green water. The ship came abreast of a small fishing village, and Corvin carefully scanned the river ahead, on the lookout for any small craft that might get in the way of the steamer. The Taiping was rounding a curve near the village when the captain turned suddenly to see Wang Lo Tsi standing beside him on the wing of the bridge. There was an oily politeness in the voice of the Chinese merchant as he spoke. You must pull in near the shore at the next bend. I have cargo which must be discharged there. Sorry, Wang, no can do. My manifest named Chung King is my next port of discharge. I'm afraid there has been a slight error, my captain, which surely you will rectify. It would be too bad to disappoint my men who will be waiting for the guns I am to deliver to them at the ferry crossing. Guns? Certainly. 
It is impossible to carry on a war, even a small one, without guns. They are in the cases marked machinery that you loaded in Hankow. Oh. So well, that's why you were in such a hurry to get aboard, eh? Yes. But the followers of Leo Song, who tried to kill me in Hankow, should know better than to attack the tiger of the Yangtze. So should you know better than to oppose my wishes. The Chinese drew a small automatic from the folds of his sleeve and held it in line with Corbin's middle. You will take orders from me, Captain. While you were busy at the last rapid, my men took over your ship. Your officers and crew are under guard. Even now they are preparing to drop anchor. Under the threat of the muzzle of the gun, there was nothing to do but to obey the wish of the gun runner. The ship had hardly fetched up on her anchor chain before Captain Corvin and his officers were marched into the wheelhouse and a heavy door bolted upon them from the outside. Wang Lo Tsi gloated over his bit of strategy. <laughs> it is said that he who rides the tiger has a rough ride. In an hour, my men will be aboard, unloading guns for the overthrow of the warlord of this province. Even now, one of my bodyguards is signaling to them. <laughs> Corvin watched through a porthole as a large junk moved silently out from shore and drew alongside. A gang of coolies leaped aboard the Taiping and rushed to secure the lines. Under Wang's direction, the forward hatches were uncovered, and the work of transferring the cases of guns began. Corvin groaned in dismay as his chief mate joined him at the porthole. Uh, yeah. Looks like we're trapped for good now. I should never have trusted that Wang Lo Chi. He'll take our entire cargo, and there's no telling what he'll do to us. He could drop us overboard, but I don't think it's likely. He knows we got a gunboat patrol in these upper reaches, and it may show up at any time. Ah, that's probably why he's in such a hurry to get the guns unloaded. Those coolies on the junk surely can't be the gang he was signaling. Captain, look. Something's gone wrong. The coolies are running to the junk. There was a slight bump and roar as another vessel moved alongside the Taiping. Corvin and his men were unable to see the approaching vessel as it was on the offshore side of their ship. The door of the cabin was suddenly opened, and three men stepped into the room. One Lo Tsi was flanked by two American Navy officers. Hello, Captain. I'm Lieutenant Dexter of the Manila. Lucky thing we happened to be passing and decided to see what was wrong. When we came aboard, Wang Lo Tsi told us the whole story. Your passenger was a pretty smart man. After the river pirates came aboard and captured you and your crew, they made him tell them where the cargo of guns was hidden. Well, uh, how'd you know we were in trouble? The Wang Lo Tsi managed to get aft and raise your ensign upside down. We recognized the international distress signal and came alongside. The men stepped out onto the deck, and the mate hurried to release the crew members who were locked in their quarters, then scanned the shore. The junk was making good time getting away, the huge mainsail billowing out. Suddenly, Captain Corbin grasped the arm of the skipper of the gunboat. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wang Lo Tsi was no hero, as he wanted you to believe. He just wanted to save his own neck when he saw he couldn't get away. He raised the distress signal, all right. But it wasn't to signal you. He was signaling his men ashore. Look! Coming over the brow of a small hill just back to the shore was a huge polyglot crowd dressed in well-worn army uniforms. The men watched as the army of Wang Lo Tsi, the tiger of the Yangtze, halted, looked with evident surprise at the scene before them, and then fled in confusion. Lieutenant Dexter smiled as he turned to Captain Corbin. <laughs> you know, I should have known that no true seaman raised that flag in the distress signal. He didn't know that by custom and regulation, the inverted flag should have been raised to half-mast. Ensign Walters, arrest Wang Lutzi, our overstuffed warlord, and escort him aboard the Manila. <laughs> Have you any idea of the low-cost enjoyment available to you by showing sound movies right in your own home? With the new 16mm Revere sound projector, you can entertain and educate your family and friends with professional full-length features, comedy, travel, instruction. All can be purchased or rented from your Revere dealer. Or perhaps you prefer a cartoon or short subject to serve as prologue to showing your own movies. Those can also be had. And with the flick of a switch, you turn from sound to 16-millimeter silent. This grand amusement for everyone is the perfect solution to your home entertainment problem. Even a youngster can put on a sound performance with this projector. The single lightweight unit is as easy to carry as a suitcase, and it sets up as fast as a card table. 
Your dealer has this new remarkable theater tone Revere sound projector now. The theater tone speaker doubles as carrying case for projector and accessories, forming a single unit weighing only 33 pounds. And now back to Adventure Incorporated. You know, gentlemen, I ran across that old gunboat to Manila the last time I was in Shanghai. She'd been taken off the Yangtze Patrol and was about to be sent back to Mare Island. Well, Greg, she deserved retiring. She had some pretty tough shows out there. <laughs> I ran across some pretty tough hombres myself. The time Adventure Incorporated sent me to Algeria to find that missing newspaper correspondent. Those boys were of a slightly different nationality, but their ideas and ambitions were about the same. Well, just when I get all primed to hear Jason's grim story, laid in the wild desert country of North Africa, he had to go and leave us. But you can bet I'll be at the adjoining table the next time those boys from Adventure Incorporated get together, even if I have to bribe the chief steward. Join us again next week at the same time as we listen to other tales told by Jason Grimm, who is really Pat McGeehan, Greg Devlin, who is Pappy Boyington, and Frank Fletcher, who is Frank Graham. Adventure Incorporated is written and produced by Charles Crowder, music by Del Castillo, and special effects by Jim Murphy. This is a Hollywood Enterprises production, produced in Hollywood, California. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now it's time to keep that weekly appointment with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. As usual, you're punctual to the minute. Naturally, when I have an appointment with my favorite doctor. Oh, well, draw up your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. Thank you. That's it. Yeah, all ready with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dr. Watson? Yes, my boy. I was going over my notes on the case before you arrived. I came across this old theater program. I think it'll interest you. Garrick Theater, Sir Basil Wentworth, in a revival of Martin Reeves' famous play, The Road is Narrow. A production that you and the great Sherlock Holmes attended, I'm sure. We certainly did, Mr. Bell, though at the time we had no idea that we were about to become involved in the tragic death of Martin Reeve. You've probably heard of him, haven't you, Mr. Bell? It seems to me I had to read him in school, Dr. Oh, Watson. he's rather out of fashion now, like so many other good things. But in the 1890s, apart from Lord Tennyson, there wasn't a more famous writer in England, or a, a more respected one. The story I'm going to tell you tonight, Mr. Bell concerns the horrible circumstances surrounding his death. Sounds like a mighty intriguing Sherlock Holmes adventure. But before you begin, Dr. Watson, do you mind if, if I... Do you have your little talk? <laughs> no, <laughs> of course not, Mr. Bell. Men, well-groomed hair helps so much in giving a man that prosperous, successful appearance. And I'm sure you'll want to know why Kreml hair tonic is preferred among America's top-flight executives. Kreml never plasters the hair down with sticky goo, which makes your hair and scalp feel so dirty. It never gives hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look. You see, Kreml is a very highly specialized hair tonic. It contains a unique and utterly different combination of hair grooming ingredients that's never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. That's why Kreml keeps unruly hair so neatly in place longer, with such a handsome, healthy-looking luster. What I especially like about Kreml is that after you use it, you can run your hand back over your hair and your hair never feels sticky or dirty. No greasy film comes off on your hand. Yet Kreml keeps hair in perfect order from morning till night, always looking so healthy and handsome. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the singular death of Martin Reed? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure began late on a foggy evening many, many years ago. Sherlock Holmes and I had been to the Garrick Theatre to see the revival of Martin Rees play. And I remember that we decided to walk home to Baker Street. As we approached the old familiar door of 221B, 
Our footsteps echoed hollowly in the deserted street, and the chimes of a neighboring church reminded us of the fact that it was midnight. A delightful evening, Watson. A good dinner, an excellent bottle of wine, and three hours of theatrical magic. Well, personally, I found the play rather depressing. Its theme is a morbid one, but the writing and construction are flawless. Yes, a magnificent play and well worth reviving. By the way, I noticed an item in the Times this morning concerning Martin Reeve. He's dangerously ill. Oh, really? Well, he must be quite an old man. Eighty-two, to be precise. Really, is he as old as that? Curious career, Watson. His greatest success was written when he was a young man. In the past 50 years, he has never written anything to compare with tonight's play. No, I don't think it... Holmes, look up at our window. Hello. The gas is brightly lighted, whereas Mrs. Hudson invariably turns it low when we're out. And look at the silhouette on the blind. There's a man pacing up and down the room. A visitor at midnight, Holmes. This looks ominous. Be careful now. It may be some sort of trap. I think not, Watson. If some desperado were lying in wait for me, I doubt whether he'd be stupid enough to turn up the gas to advertise his presence. Well, just the same. I wonder how he got in. Presumably through the front door. Mrs. Hudson has instructions to let a client wait in our rooms if his business seems urgent. Uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. At your service, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Manners. Harvey Manners. How do you do, Dr. Manners? This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you How do, do, Doctor? Uh, I must apologize for being here at such an hour of night, Mr. Holmes, but my business is urgent. I'm sure it is, Doctor. I left Carlisle this morning, arriving at St. Pancras Station two hours ago. I came directly here, persuaded your housekeeper to let me wait for you. Then sit down, my dear Doctor, and tell me what urgent business has brought you to London. Uh, thank you. Well, Mr. Holmes... I've been acting in the capacity of personal physician for Martin Reeve, the playwright. Martin Reeve? What an extraordinary coincidence. We've just returned from seeing the revival of his play, The Road is Narrow. We were talking about him as we walked home. I understand the grand old man is dying. He's not in good shape, Mr. Holmes. His heart's in very bad condition. Auricular fibrillation, Dr. Watson. Oh, and then at his age, I imagine you don't hold out much hope. No, but I think with care, he might last a year or two. Uh, but uh, the reason I've come to you, Mr. Holmes, is that I'm convinced that although he's a dying man, someone is trying to murder him. To murder him? Good Lord. What reason do you have for saying that, Dr. Manners? Well, Mr. Holmes, I've been in almost daily attendance on Mr. Reeve. Last night, his coachman drove over to get me, saying that his master had suffered another bad attack. When I got to the house... I found that Mr. Reeve had received an, a severe shock. He was in a state of almost complete hysteria, and he kept insisting that he'd seen an apparition in his room a few hours earlier. What kind of an apparition? A ghost from his past, as he referred to it. I think that someone arranged for that apparition, that they knew of his heart condition, and also knew that a sudden fright could kill him. It's possible, Dr. Manners... And it would be one of the least detectable methods of murder. But who would want to kill a dying man? Who lives at the house with him, Dr. Manners? His daughter, Catherine, his brother, Silas, who's a drunken good-for-nothing, and his secretary, a fellow by the name of uh, Hugh Kingslake. Uh, do you know the condition of Mr. Reeves as well? Uh, no, but I do know he had dictated a new one a few days ago. Oh, a honey. fact that might easily have provoked a crisis. Uh, Dr. Manners... You say that Mr. Reeve spoke of seeing an apparition, a ghost from his past. Was he able to describe its appearance? Well, he, he was a little incoherent, but uh, he kept babbling something about blonde hair and blue eyes and a young man who'd come back from beyond the grave to haunt well, him. Don't you think, uh, Dr. Manners, that these might simply be the delusions of an old and uh, a sick man? I didn't overlook that possibility, I assure you, Dr. Watson, even though Mr. Reeve's mental faculties are remarkably acute for his age. But last night, after I'd given him a sedative, I examined his room. I found these, Mr. Holmes. That's when I decided to come to you. Well, let's have a look at them. Hmm. They look like uh, blonde hair. Yes, they are, Doctor. I found them on the bedclothes, and yet uh, no one in that house has blonde hair. Interesting. Very Interesting. The hair is human, and yet the roots have minute particles of glue attached to them. Obviously, they're from a wig. Get out the timetable, Watson, will you? Yeah. We're going to Carlisle? On the earliest possible train. Though the grand old man of the English theatre is dying, we must do everything in our power to see that his death is not an unnatural one. Mr. 
Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. I'm Hugh Kingslake, Mr. Reeves' secretary. Oh, how, how, do do you do? Do? how do you do, sir? The accommodations at the hotel are satisfactory, I trust, gentlemen? Entirely, yes, thank you, Mr. Kingslake. Thank you. Good. Frankly, I'm most relieved that you're here. Mr. Reeve received a severe shock the night before last. I quite agree with Dr. Manners that someone deliberately induced that shock, knowing the serious condition of Mr. Reeves' heart. Have you any idea who that someone might be? Well, it's a little difficult for me to talk, Mr. Holmes. After all, I'm only an employee here, but, but I can't help feeling that... Oh, oh, good morning, Mr. Reeve. Kingsley, who are these men? Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. Uh, Mr. Silas Reeve. How do you do, Mr. Reeve? Uh, and what, may I ask, is the professional meddler Sherlock Holmes doing in my brother's house? Uh, I'm here at the request of Dr. Manners. Manners has no right to bring you here, sir. A lot of rubbish. All this talk about apparitions. Nonsense. Martin's in his second childhood. He's become a gibbering old fool. Personally, I wish he'd die and have done with well, it. Well, upon my soul... Never sir, mind I... your soul, my good doctor. Why don't you mind your own business and get out of the house? We don't want detectives here. Mr. Reeve, I've traveled some 200 miles to see your brother, and I have no intention of leaving this house without talking to him. And talk and the devil with you. And if my dear, distinguished brother tells you that I've been sponging on him for years, it's perfectly true. Uncle Sarge! <laughs> Enter the beautiful Catherine to try and persuade her drunken old uncle to return to his room. No, Uncle Silas. I came to get Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Dr. Manor said that Daddy can see them now. Uh, shall I take them up, Miss Reeve? Uh, no, Mr. Kingslake. I will. And don't be deceived by the Mr. Kingslake and the Miss Reeves, gentlemen. My dear niece and this young man here have a dark secret. A secret that is perfectly apparent to every member of this household. Uncle Silas! <laughs> They're in love. Delightful, isn't it? Uncle, you're intolerable. Will you lead the way, Miss Reeve? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. Don't forget to ask him about the play that made him so famous. You might learn some interesting facts. I must apologize for Uncle Silas, gentlemen. I'm afraid he's like this all the time these days. I quite understand, Miss Reeve. It must be very distressing for you, my dear. Oh, I'm used to it, Doctor. Here's Daddy's room. I won't come in with you. Too many people upset him. Come in. Please go in, gentlemen. I'll see you later. Ah, there you are. Uh, who is it, Manners? It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, Mr. Reeve. Ah, good. Good. You can leave us, Manners. Yes, Mr. Reeve. I, uh, I'll see you both later. Very well, Doctor. Uh, come. Sit on my bed. Yeah, that's it. Uh, how are you feeling, sir? Old. Old and ill. But I'm glad you're both here. Man has displayed unusual enterprise in persuading you to visit me. There's been a lot of nonsense printed about my impending death. Anyone would think a great man is dying. The author of The Road is Narrow is a great man, Mr. Reeve. He was a great man, Mr. Holmes. What do you mean, sir? The author of that play died. Forty-five years ago. What? And yet, his ghost appeared in this room two nights ago. Mr. Reeve, are you saying that you didn't write The Road is Narrow? Yes, my boy, I am. And it's a secret that's been gnawing at me for years. Now that I'm on my deathbed, I'd like to clear my conscience. Then who did write the play, sir? A young friend of mine, by the name of Colin McGrath. I started life as a lawyer's clerk in Keswick, a few miles from here. Colin lived in the same village, and we became great friends. One day, he gave me the manuscript of his play to look at, and I realized it was a work of a genius. Suddenly, he died. No one knew about the manuscript. You claimed it as your own, sir? Yes. To my eternal shame, I did. Now, I want to make amends. Mr. Holmes, I want you to find out if any heirs of Colin McGrath still survive. If they do, I'll give them half of my estate. Mm. Mr. Reeve, does anyone else know of this, uh, fraud? Yes. Knowing that I hadn't long with this world... 
I confided the secret to three members of my household. And you're convinced that the apparition you saw the other night was that of the dead Colin McGrath? Uh, there was no mistaking him. The blue eyes. Long golden hair. It was Colin. Or his ghost come to hunt me on my deathbed. This decision on your part to leave half of your estate to any heirs of the man you wronged, was that decision made uh, before you had this strange visitation the other night? Yes. Yes, it was. Did you mention it to any member of your family, sir? No. I did say something to Dr. Manners, and I didn't mention Colin McGrath's name. It's obvious that someone wished to frighten you. Knew your secret and disguised himself to resemble Colin McGrath. Yeah, it was Colin. Never forget his blue eyes. He was standing over there, in the chest of drawers. He, he looked at me. So, so approachfully. So. He's asleep. Yes, Watson. And while he lies there, some member of this household continues to plot his death. We must work fast. Well, what are we going to do? Split forces. I shall remain here for a while and see what may be found out. I'll meet you at our hotel later and we'll compare notes. And what shall I do? Go to the village of Keswick. Colin McGrath lived and died there. See what you can find out about him, Watson. I remember Colin McGrath. Well, I should be very grateful for any information about him, madam. As postmistress, I imagine that very little village gossip has escaped you. <laughs> of course it hasn't. I remember the McGrath boy well. He was no good. Didn't he marry poor old Mrs. Northrop's granddaughter Susan and then go and desert her just to kill himself? And the poor girl was going to have a baby. No good on earth. That's what young McGrath was. And you can tell him I said so if you ever reach the place I'm sure he went to. Oh, I said, well, uh, ha they had a child, you say. Uh, what happened to it, madam? How should I know? I'm only the postmistress. You'd better go and see the vicar, young man. It's a tragic story you've told me, Dr. Watson. But you remember Colin McGrath, sir? Oh, very well. And I always suspected something akin to genius in the boy, that he burned with too hard and gem-like a flame. Uh, as Walter Pater has said, he burned himself out, destroyed his life, and poor Susan Northrips with it. She died of a broken heart less than a year after his death. And their child? There was no money, no one to look after the boy. He was sent to an orphanage in Liverpool. Then that child, if he's still alive, stands to inherit half of Martin Reeves' fortune. If only we can find him. Well, it's good to be back here at the hotel, Holmes. I've had an exhausting day. I trust you had better luck than I did. What did you find out? That Colin McGrath had a child, that his wife died shortly after the child's birth, and that the boy was sent to an orphanage in Liverpool. In Liverpool? Go on, Watson. Well, the vicar gave me this photograph where, where we are, of uh, Mrs. McGrath. It was, uh, it was taken on their wedding day. Let me see it. But this is amazing, Watson. One of our problems is solved. Well, I'm blessed if I see how. Let me explain it to you. After you left, I had quite a long talk with the secretary, Hugh Kingslake. It transpired that he knew nothing of his parents. He had been raised in an orphanage, and the only memento he has is a picture of his mother, a picture that he carries in his watch. And that picture... Is a duplicate of this one. Great Scott, and the fellow calling himself Hugh Kingsley is really the Colin McGrath heir. Precisely. A fantastic situation indeed. Come on, old chap. Grab your hat and coat. We must drive over to Mr. Reeves and break the good news that the missing heir is a member of his own household. But we're still no nearer finding out who's been trying to frighten old Mr. Reeves. Surely that's obvious now, Watson. Come in. Dr. Manners, what's wrong? Uh, please, please come at once, both of you. It's Mr. Reeve. It's Hart? Yes, Dr. Watson. This evening, he had another visit from that apparition. I'm only afraid this time the devilish plan may work and that Martin Reeve won't live through the night. In a moment,
moment, we'll find out what Sherlock Holmes says is obvious. But first, more and more men today are beginning to realize they should take better care of the hair they've got. And when you buy a hair tonic, why not get your money's worth? Why not enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic? Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day long and always gives it such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never sticky or greasy. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A quick massage with Kreml stimulates circulation right in the surface of the scalp, leaving your scalp feeling so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, Kreml removes loose dandruff. It's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, remember Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men, just as soon as possible, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Let Kreml always keep your scalp feeling clean and refreshed, your hair always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, this story certainly has me on the edge of my chair. What happened next? You drove over to Mr. Reeves' house, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Bell, we did. And as we went rattling down the country lanes, the flickering oil lamps on Dr. Manor's carriage lighting a shadowy path, I found it almost impossible to get a word out of Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, sometimes you're the most irritating man on earth. And what prompts that little tirade, Watson? Well, you haven't opened your mouth since we left our hotel. Purposeless conversation is a waste of time. Not much further, is it, Dr. Manners? No, Mr. Holmes. We're nearly there. Well, I don't consider conversation purposes when it clarifies the problem, Holmes. You said it was obvious who had been frightening Mr. Reeve. I suppose I'm stupid, but I find it far from obvious. And yet the facts are clearly in front of your eyes. Eyes. That's it, Watson. Think about eyes. The, the blue eyes of the supposed ghost, eh? But the Reeves family have all got brown eyes. Apparently, it's a marked family characteristic. Quite, Watson. That fact should lead you to the obvious conclusion. Oh, you're always talking in riddles, Holmes. Here we are, Mr. Holmes. And Hugh Kingslake is standing at the front door. How is he, Mr. Kingslake? Better, Mr. Holmes. Seems to have rallied a bit. I'm glad you're all here. I'll drive my carriage round to the stables. Be back in a moment. Come in, gentlemen. With uh, Mr. Reeves so ill... It may seem a little inappropriate to announce my news. But uh, Catherine consented to marry me tonight. We're engaged. Oh, really? My congratulations. Thank yes, you, indeed. She's a charming girl. Oh, Catherine, darling. I've uh, told them our news. Oh, it must seem a terrible time to announce it, Mr. Holmes, with poor Daddy lying so ill upstairs. It's quite understandable, Miss Reeve. And uh, before we go up and see your father, I'd like you both to know that we have something in the nature of a wedding present for you. A wedding present? Yes, you're both familiar with the story of Colin McGrath, I understand. You mean that he was the true author of The Road is Narrow? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. Daddy told us all about it. And did you also know that Mr. Reeve is planning to leave half his estate to the heir of Mr. McGrath? I knew that, Dr. Watson. In uh, my capacity as secretary, I had occasion to draw up a rough draft of the new will a few days ago. Then I'm sure, Mr. Kingslake, that you'll be very interested to know that today Dr. Watson and I discover that you are the son of Colin McGrath. The that I am? You is the heir? Well, that doesn't seem possible. The fact is proven beyond a doubt, Miss Reeve. Then, then if Mr. Reeve makes the new will, I stand to inherit half the fortune. Yes, my boy, you do. That's what Mr. Holmes meant when he was talking about wedding presents. Hey, come here, somebody! That's Uncle Silas. He's upstairs with Daddy. What's wrong, Mr. Reeve? Fire! I knocked over a lamp in Martin's room. And Daddy's up here. The room's oh. ablaze. What? Come on, Watson. Well, the whole top landing's burning, Holmes. We can't go through this way. We can't, just can't stand here. Mr. Reeve will roast alive. I, I'm going after him. Come back, Kingslake. Come back, come back. Great Scott, he went right through the flames, Holmes. Send one of the servants for the fire brigade and tell the rest to bring buckets of water and to bring them fast. Dr. Watson... How is Hugh? Well, he's going to pull through, Miss Reeve. He's badly burned, but he'll be all right, won't he, Dr. Manners? Yes, oh. yes, a few weeks in the hospital, and he'll be as good as new. And father? Well, uh, I am afraid he's dead, Catherine. Dead? Oh, poor daddy. 
Oh, my dear, he might have lived for a time, but the shock of the fire coming so close on top of the other one was too much for him. He died just as I took him from your fiancé's arms. So that by knocking over a lamp, I, I was responsible for my brother's death? Yes, Mr. Reeve. The credit is yours. In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the local police might consider booking you on a charge of arson. Rubbish! It was an accident, and you can't prove otherwise. Possibly not. But there's one matter I can settle here and now. Two nights ago, someone in this house tried to murder Martin Reeve by posing as Colin McGrath. The same despicable action was repeated tonight. Well, one person that we can eliminate is Hugh Kingsley. He nearly gave his life just now, trying to save his employer. Then who was responsible, Mr. Holmes? A feature of the impersonation that especially struck your father, Miss Reeve, was the color of the eyes. He described them as a brilliant blue. Then that rules out Catherine and me. We both have brown eyes. Precisely, Mr. Reeve. I have devoted some considerable study to the art of disguise. There are wigs and uh, methods of altering height and weight. But the color of the eyes cannot be altered. Watson, ten minutes ago you had the opportunity of examining Mr. Kinsleg's eyes without the tinted glasses he's in the habit of wearing. Well, they did fall off when he stumbled back down the back stairs, but I can't say that I noticed the color of his eyes. They were blue, Watson. Brilliant blue, just as his father's were before him. You mean that young Kingslake was responsible? Yes, Mr. Reeve, I do. But that's ridiculous, Mr. Holmes. He just hurt himself severely in trying to save Father. True, Miss Reeve. But surely his reason was obvious. He intended to marry you. And when he learned a few days ago that your father planned to will half his estate to the McGrath heir, he decided to try and kill him before that will could be put into effect. Oh, I see it all, Holmes. And then tonight he realized that he was the heir. Precisely, Watson. And so it was to his great advantage to see that his employer stayed alive to execute that new will. That accounts for his bravery in the fire tonight. I can't believe it of him, Mr. Holmes. I can. I've always disliked you, and I'll have great pleasure in prosecuting him. It'd be hard to prove, Silas. After all, your brother did die a natural death. Yes, Dr. Manners. I fear that legally there's very little we can do to Mr. Kinslake. But when he recovers and realizes that he risked his life for nothing, I think he'll find his own punishment. The change in the will was not made. The estate will be divided between the family, and I doubt if Mr. Kinslake will now acquire any of it by marriage. No, of course he won't. I'll never see him again. Oh, quite right, my dear, quite right. What a despicable scheme. And to think that, that his father wrote one of the greatest plays of our century. I prefer to forget the fact, Watson. Emotional qualities are antagonistic to clear thinking. I assure you that the most winning woman I ever knew was hanged for poisoning three little children for their insurance money. And the most repellent man of my acquaintance is uh, a philanthropist who has spent nearly a quarter of a million upon the London poor. And now, my dear chap, I think we should look up the next train back to London. Our work here is done. moment we'll hear about next week's story. But first, girls, here's a sensational beauty tip from some of the world's most divinely beautiful girls. Powers models. Girls who are famous for their enchantingly lovely silken sheen hair. We glamour bathe our hair with cremel shampoo. And really, ladies, you'll be amazed how cremel shampoo brings out all your hair's natural sparkling beauty. It leaves hair shimmering with brilliant highlights that last for days. And you can always count on cremel shampoo to thoroughly cleanse your scalp and hair. It never leaves any dull, cloudy film. Then, too, the beneficial oil base helps keep hair from becoming dry and brittle. That's right. Cremel shampoo leaves your hair so much softer, a silkier, a silkier hair with satin smoothness. Your hair holds a better wave, too. So, ladies... Buy a bottle of Cremel shampoo at any drug counter and see how easy it is to have naturally lustrous hair, a vision of beauty. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. And remember, a bottle of Cremel hair tonic or a bottle of Cremel shampoo makes a fine addition to that Christmas stocking. Well, Dr. Watson, I won't be seeing you before next Wednesday, so I'll, I'd like to wish you a very Merry Christmas. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Bell, and the same to you, my boy. I'd also like to take this opportunity of extending the season's greetings to all our listeners and all our friends. On behalf of our sponsors, on behalf of Mr. Conway and myself, and on behalf of Mr. McKnight, our director. So, Dr. Watson, we'll be meeting again next Saturday night. 
What new Sherlock Holmes adventure are you planning to tell us then? The strange story of a weird jungle music that was heard in the peaceful English countryside and of a diabolical plot that failed. I call it the singer affair of the white cockerel. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Sign of Four. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion. Help win the war against tuberculosis. Buy colorful Christmas seals and use them to dress up all your cards and packages. Buy the Christmas seals that help save lives today. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the singular affair of the white cockerel. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The best understanding of America begins, or so it seems to us, with the realization that this nation is young yet, that she is still new and unfinished, that even now, America is man's greatest adventure in time and space. The University of North Carolina presents American Adventure, a study of man in the new world his values and his characteristics, who he is, what he believes, what he lives by. American Adventure is produced on a grant and aid from the National Association of Educational Broadcasters made possible by the Educational Television and Radio Center. Written by John Ely, directed by John Clayton, today's program presents Les Casey as Mrs. Bouchard in The Battle. January 8th, 1815. Early morning. The war with the British, which began in 1812, is over. But the people of Louisiana have not heard the news, and the Battle of New Orleans has not started. The Americans cling to the wall of a bulwark of earth near the city. It is a cold morning in the heart of the southern winter. <coughs> what is the matter, George? Huh? Do you have a cold? No, but I'm cold enough. Nervous? Cold, you get nervous. I see. What you writing? A letter to my wife. She is back in the city. Writing a letter? She is going to have a baby. For the Lord's sake. Oh, I have one boy already, you know. She wants a girl. But God will send what he wants to. I wonder if he cares. Huh? And what's to be said for a family anyway? I have a mother back in the city. She's all I have and I'm all she has. No, no, that isn't right. She has a coffee shop. Me and a coffee shop. Sometimes I don't know which one she loves the most. A nonsense. Here I am with my belly on the mud, looking out at the mist where 12,000 British soldiers are waiting. Look, George, you're going to be all right. Yeah, I know. I know. We have Lafitte's pirates to help us. The pirates are good fighters. We have Indians. We have free slaves. We have General Jackson, too. He we says... have General Jackson shaking with malaria. And I have a mother with a coffee shop. You have a wife with an unborn baby. And each of us has a rifle he knows nothing about. And out there are 12,000 soldiers who fought in the wars. Oh, look, George. Sit down. Write a letter. Like I am trying to do. Do something. We can't be cowards. Huh? Cowards? Am I a coward? That's cold, Lord of mercy. Just because I'm afraid, does that make me a coward? No, it doesn't. But uh, we have to remember that behind us is the city. And it's up to us to protect it. And we will. We will, George. It's cold, you know. I wish the British had come on and get it over with.
January 8, 1815. Many of the women of New Orleans gathered in chapels and homes with knives in their belts and prayer books in their hands. While in a room on the second story of a brick building, shutters drawn across a window, a woman lies in early stages of labor. Near the bed, a midwife sits rocking. Near her still stands a small boy, annoyed by all the happenings which he cannot understand. Didn't Papa eat breakfast? Yes, dear. I didn't see him. He left before you were out of bed. Why didn't he eat breakfast? He did, darling. Yeah, now don't you bother your mother now. Let him be, please. I want him to be near for a while longer. Will Papa come back soon? Yes, Louis. Did he go out on a boat? No, he went a few miles away on land. He will come back before nightfall. Why did he go? Because... Because they told him to. Uncle Coleman told him to? No, darling. General Jackson told him. How are you, ma'am? All right. It'll be soon. What? The birth or the killing? Birth, Miss Bouchard. Yes. You're right, but not for a while. You finished that letter, Bruchard? I never finish a letter. I write the page and I read it over. It never says what I want it to. Hey, listen. What is it? Listen, I said. There, there, you hear? Yes. The British are walking around, aren't they? Yes. The officers are peering out there now. Look, way down the bulwark. That's General Jackson, isn't it? Where? Uh, standing up on top, peering out. Uh, the sound is gone. The British have stopped. How far away are they? I do not know. Close. Lord. Are they going to come front on? I hope so. You do? The pirates are on the cannons. Yeah, so? Dominic is standing up yeah. now. Look, he's talking to some of the men. Lord, how calm he is. Uh, they are ready. With those pirates on the cannon, it's going to be terrible. The British will come walking through the mist in formations. Giant formations. And the pirates will be behind the earth, loading and firing as if the British were Spanish frigates in the high seas. A terrible thing. Yeah, all part of being noble and protecting a city. Now, now, look, why couldn't we go out there and, and reason with the English? Why couldn't we say, look here, we're telling you that you'd have lost if you'd tried. Now, now go on home with your lives. <laughs> yeah, what's so funny? Your suggestion. The logic of an old woman as she cooks soup in a kitchen with six cats on the floor sleeping. Hey, I don't know that I like that comment. Now listen. I thought I heard that. Yeah. They'll be coming in soon now. They've stopped. Yes. I wonder what they're thinking. Who? The English, Irish, Scotch. They're human, too. Waiting. Waiting always the same. We'd rather be waiting than walking into the American rifles, laddie. Mm. Waiting than fighting for the crown. Fighting because they pay me, but for no crown. Well, fighting for money is like selling your life, Irishman. Well, then what is farming like if it's different? Instead of money, you get potatoes. Sell your life for potatoes and babbies. How much I think it's worth to walk into the American lines? How much money? Well, now, if they're no better marksmen than we are, a shilling should do. But that's not the way to think about it, you know. Don't think at all. That's the way. When the officers say stop, stop. When they say fire, fire. If you don't say anything to fire at, fire anyway. When the blooming idiots say retreat now, laddie, that's when you start thanking for yourself. That's the only time I ever volunteer to run in the king's service. When the officers tell me to try to get myself out of whatever the officers have gotten me into. January 8, 1815, morning. The mist rises slowly, and as each foot of ground becomes visible to the Americans, the men wait until they can see the feet and the legs and then the bodies of the first ranks of the British army lined up before them, ready to advance. Bruchard, you know how to pray? Huh? 
Did you? Did I what? Pray. Well, let me alone. I'm right. Uh, Lord of mercy. What is it, a newspaper? I, I prayed, you know. I expect my mother's praying right now. If God hears either one of us, it'll be my mother. I I haven't done anything wrong, you understand, but I suppose you've got to judge a man for what he's done right. I haven't done anything right. Fighting a battle is right. Is it? It's right to kill. Even God says so, huh? I don't understand God very well. Look, will you be quiet, George? How can God be on both sides? Look here, they, they got 12,000 men. And we got how many? 2,000? I think so. Now then, then suppose they were to pray 12,000 prayers. And we were to pray 2,000 prayers. They win, is that right? Look, George. I'm just asking. Ask a priest. Well, let me ask you something else. You're wise, Bruchard. Can we count the slaves as a full prayer or as two-thirds of a prayer? You finished your letter? It isn't signed, but I'm through. Did you hear my question about the free slaves? Yes, I heard it. <laughs> the world is so full of oddities. Merrily, we go into battle, each man with the same God. And watch us, God, and we'll show you that no man has a God at all. <laughs> Close the shutters. Perhaps you heard something, Miss Bouchard. I thought I did. What? Can I open the window? Yes. Now, you stand back there, Louis. No, Miss Bouchard, it started. Mama, thunder. Is it? Is it the cannon? Yes, ma'am. He said he would write me a letter this morning. I wonder if he did. Mama. Don't you worry, Louis. It's only thunder. And soon the thunder will be over. And the men will come back to the city. Your father will be back. Is he with the thunder, Mama? Yes. Will he hurry, Mama? Yes, darling. Mama, how long does it take to make thunder? Oh, sometimes no longer than a few minutes. Perhaps an hour. The thunder isn't loud, Mama. No, darling. It's not as loud as God's. Hush, baby. Hush. She sure is a pretty baby. Nearly eight pounds. Or more. Louis was ugly when he was born. But this one is pretty. You won't have no trouble remembering her birthday, ma'am. Not this one. No. Not with a battle to help you remember the day of the great battle she was born. Where is Louis? He ain't back from the battle. I meant Louis, the little boy, my son. Oh, he's outside on the steps, ma'am. Let him come in. Yes, sir. Louis, your ma wants you. But you keep quiet, boy. Louis? Yes, mama. Has the thunder stopped? Yes, Mama, but but Papa isn't home. Have the men come back? Y yes, ma'am. Many of them are back. Louis, go to the window and watch for him. Open the shutter, and when you see your father, tell me. Yes, Mama. Now, Louis, it is very important for you to see him, and you must not make a mistake. Yes, Mama. It would seem to me... That he has had time to walk the distance back. It was only two miles, and others have already walked it. Now, now, don't you fret so soon. How long does it take to walk two miles? No, I don't know, ma'am. I remember when I lived in the country, he would come to Courtney. He would walk out from the town, and it would take him, I believe he said, 40 minutes. And I lived no farther than the battlefield is from here. When did the cannon stop? I don't know. Yes, you do. An hour ago. Was it an hour? Please be quiet. Listen. Footsteps. And on the stairs. 
Louis, you were supposed to watch. Yeah, now lie down, ma'am. I'll go to the door. Louis, how could you let your father come into the building and you not even see him? And it's very important. But, but Mama, I, I didn't see him. You lie quiet, ma'am. Here, here. If I must be quiet, so must you, little one. Your afternoon has been as difficult as mine. But now we both must compose ourselves to meet your father. He is back from the battle. Yes, sir? Is this the apartment of a man named Bruchard? Yes, sir. Louis, is that you? Louis? It, it ain't your husband, ma'am. Well, well, who is it? I bring news about him, if I may come in. Yes, of course. Who are you? My name is George Picard. I've worked in a coffee shop until today. Do I know you? No. Does my husband? He did, ma'am. Did? When? When you were boys, you mean? This morning. May I sit down? Louis? Yes, Mama? Go out into the hall. Close the door, Louis. Where is Papa? Watch for him from the hall window, Louis. Close the door. Now, tell me anything, sir, that you may have to say. Except that my husband is dead. That I cannot hear. Tell me he has lost a leg, or both legs, or is blind. Mrs. Prouchard. But I will not listen if you go beyond that. Mrs. Prouchard, I, I have no choice. He, he is dead. He is dead, and I'm sorry. It, it's a miracle that he's gone, and, and it's very strange. This morning we stood side by side in the lines and talked. He was confident and chided me because I was afraid. And then, then the battle started. A noisy thing. People running here and there. The cannons are firing. And General Jackson was rushing up and down the lines, yelling at the top of his voice. And out, out in front we could see the masses of men, the British Army, walking towards us with those front lines falling time and again as the cannon sounded. Then there was a moment when the British fled... Confusion lessened, and I... I looked beside me to find your husband gone. I thought he might have run away. But I... I remembered what he'd said before the battle. And then I saw him lying on the ground. The letter in his hand. As if in the final moment of his life he'd been trying to write down something. Or sign his name at the bottom of the page. I can't say as to that. Are, are you certain he's dead? Mrs. Bruchard, would I have come up here if I had not been sure? What is to be done with his body? Well, don't worry about that. If, if you permit, I'll see that arrangements are made. I haven't been in charge of anything like that before, but uh, it's something I would like to do. We were not, not friends, you understand, but your little boy and the baby and... And you, this family, well, families are right, and, and so the whole family's hurt, and I... Should, should I take the baby, ma'am? No. No, let her be. She'll cry only for a little while. Let her cry. Let her learn. She lives in a world of men. Let her learn to cry. One celebrates, Mother. The streets are full of laughter. Yes, it is a wonderful night. The battle is over and you are well. Yeah, I'm well. I hear that the pirates are down on the waterfront having themselves a time. They are free now, pardoned by the general. Drunk as men can get. And you should be celebrating, too. I celebrated. Only for a moment, Mother. There was that one moment when I knew that I hadn't been a coward... And that's a fine feeling in itself. I hadn't really had a chance to think about being afraid. When the battle started, I just loaded and fired and kept at it and never once thought of fleeing or hiding. So I felt like somebody. I felt like I was grown up for the first time. Here I am, 
29 years of age, but for the first time I felt like a man must feel. Then I, then I saw him lying on the ground. Hush, hush, no need to talk of that. And that letter in his hand. He has a pretty wife, Mama. And his son is, is young. Hardly old enough to know who his father is. I, I was thinking this afternoon, Mama. Well, let's not talk about it now. George, pity is not a firm base for a family, not for a marriage. Because you are sorry for these people... Now, you must hush, Mama. I will have to decide this for myself. I only intended to suggest that always before you have taken my advice. I have been to the battle, Mama. I will decide. It is not like it was before. You are not like you were before. Are you? You stand out there and watch men face danger and do it yourself. Men die beside you and you keep on living. Life takes on a meaning. Deep, different, cruel, strong. God takes on a meaning. No, no, I must decide this. But not tonight. A month or two, perhaps I will call on the Bruchards. It's something I want to do. All right, dear. But now let's celebrate the great victory and the safety of New Orleans. We must have a toast. Yes. I'll get the glasses. Here we are. The ones your father used, brought from France. Yes, thank you. Now, you may pour. Now then, the toast. How can I say? Let us drink to... Whatever it is, which makes me whatever I am, that is better than whatever I was this morning. Yes, dear. Let us drink to that. It is good brandy. George, you, you broke the glass. You threw it down as if... What is the matter? I'm sorry. But I thought of her and him. Of the boy and the new baby and... And then of the toast. Good Lord, the toast. To what it was that changed me from what I was this morning. Yes, dear, but... We drink to war, Mother. We drink a toast to war. How can we drink a toast to war, Mother? They've got fireworks on the streets, Miss Bouchard. Close the shutters. Yes, sir. Shall I blow out the candles, ma'am? No, please leave one on. Put it close by where I can reach. Yes, sir. Is Louis in bed? I put the boy to bed, but he ain't asleep. He asked for his father. Yes, for his father. And speaks real angry about the thunder. Once when some fireworks went off below the window, he shook like he's afraid. How can you explain to a boy that... Well, let us wait until tomorrow. Good night, Miss Bouchard. One moment. Would you hand me the letter? I will read it to the baby. Yes, sir. Is it, is it a letter of love, Miss Bouchard? Do men write love letters before a battle? Good night, Miss Bouchard. My dearest wife and son, and second son of first daughter... The mist is close about us as this inked quill scratches. But when you read this, the mist will have gone. And perhaps I will bring the letter to you. In which case I may decide not to give it to you at all. For a letter written in a moment of danger is not likely to avoid some confusion. But I can tell you what now is clear to me. That I love you is clear. You, my wife. And you, Louis. And you, child, not now born. And yet, how can we love the unborn whom we have not seen and to whom we fathers make such a small contribution in pain? To love the newly dead. That is explainable. For we know the dead. But to love the unborn is not. 
unless perhaps it is the future that always concerns us, and the unborn are our hopes for it. And so we live, hoping that men will be better tomorrow than we are today, that our children will go on to become what we see that we have no chance of becoming. There is something else I know also, that I feel closer to each one of you at this moment than ever before in my life, ever before. Perhaps because I feel that you need me now more than ever before. Here behind these bulwarks, I realize I stand protecting you. It is a remarkable thing that a battle is needed to make a man appreciate what he cannot appreciate so well in enjoying the thing itself. How strangely we are made. And one other thing, I also see clearly that the love I have for you and the feeling I have that I am important and need it. Make it possible for me to face this battle quite unafraid. Some men have said that families make cowards of us. Not so with me. But rather, the family is the source of my bravery. Just as the battle is a strengthening place. And if it should lead to something that would cause this letter to be brought to you by some other hand, take whatever solace can be sent in words. Remember that for you I die right willingly. And if I had come home, I would have lived understand. No. And you never will. Nor will I. Nor will any woman understand why a man will go into a battle singing. They're still burying the dead out in the battlefield. And down below they sing and carry on. Oh, have they stopped? Yes. They have stopped singing. Twelve o'clock and all is well. <laughs> Last night, we lay afraid in our beds. Tonight, we are safe, baby. Mama? Louis, what is it, dear? Mama? Mama? Oh, now you can't sleep in this bed with a new baby. So you must be a big boy and sleep by yourself. And tomorrow morning... Night again, and you can go and play. I- I'm afraid. Twelve o'clock and all is well. Don't you hear the cry, dear? All is well. All is well with the city. All is well with your father, too. Father? I think all is well with father. It is only with us, Louis, that all is not quite well. American Adventure is written by John Ely, directed by John Clayton, produced by the Communication Center of the University of North Carolina. American Adventure is produced on a grant and aid from the National Association of Educational Broadcasters, made possible by the Educational Television and Radio Center. In today's story, The Battle, the cast was composed of students, faculty members, and townspeople of the University of North Carolina community. 
American Adventure is produced and recorded by the University of North Carolina on the campus at Chapel Hill. Tom Oyen speaking. Mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. bring you the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall in Bold Venture and a Tale of Mystery and Intrigue. One thing I don't understand, Johnston. And please tell me. I'll try to explain. Why are we sitting here? It just seems to me, well, talking about this, well, Shannon's place is pretty public. <laughs> Known as reverse cloak and dagger in the trade, Mr. Shannon As far as any of your customers are concerned We're just sitting here eating cheesecake It's a uh, fine cheesecake, Mr. Bond Thanks Now, shall we go on? I don't think there's anything to go on about It's just a matter of whether the sailor wants to help you or not Sinclair is a clever man Like all foreign agents have to be We can't have him know that intelligence is on to him On to what his plans are Why he's in Havana embarrasses me to appeal to your patriotism, Mr. Val. But whatever I have to do to convince you... All I have to do is go to this party, show an ankle, and bear a shoulder to Mr. Sinclair. Is that it? And convince him to drive you to this address in San Tomas. I'll meet you there. Let me get this straight. A man suddenly disappears from the States. A man named... Faulkner. Faulkner. Guy loaded with secrets about nuclear physics. You think he's here in Havana and he's going to contact a foreign agent named Sinclair, right? Right. Of course, we'd just love to pick up Faulkner and take him back, but we don't know where he is. Sinclair, we do. And Mr. Vall is going to bring him to us. I've gotten her name on the party's guest list. Am I going, Slate? That's a question. She's got a chance to wear a strapless, and she says, Am I going, Slate? Uh, more cheesecake, Mr. Johnstone? <laughs> Faulkner. Did you hear me? I told you. Why don't you stop playing that piano and listen to me? Thank you. I said... You I... said you were a persuasive man. I know that. Of what other possible use could you be to me? Don't patronize me, Faulkner. I wouldn't dare. You're a dangerous man, Johnston. I confess you frighten me. <laughs> That's rich. You carry in that bald skull of yours enough atomic knowledge to turn the world into dust, and I frighten you. You never told me, Faulkner, to whom are we going to sell the fruit of this exquisite brain of yours? Whoever pays the most, whoever makes the highest bid. I'm glad you remember. Sometimes you scientists are prone to become vague, uh, forgetful about minor things. Like money. <laughs> Not this scientist. Life in a test tube has become loathsome to me. Jolly glad to hear it. Now you may tell me how you persuaded the young lady. Simply. Ever so simply. I represented myself as being from American intelligence. Showed her forged credentials, appealed to her patriotism, flicked her vanity. She is lovely. And she will bring Sinclair to us? Mr. Vaughn, on a proverbial platter. And what will you do with Mr. Sinclair? Kill him. I've never killed an intelligence man before. I wonder what it'll be like. Like the other men you've killed? I know you. Oh, I do know you. You 
do? Yes. Oh, yes, indeed. You're that girl with a fanciful name. You're Sailor Duval. I've seen you. Oh, I'm so glad you've come to my party. What would you like first, some food or a man? We have assorted quantities of both. Well, a man would be nice. Where's the guest of honor? Louis Sinclair. Oh, well, I do suppose it's only polite. Uh, Louis, come here, darling. I have someone here just frothing at the mouth to meet you. Well, I would be delighted. Uh, Louis, this is Sailor Duval. If you need any help, Louis, scurry. Hello, Miss Duval. Hi. Well, now. <laughs> well. Well, what? Tell you the truth, ma'am, I don't know. I'm guest honor at this party, and folks come up and talk to me, and I've been saying, well, now, well, it's been getting me by. You don't like parties, huh? Well, now. <laughs> well. Look, Mr. Sinclair, you don't have to give me the routine. Relax. I'll tell you what. You can tell me about Texas. Oh, the pleasure's all mine, ma'am. On the balcony. With you, Sugarfoot? Oh, you're so pretty in that Havana moon. It can't touch a Texas moon. The balcony, Mr. Sinclair. Call me, Louie. You're a real devil. Rootin' tootin'. Look at it. Havana. You ever been in Houston? No, but I've dreamed about it. Sweetest dream a filly can have. Where are you from, Miss Duval? Tennessee. What you doing in Havana? There was a man in Tennessee. That's why I'm in Havana. Texas man wouldn't let you go. He didn't let me go. He followed me to Cuba. Bob's like that. The whole Faulkner family is like that. Who? Bob. Robert Faulkner. Tall man, green at the temples, little scar on his cheek, one of them brainy guys. Worked in a government science project, didn't he? That's right. You know him? Oh, do I know Bob Faulkner. Bob, he used to spend summertime on my ranch. What you know, Faulkner, here in Cuba. Would you like to see him? Oh, the sooner the finer. Well, he's got a little place in San Tomas. It's about 20 miles down the coast. We can get there in 15 minutes, depending on the traffic. Bob Faulkner in Cuba. <laughs> You know what I'm going to do about you, Miss Duval? Well, I'm going to write to the boys back home about you, Miss Duval. They won't never believe I met up with a gal like you, even if I take a paralyzed oath on a cistern full of hymn books. Why, when I tell them how you... Oh, isn't this an address you showed me on a slip of paper, Miss Duval? Uh-huh. Your arm, Lou. <laughs> oh, the boys just won't never believe it, that's all. I'll, I'll knock on the door. Yes, sweet. <laughs> You're sure Faulkner lives here? If he doesn't, I'll let you beat me at Lotto. <laughs> oh, Miss Duval. I see you've accomplished your mission. You have brought us our quarry. The corn pone is all yours, Mr. Johnston. <laughs> corn pone. That's rich, very rich. Uh, come in, Mr. Vaughn. Mr. Sinclair. Where's Faulkner? You want him, don't you, Mr. Sinclair? You've been stepping on his shadow ever since he ran away from Tennessee, and now you think you found him. Your errand girl told me he'd be here. Get him. Hey, Louie, you... you're shedding your hayseed. You know, I like you better this way. You're a lovely woman, Mr. Vell. That is, you would be lovely if all this weren't so sick-making. Hey, he can't talk to me like that, can he? Can he, Mr. Johnstone? No, of course not. No, are you... Don't try, Mr. Sinclair. Oh. Just give in to it. Oh. Oh, oh. Now our Mr. Sinclair will never talk that way to another woman. You killed him. Cold blood. Mr. Sinclair was a tedious man. He wanted to arrest my Mr. Faulkner so desperately. Oh, yes, because Sinclair really was from intelligence. True blue. And I brought him to you. We have many rooms here, Mr. Val. Choose one suitable for weeping over him. He died a hero's death. <laughs> Miss Saylor, she go to B 
big party. Show pretty soldier to society. The party is over. The people have fun. Where Miss Sailor is big question. She's in San Tomas, King. Morning's getting ready to start, Mr. Slate. She can be in San Tomas and back four times. Five times, maybe. I figured it out, and it came to six. I was going to say six, but I didn't want to worry you. Thanks. You worry about Miss Saylor all the time, don't you, Mr. Slate? Just when she's supposed to be home, and she's not. Maybe I ought to go get her. What time is it, King? Five, a few minutes before. The coast train leaves at a quarter after. I think you ought to get Miss Saylor, Mr. Slate. Now don't worry about it. I'll bring her back to you. Permiso, senor. You will not mind that I sit next to you, eh? Not at all, Chico. Sit down. Yeah. Gracias. Muchas gracias. I could see by your face that you are a very simpatico fellow. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, that Havana. I think Jose Clemente outdid himself in Havana. Jose Clemente is me. Clay Shannon. Had a big time, huh, Jose? Oh, in certain places in Havana, they will remember my name. <laughs> I carved my initials on the walls. They'll never forget you. Yeah, don't be too sure, senor. In Havana, the profession is to forget. A man, his name, the days of yesterday. I... <laughs> oh, oh, help me. Help me, senor. Hey, what's the matter? You feel sick? My ugly pain chases itself inside me, around and about. Hey, please, I, I need atmosphere. Lots of fresh atmosphere. Come on. We'll go out on the observation platform. Uh, my paper bag. Where is my paper bag? All of Jose is in this bag. Now here it is. I've got it. Come on. Oh, yes, you see. Uh, hey, I told you, you are very simpatico. Right out this door. You'll be all right. Ah, here we are. Take a deep breath, Jose. You'll feel better. Uh, give me my paper bag, please, senor. In it, I have pills. Pills to heal the sickness of going away from Havana. Here you are. Gracias. Little pink pills in this. It surprises you, Senor Shannon, that in this paper bag, Jose Clemente carries a gun? It does. Especially when you're pointed at a simpatico fellow like me. Now, this is a remarkable little gun, Senor Shannon. So little and still big enough to make you fall from this train. You never get to San Tomas. I will shoot tears and say you were drunk. But you and I will know that the little gun did it. Might not be that easy. It will, senor. If you do not fall, I will make a hole in your simpatico face and then throw you over. You have a choice, senor. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Now, why didn't you want me to get to San Tomas, Jose? But you can't tell me, can you? Adventure. Our stars Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and the second act of our story. Mr. Smith, he called to San Tomas to look for ladies sailor by train first class. On train he meet a little man with gun who tried to keep him from his destination. Little man, he don't know, he don't succeed. Find his body by track in railroad weed. Little man... Little All right, King, I got the message. I thought to take your mind off your troubles, Mr. Slate. You're kidding. The troubles have I got. A little punk tries to throw me off a train. We get into a fight and he falls off. Cops ask me why I did a thing like that. I tell them why. For three hours, I tell them why. They don't believe me. What troubles, huh? The big trouble of not finding Lady Sailor where you thought her to be. Yeah. yeah. You came up with one. These others, the police, the little man, they do not make so much hurt as the absence of Lady Sailor, do they, Mr. Slate? You won't sing me a song about it, huh, King? Well, if it's not your wish, Mr. Slate. Thanks. 
You promised to bring her back to us. Yeah, I did, didn't I? I don't get it, King. I go to that address in Santa Mars, there's no one there. Just an alley cat and some hysterical chickens. I couldn't even find them a rooster. You told the police of the man from intelligence, the man Mr. Johnston? Mm-hmm. They never heard of him. But such a man would register with the police. It's always done. Pay attention, King. I told you I'd find her. All I have to do is start from the beginning. Remember how Sailor went to a party? Yes, Mr. Slate. It was time I brought her home. She might turn into a pumpkin. Comfortable, Mr. Vaughn? Why did you bring me back to Havana? Because the method of your disposal has not been contracted for. If I'm to kill you, the man has to tell me. In what manner, for how much. It's up to the man. How does my hair look? I want to make a good impression. A Faulkner doesn't impress. Oh, so there really is a Faulkner. Well, surely. This is his place. Of course, he rented it, furnished, but it's indicative of his tastes. Expensive, like mine. Tell me, how does it feel to kill a man? It gets easier all the time. But here, let's talk of more pleasant things. And consider, shall we, these goblets? Crystal. Exquisite. Here, here hold one up to the light. No? Or, um, then this candlestick on the table. Hand-wrought silver. Don't you shiver when you see something so beautiful? Never did. Mr. Johnstone. Yes. How much did you say you got for killing Sinclair? Two thousand. You want a shiver? Pardon? Wait a minute. Here, take a look at this locket. Beautiful. Just beautiful. Here, I'll take it off so you can see. The diamond in it is worth... Well, your two thousand dollars would buy a corner of it. Here. Oh, I'm sorry I dropped it. Oh, let me... And you've got your foot on it, Mr. Vaughn. And you put yours right in it. Well, what do you know? You dented Mr. Faulkner's candlestick. Oh, sailor, sailor. You're so brave and clever. Why do you fight it? Huh? There's humor in this. <laughs> a killer lying at your feet. You standing over him with a candlestick in your hand. Irony, the essence of humor. Who are you? My name is Faulkner, and yours is Duval. It's fortunate. I've had better things happen to me. You have a boat, I've heard, and I have you. I'll need both of you. And Mr. Shannon, and Mr. Johnstone, and this gun. selling. Go away. I'm Slate Shannon, Miss Grant. May I come in? Oh. Oh, the exciting, the notorious Mr. Shannon. That'd be delightful. Come in, Slate. Ricky, darling, this is Slate Shannon. Oh, don't be frightened, darling. I'm here. That's right. You just sit here at my feet and play your native songs and let me run my fingers through your curly, curly, black, black hair. Hiya, Ricky. And likewise, I'm sure. What is it you want of me, Slade? My presence at your little dive to lend it chic? Your presence does that in the dive? <laughs> Isn't he divine, Ricky? <laughs> now tell me, what is it you really want? A charity contribution? I'm looking for Miss Duval, Sailor Duval. Oh, then it is a charity contribution. Why do you come to me looking for another woman? Your ghost, Slade. That means crude. Uh-huh. Where is she? I haven't the slightest idea. The last I saw of her, she was on a balcony with Louis Sinclair. Louis yelled, Yippee! And they were off together into the somewhere. Into what somewhere? Wherever girls and boys have fun yelling yippee at each other. How would I know? But you know where Sinclair lives. Mm-hmm. You want to know, too? Yeah. Now. Mm-hmm. Tease me for it. So help me, Miss Grant. If you don't give me Sinclair's address, I may hit you over the head with guitar, curly boy and all. Ricky, are you going to sit there fingering that stupid guitar and let this, this, uh, this wonderful man talk to me like that? Of course you are. You're keen, Rick. You're a pal. 
Try the Hotel Caesar Slade, because you're so thrilling. <laughs> How about some service around here? Service? Si, senor. I am the service. Que can I do for you? Que can I do for you? Que means what? I throw in a Spanish word so I am colorful. This way the tourists don't mind no bath with the room. Do you have a senor Sinclair with a room? Sir, Sinclair. Aha, aha. Well, stop being so colorful. Just tell me where I can find Sinclair. Por favor. One second. I shall return. One little minute. Yeah, hurry back. Senor, I sell him. Senor. Someone came for Sinclair? I see, very dangerous looking man. I see him, I say to myself, aha. Then when he asks for Sinclair, I say. Gracias. Ha- oh, Senor Slay. Hey, what is this? I ask a man for Sinclair and I get a minion of the law. How come I get you, LaSalle? Mm, I ask you the same question, likewise. And so? Look, Sailor went to a party. She was supposed to meet a man named Sinclair. She hasn't been home. If she married him, I want to shake her hand and wish her things. If she married him, she should be crying. What? For she would be a widow. Sinclair is dead? Murdered. Shot. He was found beneath the pier at San Tomas. Ah. Where's Sailor? I do not know, amigo. But one thing we do know. Senor Sinclair was not as he appeared. He was a member of the intelligence of your country. Sinclair was? I thought... Thought what? I don't have to think about it. Sailor's in trouble. I've got to find her. Senor Slate. Arrest me later, LaSalle. I've got to find Sailor. Good luck, amigo. There's a gun on your back, Shannon. Well, Johnston. I know. You want a dime for a cup of coffee. If you don't want a dime, the gutter. Get into that car. Your friend Faulkner handles my boat real good. Yeah, he's the genius type. Knows everything. Hey, Faulkner. Where are we going? Tell him, Johnston. We're going to meet a freighter in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. It's going to be a neat trick in this fog. Well, the genius will find it. He's not so smart. He needs a freighter. We don't need a freighter, do we, sailor? No, he's not smart. We're smart. Look at us. I've been looking at you, Mr. Vaughn. It took a blow with a candlestick to make me do it. It's a pity you're not going on that freighter. Where's it going? To a place of refuge. A place where they're going to pay us a lot of money for picking Faulkner's brains. They pay good for traitors, huh? Well, you'd be surprised. Johnstone got $2,000 for killing Sinclair. Didn't you, Mr. Johnstone? Yes, I've got a quirk. I like money. You know what I think, Johnstone? What? I think for a man of your talents, that's a paltry sum. Real paltry, huh, sailor? It's awfully paltry. What would you consider a fair price for killing a man? Well, it depends now. If it were a man like Faulkner... Slate, how could you? Mr. Faulkner and Mr. Johnstone admire each other. Oh, my mistake. You people have something on your mind? I've still got my locket. Here, it's in my hand. You could get $5,000 for it in any hock shop in the world. You can believe her. I've gotten it. All I'd have to do is shoot you, Mr. Vall, and then I'd have the locket. My hand's on the rail, Mr. Johnstone. If you shot me now, the locket would drop into the ocean. You'd have to get wet to get it. I'd make book you wouldn't get it. It's worth $5,000. $5,000 to kill four. I'm going to tell you people something you won't believe. We'll believe you. I never had $5,000 at one time in my life. You're not getting any younger, you know. Don't you ever get tired of meeting freighters in the dark? How do you know what these people on the boat will do to you? They don't need you. Faulkner! Please, it's difficult enough. This fog... It'll only take a second. Oh, what do you want? What? Don't... You fool. fool! I'll kill you! Dutch sailor! You're going to die, Faulkner! Johnston, he went overboard. Now you, Shannon, Miss Duval. The wheel, we're going to ram that freighter. We all die. We all... Grab the wheel, sailor. Ah, you did.
did good, sailor. Faulkner. He's dead. Take the wheel, Slate. Maybe I'll be a girl for two minutes. Maybe I'll faint. Sailor. What do you want? Where'd you get that locket? A man gave it to me. What man? A man. You love him? A lot. He was my father. Why'd you let me hock it last time? You were nice to me. Come here. What did you do that for? I want to hock it again. I might have known. The first of the month. Mm Mm-hmm. Payments due on the boat. I thought you owned the boat. I put a mortgage on it so I could get the hotel out of hock. Don't you own anything outright? Yeah, the moon. Come on outside and I'll give it here. And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in Bold Venture. It was late by the time I left the Kowalskis and the streets were empty. My footsteps echoed in the darkness. I had the feeling I was being followed. Somewhere in the shadows, someone was watching me. Someone I'd been trading for 20 years. This is East Side Beat, a big city story of the one thrilling moment in a man's life that can only be called High Adventure. is High Adventure, the telling of strange stories of strong men living the greatest and most exciting moment of a lifetime, their moment of high adventure. And on the agenda at this meeting is a story called East Side Beat, the author and director, Elliot Drake. And to tell it, here's the man who lived it, Bill Harrigan. Bill? August 16th was just like any other day. It had been hot the night before, and me and the wife had taken a mattress up on the roof. It was even hot up there, and we didn't get much sleep. Walking to the subway the next morning, there was still some heat in the sidewalks left over from yesterday, and by the time I reached the newsstand at the corner, the sweat was trickling down my back under my shirt. Mrs. O'Leary handed me my paper, and the headline said something about the hottest August 15th in the history of the Weather Bureau. The subway was crowded like it always is, and I couldn't get a seat. It was all right as long as we was moving, but every time we stopped at a station, the heat closed in like an oven. I was glad when we got to 116th Street. Up on the street, it was still hot, but at least I didn't have somebody's elbow in my back. I even began to whistle as I walked the two blocks to the precinct station. Hi, Sully. Must be 8 o'clock. Right on the nose. Lieutenant sets his watch by you. (laughs) The 39th precinct is now officially open for business. Morning, Dom. Oh, hello, Bill. You're in early. Hey, got the paper? Yeah. How'd the Dodgers do last night? Want to borrow a nickel? Come on, come on, give it over. Why are cops so cheap? What are you complaining about? You got more money than the mayor. Sure. Come on. (laughs) Anything happened last night? Eh, nothing much. Where's the log? Hmm? I said, what? I'll get it. Well, here it is. Ah, lost to the film. Three to two. When are they going to get started? Please, they got to win today or they're out of it all Vacancy, vacancy, loitering, pickpocket. Hmm. Alice Tompkins. Yeah. What'd they do with her? Huh? Oh, pulled her off for the night or something. Do you have anything on her? No, not much. A couple of watches, bottle. Mm-hmm. Why don't you sit down and relax? And the world knows you come on duty at eight. Everyone goes into high. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> I wonder what kind of desk the mayor has. Mm-hmm. I said... All right, who's the funny man? What? What's the idea? I don't know. What Just you... note. What note? Don't give me that. You know what I mean. Yeah, let me see it. Get out of here. Let me see it, Bill. 
Get off my trail or you'll get it, copper. Signed, the Kowalski Killer. Somebody around here ought to be in Bellevue instead of on the force. Hey, you better get out of town, Bill. I'll get somebody's badge for this. Lieutenant wants to see you, Bill. What? Oh, okay. You leave that note on my desk, Marquetta. I'll take it to handwriting. Knuckleheads. Morning, Lieutenant. Morning, Bill. Brought in. Lester said you wanted to see me. That's right. Sit down. Well, I guess you know what today is. Well, yeah, sort of. I want to congratulate you, Bill. <laughs> Twenty years is a long time to serve your city. Oh, I don't know. And you've done it well. Yes, I'm proud to know you, Bill. Get off it, Lieutenant. Oh, I mean every word of it. Yeah, I, I guess it is a long time at that. I'll say it is. I remember when I got my patrolman's badge. <laughs> we didn't even have traffic lights in those days. <laughs> You've seen a lot of changes in this town. Yeah. Now I just want to be around for the next 20. That's what I want to talk to you about, Bill. What do you mean, Lieutenant? How long have we known each other? Six years? Seven? About seven, I guess. Been pretty good friends, haven't we? Well, sure. This isn't easy for me. Come on, Lieutenant. Let's have it. I flunked my last physical, didn't I? Uh, not the last one, Bill. Huh? You flunked it three years ago, but, uh, well, it just kind of got lost in the shuffle. Oh. And now that I've reached 20 years, you want me to retire. Is that it? Yeah, I guess that's it. But I can pass that physical. I wasn't even trying. Just give me a couple of weeks to get in shape. I can't do that, Bill. Why not? Doc says it's the pump. Nothing to worry about, long as you're careful. There's so much but... to do. You're making it hard for me. A Kowalski case. I always hoped I'd crack that one. There'll be others along to take your place. Yeah, yeah but you know how this business is. Sometimes a case is broken just because some smart cop remembers a little detail that happened 20 years ago. I know. Nobody on the force knows as much about the Kowalski kid as I do. No. Just let me stay around. I'm sorry, Bill. Yeah. I'll have Lesser type up the papers for you. Meanwhile, we'll give you enough to keep you busy. Lieutenant Wade. Yes, Lesser. Okay, we'll put a man on it. And Lesser, come into my office when Bill leaves. <laughs> Woman over 135th just saw a monkey on her fire escape. You want to take it? You don't have to if you don't want it. No, I'll take it. Sorry it had to happen this way, Bill, but you've got a lot to look forward to. Your wife, your daughter, her kids. Yeah. Thanks, Lieutenant. Hey, Bill, did you see the note on your... Shut up, jerk! What's eating him? Funny how you can go on year after year putting things off till tomorrow, and all of a sudden there isn't any tomorrow. I remember the day the Kowalski call came in. I was just a young punk, new on the force, and that was my first big case. At first, she was just reported missing, but later we found the little girl hidden in the tall grass of an empty lot over on the east side. Both her arms were broken, and her body was so brutally beaten that the father couldn't identify it. Looking down on her, I thought of my own little girl. And I went off by myself and was sick to my stomach. I've seen a lot of them since then, but that was my first, and I never forgot it. We searched that neighborhood for months, questioned hundreds of suspects, turned those tenements inside out, but we never came up with a clue. Usually in cases like that, it isn't long before the killer shows himself by knocking off somebody else. But that's what made this case different. We were never able to tie it in with another killing. And the brass decided it wasn't the work of a maniac. Somebody had had it in for that little girl and they deliberately murdered her. And then disappeared in the noise and confusion of the east side. Finally, the way work was piling up, they had to take the men off the case and it was written into the record as unsolved. But I never forgot it. And from then on, every job I went out on, I was working on the Kowalski case too. Got to be the stand and gag around the station, but I kept telling myself someday. Someday I'm going to show those punks what it takes to be a real cop. And now it was too late. Too late because I'd let all my tomorrow slip away. I was climbing a four-floor walk up on 135th Street to chase a monkey they should have sent the dog warden after. 4A. 4B. 4C. 4D, yeah. Pew. Joint stinks. Lights out. Must be a bell here someplace. Yeah. 
Yeah. Sergeant Harrigan, 39th Precinct. So? You reported seeing a monkey on your fire escape. Oh. Oh, yeah, come in. Where's the fire escape? What? Turn that thing down, will you? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Turn that thing down, sure. That better? Yeah. And the old heart desires. Where's the fire escape? Oh, what's your hurry? Want a drink? No. Great big policeman don't want a drink. Where's the fire escape? What? Oh, yeah, fire escape. The other room, I'll show you. Place a mess. Mess? Ain't been up long, you know. Usually very neat. <laughs> knobs broke. Had to get it fixed someday. You fix knobs? No. Place a mess. I know. That window? Yeah. It's hot in here. Shut the window when I saw the monkey. Don't like monkeys. Like dogs, cats. Don't like monkeys. You like monkeys? Not here now. What's your name? Flo. Flo what? What do you want to know, Flo? I got to make a report. Flo what? I don't want no trouble. What do you got to make a report for? You sure you saw a monkey? Sure I saw a monkey. What color was it? Say, I don't like what you're saying. It was brown, it was yellow and screaming. That's what I thought. Why don't you go to bed and sleep it off? You cheap flat foot. Tell me I saw him. I know when I see him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look again, you dumb ninny. Look again. I tell you, he's out there. I saw him. Shut up, shut up. I'll look again. Just stop screaming. We'll have the whole force up here. Go on, look. I, I don't like monkeys. I know you like dogs, you like cats, but you don't like monkeys. I'll look, I'll look. Maybe I am getting too old. What? Nothing. You see him? No. He must have gone away. Maybe he went up the fifth floor. What? I said maybe he went upstairs. Oh. No, he went up. Wait a minute. Hey, there he is. See? I told you. Told you I saw a monkey. Where is he? On the next landing. Well, go get him. Take him away. I don't... Shut up. I'll get him. Come on. Come on. Give up. Come on. Take it easy. Take it easy. That's it, my boy. Take it easy. Now, come on. That's right. Don't be afraid, fella. Everything's going to be... Say, he's been hurt. What's the matter? He's all blood. What? What would you say? He's been hurt. Oh, poor old thing. I don't like to see nothing hurt. It must have been somebody's pet. Huh? He's got a collar on. Yeah. Where's your phone? Who are you going to call? The SPCA. They'll know how to handle this. I ain't got a phone. Where'd you call us from? You ain't going to leave me alone with that monkey. I told you I don't like... Will you stop that screaming? Oh, take him over to Mr. Mickey. He got lots of animals. He'll know what to all do. All right, all right. I'll show you the way. Just let's get it over with. Here. Come on, little fella. There. Nothing to be afraid of now. When I picked the little fellow up, he was shivering and he tried to get away. I put him inside my coat and he tucked his head under my arm and stopped struggling. Then the woman led us downstairs and out on the street. The monkey's tail was hanging out of my coat and before we'd gone half a block, a crowd of kids was yelling and jumping all around us. We went out to the avenue and up to 136th Street. Then about halfway up the block, the woman turned and went into a junkyard. A big dog jumped out from behind what was left of an old car. His barking scared off the kids, but the woman kept walking. I never saw such a collection of junk. Fenders, wheels, mattresses, old furniture thrown all over the place, and there must have been 10 or 15 cats and dogs jumping up on us and wagging their tails. Muggy started chattering under my coat, but I hung on to him. There was a shack at the back of the yard, and the woman made straight for it. Here, here, now, what's all the commotion here? Oh, good morning, Flo. Oh, Miss Girls, I'm ashamed of you. Now, that's no way to greet a guest. Hello, Mr. Meeker. Go on with you now. I'm ashamed of you. Ah, oh, no, it's too late to say you're sorry now, George. I thought I'd taught you better manners than that. Go on now, go on. <laughs> You'll have to excuse my friends. They, they meant no harm. Uh, this is Sergeant... Uh, what'd you say your name was? Harrigan. Yeah, Sergeant Harrigan. Sergeant, I hope no one has been complaining about my friends again. No, nothing like that. You see, we thought maybe you could doctor up this monkey. A monkey? Yeah, he was up on this lady's fire escape, and the station sent me over to catch him. Oh, you, you didn't hurt him? No, he must have got hit by a car or something. When I, well, uh, by thought... all means, I'll be glad to help. Just bring him in the office. <laughs> Poor little thing. I hate to see dumb animals. Sergeant, huh? I like to call them little friends. Oh. Uh, what were you saying? I, uh, 
I hate to see uh, little friends get hurt. I know what you mean. Hey, you got a regular zoo here. Please, Sergeant. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Now, now, my pretties, we must be quiet. We wouldn't want to disturb our patient, would we? I, I, I better cover their cages. <laughs> Ain't he cute? He's nuts. Sure, but he's cute. I kind of mother him along, so his clothes mother for him. Mother him, huh? Yeah. Who is he? Been here for years. <laughs> Just goes to show you. I thought I knew everyone in this precinct. You didn't know me. Now, now there we are. Now let's take a look at our patient. Yeah. He's being awful quiet. I think he's dead. Now, let me see. Uh, put him on the table. No. His heart's still beating. Did he pass on? Probably lost a lot of blood. Oh, your shirt's a mess, Harrigan. That's okay. Leave it with me tonight. I'll wash it for you. I don't... Hey, what are you doing, Maker? Uh, I, I read in a book our little friends have been known to revive each other by breathing in each other's mouths. Oh, that, that, you see? He's breathing more regularly now. Well, I'll now be... Now we can a... take care of his injuries. Yeah. What do you think's wrong with him? Well, I, I can't tell what else. But so far, both his arms are broken. I waited till I was sure the monkey was going to be all right. Then I left him with Meeker and ran to the nearest call box. The streets were crowded with morning shoppers, but I don't remember even seeing them. All I could see was a picture that had been burned in my mind 20 years ago. The picture of the little Kowalski girl with her two broken arms hanging limp at her sides. Lieutenant Wade. This is Harrigan, Lieutenant. Oh, yes, Bill. Did you get that monkey? I'll say, and listen. Had both its arms broken. Did you call the SPCA? Don't you see? What? The Kowalski girl had both her arms broken, too. Wait a minute. We never could tie the Kowalski case up with anything else. Maybe this is it. Take it easy. Huh? What makes you think there's a connection between the two? This is the repeat case we've been looking for. The monkey was probably hit by... It's impossible. Why? If both his arms were broken by a truck, it'd have been hit on the head, too. I got something there. It must tie together. You got any suspects? I don't know. The woman, maybe. What woman? The one that sent in the complaint. She's a lush with a big mother complex. Real dog with a lousy temper. Besides, the monkey threw her. Who is she? I don't know. Never saw her before. Uh-huh. What do you say, Lieutenant? Can I follow it out? Uh, you sit tight, Bill. I'll send Marquette over right away. Why? Oh, you know what the doc said. I want you to take it I'm easy. I'm still on the force, aren't I? Well, yes, but... I'll take it easy when my papers go through. Till then, let me keep on this. Okay, Bill, go ahead. Thanks, Lieutenant. Uh, where are you going now? Over to the Kowalskis. I want to have another talk with him. Well, check back as soon as you can. I will. And take it easy. <laughs> you worry too much. That was about noon. I went across the street to a cigar store and called the Kowalskis, but there wasn't any answer. So I went back to the walk-up on 135th Street and got Flo's last name from the janitor. It was Rusek. Polish, like the Kowalskis. Then I walked across town to 132nd Street and sat on the steps of 195 to wait for Mama or Papa Kowalski to come back. One o'clock, nothing happened. Two o'clock, still nothing. Three o'clock. Four o'clock, still nothing. The kids were playing one a cat and kicked a can in the street. Five or six little girls were jumping rope down the block. I wondered how Papa Kowalski felt coming home every night, walking up a block filled with kids playing games. It was a funny way to spend what might be my last day in the force. A little after five, I saw them coming up the street. They looked older, and I remembered them, and tired. But they nodded to the neighbors and talked to the kids, and one little girl took Papa by the hand and walked halfway up the block with him. Kids can be awful cruel or awful kind. I was glad this one was kind. Ah. Well, 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 Sergeant Harrigan. Hello, Mama. Hello, Papa. Oh, Sergeant, 
It's been so long. Yeah, Mama. Four or five years, I guess. It's good to see you, my <laughs> son. <laughs> Thanks, Papa. But uh, why you sit here? I was waiting to see you. Oh, Papa, we are standing in the street. we got to ask Sergeant Bill to house. <laughs> attack, Mama, attack. Hey, please, my son. Now you call me. Sure. Right? Here, let me take that bundle. Oh, no, no. It's not hey, like come on, man. Come on, give it here. <laughs> <laughs> Always the old man. <clears throat> oh, how you say? Show off. Attack, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> so no, <huh? laughs> In we go. We have a surprise for you. Yeah? Do not tell him, Papa. What is it? Uh, you will see. Mama has apple cake? No, you will see. <laughs> oh, that's some crime, eh? Uh, uh, we got uh, three more to go. Uh, what are we stopping for? Uh, <laughs> you do it, Mama. <laughs> Don't you? So. You moved downstairs. Yes, the nose junk. That's true, <laughs> Mr. Sosman says we too old to climb stairs. We must move down here. Come, Sergeant Bill. Well, yeah. that's something. So, now you sit down and we will talk. Whew. Mama, make some coffee. Uh, right? No, Mama, I don't have time. It does not take long. You come long. back in here. I want to talk to both of you. Uh, there huh? is something wrong. No, I just want to talk to you. Hey, sit here, Mama. <laughs> so? Now, my son? I, uh... I don't know how to say this. Uh, Is that about Anna? Yeah. I wish someday we could just sit down and talk about nothing. Seems like every time I see you, I, I bring back memories. We understand. You want to help? Yeah. We have said everything. I know, but I want to go over it all again. Maybe we missed something. Dobji. We will try. Now, Anna went to school at P.S. 105, right? Dark. That's at 138th Street. Dark. She had to walk uptown five blocks and cross town three blocks. Is it right? And you said, Mama, you taught her to go over 134th Street. Dark. Bit. There was not so many cars there. I, I thought she'd be safe here. It's possible. Why, why we must do this? I'm sorry, Papa. But you see, we got something new to work on. Always. It's like this. And there is nobody in jail. I know. This time it'll be different. It's, it's all right, Pop. So, Sergeant Bill. Let's see. But then you said she started going over 135th Street. Uh, Mr. Negler opens his candy store after school. All the children stop there. Uh -huh. Now, do you remember Anna ever talking about anyone named Rusak? Rusak. Rusak. No? At least I have not here. <clears throat> Mama? No. No. Are you sure? Doc, this name I, I do not know. Well, that's that. I'm sorry, I... No, wait a minute. Yeah. Maybe you should call her Florence or Flo. You ever hear those names? Florence? Flo? Uh, uh, Florence. It, this I know. What'd she say about her? A, a new girl in Anna's class. Yes. Oh, Anna's class. No, that's not the one. She live on 136 Street. No, Mama, no, no, no. It's no use. Then she talk about other new friend. What? Doc. Other new friend? Who was it? Yes, it was Mr... Mr... Meeker. By the time I got to the junkyard, it was beginning to get dark. There was a light on in the shack, so I knew he was there. I hoped I could get up to the shack without being noticed, but the minute I stepped in the lot, the dog started barking. 
Then when I saw Meeker come out of the door and look around the yard, I knew there was nothing else to do, so I walked right up to him. Now, Henry, be quiet. You've really been most disagreeable all day, Henry. Now, go on, all of you. I don't want to hear another word of it. Oh, good evening, Sergeant. Please don't think unkindly of my family. They don't realize yet that you are a friend. Hello, Mr. Meeker. I suppose you've come back to see that poor little monkey. I want to talk to you. Oh, well, by, by all means, please come in. All right, Lily, get down off the chair. Let the sergeant sit down, will you? Go on, scat! <laughs> you know, she's really the worst behaved of the lot. Just plain selfish, that's all. Always has to sit on the sofa. That's softest. not what I came to talk about. Oh, of, of course not. You know, I, I, I'm so used to being by myself that when I do get someone to talk to, I'm, I'm afraid I talk too much. Why, only the I want to talk to you about Anna Kowalski. I was talking to Flo, and she said if I was... Baker. What, Sergeant? What about little Anna Kowalski? I, I've never heard of Anna Kowalski. Why do you, you want to talk to me about someone I don't know? Why, That's not what I heard. What, Sergeant? I heard you knew her very well. My, my little friends will tell you that I've ne never Mrs. knew... Mrs. Kowalski told well, me. Well, I'm terribly sorry, but Mrs. Kowalski is wrong. She shouldn't have said a thing he like that. He said you knew Anna just before she was beaten to death. That's not true. You can ask Henry or George. Her arms Henry. were broken, just like that monkey. They'll tell you it's not true because they're my friends and Where I... is the monkey? Well, now, uh, you know... Where is it? I, you, you see, I, I can't stand seeing our little friends uh, cooped up, so I, 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 I took him out to the park uh, this afternoon. You're lying. No, no, I, I set him free in the park. You killed him just like you killed little Anna. That's not true. Why would I do such a thing? I love my little friends. You, you see, they don't like the way you're talking to me. Where's Sergeant? the monkey? George wants me. I, I have to go to see what George... Come wants. back here, you. What is it, George? George. Come back, Maker. Where are you, George? George, where are you? Peter! Oh, there you are, my friend. Why, George, what's all this about now? You're always such a good boy. I, I don't understand. What I, 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 just, I just don't understand, sir. He's after something in that old car. Oh, why would he... No, you're wrong, Sergeant. There, there, there's nothing... There's nothing in the... In the... In the... Yeah? The monkey. Dead. <laughs> I did it. I did it. I I tried to make friends with him, but he didn't like me. I tried so hard, Sergeant. I gave him bananas and peanuts, but he wouldn't like me. All my other friends liked me, but he didn't. I just couldn't stand it any longer. I wanted to hurt him. To hurt him. To hurt him. What about Anna? I, I, I used to wait for her to come home from school. Why? I, I wanted her to like me. I, I didn't want to hurt her. Go on. Then one day she said that she wasn't coming down my street anymore. And I knew she didn't like me. Yeah. It wasn't fair. She should have liked me. Then I, I wanted to hurt her. I knew it wasn't right, but I wanted to hurt her. After I'd done it, I knew it wasn't right. But she should have liked me. So then you didn't trust people anymore. Just animals. Please. Little friends. Till the monkey came along and he was smarter than dogs and cats. He and... didn't like me. No. Uh, what... What'll they do to me, Sergeant? Will they hurt me? No. I don't think so. They'll take you away and... Put you in a place where you'll have food and a bed. I don't want to go away. Who will take care of my friends? There's so much to do. Do I have to go, Sergeant? Sometimes I... I guess it's better that way. The 
title, East Side Beat, a story of the one thrilling moment in a man's life that can only be called high adventure. And heard in East Side Beat as Bill was Don Douglas with Wendell Holmes, Ross Martin, Mort Lawrence, Linda Watkins, and Bryna Rayburn. And next week, High Adventure friends, we're proud to present a story of a man who lived a dream of hope and destruction. We like to call it metamorphosite. So until next weekend, metamorphosite, look around you wherever you are, watch it, but don't live it. This thing we call High Adventure. Remember next week, Metamorphosite, another high adventure story of action, which combined with a falcon and followed by Big Guy, forms a full hour and a half of mystery and adventure over NBC each week at this time. So stay with us now for Big Guy. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Most people are fast asleep in the wee hours of the morning. Most people, that is, with the exception of all-night disc jockeys, milkmen, and Charlie Wilde. Charlie Wilde is a new kind of private detective, a dauntless, debonair, and daring young man who hits his stride in the wee hours of the morning. Wilde makes his debut a little later this afternoon. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. You're twice as sure with two great names, Frigidaire and General Motors. Frigidaire presents Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, romance, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. And now, Frigidaire presents Herbert Marshall as Ken Thurston, the man called X. Whenever the man called X is involved, even a very simple beginning may lead to an amazing chain of circumstances. Take such an ordinary little thing as the ringing of a doorbell. Simple enough, only the doorbell of a small apartment in Upper Manhattan. That's all. Good evening. Oh, I thought... Well, how do you do? You're Mrs. Jordan? Why, yes, I am. Mrs. Jordan, I am the man called X. Well, my husband isn't here, Mr. X. Oh. He took a plane this morning. What? Yes, to Honolulu. That was a big mistake. He shouldn't have gone. But, Mr. X, it took all our savings to buy that property in Hawaii. And for months now, they've kept stalling us from going out there. Ralph thinks the whole thing's a fake. That he and hundreds of other veterans in this country have been swindled. Mrs. Jordan, that land company in Honolulu is of a highly reputable concern. This foolish trip of his may prove to be extremely regrettable for both of you. Chief, would it bother you very much if I said I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about? Ken, this isn't funny. Your actions during this past week are nothing to joke about. I'll go with you on that. Six days and nights on the edge of a swamp full of the biggest mosquitoes in Florida, waiting for a smuggler who didn't even have the courtesy to show up. Hmm. Alone, of course. I don't think anybody else would be that crazy. But I thought you were working in a Hawaiian deal, Ken. That uh, land company for veterans. I was until I got this so-called hot tip. Why? Well, what did you find out? Uh, about the land firm, I mean. Only what I've told you already. They've been spreading ads in papers all over the country. Special offer to veterans. Plantation lands in Maui. Dirt cheap. The big come on. But apparently the buyer gets nothing but an artistic little title certificate and plenty of discouragement against coming out to take possession. At least four men who did go out, well, they disappeared. Can I... Can... Uh... Come on, Chief. Let's have it. What goes on? Uh, Miss Brooks, will you send in Mrs. Jordan, please? Who's Mrs. Jordan? She may be the chief witness for the prosecution. Huh? Oh, uh, come in, Mrs. Jordan. The girl told me to come in here. Yes, that's right. I, I want you to look at this man carefully. Now, this isn't the same one, is it? 
Well, I... I'm not sure. It was dark, and he didn't come inside. Chief, I hate to seem inquisitive, but what is it I'm supposed to have done? That, that mm. voice. It's him. It's the same one. You murderer. Oh, wait a minute. You murdered my husband. What the... Uh, that's, uh, that's all for now, Mrs. Jordan. Uh, will you wait in the other office, please? Miss Rex, I hope you get everything that's coming to you. Chief, will you please tell me what the Sam Hill this is all about? Kent, the day before yesterday, her husband phoned her from Honolulu and said that you had met him there and threatened his life. Four hours later, they found him stabbed to death. Chief, I've been in Florida. But Ken, I'd have to testify that you phoned me two days ago from Honolulu. I what? It was your voice, Ken. Dead to rights. So that's it. A nice tight little frame. Whoever put it together did a good job around the corners. And, Chief, I know exactly where I'm going to start. Pagon, open up. I know you're in there. Pagon. Just a minute. I'm coming. Oh, hello, Mr. Thurston. I thought I heard somebody knocking. Incredible. I've only been at it for ten minutes. Huh? Oh, well, uh... Mr. Thurston, I was just leaving. As a matter of fact, I'm late already. You'll be later. Let's go inside. At any other time, I'd be glad to. Uh, huh? Up, you pig. On here we go. Oh, but I... But I... Well, won't you come in? Thanks. Uh-uh. So it's gone. All right, pig. What happened to it? I'm very glad you dropped in, Mr. Thurston. Only yesterday I was saying to myself, now I ought to call up Mr. Thurston. Turn it off, pig. Huh? Now... What happened to that home recording machine of yours? Oh, that uh, was only an approval. I, they, they took it back. Well, how about the records, the ones I made? They take them back, too? Uh, the records? Oh, oh they, they they just got lost, I guess, or, or something. They're going to start talking. Oh, it was only a joke, Mr. Thurston. I, I wouldn't have thought of selling them. If Mr. Smith hadn't said it was just a joke... It would be Smith. Uh, the money had absolutely nothing to do with it. I, I swear to you, by the father All of my... All pipe down. Would you know this Mr. Smith if you saw him again? But I never did see him. I only talked to him on the telephone. He he sent a messenger to get the records. Like that, eh? Mm-hmm. All right, Pagon, start packing. We are flying to Honolulu. Ha! Ah, a vacation. Well, that's a very good it's idea. It's a long way from a vacation. There's a killer waiting there for us. Probably knows we're coming. He may be anybody, Pagon. He may be anybody at all. Boy, boy. All these bellboys are never around when you want them, Mr. Thurston. They're really a problem. Can't say that I blame them, Mr. Kwong. In a climate like this, who'd want to work? You're so right. They keep slipping off to Waikiki to ride their surfboards and do tricks for the young ladies who come on vacation. Sounds like a career all by itself. Ah, yes, if I were ten years younger. Uh, Mr. Thurston, the entire facilities of the Waiwela Hotel are yours to command. I am determined that you shall enjoy your visit to Hawaii. Thanks very much. And, of course, you too, Mr. Uh... Uh, Zellschmidt. Uh, Pagan Zellschmidt. <laughs> Quite so, Zellschmidt. By the way, Mr. Kwong, have you ever heard of a company around here sending land to war veterans? I'm so sorry, no, but, of course, I've never heard of a great many things. I see. Not even a company that has an address right across the street. No. Mr. Thurston, oh, why do you keep calling it the land company? It says right on the front, Club Malahini. It's a nightclub. Doesn't make sense, does it? No. Then come on. We're going to change our clothes and drop in at the Club Malahini. Here you are, monsieur. One dry martini and one uh, uh, zombie. Thanks. Now don't fall into that, Pagan. You'll drown. Oh, bartender. Uh, we oui, must you. Was there something else? Yes. Where can I find the manager of the club? Huh? But you have found him. I, monsieur, am the manager. Louis Chic at your service. Uh-huh. My bartender did not come tonight, so... Oh, he's probably down at Waikiki doing tricks for the girls. 
My name's Thurston, Mr. Sheik. Uh, this is Pagan Zelschman. Oh, so happy to meet you, monsieur. What can I do for you? Tell me what you know about a land company for war veterans. Oh, mon dieu, another one. Monsieur, I know nothing about that company. Their address is the same as this club's. Monsieur Thurston, it is like this. In the back of the club, there is a small office which I never use. Three months ago, a man called me on the telephone and wished to rent it. I say, fine, okay, and he sent me the money by mail. Whenever letters arrive for the company, I push them through the slot in the door. But I have never seen the man. I see. And there have been others inquiring about this company? Oh, four or five in the last month. I tell them all the same thing. Well, you're consistent at any rate. Mr. Thurston, look. I know, you're quiet, pig on. I can't eat some malahinis. It's my pleasure at this time to present the attraction you've all been waiting for. The one and only, the lovely Eupeli in her dance of the island. Look at her, Mr. Thurston. Huh? Not bad, eh? Not bad at all, Pagan. As a matter of fact, I think I'll go back to her dressing room and wait for her. That's a very good idea. Now, let's go. Sorry, Pagan. No? See you later. Oh, well. Monsieur, another zombie, please. Oh, Mr. Thurston. Yeah? Uh, if you have a minute, I'd like to speak to you. My name's Frank Clark. Uh-huh, well? I, I was sitting out at the bar a while ago, and I heard you talking to Louis Sheik. I didn't want to say anything in front of him. It's about this land company for us guys out of the service. Uh-huh. I've been around here a couple of weeks trying to check up on it. <laughs> I guess you got stuck, too, huh? It looks that way. Uh, same here. Yeah, they sure got a slick layout. Been able to find out anything? Well, not much more than what Sheik told you. Oh, I, I did get a look inside that office. Uh-huh. It's empty. Nothing but a letter drop. Hmm. Any ideas? Well, I got a few about the clerk at my hotel. I'm staying right across the street here, the Wawela. So am I. You mean Mr. Kwong, eh? Yeah, that's right. I'm tied up right at the moment, Mr. Clark. Suppose we get together in the morning and talk it over. Maybe you can make some sense out of the whole business. That's a good idea. I'll see you in the morning, then. So long, Mr. Thurston. Bye. Ah, the lovely Luapelle. What? Pardon me, please. This is my dressing room. I know. I've been waiting for you. Wait a minute. Y you are from the States. So? Who are you? Oh, I'm sorry. My name's Ken Thurston. Thurston? Come in, Mr. Thurston. You know, I've always thought of a grass skirt as a gaudy sort of thing on the picture postcard. Then I'd never seen you wear one. Oh, thank you. But that is my profession, Mr. Thurston. Well, I guess it's more than that. I suppose it's an art that comes from being born here in the islands. I suppose so. At any rate, the dance was very lovely. Ole, a poena, au. What? I, I do not understand. Oh, a native who doesn't know her own tongue. I have forgotten most of the old language. Lua Pele, you're no more a Polynesian than I am. No more a part of the island than... The Veterans Land Company. The vet. All right, but I can't talk to you here. Where are you staying? Across the street at the Wawela. Then, then I'll come to your room at 10.30, right after my next dance. All right. I'll be waiting for you. Don't forget, uh, La Pela. I won't. Don't worry. I won't forget. I'll be there all right, Mr. X. You would like something else, maybe, Monsieur Zelschmidt? Louis, you may bring me a crystal goblet filled with foam from Waikiki. Ha, ha. Monsieur is very funny. I go to bring some ice now. Monsieur will pardon me. I pardon everybody. <laughs> Except Mr. Thurston, who leaves me alone here while he talks to a beautiful dame with a beautiful name. <laughs> that rhymes. A beautiful... Here you go. Mr. Thurston, Mr. Thur where are you? Over here, Pagan. The door at the end of the bar. Come on. Well, it's about time you came back, Mr. Thurston. I was getting very impatient. Never mind, Pagan. Follow me. Hurry, we haven't much time. Why don't they have lights in this hallway? Uh, where are you going, Mr. Thurston? Out the back way. Close the door after you, Pagan. It's very dark here. Is this an alley, Mr. X? It's the back street. Wait, we'll stop here a second. Because, Pagan... I'm holding a gun in my coat pocket. From here on, you'll do exactly as I say. Understand? Well, of course, I'll be glad to... Wait. You know... 
You're not... You're quite right, Pago. I am not Mr. X. Now to continue with Frigidaire's Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall. Mr. X is in Honolulu investigating a firm ostensibly offering bargains in Hawaiian lands to war veterans. Someone has proved such a skillful impersonator as to place Ken under suspicion of murder and to lure Pagan away from the Club Malahini to some unknown destination. Monsieur, I cannot keep track of everyone who comes in here. It is possible that when my back was turned, he simply got up and walked out just like that. But you didn't see him go, Mr. Sheik, is that it? Monsieur Thurston, to be perfectly frank, I do not even remember the man. Oh, no, he came with me not more than half an hour ago. He sat right here, ordered a couple of zombies. I introduced him to you, Pagon Zellschmidt. Zombie Zellschmidt? Monsieur, I think I do remember vaguely, of course. Vaguely, is it? I see, yeah. You know, Mr. Sheik, I'm beginning to get a little fed up with you. That French accent of yours is as phony as that Hawaiian dancer. Okay, Thurston, you're right. The accent helps business. Uh huh. What business? Entertainment, glamour, thrills, excitement. It's on a menu, it's for sale. Interesting menu. I'll have to have a look, look at it sometime. Wouldn't be surprised if one of the main courses turned out to be real estate. Oh, good evening, Mr. Thurston. Well, you work pretty long hours, Mr. Kwong. Oh, the difficulty of keeping help. There are so many attractions here. Yeah, that... that situation seems to be general. Has Mr. Zellschmidt come in? Oh, no, not since he left earlier with you, Mr. Thurston. You've, uh, you've been here all evening? Continuously. Mm -hmm. What else can I do when I bear the whole tremendous responsibility of this hotel on my shoulders? Yeah, it must be a terrific load. Mr. Kwong, several men have come out from the States in recent weeks and disappeared... Some of them were staying at this hotel. What do you know about it? Why, nothing, Mr. Thurston. I never permit extraneous occurrences to intrude upon my consciousness. I see. Tell me, do you happen to know a dancer who calls herself Luapele? The Waiwela Hotel has the honor of being host to Miss Luapele. I see. Well, Mr. Kwong, in that role at least, I hope to be joining you in a few minutes. Yeah, who is it? I, Mr. Thurston. Oh. Hello, Pelly. Come in. Yeah, I'll take your coat. Oh, thank you. Well, I suppose you lock the door at this point. I hadn't thought of it. Why? Shouldn't I expect it, since I was foolish enough to come here to your room? Why did you come? A man ordinarily assumes it's a result of his fatal charm, doesn't he? Lua Pelly. Lua Pelly. Smoldering, boiling, ready to erupt... The volcano. That's what your name means, you know. <laughs> no, I didn't know. It was Louis Sheik's idea. Um, shall we sit down? Sure. Oh, not there. Over here. Oh. Let's say I came because I found you interesting. That sounds like a bad book. And it isn't the reason. Oh, why do you have to doubt everything? While I'll go at the club, you were anxious enough for me to come here. Why? Well, maybe because I found you interesting. You really think so? Why don't you do something about it? Such as? Such as something like this? Ah, Lua Perry. I wondered how long it would take. How long for what? For you to make your play. All right, drop it. Oh, you're hurting me. And drop it. That's better. Is a 32 automatic standard equipment for a dancer to carry in her coat pocket? I'd have killed you. All right, go ahead and kill me, the same as you killed my brother, Mr. X. Huh? How'd you find that out? I recognized your voice at the club. Who are you? Shirley Kaufman. Kaufman? Wait. He was swindled on this land deal. Talked to him on the phone several times. That's where I first heard your voice. He was my brother. Oh? Huh? 
When he wouldn't take your advice and came to Honolulu anyway, you followed him and killed him. Then tried to make it look as though he drowned. Oh. They found him in the surf at Waikiki. That's where you made a mistake. That's why I came out here. He didn't drown. My brother had won medals in swimming meets for years. You killed him. So that's what happened to one of them. You're wrong, Lord Pelly. I didn't kill your brother. But you're right about one thing. He was murdered. Wait a second. Sit right where you are. Hello. Mr. Thurston, is that you? Hey, go. Where the devil have you been? I do not have any time to talk about that now. You have got to come right away. Yeah, where? Out at the Diamond Point jetty. Diamond Point? What's up, uh, Pagan? I cannot talk about it now, Mr. Thurston, but it is very important. You hurry, huh? I'm tied up at the moment. I can't get away. Suppose I meet you around midnight. You cannot make it any sooner? Not a chance. And another thing, I, I can't find that letter from Mrs. Jordan that I gave you. You know what you did with it? I do not remember, Mr. Thurston. It is around somewhere, I guess. Mind if I look in your suitcase for it? You are entirely welcome to it. That's probably where it is, too. Okay. I'll meet you at midnight. At the Diamond Point Jetty. I will be waiting, Mr. Thurston. So long, Pagan. What are you going to do? Look, get this straight. I did not kill your brother. And I'm going to try just as hard as you are to find out who did. I, I don't know what to think. There isn't any proof... I got the idea because you warned him not to come to Honolulu. Then he came anyway and was killed. That's exactly why I warned him. Maybe I was crazy, but I worked there at the club for a month trying to find out who's behind this land company. No luck. Then you showed up the way you did. So you jumped to conclusions. I I guess so. Lord Pelly, this whole thing's beginning to make some sense. If you'll just sit tight, I may be able to dig up the right answer. One thing you can always count on with a guy as clever as the one who's back of all this... Sooner or later, he gets too clever. You said I was named for a volcano. All right. The eruption's over. I trust you, Ken. And to prove it. Oh, oh Ken. Well, apparently, well. You, you'll have to be going, Ken, if, if you're going to meet someone at midnight. It's a half-hour drive to Diamond Point. I haven't the slightest intention of meeting anybody at Diamond Point. But I'm going to stay right here. Until midnight. Well, Mr. Sheik, straight up midnight and not a customer in the place. Why don't you close up and go home? Oh, Monsieur Thurston has the right idea. That is exactly what I'm oh, going to now, do. Oh, now, hold it. I'm the fellow who knows the accents of fate. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember, all right, but it gets to be a habit. A lot of things do. You uh, haven't seen Mr. Smith around? Who is Mr. Smith? I said... That's a good question, Mr. Sheik. A very good question. And I'm working on an answer. Mm. Four minutes past midnight and still on the job. You show an amazing devotion to duty, Mr. Kwong. I assure you, Mr. Thurston, it is not by choice. The attractions here are such I know, that... yes. The help simply doesn't feel like working. Do you, uh... you mind if I look through the hotel register? No, not at all. Though I'm afraid you'll find it very dull reading. Oh, I don't think so. In fact, Mr. Kwong, I expect to learn a lot from it. <laughs> Well, Zellschmidt, you seem to have found my room quite comfortable. Oh, oh, oh. oh, that's too bad. Of course, you can't talk with that gag in your mouth. Before I remove it, however, I want you to take a close look at this knife. See it? Oh. Because if you cry out once, I'm going to use it to cut your throat, understand? Oh, oh. All right. There you are. Oh. I don't see... Why, you couldn't use a towel that didn't taste so bad. This one had soap on it. You do seem to be frothing at the mouth of it. And please stop sounding like Mr. Thurston. Selchmidt, do you have any idea why Thurston failed to show up at Diamond Point? He didn't? Now, do, don't look at me like that, Mr. Smith. I, I don't know why. You, you talked on the phone so much like me. It would fool even me. Mm, I wonder. I'd like to know where he is right now. Oh, who knows? He's probably found some woman. He always does. That's right, yes. Lua Pele. I'd forgotten he'd met her. He couldn't have known it wasn't you on the phone, Zellschmidt. 
I imitated you perfectly. Mr. Smith, it was even better than I could do it. <laughs> I imitated his voice all right, too. Even fooled his chief, a man who's known him for years. Oh, there is not the slightest doubt about that. You are the most clever man I have ever seen. How about untying those rules? No. Now, this hotel's far too crowded to turn you loose here but in the, the room. Quiet. The... Before I decide to cut your throat. Yes, sir. I, I didn't say anything. I, I don't really mind being tied up. Hmm? I only knew why he didn't show. The neatest little racket I ever worked up. Good for a long time, yet with Thurston out of the way. Oh, he's very stupid, Mr. Smith. You could bump him off without any trouble, just like the other four. Five, Selshwit. Hmm? Your arithmetic's bad. And since we're on that subject, I think it's time to make it six. I don't need you any longer. Oh, well, five, six, what's the... Di- huh? Wait. No, 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 you can't. Mr. Rex! All right, drop that knife. Drop it. No. Oh, Mr. Rex, I thought you would never come out of that. Uh, Thurston, you've got to do something about this hand. I'll bleed to death. Not from a scratch like that. You should have dropped that knife when I told you to, Mr. Smith. Or would you rather be called Frank Clark? Huh. How did you find out? You outsmarted yourself, Clark, when you picked up my remark on the phone about Mrs. Jordan's letter. I knew you were a phony. Pagan would have asked what letter, since you'd never heard of it. Say, that's right. I, I don't know uh, about the Laney letter. At midnight, the rest of the people who might have been tied into this deal were all accounted for. The hotel register gave me your room number. I came here, I found Pagan, and waited until you came back. I knew I should have killed him earlier and got him out of here. No, Clark, that wouldn't have helped. The hotel register gave you away anyhow. When you talked to me at the Club Malahini, you said you've been here two weeks. But the register shows you've lived at this hotel for over three months. Well, uh, uh, what do you think they'll do to him, Mr. X? Hmm? Oh, plenty, Pagan. He's a five-time killer. For the other thing he did, I don't know. He stole from men the most precious thing in their lives. Their dreams. The dream of some far-off island where they'd go one day and be happy. And perhaps it may be punishment enough when he finds that even prison can't stop a man from dreaming. But it'll make his dream a nightmare. Bridget Air Star, Herbert Marshall, will return in just a moment. And now, Frigid Air star, Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And next week, I promise you another story filled with suspense and mystery. As usual, there'll be Leon Velasco along as Pagon Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. Frigid Air's Man Called X is directed by Jack Johnstone with music composed and conducted by Johnny Green. Tonight's story was written by Les Crutchfield. And so, until next week, same time, same station, this is Ken Nile speaking for Frigidaire, made only by General Motors. All characters and incidents used are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual persons or incidents is purely coincidental. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Intrigue, mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. In Shannon's place do many dwell. 
the pretty, the ugly, the high tone swell. They come to Havana to have some jolly sit around in the evening to discuss their follies. Right now this small hotel is graced by charming lady with handsome face and husband who get younger by the hour, thinking how his wife is pretty like a flower. <laughs> oh, is that lovely, Robert? Yes, Martha. Oh, you sing beautifully, King Moses. It's, um, I don't know, joyful, haunting. Thank you, Mrs. Palmer. <laughs> you must be tired, Mrs. Palmer. All the sightseeing you've done today, you and your husband. Oh, Robert and I couldn't go to sleep now. We'll just go over there and sit in those handsome wicker chairs, discuss our follies, and watch. Watch the lights of Havana, the color. That's what we'll do, won't we, Robert? Just watch. Whatever you wish, Martha. Oh, I love you, Robert. Take my arm. You didn't mind those things I bought. Anything you do, Martha, it's all right. I hope you were paying attention, Slate. Lesson one in how a gent treats a lady. Yeah, look me up when you get to be like Mrs. Palmer. That could take years. That's what I said. You know something about those two? What? I'll bet when they check out, we won't find one towel missing. Yeah, not even the one I put in their rooms. The one you swiped from the Hotel Muncie. Well, don't look at me like that, Slate. I just did it to make them feel at home. My favorite towel, and you... Uh, Senor, Senor, you may not be aware of it, but a large thrill has just entered into your lives. <laughs> not tonight, Chico. We've got everything we need. Oh, you desolate me. Don't take it too hard, Chico. Here's a buck. Ah, senorita. The minute I put my eyes on you, I say to myself in my mother's tongue, here is a queen. See how the news gets around, Slate? Please. I cannot take dollar and give nothing in return. They built me this way when I was a baby. Here, have a picture postcard. And wear it in good health. Adios, you thrill me people. (laughs) <laughs> a buck for a tourist postcard, a color picture of a flossy tourist hotel. Oh, you've been taken, sailor. Good. It was my buck. I can... Hey, look at this slate. It's already been written on. It's addressed to you. Huh? You mean you can't even send it to the folks back home? It says, I need you, slate. Right now. Drop everything. Right now. Signed, Sam Meston. Sam Meston? What does he want with me? You won't go, will you, Slate? Not to help anyone like Meston. He said he needed me, didn't he? You coming, sailor? Sure. I love to help people like Sam Meston. They're so grateful they kick you in the teeth. Good night, Mr. and Mrs. Palmer. We have to go out. Slate's trying for a merit badge. You coming? You see, Robert, I told you it would work. It was so simple, really. You're very clever, Martha. Here's your coat, Robert. You'll need it in the chill night air. Hurry, Robert. We'll lose them if you don't hurry. Be careful, dear. There's a puddle of water. I see it. Well, walk around it. There. Think of it. Mr. Shannon will lead us straight to Sam Meston. Martha. One more killing, Robert, that's all. Then there'll be nothing else to worry about. Yeah, I suppose so. Don't hate yourself, dear. I couldn't stand it. Martha, please. After all, your first wife, Alice, was an old, tired woman. And wealthy. That has nothing to do with it. Oh, Mr. Shannon, Mr. Val, just turn that corner. We'd better hurry. Help me up the curb, dear. Martha. Martha, I, I have an idea. Oh? Tell me, Robert. Why can't we go back to Muncie before we do this thing, this killing? Forget all about it. And keep paying Mr. Meston all that money. He's so greedy, dear. Mr. Meston must be... Yes, yes, I I suppose so. It's the only way, Robert. And Mr. Shannon will lead him to us. Mr. Shannon knows everybody in Havana. That's why I had that funny little Cuban man deliver this note to him. I think we ought to go back to Muncie. Now, you listen to me, Robert. We killed your wife. Mr. Meston was hired by the insurance company to investigate her death. He found the gun I used, and he's held on to it. Blackmail. It has to stop. Yes, yes, whatever you say, Martha. Of course. And, Robert? Yes? Isn't Havana a beautiful city? Say, 
and your sweet amigo and senor the sailor. Welcome, welcome. Alfredo Gomez bid you welcome to the Hotel Metropole Ritz. Alfredo Gomez says it places yours unequivocally, irrevocably, and without doubt. Hi. <laughs> the last time he gave you the place, sailor, he took it right away from me and threw me out. <laughs> That's the story of your life, isn't it? I do not wish to interrupt, but por favor, why have I given you the hotel? Is Sam Meston still registered here? Sam who? Sam Meston. Who, Meston? S-A-M, Sam. M-E-S-T-O-N, Meston. Let's see you get out of that. What are you both saying? Sam Meston. I want to see him. I want to know if he's registered here. Sam Meston. Sailor just spelled it for you. A joke? I'm supposed to say, ha ha. Ha ha. Alfredo, what's the matter with you? You know Sam as well as you know me and Sailor. Please. The moment in time has come when I must take back my hotel. I am busy. They're having a convention here. The daughters of the Hacienda Rifle and Pistol Club. Pardon me for the rest of the week. Okay, Alfredo, if that's the way you want it. Come on, Sailor. I don't understand what's going on here, Slate. Something scaring, Alfredo. Sam Meston, this is Alfredo. They were looking for you, Sam. You better go far, far away. Mind if I coin a phrase, Slate? Go ahead. Stun me with it. All right. Phrase. My feet are killing me. Why don't you go back to Shannon's place and wait for me? Uh uh I'm going to be brave. Just tell me how many more places are we going to have to look for Sam Meston? Consider it, sailor. Here's a man who's known all over Havana. And all of a sudden, people never heard of him or they don't know who he is. Funny, isn't it? I'm tingling from the strangeness of it all. Slate, when we get back, will you rub my feet? I'm going in here. Pool room? It hits you like that, huh? The middle of the night and you get a big yen to play nickel nine ball. The guy who runs the place is named Garson. He knows Meston. Whatever you say, Slade. Place is practically empty. That's Garson playing on the last table. You wait here. And do what? Your snooker's a little weak. Go practice. Garson. Huh? Oh, hello, Shannon. Didn't hear you come in. You seen Sam Meston? How would you play this shot? Ah. Uh. Here, here, and here. Uh-huh. <laughs> you like it? Ole. Gee, wow. Hey, you like it? Watch this one. You're crowding, sleep. Sam Meston. This is a toughie. Beautiful, huh? What's everybody so cagey for, Garson? You want to shoot pool? Grab yourself a table. Sixty cents an hour. Hey, look, Garson. You can't push the management around, Slate. Get out of here. Where's Meston? What happened to him? Okay, you're asking for help to get out, huh? Yeah, just a... You're asking for... And you'll tell me. <laughs> tell me, Garson, and I'll make you fit into the rack. <laughs> tell me. Uh, uh, Paseo Lima, number 14, ground floor. Huh. <laughs> Now, there's one to try a man's metal. You like that shot, Garson? I have told you to. Sam is not here. I have not seen him since he went to the Estados Unidos many days ago. Look, Lola... Maybe I didn't make it clear. Sam bought a guy to give me a postcard. It said he needed me. That's why I'm here, to help him. My husband, he needs no one. Maybe he doesn't at that slate. Look at the way Lola's dressed. From Paris, isn't it, Lola? Sailor's right, Lola. Sam must be doing good. Your clothes, that necklace, the new furniture. You notice it, Sailor? I've been rubbing my hands on it. Hmm, dusty. Now, if I had furniture like this, I'd Get really... out of here. I do not know what strange joke you are trying to play. But you have undoubtedly had your amusement. Now get out. Go home. 
Now, why didn't we think of that, Slate? Home. Place to sleep. A place to wash out my nylons. Let's go, Slate. First, I want to leave my calling card. A guy asked for help. A guy I could live without. I grub all over Havana for him. People make jokes at me, try to slug me. And why don't you take the lady's advice, Shannon, and go home? Huh? Sam Meston. Greetings, Sam. The whole world's been telling me you were out. You should listen to what people tell you, Shannon. You learn things that way and you don't get hurt. I'll remember. Just for the record, why'd you send me that postcard? You never got a postcard because I didn't send one. It'll have to be better than that, Shannon, if you want to cut in. Sam, please. Maybe just What else not... could it be, Lola? You want a piece of what I got? They're here to put a finger on me and say, give us a piece. You'll never get it, Shannon. You can die at my feet and you'll never get it. Whatever it is, who wants it? Hey, what is this, a rest stop? It is the back door, Sam. I will Entertain our guest, Lola. I'll get it myself. What do you want? Hey. Sam. Sam, who was it? You you wanted it, Shannon. Take it. The gun in the drawer. Take it. You get rich on it. Maybe you die on it. Like me. Venture, our stars Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and the second act of our story. Mr. Shannon, he looked all over town, up and down street, then turned around. This fella he looked for, his name is Sam. Now, fella, he is Mr. Very Dead Sam. Slate. Yeah? You're sorry he's dead, aren't you? I never did anything to me. What are you going to do about it? I phoned LaSalle. He's going to meet me at police headquarters about noon. I'm going to turn over the gun and... A lady come in, she walked real slow. She wear black lace for a new widow. She has the look of... Yeah, I see her, King. Be careful, Slate. She lied to you once. Good morning, Senora. I want you to know how sorry we are. Send flowers. We're going to do that too, Senora. But right now, Slate's being a gentleman. Allow him the luxury. Bueno, console yourself that you have killed my husband. What are you talking about? The killers follow you all over Havana. You find Sam, the killers find Sam. I said I was sorry. Anything I can do... There is what to do. You took a gun from Sam. The gun he told you was in the drawer. Give it to me. I don't like the way she asks. Now look, Senora. Sam told me to take it. He must have had a reason for it. I'm going to find out what it is. Give it to me. Give me the gun. Now, I don't like the way you ask. Keep it, then. Be a fool and hug it to you. Sam said it, and I will say it. That gun will kill you. Robert, are you asleep? No, Martha. You were restless all night. Once I thought you were sobbing. But you were only talking in your sleep, wasn't that it? We're done, aren't we, Martha? Done with killing? We can go home now? No, Robert, we can't. Well, you killed him, killed Meston. That ends it, doesn't it? But they have the gun, Robert. Mr. Shannon and Mr. Val. I was downstairs and I heard them talking about it. We'll have to get it somehow. Well, how will you do that? Oh, I have it all planned, here in my head. You're not to give it a moment's thought. And no more killing. Swear it. Don't ask me that, because I can't. I'll tell you later what we must do. Kiss me, Robert. And do try to get some sleep. So 
11 o'clock, Slate. Don't you have to go to police headquarters and see LaSalle? I told you noon. You trying to get rid of me? I've got a reason. You don't want me to watch you bathe your feet in Epsom salts, huh? In bicarbonate. We're out of Epsom. Well, how come? You're supposed to take care of kitchen supplies. We're out of ketchup, too. Come in. Oh, if I'm disturbing you, just tell me to go. Not at all, Mrs. Palmer. I'm going to see the size of Havana. Well, have fun and don't... Don't take any wooden nickels? I know. We've got that one in Muncie, too. The young men use it. Oh, we've got handsome young men in Muncie. Or eventually there would be no Muncie. Oh. Is there something we can do for you, Mrs. Palmer? Yes. Yes, there is. And Mr. Val, would you go with me? Me? Well, there's so many places I've missed. You know Havana so well. You could show them to me. Mr. Val would be delighted. Slate my feet. Uh, you two girls just run along. Have a wonderful time. And, Sailor. What do you want? Don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs> One more stop, dear. I promised these people I'd bring you by to meet them. See? Wasn't far, was it? Hey, this is Sam Meston's place. This is where he was... Exactly, my dear. Please knock on the door. I don't get it. What's the idea? Knock on the door, Miss Duval. Because you see, I can't. Not with my purse in one hand and this gun in the other. My grandma, what big eyes you have. Knock. Anything for the tourists. It's a motto with me. Come in, Miss Duvall. Mr. Palmer. You better take care of your wife, Mr. Palmer. Havana's too much for her. Look, the sweet thing's pulled a gat on me. The other one. Is she here, Robert? In the next room. I tied her up, gagged her. We'll go to her. Yes, Martha. You can put that thing away now, Mrs. Palmer. It helped a lot. My feet don't hit a bit anymore. I like you, Miss Duvall. You have many qualities. Now we're chums again, huh? Pals, friends, buddies. Here she is, Martha. Lola. That's your name, isn't it? Lola, you understand what is about to happen to you, don't you? Pray, my dear. I give you that. See if she's dead, Robert. Yes, Martha. She's dead. Now, you too will understand me, Mr. Bell. Sam Meston willed you and Mr. Shannon a gun. I want it. So Robert and I can live happily. You've got a gun. How many do you need to be happy? How many people dead? You will call Mr. Shannon on the phone. Tell him to bring the gun, nothing else. Tell him, if he doesn't, I'll kill you. <laughs> I don't understand, Senor Shannon. Why do you want me to return to you this gun you took from Sam Meston? What good is the gun to you? I'll tell you what good it is. Word gets around fast in Havana. And the current word is that I've got the gun. Someone's going to try to take it away from me. And you want to be the cuckoo? The pigeon. Hmm, it is a matter of opinion. Another thing. You told me you had a file on Sam Meston? See. Si. Senor Meston, ever since he has been in Havana, had no means of support that were visible to the naked eye, which made us lift an eyebrow. Last year, we investigated him. What did you find out? He was a private investigator for the Acme Insurance Company of your country. His last known assignment was for a murder case in a town with an impossible name like uh, Doncy, Indiana. Muncie, Indiana. Muncie, Doncy. It is still impossible. But a murder case. The state of Indiana versus Robert Palmer. Robert Palmer. Please, you are taking the words out of my mouth. Hmm. What about Mrs. Palmer? Mrs. Palmer was murdered. Well, what do you know? Por favor. Now, what about the gun, LaSalle? You going to give it to me? Lend it to you. If you please, sign here. And leave a deposit. No, senor, not money. Your word. <laughs> Sailor come back yet? No, not yet, Mr. Slate. 
Perhaps she stopped in place with the nice lady. Yeah, maybe we were wrong about the nice lady, King. Maybe I better go and find Sailor and take her away from the nice lady. Why? I don't think my girl ought to run around with murderers. She might get killed. Shannon's place, Slate Shannon's... Well, once don't talk back, Slate. That gun. Bring it to Sam Meston's. And no cops. Just you with a gun. Sailor. If you expect to find me alive, that is. That's what Mrs. Palmer says. And you know Mrs. Palmer. She's... Mr. Shannon? Yes, Mr. Shannon. Open the door. I have a gun at Mr. Val's head, Mr. Shannon. So you'd better come in with your hands up. Are your hands up? They're up. Good. Open the door, Robert. Have they hurt you, sailor? She killed Mrs. Meston, right in front of me. That hurt. My dear, there was no other way. Was there, Robert? Let's do what we have to do, Martha. Take the gun away from him. You have the gun with you, Mr. Shannon? It's in my pocket. Robert, get it. I've got it. Is it loaded? It's empty, Martha. That's the gun you killed your first wife with, isn't it, Mr. Palmer? I didn't kill her. The dear little lady must have knocked her off, Slate. This gun is the thing that kept Sam Meston in the chips. He found the evidence that would hang you, and he kept it. Tell me something, Mr. Palmer. Do you love the present Mrs. Palmer? Martha, we have what we need. Let's go. Miss Duval asked you a question, Robert. Miss Duval asked you the question because we'd both like to know. How does it feel to love a woman who kills so easily? Don't be embarrassed, Robert. You can tell me. Robert's proud of his love for me. You just stand there and agree with everybody, Robert. But I'll tell you something. I admire you. I couldn't love a woman like Mrs. Palmer. Why not? A sweet lady like her. We all have our faults. Hers just happens to be killing people. <laughs> yeah, that's why. I'd be afraid of her. I'd be afraid she'd kill me. Shut up. I'll... I'll... Kill them, Martha? See how easy it is for her, Robert? Martha, would you kill me? Oh, what's the matter with you? Now, now's a good chance to kill me, Martha. Kill me and blame it on these people here. Go ahead. Kill me. You can do it. Just pull the trigger. Robert. Robert, stay away from me. Robert. Robert, don't you see what they've done? Don't walk toward me. Stay away. Get her. Get her. You fool. Out of my way. Drop that gun. Drop it. I'll kill you. Kill you. I take it all back, Robert. You're a brave man. Uh, I'm a murderer. As evil as she is. But it's over now. Yeah, it's over. Sailor. Uh Uh-huh. You're clever with a dial phone. Dial 111, the police. Tell them to get here. Sailor? Oh, there's nothing like a foot bath. If anyone asks me to take another step... I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's why I'm not going to ask you to do it. Do what? There's a dance tonight at the Plaza Royale. I've got two passes. Well, I guess I'll have to stagger. Hey, wait. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll probably meet somebody. Slate, you're not going without me. I can dance. Look. One, two, three, kick. One, two, three, kick. One, two. <laughs> You'll be a sensation. Let's go dancing, sailor. And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in... 
Bold Venture. International Incident Number Four. Jack Packard and Reggie York report to London at once for assignment in French Indochina. Signed the 21 old men of 10 Gramercy Park. Adventure. The American Broadcasting Company presents a new Carlton E. Morse production featuring the international escapades of Jack, Doc, and Reggie. Tonight's incident brings you The Pearl of Great Price. Good morning, Major Packard. And you too, Sergeant York, sir. Good, Good morning. morning. Glad to have you two gentlemen back at 10 Gramercy Park with us again. Oh, thanks. Right into the great reception hall, if you will, please. Come on, Reggie. Right up. Right in, please. Quite. Well, I say, Jack. The door closed with no sound at all. Sound's been deadened in this great room. But it made such a frightful noise on the outside. I say, Jack, do you have the feeling of having been to church when you come into this room? Oh, why not? The cathedral-like windows, tapestries depicting the history of the world hanging from the vaulted ceiling three stories up, furniture and paintings and carpets that were used by emperors and queens and a princely horde from the beginning of organized government. Jove, is that what all this represents? And more. No wonder I feel reverent. I'm communing with the ghosts of the great names of history. And it's against this background that 21 old men are working. Look here. Except that we've done a couple of nasty jobs for them, do we know anything about them? We don't know who they are individually. What they stand for, yes. Do we indeed? They're a group of international figures, each one representing his native country, gathered together with wealth and power and the good of the world at heart. Mm. Come to London at once for assignment in French Indochina. Who wants to go to Indochina? I do. So do you, if it's interesting enough. I'd still like to know just what these 21 old graybeards are up to. Well, it's pretty simple. The world's in chaos today. Governments are weak and suspicious. Everyone feels as though he, he's sitting on dynamite. 21 old men use us and others like us as their undercover instruments to work behind the scenes and clean up festering spots with no one the wiser. A very excellent explanation, Major Packard. Uh-oh. There goes the tapestry back. Twenty-one old men are in session. Did you speak, Sergeant York? Not at all, sir. It's just the fact that you can see us from behind that ruddy glass while we seem to be talking to the empty air. Believe me, Sergeant, you are not talking to the empty air. I'm sure of that, sir. Before I give you into the hands of Monsieur Reynaud, our French representative, for your next assignment, the twenty-one old men have asked me to state that you, Sergeant York were overheard referring to us as 21 old greybeards. Oh, I say. Quite all right, Sergeant. Quite all right. It is simply that the majority of our members are entirely smooth-shaven, and they feel out of character being referred to as greybeards. I shall refrain in the future. And now then, Monsieur Reynaud... Hey, uh, one more question, please. Well? What about our third partner, Doc Long? Uh, are you looking for him? We are making inquiries. The matter has our attention. And now, Monsieur Renault. Major Packard, Sergeant York, your next assignment will take you to the northernmost border of French Indochina, where it joins Burma. It is jungle country. It is dangerous country at this moment because there is deep unrest among the natives of both countries. Therefore, 
you will travel from the last civilized outpost to the lost city of Shiva upon the backs of elephants. So, not elephants. Quiet, Reggie. Upon the backs of elephants with Hindu and Sikh outriders upon Tibetan ponies and camels. A circus, no less. What's our jumping off place? That you do not need to know. One of our planes will fly you to Saigon, and another will take you to the last outpost. There you will contact the camel and elephant train. I say, what for? What's the assignment? That you will be told at the last outpost of civilization. Do not waste time on questions. There is a cab driver waiting who will take you to the airport directly. Well, thanks for the ride. Oh, voila. Oh, voila. Jack, look here. This is no airport. Just the same this flying junk heap has landed. Come on, get out. Yeah. Uh, huh. Nothing but a blooming cow pasture. And all the cows look like buffalo. Uh, not buffalo, caribou. Last outpost of civilization's right. No town, no hotel, and night coming on. Uh, hey! Where's he going? I don't know. He's delivered us here. Now I guess he's going home. Well, but look here, Jack. We're just being dumped out here in the middle of nowhere. Getting dark and no friends, no contact. Oh? But... Are you so sure? Hello. Where's it? Where did you pop from? I've got some Tibetan ponies hitched to a buckboard, or what's left of a buckboard, over there behind those banyan trees. Mm. There goes our plane. Yes, I kept out of sight until he taxied off. Nobody told us we were going to meet a girl, especially not an English girl. What are you doing out here on the fringe of nowhere? My husband was an OSS officer out here during the war. He liked it here. He brought me back afterwards. Oh, that explains you being here. And your husband? Dead. Oh, oh. Don't bother. He couldn't resist the charms of the native women. And I found him on the doorstep one morning with a criss straight through him. I guess that taught him. Oh, look here. I should think you'd return to England. Has that got anything to do with your assignment out here? No. No. Is your curiosity satisfied? Yeah. Yes. Well, then, let's get into what's left of my buckboard after these four-legged Tibetan devils get through kicking the blazes out of it and head into town. All right, you shaggy little imps of Satan. Take us to the hotel. <laughs> Jolly good dinner. You know, I'm a great curry eater myself. Yeah, so I noticed. <laughs> I brought you out here in the garden behind the hotel where we can talk in the darkness without being overheard. Uh, it's about time we got down to something definite. You say you've had direct word from the 21 old man? Yes. Listen. That music's coming from the Temple of Agog behind the garden. That's a real Chinese flute. Mm, it has the flavor of this jungle setting. Yeah, what are those chimes? Chinese bells, cymbals. I don't know all the names for their instruments. Well, never mind that. What I want to know is, what are Reggie and I doing in the back country of Indochina? What's up? Your ten days' journey by camel or elephant from the Burma border. Yeah? Some place near the border is the lost city of Shiva. Well, I thought this was the last outpost. The lost city is dead. Dead? Banyan trees and jungle vines have swallowed it up. Except for a few priests of the old religion... Worshippers of Shiva, it is uninhabited. I've heard of these old cities of a lost civilization. Why are we going there? Keep your voices guarded. There is a pearl of great price hidden there. Pearl? Those are the words I was told to give you. Recently, the sacred temple in Lai King on the Burmese border was raped and pillaged. The marauders and their precious loot are said even now to be under the protection of the priests of the lost city. Uh, what's all this stilted English you're using? I'm repeating a message word for word which I was told to give you. Marauders from Indochina crossed the border and pillaged a Burmese temple. Yes. And brought their loot back across the border into Indochina. And are now under the protection of the high priests of the lost city of Shiva. And we're to round up the marauders and loot? The pearl of great price. What? That is all that is required of you. Return the pearl of great price. You mean look for a single precious stone in a sweltering jungle hundreds of miles... Here. 
Aren't we getting an awful long way from the hotel? The further from listening ears, the better. So, jungle creeps right up to the very threshold of civilization, doesn't it? It's a fight. Man against nature. It never ends in the tropics. Those creeping vines gleam like serpents in the moonlight. Yeah, let's turn back. I don't like that. Hey, where do you look at that? Men creeping out of the jungle. Run, run! No, we can't. They're behind us. Hello! The jungle raiders! The jungle raiders! Tear into them, Reggie! Why don't they? Zinda Bagello! Reggie! Reggie! Enough! Enough! Well, get again. We want them alive. Tell this slimy native to take his hands off me. Or it's Gosordo. I should think so. I deliver these men into your hands and you treat me like a piece of merchandise. It was a mistake in the confusion. You have delivered them according to plan. The main sahib does her job well. Coming around, Reggie. Oh, I say, this, this awful motion. A bit of an earthquake, huh? We're in a howder aboard an elephant. Oh, no. You're only spoofing, Jack. How do you feel? Rotten. Head splitting, stomach churning, tongue swollen. Hey, guard! Water! Give him water! Huh? One eat. Yes, sir. Bound, head and foot. Yeah. Same here. Same here. All right, remember? Barney. Oh, sure, yes. Hold that water bag to my mouth. Yes. Water. Yeah, beautiful stuff. Right, hey. Right, hey. Yeah, thanks, old boy. Oh, now I remember, Jack. We were set on by these jungle jackals and beaten into insensibility. Yeah, back in the hotel garden. They swarmed over us like locusts. Huh. What are we now? Listen. What's say? Monkeys. Birds. Yeah. We're plunging through trackless jungle. Captives on an elephant. Well, what's it all about? Hey, 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 hey. Well, I say, Jack, couldn't they roll up the canvas sides of this hotter? It's hotter than blazes. I got one or two glimpses out. There's nothing to see but jungle. Oh, the heat. The heat's worse in the open. Listen. Did I hear someone, something following us? Even a belly musician. Where am I hearing things? Whole caravan. Elephants leading off to break trail. Camels and Tibetan ponies to the rear. You mean we've been grabbed off by some roving jungle tribe? Well, what do they expect to get out of us? I don't know. Doesn't make sense. What's become of the girl? Flora? Two. They could have her on another elephant, I suppose, but looks to me like something else. Oh, all this swaying and rocking's doing things to my insides. Yeah, it'll get worse before it gets better. Keep your mind on what I'm saying. Yeah, you said... Uh, what, what did you say? I say I think Flora framed us with this bunch of bandits. But she had word from the 21 old men to help us. Or did she? Mighty funny she had to take us to the back end of that hotel garden to talk to us. And how did these boys happen to be back there waiting for us? Well, but she had to be what she said, Jack. Why? Because she's the only one who knew why we're here. She didn't even... We didn't even know ourselves until she told us. Hey, that's right. The pearl of great price. If she's an enemy, that may be a lot of hokum. How about that? Kidnapped on elephants without the faintest idea what our assignment is. Oh, boy, this heat's brutal. If we don't get someplace pretty soon, you've lost yourself a good right-hand man. Ah, good evening. It is getting cooler. Oh, such politeness. Who are you? I am the one who kidnapped you to this place. Uh, I'm not surprised you got the face for it. You do not like my face? Hey, what is this place? Where are we? What became of the elephant caravan? This is the lost city of Shiva. Sure. The lost city of... 
Hey, look, what is this? You kidnap us. You drag us out here trussed up like chickens. Then you turn us loose, give us this adobe cottage on the edge of the jungle with servants and fresh clothes and treat us like guests. What's it all about? You are dissatisfied? Did we not bring your luggage from the hotel? Did we not return your weapons? Well, you did that. But why the about face? One minute we're captives. Next, nothing's too good for us. Listen. Yeah. Okay. Drums. Ceremonial drums from the temple. The old ones are performing the rites of purification with the dancing girls. Dancing girls? Those you will not see. They are the maidens of the temple. Look, I don't care about dancing girls or maidens. Oh, look here, Jack. Let's not go too far. Stop beating around the bush. What's up? You do not know? I do not know. You don't know why you brought us here? It was a commission given to me. Kidnap the two white men from the hotel garden. Deliver them by elephant train to the lost city of Shiva. Give them the Mahatma's quarters with the Mahatma servants to wait on them. And after that... Yeah, after that, what? Do their bidding. Oh, Joe, really? How about that? Bring us here and then do our bidding. Yes. The elephant and camels are tied up in the jungle to the west of the city. We await your orders. Hey, what about that white woman back at the hotel? What about Flora? She was but a small cog in the great wheel which has begun to turn. Uh huh. You know anything about a band of cutthroats around here? Cutthroats? Jungle bandits. Just got back from sacking a sacred temple over in Burma. I would not know. Ever hear of the Pearl of Great Price? Well, did you? I'm not a dealer in precious stones. Look here, old boy. Your tongue says one thing, your eyes say something else. You call me a liar? Hey, hey, put that pig sticker back in your robe. Take it easy. That's better. Oh, but Jack, the old boy's eyes... Now let it alone, will you, Reggie? Say, how about the temple? Can we get in? It is forbidden. What's to prevent us? It rambles all over the landscape. Half the walls have caved in. It is forbidden. Say, so which side of the fence are you on? The dog of an infidel who defiles a temple with his presence shall have his throat cut before the morning. Take him, Reggie. Right oh. That's good boy. Tie him up. Well, will we ever get out of this jungle now? I don't know, but at least he's not going to keep us out of the temple. Hold it, Reggie. What now? I heard an echoing footstep. Let me get a look around this next corner. Well? Easy. Someone's coming. Get a look at him? Yeah, dressed in a priest's robe, but there's a dagger in his belt and a pistol in his hand. A man of peace, no doubt. Listen. When he comes around the corner, jump him. He's my man. Ah, good. Quick. Drag him in here under this stairway. Coming. <sighs> Poking around these dank, cobwebby places makes me think of tarantulas and puff adders. There, that's good. Hello. Ring of keys. Hey, now we can go back and find out what's behind that locked door we had to bypass. I see, Jack, we're not getting anywhere. Well, we've had three hours in here without getting caught. And if all the priests we put to sleep were laid end to end, the chair. Come on, come on. Let's see where that big door leads to. If there's a pearl of great price in this decrepit old temple, we've got about as much chance of take finding it. Easy, it. Take it easy, take it easy. We may have to search for days. And I suppose the priesthood will hold still for that. Here, this is the door. Uh-huh. Fifty keys. Which one fits? How about this? No. Oh. Then this ought to do just about it. Aha! Uh-huh. Well, I'll be blessed. Jack, not so much noise. Yeah, sounds like a jailhouse break. Hmm. Too late now. Where do we seem to have got? True. Blasted tunnel. Reed torches burning along the wall. Dirt underfoot. Here, give me a flashlight. Here, well. Thanks. Here, look. Footprints of horses in the dirt. Mighty small horses. Tibetan ponies, the little ones. Either that or the small, shaggy burrow. Recently used, too. I think we found something. No doubt of it, but what? I don't know. Maybe the hideout of the raiders. Raiders? The gang that robbed the Burmese temple. Jove. The chappies with the pearl. Could be. Belly reed torches are all right for atmosphere, but they smoke like chimneys. Electricity much more practical. Less light, the better for us. Hello, Jack. Do I hear something? Listen. Sounds like Santa Claus. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? 
Listen. Coming from around the corner, down the passage. I'm getting closer, too. Here they come. Well, I say, Tibetan ponies with sleigh bells. Pack horses. Ten ponies. Every one of them packed to the running board. So, Jack, could that be the loop from the temple? I don't know. Doesn't seem to be guarded. Just one native priest guiding the lead pony by the halter. Well, look. Look on the fourth, fifth, sixth, sixth pony. Isn't that the girl? A girl. Bound hand and foot and strapped to the pack saddle. Well, is that our idea of chivalry? What's fair about that? Here they come alongside. You clip the priest, I'll grab the pony's halter, and we'll just keep going. Uh, get him! That's a good boy. Come on. We've got the spoils from the temple. We've got the whole thing right in this pony caravan. <laughs> I say, where are you taking us? I'm taking us out to the west of the lost city to the elephant and camel caravan. Oh, this place is killing me. We'll soon be there. I got it figured out. What? The reason this pony train had only one priest in the tunnel to guard it was because the bandits themselves weren't allowed in the temple. Oh, say, good deduction. We weren't supposed to be in there either. Well, we caught them by surprise. The priest was delivering the caravan back to the bandits. What, native priests and bandits working together? Well, who knows which is which in this country. Well, where were they going with it? It's been hidden here since the Burmese temple was sacked. Our arrival probably made them nervous. They were going to move the booty to some safer place. <laughs> we grab it off first. And that's the reason for getting to the elephant caravan fast. The bandits find out that we grabbed off their loot. This jungle's not going to be fit for man or beast. Yeah, but I knocked out the leader of our elephant trains. You don't think that chap's going to be on our side now, do you? We'll give him a choice. He can still be on our side or get a hole in his head. Hey, now look, Shandu, or whatever your name is, you got nasty with us and we had to take care of you while we worked. We apologize. We'll do whatever we can to make up for the insult of knocking you out, but... You got to get your elephant caravan gone and get us out of here. See? I have been insulted. My ancestors have been insulted. My progeny have been insulted. Look, old chap, here's a hundred dollars American. Doesn't that wipe out all the insults? There is other things in the world besides money. Look, can't you get it through your head? We've captured the whole pack train of loot from the Burmese Oy, bandits. Oy, Ram Ray, Ram Ray. Yeah, you better say Ram Ray. Once they discover what we've done, they'll be on us like wild animals. They'll butcher your whole caravan. I think you lie. Reggie, go get the girl. Be back with her in a shake. Girl. They had a Chinese or Burmese girl tied to one of the ponies. Chinese or Burmese? You cannot tell the difference? Ordinarily, yes. This time the girl seems to speak Chinese, but her looks are... You have captured her? You have in your possession uh, that all one... Right, honey. You're in safe hands. The one... Mandar ki devi ko namaskar ho, namaskar ho. Then they come, young dong oi. Where are you going to go? They have saved you. I'll go to the safari. I'll go to the safari. Safari, go! Go! Safari, go! 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 Well, we certainly stirred things up. Are we getting underway? The caravan starts in five minutes. All right, Reggie. Cut those ropes off his wrist. Right, huh? All right, hold out your hand. There. Mm. What happened? What sold you on becoming our friend again? You do not know this priceless one. This princess, Ye Devi. You mean this girl's someone of importance? The pearl of great price. I say. Well, how about that? We're looking for a piece of jewelry and come up with a Burmese princess. <laughs> come, the elephant train is ready. <laughs> Sir, step forward. The elephant will lift you with his trunk to the howdah. Step right up, Reggie. Oh, I say. Braced by an elephant. Hey, look here now, tell the brute to be careful. Oh, look, Jack. Run the elevator. It will be dark presently. The marauders don't like the dark. No one likes the dark in these jungles if he's wise. What about us? Ah, oh, we have elephants. All jungle beasts are afraid of elephants. Okay, quite hot. Major Packard, the elephant is ready. The Burmese princess first. Devi ji, aap hathi pe chadenge. 
。好，我同佢哋走。David， 过嚟咯。啊，哦，得啦。Hey Reggie， give the little lady a hand when she arrives up there。Right here， here she comes。唔使帮我，你咁邋遢。I say Jack， he doesn't need any help。We've got a jungle cat on our hands。If you please, Major Packer， the elephant will lift you now。I'm coming right up。Oh， 得啦。Here I come. <laughs> How's that for elevator service, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Welcome home. We've got the sides of the howdah rolled up, and with the sun down behind the jungle, it's not half bad. Why doesn't old Shandu get the caravan on the way? Hey, let's get started. Adiwala, go! Adiwala, 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 adiwala. Well, we're moving off. You ever see so much confusion? <laughs> But we're on our way. Living monkeys and jungle birds don't help him. Yo, Dick, you're my dumb phone. Now I say, my dear, you may be the pearl of great price, but you'll have to talk plainer than that if you want my companionship. Hey, listen. Chandu, hey Chandu, what's that fight? It is the enemy trying to break through. The enemy? It is the enemy trying to break through our rear guards. But they will not succeed. Our horsemen will hold them off for another half hour. When it will be darkness. After that, we have nothing to fear. That's great. If that's the case. We should be out of this jungle and back in the outpost of civilization in just ten days. It is an enchanting evening, is it not, Major Packard? You were going to call me Jack, remember? <laughs> But it will be a pleasure. Hey, Flora, tell me something. Does that Shiva temple over there go on with that Chinese flute like that forever? You don't like it. It's not bad, but out in the garden under an Hindu China moon with jasmine in my nostrils and a beautiful English girl on my arm. Yes. Well, you'll have to admit the Chinese flute isn't a Viennese waltz or mood music for an affair of the heart. On the other hand, good. I just wanted to be sure. Oh, Jack. Oh. Oh. Well, well, well. Where have you been all my life? And to think, ten days ago, I thought you betrayed us into the hands of the enemy in this very garden. Forget business. We have something more important for this evening. Hmm. Poor Reggie. Oh. Mm hmm. He's inside the hotel guarding the Burmese princess till her government sends officials to return her to the temple. He's fond of Burmese girls. Not in the least. He's in there fuming because you and I are out here. <laughs> Poor boy. We must find some nice girl to help him enjoy his stay also. Ah yes. Say pocket. Who said that? So dark here. There by the banyan tree. What are you doing in this garden? So sorry, Mr. Sahib. It is important I deliver this message to Sahib Pocket. Message? This message, if you please. You've delivered your message. Now leave. I follow Mem Sahib's orders. Here, hold this flashlight while I read this. Who'd be sending you messages out here? Listen to this. You are requested to return to London immediately for special assignment in connection with a hundred million dollar diamond robbery. Signed, the twenty-one old men of Ten Gramercy Park. Adventure. That's all you care about. You care nothing for a pretty woman. All you want is adventure. Lady, I still have twenty-four hours to make you eat those words. You have just heard "I Love Adventure," a new Carlton E. Morse production featuring Michael Rapetto as Jack Packard and Tom Collins as Reggie York. Next week, international incident number five: the one hundred million dollar manhunt, an affair of girls and nations resulting in a high adventure halfway around the world. Other players included Al Malaton, Lal Chan Mera, Donald Morrison, Everett Glass, Barbara Jean Wong, and Harry Lang. Sound effects were created by Fred Cole, Robert Conlon, and Ed Lutus. The Pearl of Great Price was written and produced by Carlton E. Morse. Organ music and effects by Rex Corey. Your announcer, Dresser Dahlstedt.
adventure came to you from Hollywood. La ti 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 ti, la tu tu ti ta tu. Can you identify that beautiful voice? It belongs to me, Bert Parch, your MC on ABC Stop the Music program. I might call you this Sunday evening to identify a tune, and if you have trouble naming it, I'll even sing it for you. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Bold Venture. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. I offer information to all who heed. If a recuperation is your very first need, invest several dollars for peace and rest. Come to Shannon's place and be our guest. We've a reasonable hotel right on the bay. Feature seafood marinated and filet. If keeping stomach happy you should chance to tire, just step to the beach with a boat for hire. <laughs> hey, that's a neat pitch for a hotel if I ever heard one, Shannon. Where'd you find King Moses? In a gin rummy game in Port au Prince, a knocked with three. And this is a new version of it, Joe. The last time Slate told it, he was sitting on the beach and a bottle washed up on the shore. He pulled out the cork and there was King Moses. You were a lot smaller then, weren't you, King? Oh, yes, Miss Taylor, I've grown. Who put you in the bottle in the first place? The wind. I was sitting there playing my guitar, and a hurricane came up. There just happened to be a bottle lying around. Yeah, well, the way it really happened, Joe, was that... I'll settle for the last one, Shannon. Now, what about it? Ah, uh, well, I, I don't know. I admit it appeals to me, but diving for sunken treasure isn't exactly the way I want to make my way in life. Well, he's not asking you to dive for anything, Slate. He just wants to use your boat. Isn't that right, Joe? Sure. I'll do the diving, your boat, your equipment. We'll split whatever we find down the middle. My equipment? I haven't had a diving suit since I lived in Hawaii. And that was the time when all the beach boys who dived for quarters almost starved. Slate stood on the bottom of the ocean in his diving suit and a large tin cup. That's where I met Mr. Slate. <laughs> That's right. King Moses was making change. May I say something? Oh, please do. I know where the Bark Hespides is. An old slaving ship returning from the Carolinas with gold. It sank. I know where it sank. Where? I've listened a lot, and I've got me a lot of old charts. I can draw an X on a map of the Caribbean, and that's where the Hespides is. The lady asked you where. Look. Off here, the smallest island on Portuguese Key. This reef we use as a mooring. Get a bow hawser on the reef point. Shall I go on? Yeah, I like it. Back off 300 feet, drop a stern anchor, and we're secure. Then climb into a suit and jump down. Just 20 fathoms down and gold. Seeing you this way, Danny, talking to the seagulls, feeding them... One could think you were a man of kindness. Yeah, would one, though? You bring the stale off of bread like I told you? See? Here. Break it up in little pieces for me, Filippo. <laughs> so it would be tempting to their digestive juices? Just chock full of cute sayings, aren't you? They give it to me. Here, pretties. Feed your ugly faces. <laughs> That's it. Fight for it, you feathered beastie. Fight for it. <laughs> Look at them, Filippo. Cute, aren't they? Because they are hungry? Happens to all of us. Soon maybe you have flaky pastries to feed your birds. They might kill each other for them. 
You're like that, huh, Donnie? Yeah, I'll like. How are we doing with that part of it? I followed this Joe Cowan like a straight dog. Into alleys, into gutters. Had fun, huh? He talks much of the sunken ship Hespides. Of the gold that lies in a rotting hulk for fishes to nibble on. But when I stroke his ear and whisper where, he kick me and laugh. Because you're a stray dog, Filippo. I once was of dignity. I, too. Yeah, yeah, I know. You were a big man in the deep sea diving set. But you got the bend. Your lungs got tired. You're a cripple, Filippo. A cripple with an itching palm. And you are a prize to be dishonorably discharged from the Navy? To gloat over hungry birds? That's why all that gold cries out to us. Because we're cripples, you and me. We're not doing so good, huh, Filippo? We're doing excellent. Only in the last hour, Cowan went into the hotel of Shannon. I think to hire Shannon's boat. I think to hire Shannon, because he needs such things to gorge himself on what is in the Hespides. Well, what do you know about that? Eh. Now maybe we can stroke Shannon's ear a little. Hand me some more of that bread, Filippo. I feel kindly toward things. Eh. Show time, pretties. <laughs> And now, Mr. Shannon, for buying all this equipment from me, may I congratulate you? Go right ahead. I congratulate you. I think he's got something else on his mind, Slade. See, si. Now, what can it be? Is it possible? No. It is, senor, a feeling that you have forgotten something. No, I don't see what. I've got the compressor, the lines, the diving suit, everything. See, si. Which means that now I have no compressor, no lines, no diving suit. Is that fair, I ask myself? Something's awry, huh, Chico? See, si, now it comes. Alagazam! You have not paid me. Oh, we've done business before. Put it on the cuff. But, senor, I cannot open the cash register. It is so stuffed with cuffs. White cuffs, pink cuffs. I'll tell you what. I listen. If I make any money out of this trip, I'll give you ten percent. This is a modern way of payment? Only squares use money. Think of what you can do with ten percent. I need some caulking compound, amigo. Oh, see, your cock is my command. <laughs> it is in the back room. I will fetch it. My, what a lot of equipment you got, mister. Going diving? Uh-huh. Diving for what? Boiled shrimp. With hot sauce. Just asking. My, my, look at that. Real honest to Betsy Deep Sea stuff. What are you looking for, mate, Gold? Slate, he's pinching the diving suit. Mother told me there'd be men like that. You got a yen for diving gear, Buster? For gold, huh? Lucky people. Need a hand? Uh Uh-uh. For sunken gold. I'm nosy, curious, a dreamer. Tell me where so I can dream about it. Tell me. Back up, friend. Just whisper it. Come on. Come on, tell me or I'll... Dream about it, Buster. Is that gentleman lying there, what we call a gentleman with gold fever slate? Senor, senor, here's the compound for cocky. Yay! What you do lying on the floor? He's got a split seam, Chico. Cock him. Let's go, sailor. What's the etiquette, sailor? How long does one wait for a tardy deep-sea diver? How should I know? I've never been stood up by a man who wears a bubble on his head. Now you have. How does it feel? I feel like a girl with an empty deep-sea diving suit and nobody to shove into it. That's all. You and me. We're wallflowers, sailor. We've been invited to a dance and nobody wants to waltz with us. You'll show, Slate. If I know anything about men who get their kicks out of pacing the ocean floor looking for gold... You know, when I was a kid, I used to tickle my feet with dreams like this. Gold in a sunken ship at the bottom of the Caribbean. Let's go home, Slate. I'm tired. The bold venture's tired. It's all tired. All of it. Maybe something happened to Joe. Maybe somebody got to him, like the guy who tried to get to me. Yeah, maybe. That's why I want to go home. Come on, Slate. I'll buy you some gold-covered chocolates. Or maybe he's celebrating. Joe's a guy who likes to celebrate for any excuse at all. You're going to look for him, huh, Slate? Yeah. How'd you guess? I peeked through the hole in your head and saw the gold already folded in. (laughs) Hurry back, Slate. You lost, senor? 
We have many things in this place to make a man find himself. Joe Cowan, is he here? I have just made a pleasurable tour of inspection. Joe Cowan wasn't anywhere in it. Too bad for Joe. Look, I'm asking in a polite way, Pedro. Has Joe Cowan been here? See, see, many choruses ago. It was on this one he left us. Did he tell you where he was going? See, si, to the bottom of the ocean sea. Did he tell you anything else? Only that he would come back for the girl who is dancing there. Oh, look at her, senor. And wherever you go, you will come back to. Yeah, I might at that. Ask for Joe at Papa Gomez. Papa knows all the children of the barrio. Yeah, I'll put in a good word for you, Pedro. And for her, too. She needs it. You are Slate Shannon. Your name is whispered in the barrio often. By Joe Cowan? By him also. Well, then maybe he told you why he hasn't met me like he was supposed to. Why you not go ask him yourself in the place where he sleeps? Uh, that's what I've been yearning to do. For four hours now I've been yearning like that. Where does a man like Joe sleep? The latest pillow is in a yellow house on Bolivar Street, number eight. This thing of you and Joe, my blessings, child. Thanks, Papa. I may be able to use them. Joe! Joe, it's me! Slate Shannon, open up. Enter Slate Shannon. Who are you? Do as he says, Shannon. I got something that'll knock your eye out. This gun. Well, it's the curious buster with the diving bug. How was it being unconscious? Did you dream? Inside. I must say it, Shannon. Your banging made almost enough noise to awaken the dead, but not quite. What are you talking about? Observe, please, the dirty couch. Then observe slightly on top of it. He is definitely dead, Shannon. Yeah, mostly he doesn't breathe. You jealous, Shannon? Why'd you kill him? Once he was useful. Thus he lived long enough to tell us the position of the Hespides. Under duress, I assure you. And thus his usefulness expired. And thus he died. Meaning we're going diving, Shannon. Him, me, you, that dame, your equipment, your boat. Diving, splashing. Oh, I tell you, we'll have fun. What do you think of it, Shannon? Splashing too, huh? Well, the man's already said it. We'll have fun. Our stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and the second act of our story. Feels good to have an old sea hand at your right hand, huh, Captain Shannon? Couldn't live without it. Hold the thought, kid, how you couldn't live without it. How you doing with the charts, Mr. Val? I tried to eat them like you told me, Slate, but... I don't know. I've lost my taste for old parchment. I'm just jaded, I guess. Sailor Duval of the Able Body. The gun I hold on you don't make good sauce, does it, Candy Mouth? Try me without it. A promise I make to myself. Hey, Philippe, you've been gazing into the sea spaces long enough. Come up with something. Wait! Wait! Portuguese key off Port Bow! Steady as she goes! You made it, Captain. Now find the teeniest island and I'll bet I'll find you a reef to move my dreams to. Just like dead Joey said. Feel in your pockets, Danny boy, because you forgot something. Uh-uh. I got you, I got the charts, I got everything. Everything but a diver. You broke Joe Cowan in two, remember? That makes this a twilight cruise. It's been fun, Danny boy, just like you said. I remembered, Captain. I brought a diver. Filippo, you won't send him down. He'd die before he found the gold. Oh, Filippo found time to cry on your shoulder about his lungs, huh? Yeah. Anyone else, it would have broken my heart. 
I'll give you someone else. Shannon. And Shannon dives. You're crazy. All I ever dove for was abalone off Santa Monica. And two bit pieces off the shores of Monacora. That's why I got Filippo to give you hints. Go hit the sack, Captain. Come daybreak, you'll need all your strength. Sate, I've been watching you. Mind if I watch from up close? Don't make me talk, sailor. I want to save up on my breath. You could do that better if you slept. So they tell me. You'll die, Slate. They'll use you to bring up the gold. Then they'll let you die. The thought has occurred to me. Where are the playmates? They're asleep. Oh, don't you believe it, baby. Nobody sleeps on a night like this. Not you, not me, not them. Nobody. There must be a way. There must be. I've been looking for it in the water, sailor. In the bright lights on the backs of the phosphorescent fish. So far, they haven't spelled out a word. Try me, Slate. It's a word on my lips. Read it. Yeah. Just the word I was looking for. A very romantical picture you two make in the tropic moonlight. What I tell you, sailor? Nobody sleeps. You're wrong, Shannon. Why'd you do that? He wasn't even... Because I owed him one. Because he needs his sleep, Candy Mouth. Like I told him. I didn't think he'd need a gun butt to sing him a lullaby. I'll kill you. I could enjoy it from you. No? I just throw a blanket over him. I want him all tingly and refreshed in the morning. Flake the air hose so it won't kink, Danny. It's flaked. You check the air pump? The compressor? Ten times. I counted on my fingers. The lifting gear? Secure? It's holding on for dear life. How about me, Danny boy? Want to check me? Filippo tells me you'll need a lifeline. I give it to you because Filippo tells me. I'll never forget you for little things like this, Filippo. The helmet and me already. Wait. Come back to me, Slate. Are you crazy? Where else have I got to come back to? Come on, Shannon. Stuff your head into the steel balloon. Anything for you, Danny boy. Let's check the intercom, shall we? Just for kick. Hello? One, two, three, four. Hello, Shannon? Intercom okay. You are going over the side now. Okay, Danny. Shannon? Yeah, Filippo, who'd you expect? I give you your depth. Here comes 12 fathoms. Now... Thanks a lot. Can't we go any faster? As long as I'm doing this, I'd like to have a little thrill. Don't beg for it. It will come. You are safe at this speed, but no faster. What's my depth now? Here comes 14 fathoms. Now. How is it? Never had it better. Lots of light. Very blue. How's your air? Lovely. How's yours? The ship. Do you sight it? Nothing. All I see is what's in front of my faceplate. I'm going round and round, real slow. The blue light, pretty tropical plants. It's a world apart, Filippo. You don't know what you're missing. Hey, hey, hold me up, quick, hold me up. Trouble? Big trouble. A manta ray, a killer, it's coming for me. Hold me up, up. Shannon, if he's seen you, it's too late. Up, up. You have a knife, Shannon. Use it, use it. It's you or me, killer. Okay, Shannon. Let's see how good you are against a manta ray. There he is, Filippo. Give me a hand with him. Be gentle with him, can't you? It is touching, Mr. Duval, your concern for perhaps a dead man. But you are in the way. Yeah, let's get with that helmet. Let me help. As you wish it. Breathing. Slate. Slate, speak to me. Are you all right? <sighs> How'd you get inside this manta ray, sailor? So that blood that came to the top was the rays. I'm happy for you, Shannon. Take a small rest, then you will try the ocean again. How 
How is it down there, Shannon? Good footing. Give me more line. I want plenty of slack in both my lines. You heard him. Give him line. Mr. Val. What do you want? Shut up. There's something ahead. Wait. What is it, Shannon? Shannon, what do you see? Can you hear me? Give me that phone. Slate. Slate, what's the matter? Hi, sailor. I found me a boat. I will take it. The phone, Mr. Val. It's the Hesperides, all right. There's the name. Very good, Shannon. Can you get on deck? Sure, she's lying on her side. Looks like the boat's split in the middle, amigo. Half of it's gone. The gold was in the cabin. What of the gold? Well, now, take it easy, will you? Shannon, the gold! Shannon! You want gold, Filippo? I've got it. Put it on the platform, friend of mine, and send it up to me. Uh-uh. Do not be a fool. I can cut your airline. One in got at a time, Filippo, so I'll know I'll be alive for the next one. Shannon, I will cut the... Oh, no, you won't. Then you wouldn't know where your next ingot is coming from. All up the platform, amigo. He didn't do so good, did he, Filippo? Six lousy lumps of gold. You should have your lumps like that every day. Now, if I am correct, Shannon, you say we must return to Havana for more equipment. That's right. So, you two fellows drop us off at Havana, hire yourselves another boat, and go golding all by yourselves. Get her, comedian. Go wash your face, comedian. It's dirty. Come up forward, Shannon. I want to talk to you. Things. What we shall need to salvage the rest of that gold. Take the wheel, Danny. Right. First of all, we're going to need an awful lot of dynamite. Hi, Danny. Want to wash my face for me? Would you hold still? If you were gentle. Are you gentle, Danny? Want to try? Think of what the rest of our passengers would say. Yeah, they'd talk. If they could, they would. You'd kill me. That's not the idea. I'm talking about Shannon. Uh Uh-huh. Shannon will relieve Filippo at the wheel at four bells this morning. I'll wake Shannon. Stand at the wheel with him. Put my arms around him. Say something nice to him that'll make him warm. A knife in his back could put an end to it all. Maybe you can do the same to Filippo later. If you're anxious for me, Candy Mouth, why don't I do it while he's asleep? Take the chance if you want. Maybe Shannon won't sleep. You're an education, baby. Something a man needs to get ahead. Beautiful night, isn't it, Filippo? Mr. Val, what are you doing here? Right now, admiring the way you handle the wheel. Get below. Wake Mr. Shannon. It is his turn at the wheel. After all I've done for you, look what I brought you. What? Me and Slate's pea jacket. To keep you warm. Put on the jacket. Go ahead. Put it on. Very well. Your sudden concern amazes me. And my arm around your shoulder. What's your reaction to that? Amazement. Filippo. Yes? Hold me. My dear. Hold me. Hold me. You set him up pretty, Candy Mouth. Hey, Hey, Candy Mouth, come back here. Okay, okay, I'll throw him in the ocean myself. Slate, are you up? Huh? What's the matter? Don't talk, just listen to me. Danny just stabbed Filippo. He thought it was you. Now, let's get out of here, get back on deck. Hey, this is Filippo, you tricked me! There he is, by the wheel. Listen to me, sailor. I'll get you, both of you! Crawl forward along the starboard side, circle around and grab the wheel. But he's standing there, Slate. I'll draw him away from the wheel. When I yell, grab that wheel and spin it hard, and open up the throttle. Aye, aye, skipper. You looking for me, Danny? Yeah, I am. Come and get me. That's what I'm doing. You're shark bait, Shannon. Prove it to me. Yeah, I will. I work good with a knife, you see. Show me. Sailor! Where's your balance, kid? Shannon! So you got no foundation. Sailor. You're my boy. I'll take the wheel now. 
Let's pull up to the curb for a minute. Later, sailor. When we get home. What are you looking like that for? <laughs> I'm trying to figure you, sailor. I'm trying to figure why you ran to the Cuban officials and told them where the Hespides was located. And why did you give them those six gold ingots? Five gold ingots. Oh, you held one back. Show it to me. Uh-uh. I put it in my hope chest. What else you got in your hope chest? One doily. Uh, what kind of a hope chest is that? One doily and one gold ingot. It'll build. Come here, sailor. I did that even though you stole. I forgive you for it. Come here, Slate. I forgive you, too. For what? I looked in my hope chest a few minutes ago. All I've got is one doily. And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in Bold Venture. It's the Rocky Jordan Show. And I am Rocky Jordan. We take you now to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine for a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. Well, Jordan, I see we found a cool place under the ceiling fan. Ah, oh, Sam, what brings the pride of the Cairo police force to the tambourine? Need I have a reason? Uh, of course not. I have a chair. Here, just for a moment. Uh, the, uh, the Nile rises well. Oh, that's interesting. What else is on your mind? Oh, it is only that I have not seen you in many days. You know, a, a strange calm seems to have settled over your life. Oh, I'd say that's your good luck. <laughs> Perhaps. However, for one such as you who thrives on excitement and adventure, life must become a, a bit uh, restive, shall we say? Shall we? I hadn't noticed. Oh, um, incidentally, I noticed your bartender Chris handles things quite capably here. I um, mean, should you be away? All right, Sam. What's it all about? I'm really wondering if for once you would be interested in adventure only for adventure's sake. What do you got in mind? A great deal, Jordan. Now, about this prospective adventure, does it interest you? It might. Why? I thought it would. Come with me. The Café Tambourine, crowded with tourists, camel drivers, women, cheats, forgotten men down on their luck, the lonely and the lost. For this is Cairo, gateway to the ancient east, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story, Adventure in Zakazik. The desert heat had settled down like a tent over Cairo, and the big fan on my tambourine ceiling had been doing plenty of overtime with me under it. That's when Captain Sam Sabai of the Cairo police had come in with a lot of talk about adventure for adventure's sake. He had me interested. So we got in his limousine and he switched back to the standard topic of conversation in Egypt, the flow of the Nile River, till he pulled up at the internal security building in the government center. Inside, he picked a door that said, B. Balotti. Sam introduced me to the chubby man behind the desk. We sat down and B. Balotti looked me over real carefully. Well, Captain... 
This man is desert wise. He is, Mr. Ballardy. And this man knows little fear. <laughs> Such is my observation. Good. Mr. Jordan, what I am about to say is confidential. If you are interested, excellent. If not, that is your prerogative. But nothing is to be repeated after you leave here. You understand? Well, only that much so far. Very well. Our problem is one of robbery. Not of money, sir, but of valuable medical supplies. Well, somebody must be pretty sick. Please realize, Mr. Jordan, while medicines such as penicillin are plentiful in your country, they are extremely rare throughout the Middle East and sorely needed. Yes, yeah, sure, I follow. Go on, Mr. Bellotti. Repeatedly, shipments of the supplies have been raided and stolen after reaching Egypt. The loss already amounts to well over $10,000 in market value. But worth a lot more in the black market. As you say, they could bring five times, perhaps ten times their original price. Now... We do not know who is involved, but we have a feeling that the center of operations is... Uh, I will show you here on the wall map. The little town of Zakasik, located here, north and east on the delta at important crossroads. The uh, stolen supplies are probably hidden somewhere near there. Well, let's get right to the point, huh? Very well. An American en route to Zakasik has just been arrested by our customs officials... His name is Harry Evans. Am I supposed to know him? No, but we believe that he had made previous arrangements to purchase the black market supplies there. This is our chance to uncover the entire ring. Yeah, I'm beginning to get it. But you tell me. We want you, Mr. Jordan, to go to Zakazik in Mr. Evans' place. Look, Mr. Pilati, you got men to handle that kind of job. Unfortunately, there is no time for us to get a regular police agent and American such as you. Mr. Evans is due to arrive in Zakazik early tomorrow morning. All you want me to do is walk in and convince everybody that I'm Harry Evans, just like that. It is our opinion that they have never seen him in person. But, even so, it will be a distinct risk on your part. <laughs> it's one way of putting it. The black market ring is well organized and dangerous, make no mistake about that. But it must be uncovered and broken. Well, Mr. Jordan? I'll think about it. You must realize that an immediate decision is necessary. I will give you a short moment. Again, I repeat, it is entirely up to you. Sam, what are you getting me into? If you wish to say no, Jordan... How does a guy say no to a request like that? I can't, and you know it. Is that your answer, then? Well, it's not that simple. Anyhow, how would I make contact? The sellers will undoubtedly approach you. Uh, supposing they do. What about the buying? You will be supplied with $35,000 in American money. Marked, of course, for later identification. And what then? What if they ask how I'll get the stuff out? Tell them you have a plane waiting nearby to fly the medicines into Arabia. Mm. And what's my contact with you or Bilotti? A water seller will be stationed for that purpose in front of the Suez Hotel, where Mr. Evans has his reservation. I will be at the hotel in Shola Mineral Springs, about 30 kilometers from Zakazi, ostensibly on vacation. Ah, you've thought of everything, haven't you? Yeah, we hope so. Will you do what he asks then, Jordan? All right, Sam. What other choice have I got? Mr. Bellotti came back in then at two minutes to the second. He briefed me for a while and then fixed me up with my new identification. After that, I went back to the tambourine and arranged with Chris to take over. I wondered if I'd ever see him or the tambourine again. That night, I boarded the train for Zakazik. I was there early the next morning, and a taxi dropped me at the Suez Hotel. Right away, I knew how well Bellotti had set his plans. Water, Fendi, cool, pure water from the bubbling springs of Sholam. You get on the job early. Always I remain here to uh, serve in whatever way I am needed. Uh, sure, I'll see you later. As you wish, Fendi. Water, sparkling water. The water seller was playing his part well, and it was good to know I wasn't alone on the job. So I decided to check in. Ah, yes, we have your reservation, sir. The room is ready. If you will sign here, Mr. Evans. Yeah, sure. Boy, here. Kindly show Mr. Evans to room 209. At once. This way, Mr. Evans. Well, all I could do was wait, and it wasn't easy. The water seller kept to his post outside. I went from my room to the lobby, waiting for some move, but none came. I didn't like it. But I was in it now, and there was no getting out. 
That evening, I had some dinner in the hotel restaurant, sitting by the wall where I could keep an eye out. I was alone, except for a heavy-set Turk with a pretty Egyptian girl eating silently across the room. And then after a while, a party of four came in. An American, the graying, successful type, complete with cane, his talkative wife, and a couple of local boys wearing expensive tarbushes. The woman kept looking my way, and I wondered what it meant. Suddenly, she got up and came directly to my table. Oh, you poor, lonely man. Well, do I, uh... I impress you that way, lady? Of course you do. You are an American, I can tell. All Americans get lonely when they're alone. I'm Mrs. Bundy, and I insist that you join us at our table. Well, I... I... won't take no for an answer. Whatever you have to do here, you can do at our table. Oh, I think I get what you mean. All right, Mrs. Bundy. Now, that's more like it. Oh, silly me, I didn't even get your name. Uh, Evans, Harry Evans. Harry Evans. What a nice name. I'm Mrs. Bundy. Oh, but I told you that, didn't I? Well, my dear. Oh, no, no, no. Don't get up, anyone. Jeffrey, darling, I want you to meet Mr. Evans. How do you do, Mr. Evans? I thank you, Mr. Bundy. And this is Mr. Ackman, mayor of Zakazik, and Mr. Kemal, agricultural supervisor for this district. How do you do? Now, let's all sit down and enjoy ourselves. Well, it's great to see a fellow American again, Mr. Evans. Just passing through, I suppose. Well, as a matter of now, fact... Now, now, everyone keep quiet while Mr. Evans tells us all about New York. You'll do that, won't you, Mr. Evans? Well, I'll tell you what I can. It's been quite a while. Oh, dear, I miss New York so much. Egypt isn't the same. Cotton, cotton, nothing but cotton. Yes, cotton, Mr. Evans. Long staple. Fairly profitable, I might say. What is your line? Well, right at the moment, oh, Mr. Oh, business, business, business. Now, you men can talk about that tonight. Tonight? Oh, I didn't tell you about the party at our house. Just a few friends. Mr. Kemal and Mr. Ackman are coming, aren't you, dears? Now, of course you are. Join us by all means, Mr. Evans. Nine o'clock sharp. Well, I'll make it if I can. Now, if you'll all excuse me. Oh, of course, dear boy. Run along. But remember tonight, you can tell us some more about New York. <laughs> I decided this wasn't the contact, not in that kind of company, so I waited some more. Just long enough to get through the lobby, up the stairs, and down the hall to my room. Come in, Evan. Shut the door. It was the heavy set Turk I'd spotted down in the restaurant. The girl wasn't with him now, but a squirrel eyed guy who played with knives was. He put his back to the door as I went in. Just to ensure a quiet talk, Kevin. Did your friend talk to? Yes, as you can see, <laughs> he has a very sharp tongue. Now, we don't need any rough stuff. Let's get on with it. Get on with what? Now, you came here, you name it. You could be Evans. I suppose we get acquainted all around, then. Uh, you may call me Gino. It's as good a name as any. You have the money? $35,000. Where is it? In a hotel safe. Get it changed into Egyptian pounds. Why? American dollars are better. I said get it changed to pounds. Okay, Gino, right away. Wait, Evans. Let us say that I deliver certain uh, merchandise. How do you get it out? There's a plane waiting to fly it into Arabia. That satisfy you? Perhaps. How and when did you arrive in Egypt? Flew from Rome to Cairo yesterday afternoon. At exactly what time? 3.15. We will check. Go mark up. So what happens now? Somebody else have to give the okay? Just have the money. We will contact you when we are sure. And when we are ready. <laughs> Well, they were playing it very careful. I'd expected that, but Gina would throw me with a real problem. That of changing the money. The marked dollars Bellotti had given me wouldn't be worth anything now. I had to get the word to Sam. The water cellar was my pipeline, so after a little waiting, I went down and out front. The night street was all but deserted. Even the water cellar was gone. I moved up the street trying to spot him till a ragged native came running out of a nearby alley. Effende! Help! Effende, sir! Come quickly! What is it? Tell me. There in the alley, sir, a most wretched man has fallen by the knife. Hurry! Help everybody! I made it fast into the alley, somehow knowing just who I'd find. When I reached the huddled heap by the wall, I knew I was right. He was the little water cellar, and I wasn't any too soon. <laughs> Mr. Jordan, it is good that you have come. Don't try to talk. Come here, let me help you. No, no, quickly. Take this key. Tell me, who did it? The key. Take it and go. Before you are seen here. This... Go. He was beyond any help. I knew now I was in it up to my ears. With the death of the water cellar, my one contact with Sam Sabaya was gone. <laughs> They 
They called me Harry Evans in Zakazik, but now I wondered if the wrong people knew who I really was. The water cellar had made a fatal slip. Maybe I was next. Back in my room at the hotel, I had a look at the key the water cellar had placed in my hand. It had a big drop-in-the-mailbox tag attached with the address of the Shalom Mineral Springs Hotel where Sam Sabaya was staying nearby. I kept fiddling with it, wondering what it meant, till all at once the big tag snapped open. It was empty, but I realized it had been the water cellar's safe way of getting word to Sam. I wrote a quick note to Sam, telling him his water cellar was dead and to get me a new contact, that I'd been approached by a Turk named Gino and about the problem of exchanging the dollars I had for Egyptian pound notes. Now my problem was getting the key into the mailbox without being seen. When I reached the lobby, I saw it wouldn't be easy. Gino and his sidekick were there watching, so I moved into the cocktail lounge and carefully dropped the key on the floor near the bar. I was about to go. A moment, Mr. Harry Evans. I turned to see the Egyptian girl who'd been sitting in the restaurant with Gino earlier that evening. Rhonda Hassan, do you not remember? But Gino wouldn't like you talking to strangers. You have changed, have you not? Since I married you in Port Said three years ago. Uh, maybe we'd better sit down. Huh? I think so, too. You may order a brandy for me. Yeah, sure. Oh, uh, two brandies, here. Thank you. Harry. You're welcome. By the way, where is my former husband? Well, you might try missing persons. You carry it off very well, whoever you are. I think you and I will get on very nicely. Well, that all depends, doesn't it? Ah, the brandy. Oh, here you are. All right, keep the change. I do not think I will tell Gino what I know. If you know anything. When I explain, you will see. It is necessary that I get out of Egypt very quickly. I want to go to your country, to America. Oh, the police on your trail, too? Yes, but why is not important. I know that you are not Harry Evans. I think you are with the police, who will do anything to uncover a ring which steals and sells rare medical supplies on the black market. I'm not a cop. I can't do anything. You are wise to admit nothing. But I am sure you can arrange with the authorities to get me out of Egypt in return for what I can tell them about the black market ring. Look, look, did Gino send you in here? Yes, but he does not know what I am saying, which is true. Now do what I ask. I will keep my mouth shut about you. Oh, you can tell me something. Why is Gino taking his time about selling? It is his way. He will toil with you a day or two, observe your movements, and then approach you for the sale. Yeah. But your help for me had better come before that time. Oh, uh, Mr. Evans, there you are, dear boy. Oh, uh, Miss Hassan, this is Mr. and Mrs. Bundy. How do you do? Uh, you're coming to my party now, aren't oh, you? Oh, please do, old boy. Just a quiet affair. We'd like to have you. Bring the young lady along if you'd like. Well, I'm afraid I won't be able to make it, Mrs. Bundy. Sorry. Oh, now, don't apologize. We understand. Oh, Jeffrey, someone dropped a key on the floor. Pick it up, why don't you? If you like, my dear. Mm, says the Sholem Springs Hotel, return postage guaranteed. This yours, Mr. Evans? Of course it isn't his, Jeffrey. Can't you see he's staying here? We can drop the key in the mailbox on the way out. Very well, my dear. Come along. We'll see you later, Mr. Evans. Yeah, sure. And I will see you later, too. I didn't answer. Rhonda finished her drink and went out, and I sat there trying to figure. Maybe she was just Gino's way of toying with me, maybe a lot more. Anyhow, Mrs. Bundy had taken care of my mailing problem. And then came more waiting. Just before bank closing time the next day, I decided to get the dollar bills changed for pounds, with Gino's squirrel-eyed friend hovering always in the background. But no word from Gino, nor Sam. The third day came, and it was getting monotonous, with the feeling everything was closing in, and not just the heat now. In the evening, I went out on the street for a breath of air. Ah, Effendi, the shoes hold the sand of the desert. For a little bakshish, I will shine them like silver. No, not this time. Himshi. Yeah, please, Effendi, for bakshish, I shine the shoes or serve in whatever way I am needed. Two piastres. Make it quick. As you say, sir. Uh, you do something besides shine shoes? Keep the eyes from my face, Mr. Jordan. I do not wish to suffer the fate of the poor water cellar. Forget the water cellar. Where are you from? From the springs of Sholam, sent by the good Captain Sabaya. Did he get a message? Yours, Mr. Jordan, sent in the hotel key. Go on. What's he say? To remain and wait. The plan is working well. You tell him not to be too sure. How long do I wait? It should not be long. When Gino decides, 
He will move fast. It better be soon. Uh, ah, there, Effendi. The most beautiful shine. The piastres, please. All right, here you are. Thanks. Muto Shakir, when you want another shine, I will be close by. I went back to the hotel, figuring I'd sit it out some more. But when I unlocked the door to my room, I didn't have to wait anymore. We will move now, Mr. Evans. Now you could have saved the time, Gino. You have the money in pounds? I've got it. Then everything is ready. Not till I see the supplies, all of them. Then come, we will go. Where to? You will find out. Come now. We went down, I picked up the money from the safety box, and then we were out on the street toward Gino's covered jeep. I noticed the shoeshine fellow watching from a doorway. Not till we got to the car did I see that somebody else was there. Not Gino's helper, but the girl, Rhonda Hassan. She didn't look at me as I got in. Gino drove fast out of town through miles of cotton fields and then over some barren sand dunes where we came to a place that looked like the ruins of an ancient Roman fort with one small building still intact. Straight ahead, Evans. You picked a good hiding place. It's all in there, Gino? Yes, everything. Go in. Ah, hold it, Gino. I said go in. <laughs> Gino's foot in my back had sent me stumbling inside. I fell against the table and rolled to the floor as the door was slammed and locked. And I saw by a dim light that something else had fallen to the floor. I picked it up. I'd seen it before. It was the hotel key that I thought had been mailed to Sam Zabaya. Just then, the blue-white light of a gasoline pressure lantern cut the gloom, and I knew I wasn't alone. There were two of them. Mr. and Mrs. Jeffrey Bundy. And Jeffrey still had his cane. Get up, Mr. Jordan. Get up. Hurry up, Mr. Jordan. We haven't much time. Well, I'll bet I missed a great party. It was a delightful affair. You would have enjoyed it. You see, we were not sure of you then. Now that you got a hold of this key. Yes, very conveniently. It was nice of you to drop it right where we would find it. The message inside told us everything we wanted to know. Oh, the shoeshine man was your plant, too. Sophia hadn't sent him at all. Excellent, Mr. Jordan. Is everything clear to you now? It means you two are the big stuff. You got quite a partnership. Very efficient one, Mr. Jordan. How about the real Harry Evans? Where is he? Well, he was your boy, only the police have got him now. What has he told them? What do they know? All about the hijacking of a lot of penicillin for the black market, that Zaka Zeke's the pinpoint. And they'll get the rest. And enough of this. Wait, I... just one more thing. Since coming to Zaka Zeke, have you been in touch with the police in any way? After you had Gino get rid of the water cellar? That's something you'd like to know, isn't it? Really doesn't matter, Mr. Jordan, now. Yes, come, my dear. What happens here now isn't for the eyes of a delicate woman. Oh, Jeffrey, you are so considerate. Gino, you may come in now. Goodbye, Mr. Jordan. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Jeffrey Bundy stepped to the heavy door as it was unlocked and swung open. They went out as Gino came in, still followed by the girl, Rhonda. It seemed all in a day's work as Gino came toward me with a knife, Rhonda still behind him. And just as he was a step away from me, I saw Rhonda's right arm go up fast. It held a gun that caught Gino hard over the ear. He is quite harmless now, Mr. Jordan. Yeah. Thanks, Rhonda. But why? This will show you I am on your side. I didn't make a deal with you. I couldn't if I'd wanted to. All I want is to be permitted to go safely out of Egypt. You can try. I have no authority. Believe me, I can't promise a thing. But you can try. Please, Mr. Jordan, it is my only chance. You must help me. I helped you. I know, Rhonda. Of course, I'll try. What's going on in there? Hurry up, Cheetah. Mr. Jordan, I must answer them. First, take the gun. Give it to me. What about you, Rhonda? In case you do not get away, I must be clear. I must protect myself. That is fair, is it not? It's fair. Answer him now. Mr. Bundy, come! He is getting away! Gino! Rhonda! What is it? The Bundys came running in. The missus first. She took one look at Gino on the floor, let out a scream, and fainted right on top of him. But Bundy did better. He swung his cane and knocked the gun from my hand. Now the swing bounced off my head. The next time I was ready, I grabbed hold of his wrist and flipped him over my head and down on top of the other two to make it three of a kind. Pick up the gun, Mr. Jordan. It is still yours. And what now? Uh, I'll stay here. You take the jeep back into Zakazik and call Sam Sabaya. Get him here as quick as you can. Do you trust me that much? I'll take the chance. Get going, Rhonda. Well, 
Sam and some government boys showed up in record time. He sent a couple of them to pick up the phony shoeshine man and Gino's squirrel-eyed helper, and all of us rode back into Cairo. The medicine supplies were found in one of the Bundy cotton warehouses. So Mr. Bellotti got back to penicillin, and the others got the pen. Rhonda had a debt to pay, but she'd proved herself, and it looked like she'd soon get her freedom to America. Me? Oh, I'm right back where I started. Trying to find a cool spot under the tambourine fan. Rocky Jordan, written by Gomer Cool and John Dunkel, stars Jack Moyles with Jay Novello as Sam Sabaya. Also featured in tonight's cast were Gene Bates, Byron Kane, Bill Conrad, Paul Fries, and Lou Krugman as Greco. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Warner Brothers KFWB presents your preview theater of the air. Introducing radio's newest dramatic adventure series, The Adventures of Soto. Welcome, friends, to your preview theater of the air. Warner Brothers KFWB's special series of programs designed to introduce to the airwaves radio's outstanding hits of the future. Warner Brothers KFWB is proud to set aside this period each week for your preview theater. When Hollywood's writers, directors, and producers are given an opportunity to introduce to the radio audience fresh and novel program innovation. Here, too, is an opportunity for you to preview and forecast the future star attractions of the radio world. On God, Senor. Jacob Zorro. The Adventures of Zorro, the mysterious black masked rider who leaves his mark on all that is evil, the letter Z for Zorro, champion of the poor and the oppressed. California, early 18th century. <laughs> It is fiesta time in Reina de los Angeles. But underneath the gaiety, there is a scene of anxiety and foreboding. Natives and wealthy landowners alike. And even the powerful mission priests fear the unscrupulous politicians sent to rule them by the king of Spain. But now a new hope has arisen in the hearts of those oppressed people. A man who dares raise his sword against the governor and his men. A black masked rider known to the multitude only as Zorro. Zorro the fox. None but the priest, Padre Felipe, knows that in reality Zorro is the wealthy, indolent caballero, Don Diego Vega. Don Diego, who at the moment is speaking words of love, in his own fashion, to the beautiful Senorita Lolita Peruso. Senorita, it is not my desire to hurry you, but my father insists I find a wife before the year is out. Your father, senor? Do you not wish it yourself? It would be rather a bore, I expect. The ceremony and the wedding feast and all that sort of thing. Senor, is that the way to woo a bride? What sort of a man are you? Senorita, I admit my taste runs more to poetry or consorting with the muses. It suits me to leave the more manly arts to fellows like uh, this Zorro we hear so much about. Zorro. 
Ah, oh, there is a man. A scoundrel who dares not even show his face. You would do well to take a few lessons from Zorro, senor. <laughs> the clash of swords, no doubt, in no, the plaza. No, look. It is Captain Morland and the soldiers. And, and they have taken someone captive. There, in shame. Well, perhaps they've already captured our fine senor Zorro. Then, Dito Dios, it is Padre Felipe. Quiet them down, Sergeant Gonzalez. So we can begin. Quiet, you sons of the devil! Quiet! I mean, quiet! It's Sergeant Voices. <laughs> a mere mushroom brought smell. Enough, Sergeant. A man is here to be punished for swindling an honest citizen. Oh. Nothing, oh. Padre! Oh. Oh. Heaven have mercy! Sergeant Gonzalez, read the charge against Padre Felipe. If Zorro knew of this, you would not dare. Who said that? Let me catch anyone dealing with Zorro, and he shall swing from the highest pepper tree. Go on, Sergeant Gonzalez. Say, sí, Capitan. By the sworn testimony of bootmaker Raul Santos, Padre Felipe sold to said citizen Santos one dozen hides which had not been properly cured. In fact, <laughs> Raul Santos states the hides caused such a stench that his wife had to leave it at the end of... <laughs> and if you the look, Silencio! Silencio! That will be enough, Sergeant. You deny this charge, Padre? Were I a follower of a dishonest governor instead of a robed Franciscan monk, the hide would have been good. You speak truth. Oh, I speak truth. You have taken our mission land from us. And not content with that, you are now persecuting us. Say that is the truth. Thank you. Padre, I shall make you understand that because a man wears a robe, he cannot rob without punishment. You shall repay Raul Santos the price of the hide. And, uh, for the swindle... You shall receive across your back 15 lashes. Sergeant Gonzalez, Say. take him to the whipping post. Say me, Captain. The good padre is led away, while one unspoken question hangs like a storm cloud over the plaza. Where is Zorro? Zorro. Oh, if only he were here. Oh, Don Diego, you must stop him. But I, senorita... I am not Zorro. No, senor. You have the courage of a, a mosquito. Well, you do me a great injustice, senorita. I dislike any kind of violence. But I am still an honorable man. I would you were less honorable and more of a man. Adios, senor. <laughs> I, I believe she's displeased with me. Don Diego strolls leisurely toward the sound of the music. Then, making sure that no one sees him, he suddenly streaks to one of his many hideaways. Emerges seconds later, enveloped in a dark cloak, his face hidden by a stern black mask. Come, Hitano, to the plaza. <laughs> we must live up to our reputation with the senorita. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Sergeant Gonzalez. Harder. The Padre must learn his lesson. Oh, this is hard work. Uh, no, I knew it was no. I knew the name of John Zorro. Yes. Zorro the Fox. Now, Capitana must ask you to release Padre Felipe. Release him? <laughs> Rather, we would take you to the post beside him. Unfasten the Padre Sergeant or I'll... No! No, please! please unfasten him, then. Eh, hey, see, Senor Zorro. See? Anything you say. Stay, Gonzalez. See, see? I mean... No, no! I, I mean... Oh! Keep your distance, Comandante. One step closer and I shall leave the mark of Zorro on your forehead. You shall pay for this, Senor. Come, Padre. Mount. Yes. Here, help me. Hey, Mr. Dan, bless you, my son. Adios. What now, senores? Oh, Gonzalez! After him! Who? Me? Later that night, in the shadows outside the mission... Padre. Padre, who is this, Zorro? I must know. Oh, you must not ask me that, Lolita. Padre, you must tell me. But why, senorita? Oh. Padre, I do not know how to say this, but... Si. When I saw him in the plaza today... When he saved you from the lash of the whip, so fearless, so brave, I knew then that I... You are in love with Zorro, Lolita? I... I think so. Oh, Padre, it would do no harm to tell me his name. Please. Lolita, child, about Don Diego. Oh, yes, Padre, I know. 
It is with him I should wait. But, but there is something you do not know. Yes, Padre. I, the truth is... No, Padre. The truth is better unsaid. Senor Oh, you should not have come back here, Senor. It is all right, Padre. What I've just heard from the Senorita's own sweet lips is worth even the risk of a hangman's noose. You hear me, Senor. I spoke to boldly. Capitan Ramon and the soldiers, they will surely come by the mission. I know, Padre. But before I go, your hand, Senorita. No. No, there's no time. You must hurry, Senor. Oh. Then I shall be here to greet the Capitan when he comes. No doubt they will cast me in a dungeon, and then I shall swing by the neck from the pepper tree. And oh, then... no, Senor. They are coming. Your hand, Senorita. Oh, that is better. No. Now you must go. Go. Adios. Let's make him. There he goes. Over the wall. Whoa. Whoa. Capitan. Did you see that? The fellow jumped right over an eight-foot wall. Do not stand there, you son of a mule. Go on with the others. After him. Over the wall? Through it if you have to. Hurry. Say, Capitan. The beautiful senorita is in league with this scoundrel Zorro. She has nothing to do with Zorro, Capitan Ramon. The protection of mission walls makes you bold, eh, Padre? Have you forgotten today? Please go inside, Padre. Have no fears about me. If you wish it, my child. You know, of course, senorita, that the punishment for helping a highwayman escape is imprisonment, eh? I do not know any highwayman. You would stand here in the shadow of the house of God and deny that you were consorting with this, this Zorro? You call him a highwayman? But he only wants to help the poor, senor. That is for me to decide, senorita. In the name of the governor, I should place you and the padre under military arrest. Senor. Hmm. The governor has long had his eye on this mission for his private hacienda. Now, if I could turn it over to him on his next visit... You would uh... not dare, senor. It would start a revolt among the people. Besides, besides, it would kill Padre Felipe. Hmm. You are right, senorita. I myself would much rather turn over senor Zorro to his excellency. In either case, of course, I would rate a fine increase in salary. You mean, if Zorro were to give himself up, you would leave the Padre alone? Precisely. And I am sure you can make Senor Zorro see it our way. Adios, Senorita. Hola, patron. Some wine. See, Sergeant Gonzalez, see? It is the devil's own night, senor. There is much talk in the pueblo that senor Zorro has brought again. Zorro, huh? See. Well, you are safe from him while I am here. He knows better than to show himself a second time before a superior swordsman like myself. What you think you are? What the... Did I startle you somewhat, senor? Oh, viejo, that black cloak. I thought for a moment. <laughs> ah, the storm must be making me jumpy. You couldn't startle anybody. <laughs> yes, it's true. I don't have much of a reputation for fighting. My taste runs more to words of wisdom than poetry. Ah, meal mush and goat's milk. Perhaps. Uh, get me a pot of honey, landlord. Si, <laughs> senor. <laughs> ah, sometimes I wonder, Don Diego, how you expect to sweep the Senorita Lolita off her feet with your idleness? Please, Sergeant, this is no place for discussing the Senorita Lolita. Mm, perhaps, and perhaps not. I only thought that since the Senorita and the Padre are in such uh, great danger... Lolita? In danger? What do you mean? Aha! We have found something to get a rise out of you, Caballero, at last. Come, you fool, tell me. What has the Capitan done with the Senorita? She is perfectly safe, Caballero. Do not worry. Only... Only what? Well, it surprises me you do not know, Don Diego. But tomorrow when the governor arrives, Padre Felipe will be turned out of his mission and he and the senorita imprisoned. And, well, who knows? Unless that is... Yes, uh, yes, go on. Don Diego, such impatience and coming from you. Why oh, would I not be impatient? You know how much the mission means to the people of Reina de los Angeles. Well, your Lolita and the precious Padre can save that mission. How? Oh. By persuading Senor Zorro to get himself caught by the time the governor arrives. Oh, so the brave Capitan expects a woman and an old man to do his work for him. Well, perhaps you would go out and capture Zorro yourself, eh, Senor? Oh, oh no, not me. But if I were a man like you, I would try to outfox this Senor Fox. Ah, me motion go. How would you do that? Very simply. Uh, but I cannot get mixed up in these things. Landlord, where is my honey? Here it is, Senor. Thank you. Uh, uh, before you go, Senor, 
Uh, what you said before, uh, I mean about outfoxing Senor Fox. Well, if it were up to me to find Zorro... See? I would see to it that a black masked figure is caught in some evil act. Like, uh... Robbing the mission vault. Oh, how in the name of the Bendito Dios could you get Zorro to rob the mission without catching him first? My friend, the Bendito Dios did not favor you too much up here in the head. I would not expect Zorro himself to do this deed. Huh? But if someone were to dress in a black cloak and mask, he could readily be mistaken for Zorro, could he not? Oh? Masked figure were caught robbing the vault and his mark were left behind. It would be assumed that he was Zorro. Oh, Don Diego, I am beginning to think that what you lack in spirit, you make up for in brain. <laughs> I shall go to Capitan immediately. Uh, just, just a minute, Sergeant. I have always admired you, and I'd like to see you get ahead. Now, why let the Capitan have this plan and get all the credit? You mean we could do it ourselves? Not we, Sergeant. You. Who? Me? You. Oh, me. See, you would no doubt get a promotion from the governor. And about time, too. I happen to know the senorita goes regularly to mass at daybreak. And since I am your friend and want to see you get ahead, I may even see to it myself that the vault is left open. Would you really do that for me, Don Diego? Who else but you, Sergeant? Senorita, Senorita Lolita. Senor Zorro, you should not have come here to my father's house. I must not see you anymore. But why not, Senorita? Is it that the dashing Don Diego has finally captured your heart? I could never love Don Diego. <laughs> the more is he to be pitied, then. Such a charming fellow. Handsome, too. Senor Zorro, I need your help. Lolita, there is nothing in the world I wouldn't do for you. Preferably the impossible. Senor, Capitan Ramon wants me to... to make you give yourself up. Has he not the courage to capture me himself? You do not understand, senor. If you are not captured by tomorrow morning... See? The governor will take the mission away from Padre Felipe. And he will be thrown into prison. You are only concerned about the Padre, senorita? Oh, senor. He is an old man. You know that it would kill him. Then by all means, senorita, you must see that I am captured. Oh, but senor, I cannot. But why? When our mission and the Padre's very life are almost at stake. Senor Zo. It is... It is only that I... I love you so much. But you have never seen me without my mask. I may be ugly. Still, I love you. Lolita. Come here, Lolita. Oh, Carrie, let me in. And now you must listen and do as I say. What would you have me do, Senor? Go to Capitan Ramon. The governor has arrived and is with him now. Tell them that at dawn tomorrow, Zorro will be at the mission and will give himself up. You are asking me to betray you, Senor. I am asking you to save the house of God for the people, Senorita. And to trust me. To love is to trust in you. Then do not fear. And remember, do as I say. Adios! And so, with a heart full of foreboding, Lolita follows Zorro's instructions and goes to the governor and Capitan Ramon. I have done as you wanted, Capitan. I have found out that Zorro will be at the mission at daybreak. You are smart, senorita. I see you want to do everything to help your governor. If what you say is true, I will keep my part of the bargain, and neither the padre nor the mission will be molested. And now, in a large room at the mission, as the gray dawn streaks the sky... Oh, padre. Padre. Why should he have asked me to do this? There must be some other way. If anything happens... To... Oh, my child. We must keep our faith in Zorro. But, Padre, if they catch him, it will be all my fault. Have faith, Senorita. Don Diego. Oh, yes. It surprises me as much as it does you to be abroad so early in the morning, Padre. What do you want? Oh, the Capitan promised a rare treat. As you must know, they expect to capture Senor Zorro this morning. To see the man who rescued the Padre captured. A rare treat, indeed. But I don't understand, Senorita. It is rumored that it was you who forewarned the captain. Please, Don Diego. You see how upset the senorita is. Well, I... Ah, the captain. Buenos dias. And Governor, Your Excellency, in the name of the Vega family, let me welcome you to La Reina de Los Angeles. Gracias, Don Diego. I trust, Capitan, that your soldiers are about in goodly numbers. It would be most unfortunate if Senor Zorro were to stumble on us in this room, and we should have to capture him ourselves. <laughs> but do not worry, Don Diego. You will not have to soil the frills of your cups. There is a soldier behind every bush around the mission. A whole regiment to capture one man. 
I am a perfectionist, Governor. Well, still, I, I do hope there will be no shedding of blood. I am a peace-loving man. Am I not, Padre? I think the bandito Dios will forgive me if I say that you are, my son. <laughs> I, I do hope you'll excuse me now. I, I think after all, I did get up a little too early. But Don Diego... Uh, let him go, Padre. <laughs> Poor Don Diego. I fear it is useless to try to make a man of him. Still, Capitan. Uh, yes, sir. Are you sure that we have adequate protection here? If Zaro were already hidden inside the mission, there'd be nothing to prevent him from coming into this very room. I took the precaution, Excellency, of having the entire mission searched before you our arrival. Good. It would be absolutely impossible. Oh. <clears throat> Senor Zorro. But it cannot be you. Ah, but it is, Capitan. Senor, I command you to surrender in the name of the king. You have already declared me an outlaw, Excellency, and outlaws have no allegiance to his majesty. Oh, oh I see your tongue is as bold as your manner, Senor. Were I but a few years younger, I'd cross swords with you myself. However, since I'm an older man and cannot conquer you with the blade, I, I must resort to other means. Meaning, Excellency? Meaning that if you do not surrender yourself immediately. Well, Senorita and Padre Felipe, I face you under military arrest. Oh, no. Please, Excellency. For me, I am not afraid, but the Padre... Wait, Senorita. You are a ruthless man, Governor. And it appears I am powerless against you. I will therefore make a bargain with you. The Capitan has promised you Zorro will be captured this morrow. And his promise shall be kept if you will leave Padre Felipe and the Senorita alone. I am a man of my word, Senor. And now, your sword. Gladly, Your Excellency. But first, I have a score to settle with our good Capitan Ramon. On guard, Commandante. Uh, but uh, well, hurry up. Fight, Capitan. Fight for His Majesty, the King of Spain. Fight, robber of defenseless priests. <laughs> Come, Capitan, fight. I'll run this blade through you. I will show you. You black earth. Uh, so you will run the blade through me. Hey, hey, Capitan, you got cornered. Don't kill him, Capitan. I want that. Watch out. The cable. My sword. Zorro, please. Don't worry, my friend. I don't want your life. But I leave you with this. The mark of Zorro. And for the moment, amigos. Hasta la vista. Don't let him get away. There he goes. Round that corner. You, that soldier. Follow that man. Oh, there he is. Surrender in the name of... Oh, you, Don Diego. What? Were you looking for someone, Captain? Which way did he go? You mean, senor, that you have let Zoro slip through your fingers again? Oh, you must have seen him. He passed this way only a moment ago. He did? Oh, by the saints, I must be more careful. Oh, but, Capitan, what is that mark on your forehead? Oh, just a scratch. You ran into a door. A door with a letter Z on it. Well, it seems you successfully bungled it again, Captain. But, Excellency, it was not my fault. You yourself or the senorita say Zorro would give himself up. It is no doubt another trick of those mission priests. They think they can get away with anything because they have the protection of the rope. We have him bound and gagged. We have more than goat's milk. Good old Gonzalez. <laughs> you see, Excellency, my soldiers know their business. There is more than can be said of their Capitan. Come along, Don Diego. You need have no pills now. Mm. Oh, Senor Zorro, you thought you could trick us again, eh? But, Capitan, I am not... Free. Silencio! Apparently, it did not occur to you that I may have a few tricks up my sleeve. Senor, oh, Senor Zorro, you, you should not have let me do this. But listen, everybody, I am not the Look one... Look at your brave Zorro now, Senorita. Capitan, listen! Uh, it seems Senor Zorro's voice is changing. Mil mush and goat's milk. Gonzalez! Oh, Bendito Dios, no! Capitan, let me explain. You will have plenty of explaining to do, Senor Zorro. Let us see this famous Zorro face to face. I'm not uh, One moment, Excellency. Uh, perhaps it would be better. <laughs> that is, uh, with the senorita present. <laughs> and, well, uh, oh, you know how Don Diego dislikes any kind of violence. Oh, do not mind me, Captain. I find I have suddenly overcome all this taste for violence. Unmask him, soldier. Uh, Excellency, wait. Uh, this man, even though he is a scoundrel, he has tried to help our people. Perhaps we would allow him the dignity of being hanged with his mask on. Oh. It seem to have had a very sudden change of heart, Captain. If you were not a trusting man that I am, I would begin to suspect some sort of trickery. By order of the governor, unmask the man at once. Please, I can explain everything. Uh, please, you tell them, Don Diego. Who, tell me? Them. It is to me. I've seen that face before. Uh, no, Excellency. I, I mean, see. No matter. It'll probably come to me before the hanging. No! Uh, Excellency. See, Capitan. About, uh, about the hanging. Oh, 
Perhaps it would be better if, if maybe we could give Senor Zorro another chance. <laughs> that is, if he should promise. Have you lost your mind, Capitan? Enough of this nonsense. Take him to prison. No more. Take uh, one moment, Excellency. Uh, one moment. Your Excellency. Stay on there. Now that Zorro has finally been taken captive by our, uh, our brave Capitan, I believe it would be wise to assure the people that their mission will not be taken away. You doubt my word, Don Diego. Oh, no, Excellency. I am thinking merely of letting the people know what a good and honest governor they have. Now think how much paper you would gain if at this very moment you would issue a proclamation saying that the mission is safe and no harm will come to Padre Felipe. Don Diego, my compliments to your intelligence. Capitan Ramon, have a proclamation drawn up and displayed in the plaza at once. See, si, Excellency. And now we must go and prepare for the hanging. Uh, that face. That face. Where could I have seen it? And then, Padre, just as I thought it was all over for Senor Zorro, he opened his mouth to speak. <laughs> yes, my child. And what do you think he said? I cannot guess, Senorita. Meal mush and goat milk. Oh, no. <laughs> Padre, Padre, you do not think they will hang him? I mean the sergeant. Oh, of course not. The governor has an excellent memory for a face. We can rely on it to save the sergeant. But, but Padre, when he finds out, he, he will revoke the proclamation, the mission. Do not worry, Lolita. For a time, at least, we are safe. Zorro has seen to that. You mean the governor will not harm us? By the time they find out about the college, everyone will have read the governor's proclamation. A copy is already on its way to the king. His Excellency would not dare so openly to go back on his work. Padre? Yes, Solita? What do you suppose happened to Zorro? Well, now I... Do... Oh, Padre, you do know. Tell me quickly. Lolita, I have a strange suspicion that Senor Zorro would rather tell you himself. You are right, as always, Padre Felipe. Senor Zorro, you have been here all the time. See, si, Senorita. Does that displease you? I still don't understand about Sergeant Gonzalez. You... That is not for a pretty head like yours to worry about. That or it should rest. Here on my shoulders. Senor. We must not forget, Senor, that the danger is not over. Once they find out about Sergeant Gonzalez... See, si, Padre, I will go. Only when my work is finished. When everyone can enjoy the fruits of this great new land. Only then will Zorro lay down his sword or take off his mask. Until that time... You have just heard the first of the Adventures of Zorro, another preview theater presentation. Based on the character created by Johnston McCulley, The Adventures of Soto is a Mitchell Gertz production directed by Robert M. Light and written by Maria Little with High Aberback featured in the role of Zorro. Music was under the direction of Dion Romandi and written by Dwight Degnan. Original theme for Soto written by Irving Gertz. Now this is Gil Warren inviting you to join us next week at the same time when Warner Brothers KFWB will present Otto Kruger in The 13th Juror on your preview theater of the air. Stand by for the music box. The National Broadcasting Company presents Adventure Ahead. Today, Adventure Ahead takes you on what began as a title-searching trip in the Blue Ridge Mountains with the young lawyer, Jim Martin. This was Jim's first case and he expected to encounter only a simple problem in law. But soon he was caught up in a desperate struggle of the Stony Fork people to rid themselves of lawless swindlers. It's a yarn that springs from intimate knowledge of these people and the mountains surrounding them, because the author Hubert Skidmore was born in the Blue Ridge country. So, Hubert Skidmore's story of Hill Lawyer. This 
Mr. Stage to Stony Fork. Yeah. Okay. You the only passenger? I guess I am. You'd best sit up here beside me, then. Oh, thanks. I'll be all right back here. Sit up front, mister. Okay. Last fellow sat in back, shot the driver in the back of the head. Oh, I see. So you're not taking chances, huh? No, not on strangers. Yeah. You got business in the fork? Yeah, I'm up here to see a fellow named Sam Dodrow. Oh, are you the lawyer from Charleston? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm James Martin. Well, Sam, he named it about you coming. My name's Frank Frost. Well, glad to know you, Frank. I didn't know you back there. That's why I named it you should sit up here. I can understand that. You say the last fellow who sat in back shot the driver? What for? The payroll. Payroll? Yeah, killing another fellow made off with it. What payroll? Lardin Company. They send money in once a week. You ever had any trouble with it? A couple of times. But the logging company never sends money on the same day twice. Mm. I, um, I see you have a mail sack there, Some days they just send a letter. So there's always be mail sack going across. Mm-hmm. Then no one knows just exactly when the payroll will come through. No, but that don't keep us from getting stopped. Did the money come tonight? No, but nobody knows that but me. Yeah. Always running through here. Good place for him. Yeah, it certainly is. What? Good Lord, what's that? Oh! It... Oh! Who oh, is that stage? Bandits! Hang on, we'll run him first. Here! Here! Ah, this is just dandy. Lost in a strange country and in pitch black darkness. Who's there? What? Who's there, I say? Speak up, whoever you are. <coughs> what the devil? Say, <coughs> hey, who are you talking? <coughs> now, now, take it quiet there, boy. Let me go. You're mighty little to be fighting in the dark security <coughs> like, boy. Why? I thought you might be the bandit. Bandit? You mean somebody held up a stage again? Tried to, anyway. When? Where? Right where the road dips down into the mountains. What happened to Frank Frost? Frost? Oh, you mean the driver? Yeah, is he all right? I don't know. How come you're riding one of his horses? I was his only passenger. I'm up here from Charleston to see a fellow named Sam Dodrell. Oh, you must be the lawyer Sam told me about. I guess I am. Name's James Martin. Well, Jim, I'm York Allen, the doctor here. We're a little suspicious of strangers in Stony Fork. I can see that. Now, what about this bandit? Well, he attacked the stage just after we left the junction. Frank made a run for it, now distance him. And how did you two get separated? Well, Frost was afraid the masked man would cut over the mountains and head us off. Yeah, he he could have could have done that at that. There's an old uh, old turkey trail that leads over the mountains, comes out back of Sam Dodwell's. Well, anyway, Frost was afraid the bandit would take the shortcut, so he unhitched the team and each of us took a horse. Couldn't you keep up with Frank? Well, I couldn't even see him. It was so dark. That's how I got got lost. Well, come on, I'll guide you into the fort. Well, thanks. Oh, boy. Oh, oh uh, boy. say, York, huh? you mentioned an old turkey trail that leads over the hills to Sam Dodrell's place. Uh-huh. See, uh, Dodrell wrote me about a month ago, asked me to come up. <laughs> he didn't pick you for your size, did he? Well, I didn't figure size would have anything to do with it, since it was just a matter of coal claim a company's holding against him. Well, I can tell you, Sam can sure use a lawyer, providing you're not easily scared. I'll tell you what. I'll just take you to his place and introduce you myself. Come on. Sam Dodrell, meet lawyer Jim Martin from Charles. Hello, Sam. Hello, Jim. I'm here to see if I can straighten out your coal claim. Well, there ain't much size to you, is there? Oh, I don't think size matters much, Sam, since it's just a question of a point of law. I'm afraid there's more to it than that, Jim. Why? As far as I can tell, the company has no legal claim on Sam's property. Well, yes and no. Unless, of course, Sam made some oral agreement he didn't tell me about. No, I don't believe there was any spoken agreement. Well, then it's an open and shut case. The company has a three-year contract to remove timber from Sam's property, and that's all. Well, that part of it's simple enough. It's a question of coal that's causing the trouble. Coal? 
Well, there's no mention of coal in Sam's contract. That's just the point. When coal was discovered under the hill, it caused a lot of excitement. But the logging company's only interest was in the timber, wasn't it? That's what the folks all thought at first. Then they found out that the company was trying to take the coal, too. Well, they never had no right to it. There never was a word said about coal when they bought the timber. Sam's right about that. Well, then, that's simple enough. I'll just get a waiver on the company's claim from the company representative. You mean Fred Wolf? Yeah, I believe Wolf is his name. Yeah. Oh, he ain't the one to see. He isn't. Then who is? Oh, I ain't much good at talking, Doc. You tell him. He means Red Clute, Jim. Red Clute? As soon as coal was discovered, Red Clute moved in here with two other cutthroats named Stump Rogers and Bill Perkins. What do they have to do with the coal? Uh, quite a bit. You see, Clute, Rogers, and Perkins went around claiming to be lawyers and signing up folks. Signing them up for what? They promised the people to straighten out the scramble title to the coal rights and to get them a fair price. They'd give the people a dollar to sign some papers and then take the papers back. Mm, I'm beginning to get what you're driving at. Now, these papers were some legal trick that gave Clute the right to buy or sell the property for any price he wanted. Why, that's robbery. I could prove it in any court. I'm afraid you don't know much about the back hill places, Jim. There isn't any court. Well, there's a sheriff, isn't there? Yes. Uh, there's a man with a sheriff's badge on. Oh, you mean he works for Clute? That's right, Jim. Clute's got half a valley scared to death. Have you ever had a fight with Clute, York? Clute don't fight like that. If anybody gets in his way, him or Bill Perkins or Stump Rogers go squirrel hunting. First thing you know, somebody comes down from the hills to say they've found another body. You mean they even get away with murder? That's my word for it. Well, I can handle the legal end of it, but... I've had no experience in this kind of fighting. Well, we ain't been able to whoop it neither, son, so reckon none of us will think it might less of you if you'll back out. Sam's right, Jim. You're a lawyer, but this may be a case for a gunman, too. And as Sam says, you're not exactly the size Well, for maybe it. my size is against New York, but I came up here to help Sam Dodger get his coal claim straightened out, and I intend to. Well, if you feel that way about it. I don't reckon you fetched a gun, did you, Mr. Martin? Well, no, I don't suppose I'll need one. Well, you just might. Here. Of course, I ain't much use for this here hand pistol, but I reckon they're all right for common shooting. I don't know. I never shot one of these things. You better carry it, Jim. I always do when I know there's trouble ahead. Good morning. Is that the company office up there? Ain't you on the wrong side of the river, little man? I don't think so. This is the way to the company office, isn't it? You in here to buy coal? I can't see that's any of your business. I'm making it my business. I don't know your name, but I can guess it. Clute's the name. Red Clute. These here boys are my friends. And we're waiting for an answer to my question. Sorry, but I'm here on business. Will you men let me pass, please? Let me at him, Red. I'll make him talk. Get back there, Perkins. Keep your hands off him. I'll do the talking. But he ain't done nothing. I'll make him. Get him. back there, I said. Now, listen to you. I could bake a shrimp like you in two. I haven't time to argue about that. I just want to attend to my client's client. affairs. Client? Did you say client? That's uh, like I told you, Red. He's here for Sam Dodrell. Shut up, Rogers. How about that, pint size? If that's what you're here for, I'm the man you want to see. Right now, I want to see the company represent. I tell you, I got the coal rights on all the Dodrell land, and I'm telling you to keep off that property, or there'll be trouble. Thanks, Clute, for the warning. Come in. Mr. Wolf? Yep. I'm James Martin. Yeah, I know. Red Clute was just here. Said I could be expecting you this morning. I just met him on the path. I saw from the window. I'm here about the claim your company has against Sam Dodgers' land. Well, as far as I can tell, Clute plans to tie up all the property he can, and in time he'll sell it to the company. Well, I'm not interested in Clute's plans. All I want is a waiver from you to the effect that your company holds no claim on Sam Dodgers' place. I wouldn't advise anybody to interfere with Clute. Clute has nothing to do with this waiver. Oh, well, it won't make much difference to me one way or the other. Good. Then just sign here and here. Below. Uh -huh. All right, if it'll make you happy. Well, yeah. now uh, you satisfied? That's fine, Mr. Wolf. That waives any claim your company might have held on Sam Dodrell's coal. 
That's all you wanted of me? Oh, yeah. As far as I'm concerned, this waiver closes the case. Sam Dodrell's property is absolutely clear. And if you've finished what you come up here for, young fella, take my advice and uh, get out of this valley as fast as possible. We'll see about that. You know, men have been killed around here for a lot less than happened out there on the path between you and Red Clute. And maybe this town needs a cleaning. I know there's been a lot of things going on around here that shouldn't, but uh, you're mighty little to try fixing them, mister. Now, next time Bill Perkins decides to take a swing at you, Red Clute might not feel like stopping him. Well, I'll just go on minding my own business, Mr. Wolf, and that of my client. And thanks for the waiver. Good morning. Is Sam Dodwell home? Who are you? What are you wanting to know first? I'm Jim Martin, Mrs. Dodwell. A lawyer from Charleston. I'm trying to clear up Sam's coal title. Oh, well, land sakes alive. Sam, he named it to me about you coming. Oh, sit you down. Oh, it's thanks. a warm morning to be traipsing. Well, Sam asked me to come over this morning and look over his property, but I'd like to speak to him first. Oh, well, I'll call him. He's out in the barn. All right. Sam! Sam, that lawyer fellow's here. I never knowed what to tell you. Seems like it ain't been nothing but killing and shooting and shooting and killing. I don't think there'll be any more of that, Mr. Duck. Oh, I hope not, mister. If Sam was to... Well, if that was to happen, I'd go plumb out of my mind. Oh. Howdy, Mr. Martin. Hello, Sam. Well, our little case is all cleaned up. I was down to see Fred Wolf a while ago, and he signed a paper releasing all claim which the company might have had on your property. Oh. What did Red Clute say? Clute? I didn't mention it to him. Just the same Clute's out to get all the coal land it can, including mine. We'll handle him, Sam. Right now, though, I'd like to uh, make a trip around your place so I have an accurate description of the property to attach to this waiver. Now, be careful. No telling who you're liable to run into again the hill. Oh, I don't expect any trouble. Uh, where will I strike the north line of your property, Sam? Well, now, there's a jagged cliff. You can't miss it. Then the fence will start back down the hill, past an old abandoned cabin on the back property. You'll see it. Yeah, I'm sure I will. And uh, I may stop by again after I've ridden around. And please, Mr. Martin, don't let no shooting get started. Like Doc Allen says, one killing always leads to another. Uh, getting into the woods now, Danny. Don't scrape me off the saddle. Any these low branches, eh? That's a good girl. Yes. Pine needle's almost like a carbon. Should fight that jagged cliff, but... Yep. There she is. Now that'll be the north line. Now the... Bench... What's that? Those huckleberry bushes. A man. Lying face down. He's been shot. Good Lord, he did. It's Bill Perkins. Howdy. You're not going to shoot me, are you? Oh. Oh, it's you, York. Hello, I didn't hear you. I tried not to make any noise when I heard that commotion over here. He's dead. Who's dead? Bill Perkins. Shot in the back of the head. Uh-oh. Hey, that's not good. You better let me have your gun. Look, I never fired it. Well, I know you didn't do it, Jim. You have no reason to shoot a man you never seen before. He was dead when I found him. Well, that's your word for it. You see anybody else on the hill? Yeah, coming up through the woods, but he disappeared before I got a good look at him. When was that? Just before I found Perkins. What's that in your hand? What? That piece of paper. Where'd you get it? Oh, I found it beside Perkins' body. Hmm. Uh, looks like the corner of a heavy manila envelope. Yeah. It looks sort of familiar to me. I sure wish somebody else had found the body. Who do you reckon did it? Well, I'd say any one of four people. Four? Who? You and the fellow that you saw just before you found Perkins. That's two. Who else could have done it? Well, me, of course. I was close enough. But we know that's not true. That's three. Who else? Sam Dodrell. Oh, not Sam York. I left him at the house. Well, what of it? He could have beat you here, riding around the old turkey trail. Comes out just behind that abandoned cabin over there. Ah, Sam expected more trouble from... But even after I got the waiver from Fred Wolf, 
So maybe we ought to find him as soon as possible. Clute's mind works in a funny way. If he thinks he already has Sam tied up, he'll turn toward the next person in his way. And Jim, I imagine that might be you. Hey, who shot Bill Perkins? Well, Clute, I'd expect you to be at the head of a mob like this. Who shot him? You probably know as much about that as I do. Where was he killed? We found him on Sam Dodrell's property. Oh, Dodrell, eh? Where is that low-down coyote? Right here, Clute. Come as soon as I heard, Doc. Dodrell, you done it. You killed Bill Perkins. Don't start any trouble here, Clute. Who found him? I did. Oh, you shot him, didn't you, Jim Martin? You killed Bill because he beat you up this morning. You swore you'd get it. I never spoke a word to Bill Perkins, and you know it. I was there and heard you, and so did Stump Rogers. Yeah, that's right. You swore you'd get Bill after he beat you up this morning. Uh, I reckon there's only one thing to do with a dirty dog like that, huh, fellas? Uh, Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know, it seems to me you're lining up pretty fast, Clute. Martin didn't kill Bill Perkins. When I come on him beside Perkins' body, not one bullet had been fired from his gun. Could have replaced a bullet, couldn't he? Nobody but a fool be caught over a dead man with an empty gun. Now, listen, instead of letting Clute here run this valley, it seems to me you ought to get the sheriff and let him handle it. He ain't no good. He only done what he's told. Yeah. Wait, wait. The killing was done on my place. Yes, yes. Right. Clute named me once as the murderer. Now he's a tenant on Martin. Seems to me like he don't know what he's talking about. Yeah, how about that? And like Mr. Martin says... I figure we ought to get the sheriff in. Me and Seth will watch the place. You got my word for it. This fellow will be here when you get back. And while you're doing that, you might find out where Clute and Rogers spent the morning. Fred Wolf will name that to you. We was there in his back office talking to him for the last two hours. I reckon we'll check on that story. Come on, then. Now, Seth, if that skunk ain't here when we get back, I'm holding you and Mark responsible. Come on, boys. Yeah. Thank goodness Sam talked them into waiting. Now, where's the revolver, Jim? They'll want to see it when they come back. Lying on the table where you put it. I saw Clute was going to start trouble, so I went after it. Anyone see you? No, but when I picked it up, one bullet was missing. Ah, Clute's dead set to frame you, all right. Well, where'd you say the gun is? Right where you put it. Where I put it on the table. That's right. Well, it's not there now. What? Look for yourself. But it was there just a minute ago. Somebody's taken it. It's got to be here somewhere, York. It's no use, Jim. The gun's gone. But... If I can't produce that gun... Luke he must figure you're the next person in his way. And so far, he's framed you perfectly. You think maybe he took the gun? Him or Stump Rogers. What do we do? Head for Sam Dodrell's. Get the saddlebags. But if we run, York, it'll look like I'm guilty. We've got to have time to think. Come on. What about the guard? We'll slip out the back way. But, York, you... No time to argue. Luke's got them all stirred up now. A little more talk and they'll be ready for a lynching. <laughs> Howdy, men. I sort of figured you two would strike out for here. But took you so long. Came around back to the mountain to avoid Toot's gang. Frank Frost rode over a while back. He'd been down at the fork. What's happened? Clute's getting them all fired up and ready to hang Mr. Martin as soon as night comes out. Uh, two or three hours, not much time. Enough, maybe, because I think I've got a lead on who killed Perkins. What's that? Hell? I think so, but first I want to see the stage driver. Frank Frost? That's right, my companion of last night. But the company payroll didn't come in, you know that. That's just it. It still do. Well, yeah, but... It's just an idea of mine, York. If nothing happens, I'll meet you and Sam back here just before sundown. <laughs> Let's get started. Yeah, it's in a necktie party in quite a spell. Yeah, what are we waiting for? Now, don't be hasty, men, but I know how you feel. You all knew Bill Perkins, a fine man. Last time I saw him, he was going to help Sam Dodwell straighten out his coal claim. And for that, he was shot in the back of his head. Oh, come on, Red. You done told us that a hundred times. Yeah, but there's more to it than that. This Martin feller was in on it, too. Yeah, we all seen him running out of the doc's office with a gun. Yeah, yeah we know that. We know what we're after. Let's slide out after him. All right, men. That's how you want it. That's That's how right. Want it. All right, we'll start out in pairs. Hank, you take two men and make straight for Sam's place. All right, Red. Now, you, Nat, take a man and circle around the far side of the dot road. Which way are you and Roger going? We'll take the lower road, make our way across the hill. If we head for the junction, we'll stop him. <laughs> Oh, oh, Daddy. 
Jim. Is that you? Yes, yeah, sure. Sam and I were getting worried. I think I found something interesting. Well, you shouldn't be roaming the hills with a lynching party out. Everybody's gone crazy, even Frank Frost. Frost? What's he done? For the last hour, he's been telling Clute's gang that he's scared to bring the mail over tonight. Says this is the last day before payday and the money's bound to come tonight. Clute's bunch scare him? Well, not enough to for him to leave the payroll at the junction. Last I heard, he was all fixed up to go after. Good. But where's Sam? In the house. Sam! Sam! Yeah, Doc? We better get started, Sam. They'll be here any minute. Uh. York, remember last night you told me about an old turkey trail that led back to Sam's place? Sure. And last night you said that same trail cuts across the mountain and meets the road to the junction? Well, that's right, it does. In other words, a man on horseback could ride from the junction to that old abandoned cabin on the back of Sam's place without going through Stony Fork. Well, I reckon so. How about that, Sam? Well, can't use none much, but I reckon a fella could get through. Good. Let's get a move on, then. We don't want to run into Clute's gang. Yes, but where are we going? To the old abandoned cabin at the back of Sam's property. Jim, why we're hanging around this old cabin, I don't know. Where's the path leading in from the junction road? Down that away. Comes out in back of the cabin there. And get where you can keep an eye on the cabin, but don't make a move till I tell you, no matter what you see. Hey, listen. They coming from the junction road? Well, it sure sounds that way. Then do just as I say. I think luck is with us. Follow me. And don't make a sound. There's a light inside the cabin. I was right. It's Clute and Rogers. Clute and Rogers. We've got to get in there quick. What's that in Clute's hand? The company mail sack, Sam. Maybe with a payroll. A payroll? It is, by thunder. Here, I see it. It was them all the time using my place. Go down that gun, Clute, and come out. Shoot above his head, Sam. Don't the mail sack out in the window. Drop your guns and come out, Clute, or we'll shoot to kill. Oh, don't shoot. Let me out of here. Come on, Rogers, and bring Clute with you. Ah, Clute's done shot out the lantern. The cabin. He set it afire. Jim, Jim, come back here. Where are you going, boy? To get the mail sack. Come back, Martin. They'll shoot you down. The whole cabin's ablaze. They'll have to run for it. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. I'll have enough, men. Don't shoot up. I'm coming. Keep your hands up, Rogers. Move back. The whole cabin's in place now. Where's Clute? He won't come out. Nobody will ever get red alive. Well, I, I figure we can start back now. There ain't no wind. Nothing here about so burn. That ought to be Frank Frost. Hi there, Mr. Martin. Howdy, Frank. Howdy, Frank. Did you come here all right? Yes, Frank, it worked fine. Howdy. You all right? Sure. Went off slick to whistle. Ah, I done just what you said. You, you done what, Frank? Mr. Martin figured it was Clute after the mail last night, so he told me to spread the word around that the payroll was bound to come tonight, this being the last day before payday. Well, how'd you figure it was clued after the mail? Well, I first got the idea when I talked to Fred Wolf this morning. Fred Wolf? What did he have to do with it? Well, when he tried to protect Red, knowing that Clute was buying coal right out from under the company, I knew something was wrong. Hmm. Well, I figured maybe he tipped Clute off when the payroll was likely to be arriving. But how did you figure that Clute had tried for the payroll tonight? Remember how the men were roaring to lynch us when they left your office, York? Yeah, I was surprised at the time that Sam was able to talk Clute into waiting. Well, it gave me the idea that Clute had something else up his sleeve. I wondered about that myself. I took a chance and had Frank pass the word around that the money was sure to come tonight. Clute was using the posse to draw attention away from him and Rogers. Exactly. Remember that little uh, scrap of paper I found beside Perkins' body? The one you said looked familiar to you? Uh-huh. Well, I remembered the company envelopes I'd seen on Fred Wolf's desk and figured that scrap would match. But what gave you the idea that was using the old abandoned cabin on Sam's place? It was a perfect hideout. Now I begin to see why you were interested in that old turkey trail that leads across the mountains from the junction. Yeah, but who killed Perkins? 
And why? Red Clute. He thought Perkins got the payroll last night and refused to split. And you figured all this out from a little scrap of paper. Well, the scrap set me on the right track. I spent the afternoon here at the cabin making sure. But how could you be sure? I found the rest of the envelope. Is that you, Sam? Yes, Sarah. We got it all straightened out, Miss Dodrell. Yeah, next thing to do is get rid of that sheriff. What about you, Jim? You'd make a good sheriff. Ain't much size to you, but you got sense and you don't scare off easy. I was scared this morning down at York's place when I saw that bullet was missing. Ah, I wonder what happened to it. Hey, you, Rogers. Hey, come on. What happened to that bullet? Well, uh, I took it. I uh, figured it would make things look worse. Uh, and I took that gun. When I seen the bullet was missing, I took it so as Doc that you wouldn't get into trouble. Well, that clears it all up then. Well, come on in the house, Mr. Martin. I think the folks will like to see you. After all, you're part of the family now. <laughs> Lawyer is from the novel by Hubert Skidmore and was adapted for radio by Howard Carraway. The part of Jim Martin was played by Lawson Zerby. Others in the cast were Jim Bowles, Kermit Murdoch, Walter Vaughn, Richard Keith, Jack McBride, and Tony Merle. Music was conducted by Henri Nosco, and the production was under the direction of Herbert Rice. NBC and its affiliated independent stations present Adventure Ahead as a public service. <laughs> Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... You'll Be Dead in a Week, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Nine o'clock in the evening, somewhere out on the Strip to the west of Hollywood. In case you don't know, the Strip is a portion of Sunset Boulevard, which runs through and adjacent to some of the more exclusive residential districts between Hollywood and the Pacific Ocean. In the Strip are some of the more expensive shops, salons, and eating and drinking places. The Strip is not a portion of Los Angeles Captain Friday and his operative Skip Turner would be apt to patronize. Certainly not the flossy drinking establishments with soft lights, boudoir furnishings, and intimate music. And yet, here they are, Captain Friday and Skip Turner, uncomfortably seated on two small chairs before a two-small table in a half-lighted corner of Maggie's Intimate Drinking Salon. Hey, Captain. Huh? You sure enough trying to bore me to death. <sighs> you aren't any more bored than I am. Well, then what are we sticking here for? All this plush and soft lights and elegance. Business. We gonna do business in Maggie's intimate drinking saloon? <laughs> Not saloon. S-A-L-O-N? Salon. Well, pardon me while I arch my pinky. Hmm. I asked you a question, Captain. Did you? Yeah. What kind of business we got here in Maggie's place? By the way, where is Maggie? I don't know. Well, it says Maggie's saloon. Salon. Yeah. All the folks I've seen is a hat check girl out yonder, the one waiter, and the bartender in the next room. And you know, that ain't very many people. Not a very large establishment. Yeah. Seat about 20 or 30 at the most. That's what it means by Maggie's intimate drinking salon. Small, quiet, and exclusive. Yeah, darn exclusive, if you ask me. We're all the guests they got. Isn't there anyone in the other room? No. I can see in there. Nobody but the bartender and the piano player. That makes four of them and only two of us. Piano player, bartender, waiter, and hat check girl. Now, look at Cap, about this hat check girl. Skip, right it... at the moment, we're not interested in hat check girls. Who oh, ain't interested in a hat check girl? I... Oh, you mean the business we got here? Right. 
Oh. Okay, spill it. Just a minute. Waiter's coming over. Why? We don't want no more of this stuff. Order anyway. Huh. Uh, will there be something more, gentlemen? I guess so. Same as before. And you, sir? Yeah, bring me a glass of milk. Uh, milk? That's what I said, milk. I beg your pardon? Go on, get me a glass of milk and quit looking like you never heard of the stuff. I will see what can be done. Hey, and wait a minute. Yes. Why ain't that piano player in there playing? It is a little early in the evening yet. Well, it ain't early if he's got paying customers, is it? I will have to pick that up with him. You do that, will you? And tell him to rip off uh, the last roundup of the Dogtown Strutter's Ball, something like that. I will mention your suggestions to him, Dogtown Strutter's Ball. <laughs> no, I don't think he cares for me. Can you blame him? When did you take up milk as a beverage? Oh, I'm just ordering milk now on account of it makes our waiters a darn mad. He takes it as a personal insult. <laughs> hey, what's that? Letter? Well, yeah, I can see it's a letter. Hey, does it explain the reason for our being here? Yeah. Want to hear it? Why, sure. Kind of fancy paper, ain't it? Ain't that a girl's handwriting? Yes, it's fancy paper and it's a girl's handwriting. Anything else you want to know? Yeah, what's it say? If you'll keep still long enough, I'll read it. Okay, shoot. Letter's signed Eve Carson, girl who wired us in San Francisco. This is what she says. It will be very much to your advantage to meet me in Maggie's intimate drinking salon on the Strip sometime between 8 and 9 this evening. I will come directly to your table and join you as though I were an old friend. Please treat me as such. What I have to say to you will take only a few moments, but will mean a great deal to me as well as to you and your friend, Eve Carson. Is that all? That's all. And that's why we're here. Meet Eve Carson and treat her like an old friend. That's right. Yeah, let me have a look at that letter. Go ahead. Very much to your advantage to meet me. Hmm. Does she mean by that that uh, she's young and good-looking, you suppose? Yeah, give me that letter. Well, I always did say it was to a fellow's advantage to meet a young, good-looking girl. But look, you Cap, she said between eight and nine, and it's ten minutes after nine right now. Yeah, I know. You mean she ain't coming? Hmm. You know as much as I do. But if she's not coming... Hold it. Waiter's coming back. Mm-hmm. Well, hi, sport. See you found some milk. Quite. Sure, I knew you'd find some if you tried. However, I am to inform you this is positively the last milk I can serve. This is all, huh? Positively. Don't know any accommodating cows personally, I don't suppose. If you please. Okay, let it go. Hey, did you talk to the piano player? I did. Well, why ain't he playing? He is not so disposed. He's what? He is not so disposed. Now, what kind of talk's that? Did you tell him I asked for him to play? I did. What'd he say? I'd rather not say. Oh, he did, did he? Well, darn, he's ornery high. Hey, Skip, sit uh, but, down. But, son... Sit down. Here you are, waiter. Keep the change. Uh, thank you. Okay, beat it. With the greatest pleasure. Captain Friday, we're being insulted by the whole outfit. You started it. Me? You've been riding the waiter ever since we came in. Yeah, but I ain't done nothing to the piano player. I mean, not yet, I ain't. And you're not going to do anything to him, either. Just rough him up a little, maybe? No. He a friend of yours? No. Well, then what hurt? We aren't starting anything in this place until we know why we're here. Well, it don't look to me like we're ever going to know. My girlfriend Eve Carson said between 8 and 9, and it's 9.15 right now. Wait a minute. And... Somebody's coming in. Oh, sure enough. More customers. No women, though. You can see out in the hallway? Yeah, three men. Giving up their coats to the hat check girl. Huh. Funny place for three men to come without women. Well, after all, we came without women. For a reason. Besides, we expected to meet a woman here. And here they come. Yeah. Sitting down across the room from us. Queer looking set up. Skip. Yeah? Do you have to stare at them? Huh? Was I? Yeah. Now relax. Hey, do you see what I see? What do you see? Well, two of our three customers are gorillas. They're toting pistols and they don't seem to care who knows it. Huh. Well, on the flea bit side, don't seem to have much in common with the third member of the party. Yeah, he's a kind of nice looking fella, ain't he? Now, what you suppose he's doing associating with them kind of monkeys? Skip, stop looking in their direction. Yeah? Why? They know we're talking about them. They don't like it. So they don't like it. Now, look, Skip. We came here for a special purpose. We don't care why a good looking, well dressed, obviously cultured young man is associating with a couple of thugs. It's none of our business. Okay, fella. Hey, waiter. Now, what do you want? Hey, waiter. Uh, you spoke to me? That's right. 
Get me another glass of milk. I think I told you there is no more milk. Now, look, am I going to have trouble with you? I beg your pardon. Get me another glass of milk. Perhaps uh, you'd prefer to go to some other establishment. No, I wouldn't prefer to go to some other establishment. Get me a glass of milk and step on it. I will see what I can do. Well, go on and do it. Next thing he'd be wanting is a nursing bottle. <laughs> you hear that? <laughs> yeah. What are you antagonizing him for, Skip? You really don't want any more milk? I know it. It's just that I'm bored. Besides, he's been trying to hi-hat us all evening. Hey, will you excuse me for a minute? Skip, sit down. No, I got something I got to attend to. Well, at least tell me what you're up to so I can be prepared. <laughs> well, sir, I'm going in there and talk to the piano player for a minute. What about? Music, son, music. What do you talk to piano players about? Look, Skip, take it easy. This place is loaded with dynamite. Yeah? Yeah. Now, watch your step. Oh, shucks, Captain. Can't do no hurt just having a little music lesson. Well, hi, son. You the whole doggone symphony orchestra in this here joint? That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> Mind if I lean on your piano? Why not? Thanks. My name's Skip Turner. Yeah? Mm-hmm. That's my sidekick in yonder, Captain Bart Friday. So what? Oh, nothing. That's a funny joint you got here. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Why? Well, it's all dolled up like a woman's bedroom. If you don't like it, there's lots of other places on the strip. Sure, I know. Funny thing, though, it don't seem like this was the kind of place that would attract a couple of gun-slinging gorillas, now does it? Huh? What's the matter? There's a couple of trigger men in here now. Why, sure. You surprised? Why do you come in here and tell me? Sit down. Stop looking over your shoulder. And I still want to know why you came in here and told me. Just thought you might be interested. Oh, here comes the waiter with my milk. In here, waiter. You always drink milk? Not always. Sometimes more than others. How about having a real drink on the house? Nope. Thanks, just the same. Oh, you wish your milk served here? Yeah, I'll tell you. Hey, did you ever try sipping milk like wine? Tastes all right. Oh, oh. You threw that milk in my face. Yeah, I threw that glass of milk in your face. How dare you? Listen, son, don't ever try to serve me no Mickey Finn. Don't ever do it. Especially in a glass of milk. You threw that milk in my face. Look at my uniform. Hold. Maybe you want to make something of it? What's the matter with you, piano player? Sit down. This ain't your party. That's right. It ain't my party, is it? Oh, what about it, waiter? You want we should bounce each other around for a while, or she will call it quits? Bear, ill-bred clout. And there he goes. Call me an ill-bred clout on account I didn't drink his Mickey Finn. We don't save Mickey Finns in this place. The heck you don't. We don't save Mickey Finns in this place. Well, son, I'm awful sorry to have to differ with you, but that waiter shown up tried to dish me up one in that glass of milk. I think it's time you and your friends were leaving. Hey, is that friendly? You're more trouble than you're worth. Get your things and get out. You don't say. Yeah. You know, fella, you almost talk like you was the owner of this joint. I am. Oh, now, come on, don't give us that stuff. It says right on a sign outside the door that this is Maggie's drinking emporium. I'm Maggie. He... <laughs> no kidding. And I want you and your pal out of here in two minutes and just to prove it. Hey. You're now looking down the muzzle of a thirty-eight. Captain Friday and his right-hand man, Skip Turner rushed from San Francisco to Hollywood on a strange and mysterious mission. They were directed to Maggie's intimate drinking salon on the Sunset Strip, where they were to meet a certain Eve Carson. So far, all they've discovered is Maggie, and Skip has just found out that Maggie is a pretty tough customer. I'm Maggie. Hey. <laughs> no kidding. I want you and your pal out of here in two minutes and just to prove it. Hey. You're now looking down the muzzle of a thirty-eight. Well, during the fight. Hey, that was a cute trick, flipping a pistol out of your coat that away. Never mind the compliment. Gather up your pal and get going. Can you play that 38 as good as you play the piano? I hope for your sake I don't have to show you. Yeah. Well, I'm mighty glad to see you're standing up. What do you mean? Because I just hate hitting a fellow when he's sitting down. Oh, oh goodness, son. You sure did go down easier than I expected. Feeling kind of rubbery in the knees? Mm-hmm. Well, it's just like I always said, a fella shouldn't never ought to pull a gun unless he intends to use it. <laughs> fella, you're just playing out on your feet. <laughs> That's it. Sit down. Oh, 
Okay, sprawl on a piano, if that's how you feel. I gotta be getting back to Captain Friday. Nice meeting you. Be seeing you later. Hey, Captain, you... Well, I'll be doggone, a little old female girl. Where'd you get her, boss? Don't pay any attention to him. He's only Skip Turner. Hello, honey. Hello, Skip. She's ours all right, ain't she? What's that? I mean, she's the little old Eve Carson sugar we've been waiting for. Yes, yeah, she's Eve Carson. Where'd we get her? She came in while you were in the other room with the piano player. What happened? Oh, I had to smack him a little. He's in there now with his head in his arms, laying over the keyboard, listening to the birdies. And say, you know who he is? No. Do you? Why, sure, he told me. He's Maggie. Maggie? Sure, you know. Maggie's in him a drinking saloon. Salon, Skip. Yeah. Ain't that a heck of a name for a man? Maggie. His name isn't Maggie. But he said he owned this place. That's right, but his name isn't Maggie. Well, he can't amount to very much. Playing his own piano, acting as his own bouncer in his own little dive. That's where you're mistaken. Skip. Yeah? How did you get away with it? Well, you mean socking him? Yes. People don't smack Blackie North. Who's Blackie North? The owner of this place. The man you hit. A gang leader and plenty dangerous. Him dangerous? Yes, and what I want to know is why hasn't one of his trigger men shot holes in you? Trigger men? See here, who are you anyway? Eve Carson. Sure, we know that. But who are you? Why did you ask us to meet you in this hangout? Why is it to our advantage to meet you? Who's Blackie North and why does he have trigger men? And what connection have you with him? Well, that's a lot of questions. And I want a lot of answers. You'll get them. Don't worry. Yeah, and there's one more thing I want to answer, too. What's that? I want to know why that good-looking boy and them two gorillas across the room haven't taken their eyes off you since I come back to the table. And you'll get an answer to that, too. You mean those three men over there are in this, too? Yes. Those two rats are a couple of Blackie North's torpedoes. Yeah? And who's the good-looking dude? Oh, that's Wesley. Wesley, huh? Yes, my brother, Wes Carson. Oh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> Captain Matt, there's her brother, Wes Carson. Yeah, uh -huh. Apparently, Wesley doesn't like his sister out with a couple of strange men in a dump of this kind. And I don't know as I blame him so much at that. Hey, how about me going over and introducing myself and bringing them over here? Oh, no. Why not? For two reasons. First? Well, one of those gunmen will prob probably blow a hole in anyone who goes near Wes. You don't say. Second? What? You said you had two reasons for not going after your brother. Oh, oh second. Well, I... I've got to tell you why I asked you to come here before anything more happens. Oh, you're expecting something more to happen? Well, it's bound to since Skip here slapped Blackie North around. Okay. Relax and tell us about it. Well, first, I I've got to tell you who Wes and I are. We're the only members of our family left. I'm 24 and Wesley's 28. And between us, we're worth maybe a million, maybe two million dollars. Oh, God, little old female gold mine. Well, that's what a lot of the smart boys thought. Nobody's worked me yet. Yeah? Go on with your story, Eve. Oh, yes. We came to California about two years ago after Father, our last living relative, died in the East. We loved it out here. The first year, just getting acquainted. All the resorts and places to play. Oh, it was wonderful. Finally, about a year ago, we rented a house in Beverly Hills because Wes thought it would be fun to be near Hollywood and thought we might get acquainted with some of the motion picture crowd. What's all this leading to? To what's happening tonight. I'm almost through now. About two weeks ago, something happened to my brother. He was coming downstairs to breakfast one morning when he suddenly lost consciousness and plunged headfirst downstairs. Oh, I get it. He bumped his head in the fall and he ain't been the same ever since. And now he's mixing with gangsters. No, I I almost wish it was that. What did happen? Well, he wasn't hurt in the fall, but he went to our doctor to find out why he lost consciousness. And why did he? Well, that's the whole story. There's something dreadful the matter with him. Something incurable. I, I don't know much about it. All I know is the doctor told Wes, in a week, you'll be dead. What's that? Hey, he didn't. Yes, he did. In so many words... In a week, you'll be dead. You didn't just take one doctor's word for it. Oh, no. We checked with three other specialists. And they all say in a week your brother over yonder will be dead? Yes. Well, where do we come into the picture? Well, well, I heard about you boys. Read about some of your adventures. I mean, you sounded like the, the kind of men a couple of people in trouble could depend on. You're darn tootin', honey. Just a minute, Skip. Huh? Let's hear what you have in mind first, Miss Carson. 
Well, it's perfectly simple. Naturally, when Wes heard the bad news, he was hit pretty hard. He didn't make a big scene or anything, but he kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, What have I got to lose? And he's been running wild ever since? Well, he's been doing everything he can think of that amuses him. Hmm. And right now, it amuses him to be tied up with Blackie North and his bunch of cutthroats. Yes. And what do you want us to do? Look, he's only got a week more to live. Well? Well, if if you two could, could sort of look out for him, take care of him, protect him. Protect him from what? Why, why from himself, I, I suppose. <laughs> it's a funny assignment. Oh, no, it isn't. Look, you don't understand. Well, if he's got to die, at least he can die with a family name clean, not, not as a criminal. Well, say some more. What else? Well, that's, that's all. Get him out of Blackie North's clutches. Keep him out of the hands of the police. Keep him from losing his life in some crazy or criminal experience. Or from committing suicide when he's low in his mind. Keep him from hurting himself or anyone else for this week that's left. Hey, now, that's an order that is an order. In other words, your brother figures he's got just a week to live, so what difference does it make what he does or how he does it? Yes, that's it, exactly. Well, honey, uh, it ain't pleasant to say, but what difference does it make? Oh, no, he mustn't. He's fine and clean and good. He's always lived that way until... until this happened. He can't become something evil now, something that society once wiped out, something to make sensational headlines for the paper. Oh, no, he mustn't. If I get you right, you want us to curb his last week of fun just so you can write he was a good man on his tombstone. You're wrong. You were never more wrong. I want him to have all the fun and excitement he wants... All I'm asking is that you folks keep him out of trouble. Keep him out of jail. Keep him from harm or violence. Ah, so that's it. And him not caring what he does. Well, it's worth $10,000 to me. Ten grand? (coughs) Cappy, that ain't hay. You mean that? Ten thousand and expenses. And here's a thousand in small bills to show good faith. Yeah? What about it, Skip? Put that grand in your pocket before she changes her mind. All right, Miss Carson, it's a bargain. And a bad one, if I'm not mistaken. It won't be easy. The police are looking for Wes right now. What's that? Hey, you didn't tell us that. Why should I? Hey, Cappy, trouble's coming up. What sort of trouble? Well, I've been watching the hat check girl. This is the third time she's turned customers away. She keeps telling people the place is full up. Not letting anyone in, huh? Uh Uh-huh. Blackie North still unconscious on the piano in the next room? Yep, still laying just like a left. Miss Carson. Yes, I think our first move to help your brother will be to free him from those two trigger men over there. Well, they're just Blackie North's men. If you really want to help him, free him from Blackie North. Eventually. But first, we'll wrap up those two gorillas. Skip. Yeah. I'll go get them. Hey, what about me? You sit tight with Miss Carson. Keep an eye on the next room and especially watch the back door. Don't let anyone poke a gun through a crack and open up on us. Oh, you'll be shut down before you get halfway across the room to my brother. By those two men with your brother? Yes. <laughs> watch and see. Keep me covered, Skip. Dive in when I yell. You bet you. Why, Skip, what's the matter with Captain Friday? He acts like he was drunk. Yeah, good job acting, too. Staggering closer and closer to your brother's table. You you mean it's just an act? Yeah, he's almost close enough now. Now watch. Get him, Skip. You... <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, Captain, that's both of them. And now, if you'll excuse me, son, I'll tap that weight on the chin and make it 100%. <laughs> Hello, Wesley, old kid. Boss wants to talk to you. Say, what's the idea? Who asked you to crash my party? Sorry to butt in like this. Well, I was sitting here quietly drinking with a couple of friends. The next thing I know, you two have beaten them into unconsciousness. <laughs> Take it easy, fella. Well, who do you think you are, anyway? How about coming over to our table and talking it over? Why? Because I think that's how your sister would like it. She is your sister, isn't she? Eve, certainly. Now then, come on. Well, how do we do, Miss Carson? You boys are rather wonderful, you know that. Oh, how well, the lady does talk. Sit down, Carson. Hello, Wes. What's the idea, Eve? Are you the cause of all this? The cause of what, Wesley? Well, the whole Blackie North gang lying around like a bunch of stiffs. Even Blackie himself sprawled across his piano in there. Do you really mind? I mean, they're nothing to you, are they? Oh, why should they be anything to me? I just thought they might be amusing. But, Eve, if you think anyone's going to bounce Blackie North and his men around the way they've been bounced around tonight and not pay for it... Well, how about letting us worry about that, son? 
Well, who are you? Oh, I'm sorry. This is Skip Turner, and this is Captain Bart Friday. Will somebody tell me what this is all about? Sure. Your sister here has hired us to play bodyguard and fall guy for you during the next week. She told you I'd be dead in a week? That's right. And that during that time, I intend doing whatever it suits me to do? Yeah. And you two guys are crazy enough to agree to see me through? Why not? <laughs> suits me. You asked for it. Hey, you seem doubtful, fella. Well, naturally. Dangerous, huh? Unless you or the police put Blackie North out of the way, he'll get you. As sure as we're sitting here. Yeah, let's not worry about that for now. Your sister said the police wanted you. Eve, you told them... Why not? They're here to protect you from the police as well as everyone else. Is that on the square? Looks like it. We gave our word we'd see you through everything for a week. Well, if, if you mean it... We do. Now, why did the police want you? They don't know they want me. They just want the guy who stole this handful of diamonds out of a certain movie star's bedroom last night. Holy mackerel, Captain. Look at them diamonds. Anybody else know you stole them? No. Why'd you do it? Just for the thrill, just to see if I could. Mind if I take them? Sure, why not? What do you want them for? I you was know, just thinking how pleased the police would be to come along and find these diamonds in Blackie North's pocket. What's that? Yeah, and how surprised Blackie would be. You, you mean plant them on Blackie? Why not? Didn't you say that unless we finished him off or the police got him, he'd stop at nothing until we were dead? Yes, that's true. And we're doing two good deeds, helping the police capture a criminal and fixing it so we won't be murdered. Skip. Go out to the bar and get the police on the telephone. Tell them to hurry out to Maggie's intimate drinking saloon? Salon, Skip. Yeah. And what'll I say when they ask me who's talking? Oh, tell them you're a fairy godmother to all good policemen. <laughs> Man, that's something I always wanted to be. <laughs> fairy godmother to a policeman. <laughs> Captain, we're not going to be here when the police arrive, are we? Not at all. As soon as Skip has stirred up the police, I suggest we adjourn to the Carson home for a good night's rest. Yes, everything's prepared for you two to stay with us. No, I don't want to go home. But, Wes... I don't want a good night's rest. You know what I want to do? What do you want to do? I want to rob a bank. Wes... And I know just the bank I want to rob. Wes, you can't rob a bank. Yes, I can. For seven days, I can do anything I want to. And you've agreed to cover up for me. But why do you want to rob a bank? Because I've never robbed a bank. And in seven days, I'll be dead. Hi, Kathy. I tied up a hatchet girl and gagged her. Hey, you hear that? What's the matter? The police. They're coming. You mean you called them? I didn't have to. They got wind of something. Hey, we better get moving. Everybody out the back way. We can't get caught here. Carson, take your sister. Come on, Skip. Whoopee! <laughs> First it's Blackie North, and now it's the police. Come on, let's go. Here is a strange assignment for Captain Friday and Skip Turner. The guarding of a man who has only a week to live. Listen next week to the second episode of You'll Be Dead in a Week, entitled $200,000 to Lose. Next week, at the same time, you are listening to Adventures by Morse. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... You'll Be Dead in a Week, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Late yesterday afternoon, Captain Friday and his operative, Skip Turner, hopped a plane in San Francisco and hurried south to Hollywood on a very mysterious mission. They were instructed to meet Eve Carson at a place called Maggie's Intimate Drinking Salon. It's a flossy drinking establishment located on the Sunset Strip, an exclusive small shop district. The two boys landed at the municipal airport, hustled off the plane and grabbed a cab to their destination. They found Maggie's intimate drinking salon an intriguing spot. But they were even more intrigued with the story Eve Carson was telling them. Right from the beginning, Miss Carson. Well, you see, Captain Friday, my brother Wesley and I, 
came to California after father, our last living relative, died in the East. Between us, we're worth a million, maybe two million dollars. Oh, gone, little old female gold mine. Well, that's what a lot of the smart boys thought. Nobody's worked me yet. Go on with your story. We loved it out here and were very happy. Then about two months ago, something happened. My brother was coming down to breakfast one morning when suddenly he lost consciousness and plunged headfirst down the stairs. I see. Bumped his head in the fall and he hasn't been the same since. No, he apparently wasn't hurt in the fall. But he went to our doctor to find out why he lost consciousness. The doctor told him, Wes... In a week, you'll be dead. Well, you didn't take just one doctor's word for it. Oh, no. We checked with three other specialists. And they all say your brother will be dead in a week? Yes. I see. And, of course, we're very sympathetic, Miss Carson, but where do we fit into the picture? Ever since Wes heard the bad news, well, he just shrugged his shoulders and said, what have I got to lose? And he's been running wild ever since, huh? He's been doing everything that amuses him. Right now, it amuses him to be tied up with Blackie North and his bunch of cutthroats. Blackie North? Hey, you mean a gangster? Yes. But see here, I, I don't see where Please, we... Please, Captain Friday, if you could sort of look out for him, take care of him, protect him. Protect him from what? Why, from himself, I, I suppose. If he's got to die, at least he can die with a family name clean, not as a criminal. If I get you right, you want us to curb his last week of fun just so you can write, he was a good man on his tombstone. But this little conference wasn't the only thing that took place at Maggie's intimate drinking salon. Skip Turner, a little bored with the inactivity in a dimly lighted cocktail bar, picked a fight with the piano player and laid him gently across the keyboard. He did the same thing with the waiter and then tied up the hat check girl, while Captain Friday disposed of two of Blackie North's gunmen who had descended on them. It was all over before Skip learned from Wes Carson, the man they were hired to protect, that the piano player was none other than Blackie North himself. Say, what are you trying to do, fella? Commit suicide? Huh? That man you just knocked out is Blackie North. Well, what about it? You'll wake up some morning with a carcass full of lead. Who are you, anyway? Wes, please. They're friends of mine. Eve, are you the cause of all this? Do you mind, Wes? These gangsters are nothing to you, are they? No, they're just amusing. But Blackie North's a pretty tough guy. Somebody's going to get hurt. Who are these two fellows? This is Captain Friday and Skip Turner. How are you, Wes? Your sister here has hired us to play bodyguard and fall guy for you during this next week. Oh. She told you I'd be dead in a week? That's right. But during that time, I intend doing whatever it suits me to do. Oh, she didn't spare the horses, none. We know the score. And you guys are crazy enough to see me through? Well, we'll try to keep you out of jail. That may be more difficult than you think. The police want me, you know. Yeah? Why? Oh, they don't know they want me. They just want the guy who stole this handful of diamonds out of a certain movie star's bedroom. Hey, look at them rocks. Why'd you steal them? Just for the thrill. Just to see if I could. Anybody else know you took them? No. Hmm. Mind if uh, I take them? Not at all. I haven't any use for them. Well, what are you going to do with them? Here, Skip. Hmm? Plant these diamonds on Blackie North before he wakes up. <laughs> It'll be a pleasure. I'll go out to the bar and get the police on the telephone. We'll be doing two good deeds. Helping the police capture a criminal and fixing it so we won't be murdered. Hey, you hear that? The police are coming. Yeah, they must have got wind or something. Get rid of those diamonds quick, Skip. Right, boss. Come on, Eve. Wes, let's get moving. Moving where? Well, what would, uh, what would amuse you? I want to rob a bank. And so the little party left Maggie's intimate drinking salon and retired to the Carson home in Beverly Hills to plan a bank robbery. That was last night. This morning, Captain Friday and Skip are seated in the breakfast nook, wondering about their next assignment with Wes Carson. Hey, with all this leather upholstery on the window seat and the glass top on a table, this looks more like a cocktail bar than a breakfast nook. <laughs> I can see you don't get around much in Beverly Hills, Skip. No, and I ain't used to going without breakfast, neither. What gives? Miss Carson's preparing it, I believe. It's the maid's day off. Oh, this would have to happen to me. I'm starving. Oh, it may not be so bad. She seems a very practical girl. Yeah, but I wish she didn't have to practice on me. I... What you staring out the window for? The fog's lifting. Well, it always does about this time. What you looking at? Huh. Uh, just as I suspected. There he is on the corner. Who? One of Blackie North's gorillas. See him? Where? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the torpedoes we beat up last night. He's watching this house, all right. Uh, you want me to go out and dust him off? No, we got more important things to attend to. And don't say anything to Eve. Might worry her. Wonder if the police picked up Blackie last night. No, unfortunately, our little plan didn't work out. How do you know? No, I've already read the morning paper. That siren we heard was a police car, all right. But they were on their way to a club a couple of blocks down the strip. Yeah? What happened? Oh, the usual brawl. Movie actor and an orchestra leader. Well, then... Hey, that means that Blackie's got them diamonds and nobody knows it but us. It's about the size of it. We certainly played Santa Claus to Blackie last night. Now, watch it. Here's Miss Carson. Huh? Oh, good morning, Miss Carson. Good morning. Sorry to make you wait so long for breakfast. Mmm, hot cakes. I hope you like them. Please help yourself to the syrup while I pour the coffee. Could uh, we do anything to help? No, everything's under control now, I think. Please begin. <laughs> I don't need no urging. Mm, these hot cakes look delicious. Mm, and they are delicious. Man, pancakes are my favorite fruit. And these are the best I ever tasted. Hey, you certainly fooled me, Miss Carson. Fooled you? How? Well, you don't look like a babe who could hash. <laughs> <laughs> That's a left-handed compliment, Miss Carson. Skip means you're so beautiful and charming, he'd never suspect you could also cook. Oh, thank you. But I'm afraid I haven't cooked much since finishing school. Oh, you cooked in school? Well, of course. In the domestic economy class. We all had to take it. Well, blow me down. Hey, they're finally getting some sense in these colleges. Won't you have some more? No, thanks. Better save the rest of that batter for Wes. He'll be hungry when he wakes up. Uh, you're... You're sure he's all right, Captain Friday? Oh, yes. I only put one sleeping tablet in his drink last night. They're harmless. I do wish you weren't so set on robbing a bank. So do I. And if it wasn't for you and your pancakes, Miss Carson, I'd be tempted to take it on the lamb right now. But he is set on it. That's why I gave him the pill last night, so I could make a few phone calls. Do you think he can manage it? Safely, I mean. Well, Mr. Jordan's on his way here right now. Mr. Jordan? Uh, he's the manager of the city bank. Your bank, I believe. Oh, oh, yes, of course. Oh, Captain Friday, I love my brother. He's such a good, clean boy. Don't let anything happen to him. Please. We'll do our best, Miss Carson, but robbing a bank is dangerous business. I know. And and sometimes I, I think I shouldn't. But I do want him to be happy for this last week. Mm, probably Jordan now. He said he'd be right over. Where would you like to talk to him? Right here will do. I'll bring him right in. Hey, uh, you know this fellow Jordan, boss? Not very well. I've met him. Well, what if he won't go for the deal? I think we can handle him. Mr. Jordan says he knows you, Captain Friday. How are you, Jordan? Well, Captain, it's good to see you again. This is my right-hand man, Skip Turner. Oh, glad to know you, Mr. Jordan. Thank you. Well, Captain, I brought along Miss Carson's bank statement, but I must confess I'm a little puzzled by the mystery. I think I can clear it up for you. May I see the statement, please, Mr. Jordan? If it's agreeable to Miss Carson. Quite. Hmm. Well, it shows a balance of over 200000 in the checking account. Is that right? That's right. Two hundred grand. Mm-hmm. A face and a figure like yours and two hundred grand in the bank. And a good cook besides. Oh, the Lord sure good to some people. If you finished extolling the virtues of Miss Carson Skip, we'll get down to business. I'll be quiet. But you can't keep me from dreaming. Would you be willing to risk two hundred thousand in this, uh, this robbery, Miss Carson? Anything for Wes, Captain Friday. Good. We have a strange request to make of you, Mr. Jordan. Yeah? We want to rob your bank. Rob my bank? <laughs> but surely you're joking. No, we're in deadly earnest. We want to steal $200,000 of Miss Carson's money out of your bank. But I don't understand Mr. It. Jordan, you know my brother, Wesley. Of course I know Wes. We handle his account as well as yours. Well, he... He'll be dead in five days. Where? Wes dead? That's the prophecy of the best doctors on the coast. But but I can't believe it. He looks so healthy. Why, only yesterday I saw him. Nevertheless, and... Mr. Jordan, we have it on the best authority that Wesley Carson will die within five days. Apparently there's nothing medicine can do about it. Oh, Miss Carson, I'm so sorry. Wes is such a fine young man. Now, you can well understand that Miss Carson wants her brother to enjoy all the happiness possible during these last five days. But of course. And if there's anything I can do... There I... is. A lot you can do. You can let him rob your bank. It's an impulse he's had since childhood. And now he feels there's no longer any reason for repressing it. Oh, I see. Here's our plan. Miss Carson will give you a check for $200,000. You distribute this money among your tellers. We'll stage the robbery, enter the bank, and steal Miss Carson's money. Will you cooperate? Uh, well, of course I'd like to help, but robbing a bank, there are difficulties I'm sure you haven't thought of. Difficulties? 
Well, what are they? Well, in the first place, we're insured against robbery. You'd have to have an understanding with the insurance company. I talked to the president of the insurance company last night. He's agreed to delay the investigation for six days. After which time, all the stolen money will be found in an ash can at the rear of the bank. Then you can tear up Miss Carson's check. Well, if the insurance company's agreeable, but what if something goes wrong? Well, you're protected. You have Miss Carson's check. You owe her nothing. You're out nothing. Have you fixed it with the police? No, I don't think they'd approve. And secondly, I'm afraid Wes might suspect. Yeah, and as long as we're in this, we might as well enjoy it. I'm afraid I don't share the same craving for excitement. When would this hold-up take place? This afternoon. Skip, Wes, and I will enter the bank about ten minutes to three, just before closing time. You mean you want to stage this robbery in, in broad daylight? Why not? But Wes is well known at the bank, and a lot of people know you. You'd be recognized immediately. You leave that to us. I can assure you none of us will be recognized. You mean you wear masks? Mm, something like that. But I have a gun in my desk. I'd be forced to use it. I know. Top drawer, left side. Just leave it in the same drawer and you won't have a chance to use it. Mm, but the more I think of this, the more ridiculous it seems. Robbing a bank in broad daylight. You, you can't get away with it. Well, it has been done. I know, but they were professionals. And besides, they're usually caught sooner or later. And another thing. There's an electric button under every teller's window. The moment one of them got suspicious, a light uh, touch on one of these buttons would bring the police. Well, the tellers won't touch any buttons. Not if we have them covered. Well, those tellers are mostly girls. I'd never forgive myself if anything happened to one of them. Nothing worse than a fainting spell, I assure you. Oh, I'll take care of the ladies. How's my department, Mr. Jordan? And they'll have something to talk about for the rest of their lives. You're forgetting about our guard. He also carries a gun. Oh, Hennessy? I'll take care of him, too. I don't know. He's a good man, Hennessy. Well, good men are my specialty. And it's settled? Uh, will you write out a check for 200000 Miss Carson? Not so fast, Captain. I haven't agreed to anything. Mr. Jordan, put yourself in the place of Wes Carson. Please, Mr. Jordan. He only has five days. I, I know, Miss Carson, but, but robbing a bank... You've nothing to lose, Jordan. To all outward appearances, this will be an ordinary hold-up as far as you're concerned. If we're caught, we'll take the rap. Why, I could lose my position or, or land in jail. Not at all. You're not to implicate yourself in any way. Well... Well, then, is the check ready, Miss Carson? Here it is. $200,000 drawn on Mr. Jordan's bank. Well, I'll try. Oh, that's the way to talk, fella. We'll have a lot of preparations to make, Mr. Jordan, so you'll excuse us if we rush you off. We'll see you later in the day. Good heavens, you really mean you're going to do it today? At ten minutes to three. Oh, dear. Well, all right. But I warn you, I'll have to do my best to stop you. Of course. That's the way we want it. We'll take our chances. Well, goodbye and good luck. I certainly hope everything goes off smoothly. You don't know how grateful I am, Mr. Jordan. I'll see you to the door. Oh, dear. Ten minutes to three. Come on, Skip. You've got to wake Wes and then do some shopping. And then rob a bank in broad daylight. <laughs> Man alive, this is right down my alley. busy morning for Captain Friday and Skip. After waking Wes Carson and finding him none the worse for having taken a sleeping pill the night before, they left him eating a hearty breakfast while they departed on a shopping tour. The tour included a Hollywood studio arsenal, where they procured several rounds of blank cartridges, and a Hollywood costumers, where Captain Friday selected a number of articles of clothing and makeup items. They're now in an upstairs bedroom of the Carson home, getting ready for the big adventure... The robbing of a bank in broad daylight. Well, how do I look, Cap? Like a real ranch hand? <laughs> I'd say a cross between a ranch hand and a member of a hillbilly band. <laughs> <laughs> These blue jeans are a little tight. Well, that's in character. All cowboys wear them tight. Yeah. I gotta get used to these high heel boots, too. Feel like I'm falling down all the time. You better get over that feeling quick. In the slightest mistake this afternoon, we'll all be falling through a hangman's trap. Hmm. Hey, you think we can depend on Carson keeping his head? I can't tell what he'll do in the excitement. We'll have to watch him close. Have you put the blanks in his gun? Oh, not so loud, Skip. Carson's in the next room. Yes, all the guns are carrying blanks. Oh, don't trust me either, huh? Of course I trust you. But I know there's nothing like the sound of a gun going off to let people know you mean business. Hey, you mean we may have to let somebody know we mean business? I don't think so, but we're ready if we have to. I'll get it, boss. 
Well, howdy, partner. <laughs> Just drove a hundred hay to candle down from the bar X. Yeah, mighty thirsty, and so am I. How about a water in my stock while I wet my whistle? <laughs> Good boy, Wes. You're a born rancher. Think I'll do? Sure you will. Oh, come in, Miss Carson. Isn't Wes wonderful? With that blonde beard, I'd never know him in a thousand years. Yeah, and that ten-gallon hat makes him six inches taller. Yeah, let's see, Wes. Let me look at you. Blue serge suit, cuffs tucked into high heel boots, stiff collar, bowstring tie. Yep, you'll do. You're a wealthy cattleman if I ever saw one. Gee, this is exciting, isn't it? I never had so much fun in my life. <laughs> I had an awful time getting him away from the mirror. You should have been an actor, Wes. <laughs> well, how you like me, Miss Carson? Of course, I ain't a wealthy cattleman like Wes and Captain Friday here. Me, I'm just a poor ranch hen that drives that big car and does all the dirty work. I love your long sideburns. <laughs> and that false nose makes you look positively beautiful. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, if you saw me on the street, would you know me? Well, if I did, I, I don't think I'd admit it. <laughs> but seriously, boys, the disguises are wonderful. Even though Mr. Jordan knows you, I don't think he'll recognize you in those outfits. I hope you're right. Our lives may depend on it. Now let's go over our plan again. Uh, <clears throat> I'll get in character by rolling a cigarette. Get this now, both of you. We'll drive Miss Carson's sedan up to the curb in front of the bank. There'll be a piece of blanket hanging from the trunk in the rear. The end of the blanket will cover the license plate. That sounds all right. Naturally, I don't want Eve implicated in any way. Now we're at the bank. We go in together. Skip a little respectfully behind Wes and me. Mm -hmm. We go straight to Jordan's office behind the little wooden railing, Wes. What do you do, Skip? Hmm? Oh, I look for Hennessy. He'll probably be around the counter in the middle of the floor. Hennessy? Oh, oh yes, that's the guard. He ought to be easy to spot in his uniform. Oh, I'll find him. And then I ask him to show me to the washroom. It's in the rear of the building. Hennessy prides himself on being a gentleman, so I think he'll escort you back there. Well, if he don't, I'll have a gun in his ribs. He'll be polite, all right. When you get to the washroom, you tie him up and gag him. You got your materials? Mm-hmm, right here. Lariat and yellow scarf. Good. Then you get back and cover the entrance. Let anybody come in that wants to, but don't let anybody go out. <laughs> Over my dead body. Well, let's hope not. Yeah. Meanwhile, Wes, you and I are sitting in Mr. Jordan's office. Mm -hmm. We're a couple of ranchers from San Fernando Valley, and we want to negotiate a loan. Right. We discuss the terms of the loan with Jordan until we see Skip return from the washroom and go to the entrance. But what if Skip needs somebody else back there in the washroom? Oh, I'll take care of him. This rope's pretty long. Oh, oh well, Wes, must you go through with this? So many things can happen. Oh, don't worry, sis. We'll have a picnic. Yeah, this ain't no time to get scared. Granting everything's okay and back. If everything's okay, I'll walk through the bank, and then when I go by Jordan's office, I'll take off my hat and wipe my forehead. And when you get that signal, Wes... I remark on the heat and ask Jordan where I can get a drink of water. Now, I don't know what Jordan will say, but I do know there's a water cooler in the teller's cage adjoining Jordan's office. If he suggests the cooler, he'll probably open the door for you himself. If he doesn't, I will suggest it. You can see it from the office through the grill work. Mm -hmm. I go into the cage and get a drink from the cooler. Now, some of the tellers will probably look around as you enter the cage, but as you take a paper cup from the holder and pour yourself a drink, they'll probably continue their work. I finish my drink and whip my gun out of my coat pocket and order all tellers to step back two feet from their windows. By this time, I'll have taken Jordan's gun from his desk drawer. With the gun in Jordan's back, we'll both go into the cage. I'll have the tellers covered, all five of them. I take this sack from under my hat like this, and then I go to work in the number one teller. Right. You order him to empty his drawer into the sack. Then you go on to the next teller. If all goes well, it shouldn't take more than 30 seconds to empty all five drawers into the sack. Then we back out the same door we came in and break for the entrance. Ah, uh, not break exactly. Walk. Don't run. A lot of people in the bank won't even know what's going on. The less commotion we make, the better. Yeah, and don't forget your sack with. <laughs> oh, no. It's full of money, and I've got it under my arm. I walk outside and get in the back seat of the car. I get in the front seat and start the motor. But what if you're jammed in? You know, a car in front and a car in back. In Beverly Hills, cars park facing the curb. Nothing can get in front or back of us without blocking the street. Oh, of course I know that. I, I guess I, I'm so nervous I can't think. Now... I back out into the street facing south. Skip? Uh, I keep the entrance covered until I see you're ready. Then I run and jump into the front seat beside you. And we're off. Once we get into the canyons and the hills, we'll change our clothes and get rid of our disguises. We stuff the blanket into the trunk so our license plate shows. We drive calmly back here and park the car in the garage. Once we get that sack of money in the house, we're safe. Oh, sounds great. When do we start? And let's see. It's 2.30 now. Take us about ten minutes to get there. Ten minutes more to get the right parking space. Yeah, we'd better be on our way now. I'm ready. Let's go. Goodbye, Wes. Let me kiss you. Oh, don't worry, Eve. Everything will be all right. But how will I know? 
When will you be back? It shouldn't take us more than 15 minutes to change clothes afterward. We should be back here in uh, 45 minutes. I have a feeling this is going to be the longest 45 minutes of my life. So have I. Come on, let's get it over with. You see, gentlemen, the appraisal of the property... Mr. Jordan, may I see you for a moment? Yes, of course, Mr. Littell. Uh, would you excuse me for a second? Yes, certainly, Mr. Jordan. Only take a second, I'll be right back. Watch it now, Wes. Skip has taken Hennessy into the back room. He should be back by now. And we can't make a move till Skip's at the front door. What if he doesn't show up? Don't worry about Skip. He'll hold up his end. Will we just stall along with Jordan? That's the idea. Watch it. Here he comes back. As I was saying, gentlemen... You must understand that I couldn't make a loan until I'd had your property appraised. Uh, that may take several days. Well, I'm feared you can't wait that long. See, we need the money now. We've got a bargain in some beeves up north, Mr. Jordan. Uh, what time is it? Eh, uh, almost three o'clock. Why? Oh, I don't know. Just wondering. Yeah, I guess it ain't time to visit no other banks today. They all close before sundown, don't they, Mr. Jordan? Yes, I'm afraid nearly all banks close at three o'clock, including our own gentlemen. Well, we don't seem to be doing no good here. See anything of Bill? Oh, don't worry none about Bill. He'll take care of himself. <laughs> Bill's one of our ranch hands, Mr. Jordan. He don't get a chance to come to town very often. Uh, why don't you gentlemen come in early tomorrow? We'll have more time to talk over your loan. I'm sure we can work it out some way. Early? Say about uh, cock crow? Cock crow? Ha, <laughs> ha. I always forget you city fellas don't know how to talk time. Cock crow's five o'clock. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, I'm afraid that's a bit early. You see, we don't open our doors to the public until... Uh... There's Bill. Where? Yep, I see him. I told you you didn't have to worry none about him. Mm, he must be pretty warm. Bill's taking off his hat and wiping his head. Yeah, it is pretty warm in the city, especially when you're dressed up in your Sunday clothes. Have a drink of water handy, Mr. Jordan? Water? No, I'm afraid Ain't we don't. Ain't that one of them newfangled water coolers in that there cage? Oh, yes, but we don't usually... Go on in, help yourself. Mr. Jordan won't care, will you? Oh, no, 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 of course not. But I'll have to unlock the door to the cage. Mm, sorry to be so much bother. When you're so dry, you're chewing on cactus. There you are. Cool is over there. Hey, what are you doing in that drawer? Button your lip, Jordan. Now ahead of me. Into the cage. It's you. Why, I didn't recognize... Pipe down and do as you're told. Uh, uh, yes, sir. All tellers, hands over your heads. Step back two paces from your windows. Oh, hold it, sir. Hold it up. Hold it up. Hold it up. You there, Blondie. Back two paces. They're all back. Get going with the sack. Now, you. Dump your drawer into this sack. Keep your hands up and your heads down. All right. Number two. Into the sack. Uh, you, you'd better do as he says. Yes. Number three window. Empty your drawer into the sack. And don't spill any. Now number four. Thank you, miss. One more. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd advise you to stay away from those buttons. The first person who touches one gets a bullet. That's Bill out there in the doorway. He can hit a dime at a hundred yards. Come on, bring the sack. Back and out. Keep him covered. Take it easy, Wes. Here's the car. I don't see Skip yet. Keep your eye peeled. I'm ready to go. Here he comes. Come in. We made it. But there's a soldier signaling us. Oh, no time for hitchhikers now. He's an MP. Look at his armband. Yeah, waving us down. I'll slow down. Hey, look, there's somebody coming from the other side. They're jumping on the running board. All right, get him up and into the back seat. We're covered from both sides. Why, that punk keep him covered, Porgy. Blackie North, in a soldier's uniform. That's a federal offense, fella, you know that? Look who's talking. I got him now. Take the wheel, Porgy. Blackie North, the gangster from Maggie's Intimate Drinking Salon, apparently heard of a bank robbery deal and had his guerrillas on hand to collect the $200,000 without even going near the bank. On top of that, he still has the diamonds that Captain Friday and Skip Turner planted on him in the hope the police would find them. A pretty good day's work for Blackie North. Listen next week for the third and last episode of You'll Be Dead in a Week. You are listening to Adventures by Morse.
Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... You'll Be Dead in a Week, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder... Come with me. Four o'clock of a sunshiny afternoon in the green foothills north of Hollywood. A sedan raises clouds of dust as it ascends a rising, winding dirt road toward the uninhabited summit. Looking on this innocuous scene, no one would suspect that Captain Friday, Skip, and Wes Carson are prisoners in the back of the sedan. Half turned in his seat, alongside the driver, is a man dressed in a soldier's MP uniform. He rests a gun on the back of the seat, keeps it pointed at the three in the back. While an army uniform is sacred to most of us, it isn't a Blackie North, notorious gangster. He used this disguise to trap Captain Friday and his companions after they had successfully robbed a bank. But we're getting ahead of our story. We'll start back at the beginning. Last night, Captain Friday and Skip were summoned to Maggie's intimate drinking salon on the Sunset Strip by a mysterious letter. Eve Carson, Beverly Hills heiress, was the writer. Yes, I wrote that letter. I've come to you for help. I'm in trouble. What sort of trouble? About two months ago, my brother Wesley lost consciousness and fell downstairs. Affected his brain? No. No, he's apparently as alert and healthy as ever. But when he went to our doctor to find out why he lost consciousness, the doctor told him, Wes, in a week you'll be dead. Well, you didn't just take one doctor's word for it. Oh, no, Captain Friday. We checked with three other specialists. They all say in a week your brother will be dead, huh? Yes. Only... Only two days are gone already. I see. Well, of course, we're very sympathetic, Miss Carson, but where do we fit into the picture? Ever since Wes heard the bad news, he's been doing everything that amuses him. Right now, it amuses him to be tied up with Blackie North and his bunch of cutthroats. That's Wes now at the table over there. That clean-looking fellow with those two gorillas? That's your brother? Yes. Oh, if, if you could sort of look out for him, take care of him, protect him... Protect him from what? Well, wait, from himself, I I suppose. If he's got to die, at least he can die with a family name clean, not as a a criminal. If I get you right, you want us to curb his last week of fun just so you can write he was a good man on his tombstone. I, I want him to have all the fun and excitement he wants. All I'm asking is that you keep him out of trouble, keep him out of jail, keep him from harm or violence. It's worth $10,000 to me. All right, Miss Carson. It's a bargain. And a bad one, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Captain Friday took the job of watching over Eve's brother, Wes Carson, during his last five days. But, as he put it, it was a bad bargain. Wes had become entangled with Blackie North, a Southland gangster who was only one step ahead of the police. To further complicate matters, Wes, just for the thrill, had stolen a handful of diamonds from the home of a movie star. Captain Friday solved this problem by planting the gems on Blackie North, then called the police, hoping they would search him, find the gems, and stow him away safely behind bars. Before they were able to accomplish this, however, Wes Carson came up with a startling announcement. He wanted to rob a bank. But here's Captain Friday to tell you about that. Yes, Wes wanted to rob a bank, and there was nothing to do but humor him. We arranged for him to rob his own bank by having his sister deposit $200,000 with a cashier before the robbery took place. Wes, of course, didn't know about this, and everything went off as we planned it. Wes picked up all the money in the teller's cages. We backed out of the bank and ran for the car parked at the curb. Skip Turner covered our getaway. I'm in. We made it. Look, there's a soldier motioning us to stop. Hey, no time to hitchhike us now. He's an MP. Look at his armband. We can't turn the corner without running over him. I guess we better stop and see what he wants. Hey, there's somebody coming at us from the other side. They're jumping on the running board. All right, get him up and into the back seat. Into the back seat before I drill you. Blackie North in a soldier's uniform. That's a federal offense. <laughs> Look who's talking. Take the wheel, Poggy. I'll take their guts. 
And I don't want to hear a peep out of anybody for ten minutes. You get it? Suckers, hands in the air. And get out one at a time. You first, Friday. I got them covered, Blackie. You next, Carson. And no funny stuff or I'll drag gulch every one of you. Well, you certainly turned the tables on us, Blackie. Now you, wise guy. Just call me Skip. And keep them hands up. Hog is a little nervous with his trigger finger. You said it, Chief. It is kind of vitchy. Now get moving, single file, towards those trees. Bring the rope, Hoggy. Coming, Chief. If you want to play soldier, why aren't you in the army, Blackie? Because the army's full of dopes like you guys. I'm smart. I'd rather play you, see? How'd you get that uniform? Roll some poor soldier? People are always giving me things, like diamonds and gunny sacks full of dough. Halt! Well, I must say I approve your taste in nature, Blackie. This is a beautiful spot you picked. You won't think it's no picnic before I get through with you, Carson. What are you going to do, burn us at the stake? you pray for burning before long. Lay down, you two. Heads facing that tree. You on one side, Friday, you on the other, wise guy. You mean lie down on the ground? Afraid of soiling your pretty panties? Get down there quick before I bust your skull open. Okay. No need to get rough, Blackie. No? What about that pink tea you gave at my place last night? Yeah, what about it? I got a memory like an elephant. You got a nose like one, too. Yeah, I got it last night. And I ain't forgetting that, neither. Shut up, Skip. You're only antagonizing him. All right, you guys. Shove your heads against the tree. Yeah. Like this? Okay. Now put your arms around the trunk. Now flatter your back. Anything you say, Blackie. All right. Go to work with that rope, Poggy. Yeah. Get their arms around the tree and tie their wrists. I got... Hey, I feel neglected. Don't I deserve some attention? We yeah. got something special in mind for you, Wes. How'd you know we were going to rob a bank today, Blackie? <laughs> you small-time operators. You thought I was out cold last night. You mean you were playing possum? It'd take a better man than that wise guy you got with you to knock me out. Let that be a lesson to you, Skip. Always be thorough. Fine time to be given out with lectures. There. There, I guess they won't slip out of them knots. Let me see them. Yeah, they're good nights. Yeah. But slip them a little tighter. Jenny. These guys got too much circulation already. Okay, they see. There. How do you like that? <sighs> Fits me just like a tourniquet. Now get their feet, Porgy. Yeah. The same kind of nuts. Same kind. And you, Carson, keep those hands up. Oh, how about putting them behind my back or something? I've been holding them up a long time. You keep them up there. I'll show your fingers off one by one. Yes, sir. Hey, listen. What's that? What, Chief? I thought I heard a car. Wouldn't be no cars up here. Probably the police after the bank robbers. I didn't hear nothing, Chief. Well, hurry up with that rope. Okay. Since you overheard everything last night, Blackie... Then I guess it was your man you had staked outside the Carson home this morning. Sure. We've been tailing you all day. Congratulations. I only saw him once, through the window. You hear that, Poggy? That'll cost you. The fog went up like a scared window shade, Chief. It never did that before. Don't let him jip you out of your share, Poggy. Shut up, you. All them ropes, Poggy. Well, they're all tied up like fish in the net, Chief. Yeah, good and tight. Good job, Poggy. Yeah. Maybe I won't find you for that lousy tailing job this time. Thanks, Chief. Say, I can't stand this much longer. Can't I rest my hands and my head? I'm giving the orders, and I said keep them up. I'll get around to you just as soon as I tend to a little unfinished business. And now you, wise guy, you beat me up last night, didn't you? Well, I didn't even hurt you. You said so yourself. But you meant to, and now it's my turn. How do you like this, wise guy? Oh, look here now. You can't kick a man when he's down. Oh, can I? Just watch. Oh, you oh, dirty... Oh, oh, oh. Uh, Look at that flying tackle. Head up, boy, Wes. Get him. Uh, Hoggy, hit him on the head. Don't shoot. Hit him. Get his head out in the open, Chief. That's it. Uh, I guess that'll stop our little football player. Hit him right back in the ear with a butt, Chief. Good aim. You've yeah. killed him, Blackie. Nah, he'll be all right in a couple of years. If he dies, you'll go to the chair. You know that. <laughs> Who'll tell on me? You guys are going to lay here till you rot. Won't do you no good to yell, neither. Nobody can hear you up here. Listen, Blackie, I don't care about myself, but you'd better take Carson to a hospital. He's bleeding around the ear. He asked for it, didn't he? <laughs> so long, you guys. Hope you enjoy the wine. Come on, Porgy. How are you, Skip? Okay. Hurt much? Oh, just a couple of busted ribs. Uh, is Wes breathing? Can you see? Yeah, I think he's breathing all right. He's in a bad way. We've got to get him to a hospital. Yeah. 
Any ideas how we're going to do it? Yep, there go our friends. Yeah, I'm glad to see him go if you ask me. But Porgy must have spent some time at sea. The more I work my wrists, the tighter these knots get. Yeah, same here. Yeah, we're in a pretty pickle, all right. Hey, I wonder if it'd do us any good to yell. No, nobody'd come up here, even on a hike. Yeah. Makes you feel kind of alone. Yeah. Skip. Yeah? I've got a hunch. What? I think Blackie made one big mistake. What? Tying us both to the same tree. I don't get it. Look, if you slide around a little, your wrists would be directly in front of my face. Try squirming around. Okay. Is that your nose I feel? Don't poke your finger in my eye. Hold it. And what you gonna do, stare those knots loose? Yeah, just as I thought. This isn't rope at all, it's sash cord. Well, same thing, ain't it? But it isn't nearly as thick. Hold still. Now, what you doing? Uh, chewing on the rope. I'll make it too, if my teeth hold up. You mean you're trying to chew through the strands? Well, that'll take days. Worth trying anyway. Besides, it doesn't taste bad at all. Blackie North and his torpedo Porgy overheard the planning of the fake bank robbery and devised a means of cutting themselves in on the $200,000 taken from the bank. The two gangsters, wearing army uniforms, stopped Captain Friday's car, drove to a secluded spot in the Hollywood Hills, and after knocking out Wes Carson, bound Skip Turner and Captain Friday to a tree. The only possibility of escape seemed to lie with the captain's efforts to chew through the sash cord with which Blackie North had tied them. How's it coming, Cappy? It won't be long now. I'm on the last strand. Well, can you hold out? It's getting pretty dark. My jaws are tired and my mouth's full of rope. Well, why don't you rest a while? You've been at it for hours. Only three by your wristwatch. It seems a lot longer. It's getting black on an infidel's heart. Has Wes moved? Mm-mm, he got cold. That's an awful gash he's got behind his ear where Blackie hit I hope he isn't dead. Poor kid. Well, I can't stop now. Time may save a life. Yeah, go ahead and all. You'll get in some place all right. I can feel the cord given. Hey, I'll pull on my wrist. It may help some. You know, I ain't sure, but I think I heard West side just now. You know, you got to hand it to that kid. He's got what it takes. Yeah. And if we'd all pitched in on Blackie like he done, we might not be in this pickle. But then, on the other hand, we might all be laying flat like Wes. Yeah, I guess we had a better chance this way. Keep going, Captain. I'm helping all I can. <coughs> hey, I'm loose. You did it, Captain. Uh, thanks to a good dentist. <laughs> now, wait till I get this rope off my wrist and find my knife. That's another mistake Blackie made, not frisking us. Yeah, well, how was he to know you had a row of razor blades in your mouth, Captain? <laughs> well, I'm through using my knives for a while. How about yours? I got it. Boy, my hands are so numb, I can't hardly feel it. Now, rub your hands together. Oh, they'll be all right. Here we go. Uh, ooh, like needles of blood running back into your fingers. Yeah, it only hurts for a minute, though. Mine are practically all right by now. Here, I'll cut your feet loose. Now, how about your own? After you. It'll only take a second. Uh, there, that's it. Now, give me the knife. I'll get yours. Yeah, reckon I would have to be a sort of an acrobat to do it myself. Yeah, Porgy was right about this being a fish net. <clears throat> I guess that doesn't. Hoo-wee! Wonder if I can stand up. Yeah, my feet are not so bad. Good thing they left our boots on. Yeah, my feet are a lot better than my hands. Now, let's take a look at Wes. Yeah, here he is over here. Wait a minute, I'll strike a match. Yeah, poor kid, he's bled quite a bit. His pulse is beating. Good, maybe he's got a chance. If we can get him to a doctor. Well, but how? We're miles from nowhere. Only one way. Carry him. Help me get him onto my shoulder. Oh, no. You load him onto me, Captain. With two busted ribs, you wouldn't get very far. <laughs> Reckon you're right. All right. Up we go. Uh, there. Now, you lead the way to the road. Yeah. That's going to be a long trek into Hollywood. It's getting pretty dark. Yeah, we'll stop at the first house we come to and get help. What, in these disguises? We're giving ourselves up as bank robbers? <sighs> Man, the papers must be full of our descriptions by now. I bargained to see this kid through. I'll keep my part of it as best I can. 
But if you want to... Hey, know. boss, you know I'm sticking to you. Here's a road. <laughs> Sorry, Skip. Oh, sure, I know, Kim. Hey, look, there's a house down yonder. Where? I don't remember any house on the way up here. Don't you see that light? No, that's not a house. That light's moving. Yeah. Hey, it's a car on the winding road. They're coming up the road towards us, too. You suppose it's Blackie coming back? Or the police. Blackie might have tipped him off. What are we going to do? Well, if it's the police, we'll give ourselves up and get some medical attention for Wes. And if it's Blackie? Well, nothing we can do but hide in the brush and let him go by. What if it ain't neither Blackie or the police? Then we'll get him to drive us to a hospital, of course. Well, whoever it is will recognize us from the descriptions in the paper. And that's a chance we'll have to take. Here it comes. Hey, we better get off the road. Can you make out what kind of a car it is? No, not yet. Coming at a pretty fast clip. Oh, now I can see it. It's a roadster with a top down. Good. Maybe a couple of spooners. How about a hail? Go ahead. Stand out in the road where they can see it. Hey, we need help! That's a girl, alone. Hi, miss. Will you help us? We had an accident. Skip, Captain Friday. What? What's Miss Carson? Eve, what are you doing here? Oh, I've been looking everywhere for you. Where's Wes? Right here. And badly hurt, I'm afraid. Oh. We've got to get him to a doctor, quick. Get in. Is he conscious? No, hasn't been for hours. No. Hold him on my lap. Yeah, that's it. Close the door, Scott. Yeah. Hey, you want me to turn the car around? No, I'll do it. Good girl. Drive slowly over these bumps. We don't want to shake Wes up any more than we can help. Bullet wound? No. Bump on the head with a gun butt. Concussion? I'm afraid so. Blackie North. How did you know? Well, after you left the house, I, I was so worried I couldn't stand it. I jumped in the roadster and drove to the bank. I was parked outside when you came out. Yeah, and you saw Blackie kidnapped us. I, I saw a soldier and another man jump in the car. I knew that wasn't part of your plan, so I got suspicious. You followed us? Yes. But I had to stay far enough behind so I wouldn't be seen. I, I lost you in the hills. I've been looking for you ever since. You're a brave girl, Eve. Let's hope you were in time. Well, I... I feel responsible for all this. I, I'm terribly upset. They were coming to the paved road yeah. now. Now you can step on it. Our house is closer than the hospital. I can have the doctor in a few moments. Oh, I felt kind of bad walking out on Miss Carson. Nothing we could do. West is in the hands of the doctors now. Yeah, sure was a flock of them. Good thing we had time to change clothes and get our makeup off before they arrived. Mm. Eve did a good job on Wes, too. Not a trace of that beard left. Yes, swell kid. Hope we can recover her money. And her car. And I hope those doctors can do something for Wes. Too bad if he has to die like this. Well, at least he had some excitement. If he has to die, I reckon this is the way he'd want it. Yeah, I'd hope to keep him alive for five more days till his time was up. Mm. Well, it's out of our hands now. Hey, Captain, you want me to carry that package a while? No, thanks. Must be pretty heavy. I'm all right. How's your side? All right. Hurting you? A little. You should have let one of those doctors back at the house fix you up. All you can do for broken ribs, tape it up. Shucks, I've had busted ribs before. <laughs> well, it won't be long now. There's the sign in the middle of the block. Maggie's Intimate Drinking Salon. Yeah. Hey, do you see what I see? Yeah, where? Parked at the curb in front. Yes, I believe it is. See Carson's car. Well, if the car's here, then Blackie must be here. And the gunny sack with her money. And don't forget the diamonds. Yeah. Feel up to a tussle? With Blackie North? <laughs> Anytime. What about your ribs? Blackie North broke them, didn't he? Don't ask foolish questions. Oh, excuse me. I want to drop in this drugstore for a moment, make a phone call. Who you calling? A couple of friends of mine. Look out for this package while I'm going. It'll just take me a second. Yeah. I'll get a paper and see what it says about the bank robbery. Looks like we got headlines. Let's see, uh, bank robbed of quarter million. So... <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay, Skip, I got my call through. Nickel wisely spent, I think. Yeah, I spent one too. Look here at the paper. Well, you gave us quite a splurge, didn't you? <laughs> they call me young and handsome. <laughs> <laughs> They make quite a point of my paunch and beard. It's good. <laughs> and poor Wes would get a bang out of what they said about him, too. Too bad he can't read it. Well, Skip, we haven't much time for biography. Let's go to work. Yes, sir. It'll be a great pleasure to work on Mr. Blackie North. 
Now, if we don't see Blackie or Porgy, we'll sit at the bar and have a drink. And if we do see them, well, that's just too bad for them. Blackie must have an office somewhere in the back. Keep your eye peeled for it. That's where the money probably is. Okay, let's go. See anybody? Mm-mm. Not even hat checker. Not a customer in the house. Well, the bartender either. I'll look behind the bar. You look in the kitchen. Yeah. Nobody in the kitchen. Well, I left my package back here. May come in handy later. See any more doors? Uh, not a one. There must be an office here somewhere. Why, well, sure. Elsewhere is everybody. That beats me. Man, this place is like a deserted village. Well, there's something screwy here. Yeah. Silent like a haunted house. Hold it. What's that? Sounded like a sliding door. Someone's coming. Sit at the bar, quick. Yeah. Oh, good evening, gentlemen. I did not realize there was anyone at the bar. Kind of deserted tonight. Uh, we cater mostly to the after theater crowd. Uh, what will be your pleasure, gentlemen? A glass of milk. A glass of you. <laughs> you are here last night. Well, how sweet of you to remember. But Blackie said, Chief! Had him skip. Yeah, come on. You are... Yeah, that's enough. He's out. Anybody here? Apparently not. I wonder where he came from. Sounded like a sliding door. Well, obviously, one of those panels slides back. He maybe he was fetching a drink for somebody. If it was, they'll be after him in a minute. Right here, help me prop him up against the bar. Prop him up? What? If anyone comes after him, give us a little more time. Oh, yeah. I get it. Yeah. Hey, he looks like a wax dummy. Pretty lifelike, all right. Hey, here comes somebody. Grab a stool. Get going, Gene. The chief wants a drink. We. Oui. <laughs> How was that for a French accent? <laughs> Great. Texas Frenchman. <laughs> Skip. Yeah? I saw the door. It's in the wall to the left. Oh, come on. Let's go look. Easy now. Right here. This panel. See anything that looks like a button? Mm, not yet. Are you sure this is it? I'm positive. Porgy leaned against the wall before the door opened. Yeah, maybe this little knot of pine here. Shall I try it? Yeah, go ahead. No, nothing happens. Can I help you, gentlemen? Uh, hey, the waiter. Yeah, he's got a gun. When you knock a person out, you should make sure he is really unconscious, gentlemen. This is the second time you have failed in your objective. No, gone. Guess I'll never learn. I believe you are trying to open the door, gentlemen. If you will put the heel of your boot on the second square of linoleum, you will find it will slide back automatically. We ain't so anxious to get in as we was. But I am, gentlemen. I am sure Mr. North will be delighted to see you. And if we refuse? In that case, gentlemen, I shall be forced to commit justifiable murder. What with? My revolver, naturally. Well, you didn't think we'd be silly enough to leave any lead in that gun, did you? Why, well, I emptied the chambers myself. Didn't you see the bullets in the shake on the bar? I do not believe you. Grab him. Yeah. I got him. Thoroughly. <laughs> I didn't think he'd fall for that old turkey. <laughs> Man, it had whiskers, but it worked. What's going on out here? Gene! Hello, I... Porgy, old oh. pal. And you too, Blackie. Keep your gun on him, Skip. I'll dust him off. Where did you... How did you... We're g- professionals, Blackie. Why should we explain to you dope? Thanks for the gat, Blackie. You too, Porgy. Oh, and looky at the nice stacks of money on the desk. Yeah, nice of you to count it for us, Blackie. Is it all there? Listen, you guys, I'll make a deal with you. Keep him up, Blackie, or I'll dry go to you. L- listen, you guys, I- I- I'll split with you. Winner take all, Blackie. I- I'll squeal to the cops. Which reminds me, Skip. Hmm? Bring in that little package at the bar. Oh, yeah, sure. Hey, is it behind the bar, Captain? Yes, yeah, near the sink. Now, listen to some reason, Friday. We I'm... might make a deal at that. Where's that handful of diamonds we left here last night? Uh, what kind of a deal? We'll take half the dough and the diamonds and call it quits. Half the dough and half the diamonds? That's reasonable. Here's the package, Chief. Fine. Just open the package and strew the contents around, Skip. We, as Gene would say. I wonder if he ain't talking. Uh, just lay those clothes on the back of the chair. Boots on the floor, my beard's on the desk near the money. What's the idea of littering the place up with that stuff? Well, these were the costumes we wore this afternoon, Blackie. I thought you might like to use them next time you robbed a bank. I thought we was going to make a deal. Well, where are the diamonds? Right here in my vest pocket. Here. Hey, look out. You're dropping them, Cap. Uh, what's the idea of throwing the diamonds around? Well, I thought we ought to plant a little more evidence. Why, you double cross? Hey, you make it a break. Tackle him. I got him. Go after Porgy. Yeah. Yeah. Never mind. Huh? We've got Porgy. Well, if it ain't the homicide squad. Yeah, I didn't waste any time after my phone call, Lieutenant. What's going on here? They were just making a break. We had to use a little action. Nice job, Captain. That the money on the desk? I think you'll find it's the stolen money, Lieutenant. Here's the disguises they wore. Blackie's friend, Gene, is outside the door. Yes, one of my men has him. 
Huh. What's this on the floor? I think they're the diamonds stolen from that movie star last week. Blackie tried to make a deal with us. Well, Captain, thanks very much for the tip-off. How'd you happen onto it? Miss Carson of Beverly Hills hired us to recover a stolen car. It turned out to be the bandit car. Nice work. And, uh... I believe you said you wanted your name kept out of it. Credit's all yours, Lieutenant. That is, if you let us drive Miss Carson's car away without any further red tape. I think that can be arranged. I just won't mention a car in my report. Thank you very much, Lieutenant. I'll be reading about you in the papers. We have some wonderful news, Miss Carson. All your money has been recovered. Yeah, and your car's in the driveway. That is wonderful news, but I have better. Your brother? The doctors performed an operation. The blow on his head released a nerve that was strangling his spine. Oh, he's going to live. Well, that is wonderful news. Needless to say, Skip and I are delighted. Yes, sir. And when Wes gets well, I have a hunch he'll be free from Blackie North. And I have a hunch that Blackie North won't be free. You'll Be Dead in a Week, written and produced by Carlton E. Morse, has been another in the series, Adventures by Morse, a regular feature over this station. Tonic and Kreml Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, once again, it's time for our weekly visit to Dr. Watson, genial friend and colleague of the great Sherlock Holmes. Good evening, Dr. Watson. I trust I'm not intruding? Not at all, my dear fellow, not at all. Sit down, won't you? Thank you. You know, Dr. Watson, I've been struck by the remarkably large number of signed photographs of titled personages and notables that ornament the walls of your study. Mementos of your active career, I presume? Yes, though I must admit most of them are clients of Sherlock Holmes rather than grateful patients of mine. Well, this picture, for instance. Naturally, I recognize the photograph of the late royal... No, 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 no names, Mr. Bell. I I, I beg you. Holmes and I always referred to the gentleman question merely as uh, Mr. Edwards. And what did you and Mr. Holmes do to cause his royal... I beg your pardon, Mr. Edwards, to inscribe his photograph in such affectionate gratitude? Oh, nothing of any great importance, I assure you. Merely that Mr. Edwards had become a trifle entangled, shall we say, with a little dancer at Maxim's in Paris. A young lady rejoicing in the appellation of uh, (laughs) Frou-Frou. Quite a delightful little bit of fluff, too. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, I gather that Sherlock Holmes settled the matter to Mr. Edwards' complete satisfaction. Uh, very easily and very discreetly. But it led us into one of the most curious and singular affairs of Sherlock Holmes' career, and one which I don't believe would ever have been solved had Holmes not been a distinguished amateur on the violin. I call it the adventure of the genuine Guarnerius. Sounds intriguing, Dr. Watson. But if you don't mind a momentary interruption... Not at all, Mr. Bell. Go ahead. Men, there's a famous saying about locking the barn door after the horse has been stolen. Well, the same applies to the hare. Once bald, bald forever, they tell us. But you can make the most of the hair you've got. And you can't begin too early. That's why I want to tell you about Kreml hair tonic. Kreml contains very special hair grooming ingredients found in no other hair tonic. Kreml makes the hair stay better groomed longer. With that natural, greatly desired he-man look. Never greasy, never sticky. But Kreml does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome. A massage with Kreml actually helps stimulate circulation in the surface of the scalp. Your scalp always feels so alive, so invigorated after applying Kreml. This highly specialized hair tonic also has an excellent lubricating effect on a dry scalp. It makes dry, brittle hair that breaks and falls feel softer and more pliable. So men... Buy a bottle of Kreml hair tonic at any drug counter. You'll be delighted with its extra advantages. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the adventure of the genuine Guarnerius? Well, the British ambassador to France, Sir Hubert Ashley, had invited Holmes and myself to a reception at the embassy in Paris. 
in order to thank us both for successfully concluding the rather delicate affair of uh, <laughs> Mr. Edwards. The ballroom was a blaze of light. The guests were dancing. By Jove, Holmes, have you ever seen anyone more attractive than our host's wife? I must say that Lady Ashley is really the finest type of English beauty. Sometimes, Watson, I envy you the directness of your mind. What do you mean? When you look at a beautiful woman, you see only beauty. Well, what on earth would you expect me to see? In the case of Lady Ashley, my dear fellow, I notice her elderly husband, her many gallant admirers, and I think, what a motive for murder. Oh, really, Holmes? Oh, Mr. Holmes, I trust our guest of honour is enjoying himself. Very much indeed, Lady Ashley. Uh, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, may I introduce a very dear friend, Monsieur Jacques Merivaux, who has known me more years than I care to remember. Well, How do you do, sir? Good evening. Yes, I think I can claim to be Lady Ashley's most devoted cavalier, having first made her acquaintance when she was just over two hours old. <laughs> <laughs> she wept bitterly the moment she saw me. Yes, but I've been trying to make up to him for it ever since. During the time we're in Paris, Monsieur Merivaux, I've been promising myself the pleasure of a visit to your famous music shop. You should be honored, Monsieur Holmes. I've heard, of course, that you play the violin. Merely as the veriest amateur. Incidentally, I'm looking forward eagerly to hearing Monsieur Drenko play this evening, Lady Ashley. I was unfortunately out of London during the only recital he gave this season. He's a great artist. Yes, he comes from one of those little countries down the right-hand corner of the map, doesn't he? I always heard the fellow was a bit of a barner. You have an opportunity to judge at once, Watson. Our host is approaching with a gentleman in question in tow. Oh, Holmes, there you are. Monsieur Drenko has been asking to meet you. Monsieur Drenko, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. How do you do, How do, you do? Holmes? Hubert, if you'll excuse me, I must see to our other guests. Until later, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Yes, yes, indeed, of course. Dr. Dr. Watson and I are looking forward to hearing you play, Monsieur Drenko. I always enjoy an appreciative audience. Uh, tell me, Mr. Holmes, might I speak with you alone for a moment? Uh, come along, Mariver. You promised me your opinion on that 83 champagne. No, it's a sound vintage, but I... Well, Mr. Drenko? I said, hello, Mr. Holmes. I have no secrets from Dr. Watson. Very well, then. It so happens that I find myself in a slight uh, predicament. I thought that with all your experience, you might advise me. As a social favor, Mr. Drenko? Gladly. If, of course, you would like to come to the tea at my hotel tomorrow and bring your violin to entertain my guests. I beg your pardon, Oh, <laughs> I understand, Mr. Holmes. We professionals must each respect the other's métier, must we not? It would be preferable. Yes, I told you what sort of fellow he was. Nevertheless, Mr. Holmes, I still ask for your advice, and I will expect to pay the customary fee. You see, I find myself a trifle involved. Only a harmless flirtation, of course, but I did write one or two indiscreet letters to one of the girls at Maxim's, and... Now the greedy little thing threatens blackmail. Hardly an unusual situation, Mr. Drenko. For myself, for my reputation, I do not care, you understand. An artist is an artist. But uh, there is my wife at home. I must think of her naturally. You're thinking of her a trifle late, aren't you, Omar? So you can see there might be unpleasant mm. results if Frou-Frou... Frou-Frou of Maxims? You know her. Oh, we're not unacquainted with a young person, eh, Holmes? Uh, from my rather brief acquaintance with her, I think the matter may be settled rather simply. Ah, I shall be happy if you will handle the affair. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The Theodore Drenko, whom we're all very happy to welcome here this evening, will now give us the pleasure of his incomparable music. <laughs> You are, gentlemen. Mademoiselle Frou-Frou's dressing room is right here. Oh, Papa. <laughs> I say, Holmes, did you notice that girl just passed? The one wearing just those little, uh, little thingamajigs? Quite. I also noticed, Watson, that backstage at Maxim seems to be one place where you not only see, but also observe very closely. Oh, hello, hello, Monsieur Holmes. Good evening. Oh, I have not expected to see you in that cute little Dr. Watson oh, again so soon. <laughs> but perhaps this time it is pleasure, huh? Not business. Oh, I'm afraid not, Mademoiselle Frou-Frou. Mademoiselle Frou-Frou, 
It was only because I thought the gentleman we have agreed to refer to as uh, Mr. Edwards was at least as culpable as you that I persuaded the French police not to prosecute you in that matter of his mother's jewels. But, Monsieur Holmes, that little matter, we have settled it, uh, have we not? The charge is still pending, mademoiselle, and at a word from me could be followed up. But why should I you? also happen to know that the Marsovian embassy is most curious regarding the attraction which brings Prince Danilo so frequently to Paris. That uh, also does not concern me at the moment. Assuming, of course, that you return at once all the letters that were written to you by Monsieur Drenko and that you cease from molesting him in any way. Oh, mais je comprends très bien. Oh, I see. Well, Monsieur Holmes, uh, since you have put it so convincingly... I am rather tired of listening to a soul fully played violin. Monsieur Drenko may have his letters back. Here they are. Thank you, mademoiselle. I knew you were a sensible girl. Good night. Good night, mademoiselle. And now what? And now for a good night's rest. And in the morning, we can report to Monsieur Drenko the satisfactory solution of what was perhaps our simplest problem. Well, I hope you charge him a stiff fee, Holmes. I still say that the fellow's a bounder. Good morning. I think Monsieur Drenko is expecting us. Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. What's the number of his room, please? Quick, quick. Send a message to the police. Oh, Monsieur Holmes. Monsieur Marivaux, what's the matter? It's Drenko. Well, we're on our way up to see him. He's dead. Killed himself. What? Good heavens! Come, Maribel, take us up to his room. The man's been dead for more than an hour, Holmes. Yes, no, not more, more than half an hour. Closer to an hour, I should think. I see. Maribel, would you please ask that chap we passed, uh, the one who was painting the hall, to step in here for a moment? But of course. Curious. I wonder what could have been Drenko's motive in committing suicide. It is a phantom, Monsieur Holmes. Ah, yes. Tell me, have you been working there all the morning? Uh, oui, Monsieur, ever since eight o'clock. For over two hours, in other words. And were you working constantly in sight of this door? Absolutely, Monsieur. I heard the gentleman in here practicing the violin for a little while, but he stopped almost an hour ago. Well, that puts the time of death at just about what I thought, Holmes. And you saw no one enter or leave this room during the entire time? No one. Oh, uh, except five minutes ago this gentleman went into the room. A few seconds later, he came running out calling for the police. Thank you. Your statement has been very clear. You may go now, but better not leave the hotel. No doubt the police will want to question you. Très bien, monsieur. I have never had such a shock in my life, monsieur Holmes. I came up to deliver a new violin that Drenko had ordered. And when I opened the door and saw him lying there, with his face all twisted up in agony... Yes, the common appearance of cyanide poisoning. Not very pretty, I'll admit. You'll note the characteristic odor of bitter almonds, Watson. Yes, indeed. And here's the empty bottle. Quite. The poison label on it removes any possibility of accident. Now, nobody could possibly have got in or out of the, the window at the sheer drop of, of four stories to the street. Look, Monsieur Holmes, this torn piece of paper. I found it here on the desk. It's his suicide note. Evidently written under the stress of considerable emotion, to judge from the writing. Hmm. It is intolerable. I utterly refuse to endure it any longer. Signed, Mihai Drenko. It's his handwriting, Monsieur Holmes. I'd swear to it. Hmm, yes. Unquestionably the perfect setting for suicide. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Well, Monsieur Holmes, a pleasure to meet you again, even if under such unfortunate circumstances. How are you, Inspector Bernard? Nice to see you again, my dear fellow. Oh, oh, thank you, sir. Dr. Watson and I have been carrying on for you until your arrival. Oh, thank you. And uh, may I pick your brains to ask what you have learned? A Marivo here discovered the body only a few minutes ago when he arrived to deliver a violin Drenko had ordered. The painter you'll find out in the hall has had the room under observation all morning and will assure you that no one else entered or left it. And the fellow stopped practicing about an hour before. Set the time of death pretty accurately. Here's the suicide note, Inspector. I'm afraid we're presenting you with rather an open and, and shut case. Oh, well, Dr. Watson, a hard-working officer like myself welcomes the absence of any uh, mystery. And uh, here's the violin that Drenko was practicing on. Let me see it, Watson. Odd. 
Very odd indeed. You mean uh, odd that Renko should be practicing the violin until just before he killed himself? No, Inspector. That fact by itself would merely be singular. But listen to the violin on which he was practicing. Sounds all right to me. I confess, Monsieur Holmes, that I find no mystery in a man playing the violin just before he killed himself. Perhaps, Inspector, you may then be able to explain why a world-famous violinist like Drenko should do his practicing on a violin that is most unmistakably out of tune. But how should I know what a man would do just before he commits suicide? Suicide? This isn't suicide, Inspector. This is murder. <laughs> Men, once you get bald, there's nothing you can do about it. Science tells us it's impossible to grow hair on bald heads. But you can make the most of the hair you've got. And let me tell you, there's nothing better than Kreml hair tonic to do it. In the first place, Kreml does a marvelous job of hair grooming. It keeps every lock neatly in place, yet never looks greasy or sticky. Kreml contains very special hair grooming ingredients, the like of which have never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. But Kreml does lots more than just keep hair in place. A massage with Kreml helps stimulate circulation of the blood in the surface of the scalp. Your scalp feels so clean, so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, it removes loose dandruff. And if your hair is so dry and brittle that it breaks and falls, remember, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer and more pliable. It also has a grand lubricating effect on a dry scalp. So remember, men, make the most of the hair you've got. Use Kreml Hair Tonic daily. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what happened in that hotel room when Sherlock Holmes told Inspector Bernard that Drenko, the violinist, had been murdered and had not committed suicide? Well, naturally, Inspector Bernard was rather surprised. As a matter of fact, it seemed to me that he was a bit huffy about it all. But, Monsieur Holmes, you cannot fly in the face of all the evidence we see before us. The bottle of poison clearly labeled, the suicide note unquestionably in his own handwriting... Dr. Watson's medical evidence that the man had been dead at least an hour, and the final confirmation of the man painting in the oil who tells us that no one entered or left this room until a few minutes ago. And against all this, Mr. Holmes, what have you to offer? A violin that is out of tune. Ah, zut alors. Nevertheless, Inspector, it is the crux of the entire case. But, Holmes, how can you tell what a fellow like Drenko would have done? I can assure you, Watson, that he would have done almost anything in the world except practice on this violin. No, Inspector, this was murder. I'll stake my reputation on it. Uh, It is only your reputation, Monsieur Holmes, that makes me hesitate at all. Give me 24 hours in which to establish how this murder was done and who did it. Since you ask it, Monsieur Holmes... Very well. Thank you. Come, Watson. We have some busy hours ahead of us. Good day, gentlemen. Good Good day. Good day. day. And where are we off to in such a hurry, Holmes? The British Embassy. The Embassy? Why on earth? You evidently failed to notice during last night's reception that Lady Ashley left us very abruptly the moment Drenko joined our party. Her manner to him vengeed on rudeness. And that's so unlike Lady Ashley that I feel that an inquiry in that quarter may bear interesting fruit. Mr. Holmes, the purpose behind this unexpected visit? In just a moment, Sir Hubert. I'd like to have Lady Ashley present yes, when I... Yes, Hubert? My maid said you wanted to talk... Why, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. I didn't know you were here. I'm afraid our visit concerns a professional matter, Lady Ashley. You see, Dr. Watson and I have just come from the room of the late Monsieur Drenko. Is it... The late Monsieur Drenko? I, I don't understand... Drenko has been murdered, Lady Ashley. He... Oh. Quick, Watson, catch her. Cynthia. Uh, she's quite all right. Looks nothing but a faint. If you will just ring for your wife's maid, Sir Hubert. Yes, I'll get her at once. I must say, Holmes, you certainly broke the news rather brutally. She took it pretty hard. Nonsense, Watson. What caused her to faint was relief. That was my object. I had to find out what her reaction would be. Here, Annette. 
You and Mary help Lady Ashley up to her room and put her to bed. Oh, we, we must Just you. keep her quiet. A cup of hot tea will do her no harm when she comes round. And now, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me. I'm sorry, Sir Hubert, but I must ask you to remain here with us for a few moments. Well, I, I don't understand. Uh, Sir Hubert, Lady Ashley's reaction to the news of Drenko's death was a good deal more pronounced than might be expected in the circumstances. I haven't the faintest idea what you're trying to insinuate. I insinuate nothing. I merely state facts. Would you prefer that I question her? Or will you tell me what lies in back of all this? Very well, Mr. Holmes. But I should like to spare my wife as much as possible. My only interest is in any light that she might be able to shed on the matter. Cynthia is a very young and very beautiful woman. Before we were married, she had... Well, how shall I put it? uh, Fallen under the spell of this man, Drenko. I, I asked her no questions, but... I know that he continued to have some strange hold over her. I had the impression that she hated seeing him and that he was forcing his presence on her on those occasions when he was a guest in my house. Yes, I still don't believe anyone killed the fellow, but if someone did, it sounds like a good riddance. Unfortunately, Watson, we are not concerned with the equities of the murder, but with its solution. Thank you, Sir Hubert. You've been extremely helpful. Well, justice must be done, Mr. Holmes. But if ever I wished that your great powers might fail, it is now. I have no hesitation whatsoever in saying that I'm infinitely grateful to the murder of that swine drinker. I say, Holmes, will you join me in a cup of tea? No tea, thanks. I'm rather trusting to the inspiration of music to assist me in resolving some of the more puzzling features of this case. <laughs> at least you can't complain of a scarcity of suspects. First of all, Sir Hubert, for obvious reasons. Possibly Lady Ashley. Great Scott, Holmes. What's the matter? Tea too hot? No, but have you thought of the possibility that Fru-Fru might have killed Drenko? After all, she might have been mad in love with him. The possibility had occurred to me, but I discarded it. Oh, discarded it. By Jove, look at this glass here on the table. It's positively vibrating from from that high note. A not uncommon phenomenon. As you must know, certain objects vibrate in harmony with certain notes. Uh, Watson, get your coat. We promised to pay a visit to Marivaux's shop. I think this would be an ideal time to discharge that obligation. dingy little place, I must say. Founded 1821, eh? Looks as though they hadn't washed the window since. But full of priceless treasures. As Marlowe said, infinite riches in a little room. I say, where's Marivaux? I don't like the look of that customer over there, the one with that bushy back beard and theatrical cloak. He looks like one of those bomb-throwing fellows. What you call them, uh, nihilists. You must remember, Watson, that music appeals to oddly assorted people. Well, of course does. Mm-hmm. Professor Moriarty, after all, knows no peer in his interpretation of certain of the Bach fugues. Well, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, or is this other gentleman waiting? No, 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 I'm in no hurry. It's no wonder the fame of your shop is worldwide, Monsieur Maribaud. I see you have some remarkable instruments. You see about you the fruits of a lifetime of devotion to the violin. <laughs> I must confess, Mr. Holmes, that it pains me every time I sell one of my treasures. I can well believe it. And uh, if you've made any further progress toward a solution of Drenko's death? I feel safe in saying that my investigation has gleaned a few pertinent facts. Would it uh, be indiscreet for me to ask what they are? Not at all. You yourself were present when I made the curious discovery regarding Drenko's violin being out of tune. And only a short time ago, while I happened to be playing my violin... Dr. Watson made a remark which threw further light on the case. Didn't you, Watson? Yeah. Oh, yes, 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 of course. I don't know what kind of a violin you possess, Monsieur Holmes, but I'm sure you'll appreciate one magnificent example that I'd like you to try. A Guarnerius, the equal of any Strad I've ever seen. I'm afraid it would be far beyond the reach of my poise. But you at least owe yourself the pleasure, the great experience of playing it. Here it is. Isn't it beautiful? Exquisite. If the tone's as mellow as that varnish... But, of course. Why don't you take it into my private office and try it? Hmm? No one will disturb you here. Thank you. I've never had the good fortune to test the Guarnerius. 
Dr. Watson, while Mr. Holmes is amusing himself, perhaps you'll be interested in one of these bows. Bows? Oh, yes, yes. Horsehair thing with each other. Bows. Uh, there's more to it than that. There is only one family in all Italy, Dr. Watson, that possesses the great secret of making a bow like this one. Yes, it's all very fascinating, Mr. Marivaux, but Holmes must have made up his mind if he likes that fiddle by now. And I know he wants to ask you some questions. I, he told me that... To... Good heavens, what on earth... He's lying on the floor. He must have fainted. Holmes! I'm afraid he's dead. Quick, Dr. Watson, go for the police. And give you a chance to plant a bottle of cyanide by my side? <laughs> oh, no. Watson, stay here and listen to Maribel confess how he murdered Drenko. You, you're alive? No, thanks to you. I took the trouble to dissect the violin you gave me and then played one of the others here to lure you in. He killed Drenko? But the suicide note... Elementary, my dear Watson... I would hazard a guess that it was torn from the end of a letter to Marivaux referring to an unsatisfactory instrument, which was intolerable and which he couldn't endure any longer. But Holmes, Marivaux was nowhere near Drenko when he died. Marivaux had left a very oddly constructed violin with Drenko, presumably last night, knowing that it was Drenko's habit to practice each morning from eight till ten. Inside the violin, in place of a sound bar, Marivaux had put a thin glass vial containing cyanogen, the lethal gas, which is identical in odor and effects with the cyanide. Good heavens! When Drenko reached the proper high note, the extremely thin glass vial cracked under the impact of the sympathetic vibration, releasing the deadly fumes through the F-holes in the violin. And the violin that Marivaux was delivering to Drenko when he discovered the corpse... Precisely, the... Watson. He merely left that one by the body, planted the note, and carried off the fatal weapon and all proof of the crime in his now empty case. He made only one error... He neglected to tune the violin he left. Amazing, Holmes. I've listened very patiently, Monsieur Holmes, to your ingenious and utterly imaginary reconstruction. I suppose you can furnish a motive, too? I'd prefer to spare Lady Ashley the ordeal, Marable. But I have no doubt that it was in you she confided that Drenko had been blackmailing her on the strength of their earlier romance. But to convict a man of murder, you need something more than words. You need proof. You seem to be overlooking this dissected violin on your desk with which you attempted to murder me. I fancy that the sample of your handiwork with the vial of gas affixed therein will offer ample proof... You'll never send me to the guillotine. I'll kill myself first, but I'm going to take you with Drop me. that vial, Manuel. Precisely what I intend to do. Drop it and release the fumes. They will put a speedy end to all three of us. I've got you, Miss Manuel. Give me that vial if you don't want a broken arm. Ah, there. That's better. Good heavens, it's an analyst. I mean, Inspector Bernard. As you noticed when you commented on his beard and cloak, Watson, the inspector's tastes in disguise are a trifle flamboyant. <laughs> and uh, now, Monsieur Holmes, I must extend my thanks to you on behalf of the Sûreté. Not at all, Inspector. Your promptness in acting in response to my message undoubtedly saved Watson's life and mine. Thank you. Oh, no, Monsieur Holmes. Thank you. Oh, well, have it your way, Inspector. <laughs> and now, Marie come <laughs> along. <laughs> Phew. Rather too close a shave to suit me, Holmes. I say, that fellow Marivaux was, was very ingenious. Quite. You know, Watson, I have one bitter regret concerning this case. Regret? I find that I have, despite all my protests, ended by acting for Drenko without a fee after all. <laughs> In just a moment, Dr. Watson will tell us something about next week's story. But first, girls, some of the most beautiful women in the world are Powers models. And one of their outstanding characteristics is their shining bright hair. Now, here's how they keep it shining. Powers models use Cremel shampoo. This amazing, beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair. Revealing all its natural, glossy luster. My wife says Cremel shampoo is wonderful for washing children's hair. How about that? Oh, yes, it would be. Because there are no harsh caustics or chemicals in Cremel shampoo. And its luxurious active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, if you could only see how Powers Models' hair fairly radiates glossy highlights, I'm sure you'd want to try Cremel shampoo right away. You can get a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you about the adventure of the Sally Martin. The Sally Martin? She was a boat, Mr. Bell. Oh. A luxurious yacht. 
Holmes and I entered the case when her owner was found lying dead in his bunk with a knife stuck between his ribs. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Illustrious Client. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting to be, you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the Sally Martin. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Bold Venture. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. And allured, sailor, we see Morrow Castle, the famous fort guarding the entrance to Havana Harbor. It was constructed in 1589, contains many interesting and exciting relics of the past. Oh, shut up. What's the matter with you? I take you for a moonlight ride aboard the Bold Venture, point out the places of scenic interest, give you choice bits of information, develops the mine. Where else could you get all this gratis? All this gratis I could get by curling up in my downy bed with a circular. <laughs> all right, sailor. What do you expect from a man who takes you for a boat ride around the harbor? Expect him to anchor and... Hey, hey, look at that maniac. He's trying to run us down. It's not a he or she, just standing at the wheel, headed for us. A crazy fool, doesn't she know that... She slammed her boat into the seawall. Let's go. Folded it up like an accordion. That girl must be. I'm going in after her. You got her, Slade? Yeah. yeah. I'll hand her up to you. Just hold her on till I get aboard. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'll take her. Huh. Such a beautiful girl. Don't stand there admiring her. She's nearly drowned. Worse than that. Drowned? Look. This mark on the front of her head. Probably from the crash. My guess is that's what did it. She is beautiful. To have died like that. To have killed herself like that. For what reason, sailor? Here, take my hand, athlete. Don't need it, Jail. Been climbing aboard rafts in the moonlight ever since I can remember. Hey, hand me a towel, punk, and the water was cold. Mm, here. Thanks. They smiled on you tonight, Richard. Your stars smiled on you. People were there to watch how your girl died. Oh, I'm just lucky, Pumpkin. Always have been. Who watched? I saw it through the night glasses. A couple aboard a boat called the Bold Venture. I think they tried to help her. Goody. Tell me how it was, Richard. Mm -hmm. 
Tell me how you killed your beloved, my sister. <laughs> she thought I was going to kiss her. She closed her eyes, and then all of a sudden she opened them and saw the gun against her, and she passed out. Well, then what? I propped her against the wheel, headed her boat for the seawall, opened the throttle, and dove overboard. Well, why do I tell you that part? You saw it. You watched me swimming in the moonlight. Oh, you fool. You've ruined it. It had to look like murder. It had to. We planned it that way. She's dead, pumpkin. Why should I have stretched a muscle I can use another well, time? don't you see, you fool? They'll call it suicide. They'll find out how she tried to kill herself before. They won't call it an accident. They'll call it suicide. And the insurance boys won't pay off on suicide. Yeah, I never thought of that. <sighs> now, easy, easy, pumpkin. Young Richard will think of a way. Morning, sir. Welcome to Shannon's place. The Hotel Nifty, rooms 350. Are you alone? I don't want a room. I want to find out about a guest. Just a minute. Front boy. Good morning, sir. Welcome to Shannon's place. The Hotel Nifty, rooms 350. In advance, sailor, the guy's got no baggage. The guy wants information about a guest. Don't you, guy? Yes, yes, I do. My name's Richard Marlin. I'm trying to find out about a Phyllis Calvert. Phyllis Calvert, huh? Yeah. About her, I'll give you all the information I've got, Richard. I never heard of her. Now, look, uh, whatever your name is, I've been making the rounds of the Havana hotels. All the information I've gotten about Phyllis Calvert is that she's not registered. What makes her so important to find? My fiancé. Well, they'll do it to you every time, kid. Cut it out, Slate. Just because you never had a fiancé. Who needs one? I should never have let her come here alone. Mixed up girl like Phyllis. If anything's happened... Look, look, do me a favor, will you? Sure. I'd be glad to help. Here, uh, here's a picture. If she comes in here, well, uh, I'll leave you my address. And if she comes in here, then you can... Hey, look at this, sailor. You tell him, Slate. We've seen this girl. It's not a very good picture, Slate. Richard, we're, we're not really sure. What's the matter? Why are you looking like that? Like Sailor said, we're really not sure. But we can find out. Well, then let's do it. Where? I'm sorry, Richard. I really am. We'll have to go to the morgue. Make a note, Slate. Why, you forget something? Just make a note reminding us never to go calling in this place again. It's... Yeah. I can't tell you how grateful I am you two came with me. If it's Phyllis that's dead, I'll want someone with me when it hits. With others I have seen, it has been that they wish to be with their dead in loneliness. But it is not always as we... You are prepared, Senor Marlon? Yeah. Show her to me, Inspector. I promise I won't scream and wake her. Wake any of them. Senor Marlon? It's Phyllis. Cover up her face again. It's not this way I remember her. We'll play like I never saw her this way. We're sorry, Mr. Marlon. Why? What makes you Sorry. Was it you that killed her? Is that how killers feel about a girl they let die? No one killed her, Senor Marlon. It is our opinion it was suicide. You're crazy. You've seen so many dead, you want to make it easy on yourself. Suicide. <laughs> From what you have already told us of the senorita, that she tried to die twice before. Our technical experts think so. I think so. She was murdered. I told you Your she grief was... has made you hysterical, Senor. <laughs> I respect it. I leave you alone with it. When you are more calm, come to me, and I will share it with you. You saw her, Shannon. You saw that bruise on her head. Someone killed her. Could have been from the crash. Maybe she lost control and... Phyllis lose control of a boat. She's been handling boats since she was a baby. And what LaSalle said has to be true, Richard. She wanted... She was murdered. Look, all I ask of you is that you prove it. How can she rest if they think she took her own life? How? 
And me? How do I sleep? All right, kid, we'll try. How much? A thousand? Two? For nothing, Richard. Isn't that how it should be? So you can sleep. Let's go, sailor. You heard me, mister. Calvert. C-A-L-V-E-R-T. Phyllis Calvert. I don't know whether I'm at liberty to give out the information. We here at the Caribbean Cruise Line pride ourselves on the discretion with which we treat our passenger lists. Open that book and look it up. Everything you can tell me about it. Open the book. What else? Phyllis Calvert. Calvert. Cal... Yes, yes. Here we are. Phyllis Calvert. Disembarked a week ago today. And what? And from the steward's notation, we learned that her baggage was sent to the Hotel Mozambique. Is that what you wanted to know? I don't know what you're talking about, senor. To my knowledge, no man was in here asking about Phyllis Calvert. Well, maybe you weren't here at the desk then. Yes, possibly. Phyllis Calvert. I mucho muchacha. She's dead. I grieve. Permit me. Did you see her go out with anyone? Do you know anything about her? Last night she called the desk from her room, please to reserve her a boat. I took care of this reserving myself. Where'd she hire the boat? From Segura. His little dock near La Fuerza. You say dead, senor. Ay, que triste. Es muy triste. <laughs> No, senor. Segura is not here. Segura put on happy clothes with shoes. Where'd he go? To Calle Jota, to Fiesta. The street dance? Si, and Calle Jota, to dance, to sing, to have fun, to love, to get beat over head by jealous boyfriend. Ah, oh, tonight Segura will leave. <laughs> Sailor, go ask him for a dance. How do you know it's Segura? I asked the girls to point him out to me. They hid their giggles behind a fish he'd given each of them. That's how I know. Go on. You get a samba and a free fish besides. Why don't you go dance with him yourself? <laughs> it's a question. I'm not dressed for it. Well, keep your mouth open, kid. I may toss you a herring. Uh, hi, Segura. Care to cut a cobblestone with a girl? <laughs> You must understand, senorita. I am all out of fish. Oh, who needs it on a night like this? You want to dance with me for myself alone? Oh, you are brave. I've been dreaming about it. You're a flash with the girls, huh, Segura? Mm, they call me El Swifty. Is that what Phyllis Calvert called you? Phyllis? Oh, Phyllis. The one with open toes in her shoes. One of your admirers, huh? No, no, I only notice the open toes when she come to rent boat from me. And men in my profession see such things. <laughs> they were painted, the toes. And they twinkled in the moonlight on the boat ride. I bet. I wish I could have been there for the twinkle. Oh, she went out on the boat alone? Uh, you didn't go with her? Who cares? While we dance, they are turning out the lanterns. The music changes to tango. The street is dark. And in all Havana, there is only me for you. Hey, you're a regular Valentina. It has been mentioned. Better try another line on me, senorita. That one is tired. Try this one. Who was Phyllis with on the boat? Again, Phyllis, again. I, in my back, the pain. I... Slate, Slate, come here. Yeah, what's wrong, sailor? What's the matter? Hey, what's this, a new kind of dance? Your partner lies on the floor and you... Because he's dead, Slate. Because a knife in his back made him that way.
to Bold Venture. Our stars Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall and the second act of our story. A lovely girl, she crashed into old sea wall. Now lie with the dead in a cold, cold hall. Police, he says she's suicide, but her lover, this notion cannot abide. To help the lover, lady sailor, she dance in street with a man, a very warm glance. He hold her close and around her spin. When death tapped his shoulder on, dance cut in. Don't remind me of it, King. If I hadn't danced with him, it wouldn't have happened. But you gave him a memory to take with him, lady sailor, your face. There are harder ways for a man to die, sailor. I could envy Segura for that. What are you doing to me, Slate? Want me to cry all over again? Give it up, Slate. Let the man find his own reasons why his girl died. Yeah, don't you see, sailor? That fisherman's being killed like that proves the girl was murdered. Killer didn't want him to tell you anything, so he stuck a knife in him. Well, Sal says it had nothing to do with her dying. This was one Segura bought for himself because he was so popular with other men's girls. Well, what does LaSalle know? The difference between suicide and murder. He gets paid for a quirk like that. That makes me a sucker, huh? You named it. Look, sailor, a girl dies. I lift her body out of the sea with my own hands. I can still feel it. That gives me whatever rights I want to take to myself. It, it makes it... Answer the phone. Yeah. Slate Shannon. Oh. Oh, yeah, Richard. Sure I can. Be there right away. Let's see. You were saying if I want to find out... Now, don't out... bother to cue me, sailor. Richard's found the murderer. Sucker, huh? I don't get it, Eileen. Why tell Shannon I've got something I haven't got? But you will have, and soon. Rest your muscles, Dickie boy. <laughs> oh, the life I've lived. Phyllis, Segura, Shannon's girl. You deprived me of that one. If she ever comes that close again, I'll give her to you. To kill. Shannon, too, if you want him. Come in. A pretty day to you, senor. I have brought the club sandwich you honored us with your order. Put it over there, Pepe. I see. Now sit down. Oh, it's quite all right. Mr. Marlin here will protect you. If I were not so modest myself, senor, uh, I could wish the mister were not here. <laughs> see? I sit. Whatever the senora wishes. You're quite a lad with the girls, aren't you, Pepe? I am only a beginner. But so proficient, I hear. Oh, I've heard lots about you. From the elevator girls, the waitresses. From my sister. Your sister, senora? Phyllis Calvert. She had the same room in the same hotel. Surely you remember her. She remembered you. I am grateful that such a girl remembered me. You killed her, didn't you, Pepe? Please, senora, you just said something crazy. Did you not hear you it? You killed her. Phyllis made dates with you, a handsome boy like you, and for that you killed her. You are crazy. They fill this hotel with crazy people. You are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Here's his address, Dickie boy. When Shannon knocks on your door, be nice. Give him a murderer. <laughs> Mr. Shannon, Miss Duval. I don't know how to thank you. Take it easy, kid. Oh, please, please come in. And now it's all over. You've got to understand about a man like me. Someone I love, murdered. An eye for an eye. You'll see, you'll know. Someone did to you what's happened to me. We're not going to be able to help you unless we know what you're talking about. We came here because you said you knew who murdered her. He hit her. And he propped her against the wheel, headed her boat against the seawall. All right, I'll buy all that. Now, who did it? A bellhop. His name is Pepe. If Phyllis was going to marry our friend here, what was she doing in a boat with a bellhop named Pepe? That's a good womanly question. Answer it, Richard. Well, Phyllis was... 
Well, people smiled at her. She liked people. Ben? She was fond of people. She didn't know what she was doing. She needed me near her. You didn't know, Phyllis. Okay, kid. Let's go down and interview a killer. Happy little fish on the end of my line. You wiggle a lot, can you see? Your name Peppy? Oh, I, I did not see you approach, senor. Is your name Peppy? Yes, I am Peppy. They told me at your rooming house you were down here on the beach. You come here often? You went upset, I am. Okay, Richard, come here. What, what, what is it you want, senor? Why do you call? You'll see. Is this the one, Richard? That's him. You, 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 you will not... Don't try to run, Peppy. Did this woman, this Phyllis, a bad thing? You she... were with her on the boat. Take your hands away from me. Peppy does not permit. You see why Peppy does not permit? Ah, for a downy-cheeked lad, Peppy, you sure flash a big knife. <clears throat> she would bring things to me and meet me. See, I was with her. And why not? If Peppy... Stare, Mr. Shannon. Because I killed a man. Because I avenged a death. And you'll never know what a pleasure it was. And that's the way it was, Inspector. Pappy pulled a knife. That's why we came here to tell you about it. I don't care what you do with me. I want you to know that. Phyllis is dead now. Nobody's going to do anything to you. It was self-defense. There will be an inquiry. But with Mr. Shannon to give you a vouch, you will get off. He can go then, Inspector? See, si, if you will... Yeah, give... I'll give him a vouch. Let's get out of here, kid. Come on, sailor. Feeling pretty rocky, Richard? I, uh... I want to tell both of you something. I offered you some money earlier. A thousand dollars to help me. Two thousand dollars. Slade, what's the matter with you? Since when does anybody have to pay for your help? He said $2,000, didn't he? I did. In a few hours, Mr. Shannon. My rooms. I like a boy who pays his way, Richard. We'll be there. Richard. Hi, Shannon. Come for your dough? It's inside. Come get it. Thanks. I want you to meet somebody, Shannon. What do you think I've been staring at? People. Now, this is Eileen Calvert, sister of Phyllis, Slate Shannon. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, people. Yoo-hoo. Oh, Sailor, this is, uh, uh, what's your name again, lady? Eileen. Likewise, I'm sure. Where's the money? Two thousand, wasn't it? No, I changed my mind. Better make it five. Slate's always doing that, Eileen. You say two, he raises you to five. Now, come, Shannon. First it was for nothing, then for two Gs, now it's five. All that money makes blind spots. I could forget how three people died. You're trying to say something, Mr. Shannon. How much insurance money did your sister leave you, Eileen? Well, you're not going to tell me. Must have been a nifty bundle. <laughs> Nifty is not quite the word. Try gorgeous. All right, I'll try it. Gorgeous. That still smells. We're trying for ten, Shannon? Slate's trying to tell you that he thinks... No that... help from the audience, sailor. You killed Phyllis for her insurance money. It was supposed to look like an accident, a murder. But you loused it up and the cops called it suicide. Yes, that's right. With my sister's background, it looked just like suicide. The insurance people wouldn't pay off on that. You just made yourself ten grand, Shannon. Fifteen. You're going good, kid. Don't stop now. Worth fifteen thousand? It's worth it. Give it to him, Richard. Where is it? Top desk drawer. Did you find it? I found it. All right, Shannon, this gun says we bargain. Don't try anything. I said don't try it. It's late. Don't be a fool. Now you shot her. You shot Sailor. You didn't make it, did you, kid? Let go of that gun, Eileen. No. 
drop it. No! I'll take it. Sailor. Hmm? What? Does it hurt? What? What took you so long getting here? I see. That doesn't look too bad. You'll be all right. I tried to help. Now, 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 don't talk. Just don't talk. It'll be all right. I'll take you home. Construction of the Cabana Fortress was commenced in 1763 and finished in 1774 at a cost of $14 million. Although considered impregnable at that time, at present it is only of historic value. Now, isn't that interesting and educational, sailor? Look, Slate, I'm sitting here on a deck chair on our boat. My arm's in a sling. I'm defenseless. And you give me history. It's a tonic, sailor. Takes your mind off your troubles. You want to take me off my mind? I got a better way. The doctor said I should keep you calm. That quack. Come here, Slate. That's what I mean. That was restful. Restful? Yeah. The construction of the Cabana Fortress was commenced in 1763 and finished in 1774. See how easy it is to educate me? If you weren't so helpless. Isn't it wonderful? Just watch the sling, Slate. And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring... Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, together in Bold Venture. Books bring adventure. Today we bring you the story, Struggle is Our Brother, by Gregor Felsen. You remember how the Germans invaded Russia without warning just before dawn on June 22, 1941? At noon on the 22nd, all unknowing, a young farm boy was riding up a hill that overlooked the grain fields of the Ukraine, the Resna River, and the Amsov Dam, the great American Soviet dam. There were sheep on the hill, and an old shepherd sat under a tree playing his pipe. Hey, Paul! Huh? Oh, Mihail Bradenko, what are you doing up here when you want to be hoeing? I brought your lunch. You forgot it. Oh, so I did, and I'm hungry as a bear. <laughs> Thank you, Mihail. That's all right. I like to come up here. Oh, you would rather ride than hoe, huh? Who wouldn't? But I'm not playing hooky. Honest, Pavel. Mm -hmm. It's my day off, and I'm going to ride down to the river for a swim. It's good and deep above the dam. It never dries up now, even in August. Oh, no, we do not have to fear droughts anymore. That dam is worth all it cost, and it cost us plenty. We went cold and hungry for it, and we worked. You don't know how we worked. I remember. I was only seven, but I used to go over and watch the men working, and those American engineers bossing the job. Mm -hmm. I had never seen Americans before, and, well... I was kind of disappointed because they were just like Russians. Except for the funny clothes that they wore. <laughs> what did you think they would be like? I don't know, but just different. Well, they knew more about machinery than we did then. But they did not put on any airs. 
And they worked as hard as any of us. And they understood what that dam would mean to us. We will fight for it if the Germans invade. You don't really think the Germans are going to invade Russia, do you? Well, they've started out to conquer the world. But they made a treaty with us, Papa. I heard it on the radio. Hitler promised... He does not keep his promises. And he wants the Ukraine to feed his armies. He won't get it. I could help this time. I'm not too young to fight. No one is too young or too old to fight for his freedom and his country. Eh, maybe we will not have to fight, but I don't know. Look at all those planes. They're Red Army planes. They're heading west, and in a hurry, too. Yes, west to the Polish border. And the Germans are in Poland. I tell you, boy, it looks like trouble. We are right in the way of it. But we have our radio to warn us. Yes, our radio is broken. Huh? Yeah, Sasha Midnik was trying to fix it this morning, but but he said we'd have to send to Harkov for a new condenser. And we do not have a radio. So if anything happens, we... Huh? Well, listen, something has happened. Yes. You hear that? Somebody's hammering on that big iron rim that stands in front of the community house to sound the alarm. Come on, Pavel. My horse can carry both yes, of us. Yes. Get up behind me and I'll take you to the village. Doesn't anybody know what's happened? Uh, weren't you here, Anna? No, I was working in the fields when I heard the alarm. But Mother says an officer rode up on a motorcycle and went into the community house. And oh, there he is now, just coming out. Ah, that is Lieutenant Stalo from the comrades. garrison in Harkov. Attention, comrades! Attention! I have terrible news for you. We... We have been invaded without warning. In the dead of night, while we slept, the Germans, the Germans, the Germans took us by surprise and are advancing fast. And we have no time to lose. All men of military age will report to the army at once. Old men and children must keep lookout while the rest of you work. Men and women, girls and boys. You must harvest your crops quickly to feed the Red Army. It may be a long, hard struggle, but we will win in the end. So keep your hearts up. Comrades, to your posts now. To the barns and the fields. Forward, march! Come on, let's go! Oh, we young Russians again. to quit work and go home to supper. Let's get these potatoes sacked first so the night crew can load them on the trucks. This is the last field. We've done pretty well, haven't we? I never thought I could work the way I have this summer. But it makes me feel good to think all the crops are in. The hay and the grain and the sugar beets are all harvested and sent to the rear where the Germans can't get their hands on them. The Germans must be pretty near. Listen to those guns. I never heard them so plain before. Pavel says there was fighting by the river yesterday. He could see it up on the hill. There comes Pavel now. I wonder what he wants with us. <laughs> he wants me to come into supper, I guess. He's kind of adopted me since the bomb fell on my house and killed all my family. 
We are all one family now, Mikhail, and struggle is our brother. You know, Anna, I used to be scared when the bombers came over. But I'm not anymore. I just keep hoping one of them will fly low enough so I can shoot it down with my rifle. Hey, you two! Don't you know enough to come in to supper? We're coming just as soon as we finish sacking these potatoes. Never mind the potatoes. Come and eat. Goodness knows, then you will get another square meal. You will need it. What do you mean, Pavel? The Germans are coming. <gasps> they will be here in a few hours. There is nothing to stop them now. The Red Army has already crossed the river. All but the rear guard. They are just hanging on till they can blow up the dam. Blow up the dam? Our own men? Oh, no, Pavel. That dam, why, why, it's water for our farms and power for our factories. It's the bread we eat and, and the shirts on our back and the shoes on our, our feet. It's tanks and guns and planes. Yes. And you would leave it to the enemy to use against us? Oh. Now I see why the Germans haven't bombed it. They wanted it. They wanted it enough to sacrifice a division for it. But they will not get it. All the vital machinery was shipped away months ago. The explosives are laid ready with a detonator to set them off. Buried in a metal box under the roots of a tree. So a man can just pull a plunger and whoosh, up she goes. Yes, you could do it yourself if you knew where to find the box. Mm. Do you know where it is, Pavel? Could you see up on the hill? Yes, yes, I watched them bury it. Under the roots of that big fir tree that stands all by itself at this end of the dam, right by the spillway. You will hear the explosion. But I am glad I do not have to watch the dam go. We'll build it again, Pavel, when the Germans are gone. But what are we going to do now, Pavel? We can't hold the village. Rifles against machine guns? <laughs> they would mow us down in five minutes. Let them have the village, what is left of it. We will take to the woods. To hide like rabbits? To fight like wolves. Silent, unseen, deadly. I know how to do it. I was one of Budjeni's partisans in the revolution. Oh, so that's what we're going to be. Guerrillas. Yes, my son. A hidden army behind the German lines. Only, you will not wear a uniform. And if you are caught, you will be shot or hanged. I'll try not to get caught then. Yeah, you will do all right. Now go and eat. That is the first thing a guerrilla learns to eat when he can. Because he never knows where his next meal is coming from or when. Oh. Don't look so worried, Mikhail. I'm not worried about eating. I I was thinking about that dam. We haven't heard any explosion yet. No. Well, something must have gone wrong. We do not know what has happened. But the arms of them will never work for the Nazis. <laughs> We've done a lot of damage to the Nazis since we took to the woods. But but I'm still worried about the dam, Pavel. And we have found out how they took it. A detachment of Germans in Russian uniforms joined that rear guard and wiped them out. Then we must blow up the dam. We must. Yes, we must. I will do it myself, but I cannot walk far with this wound in my leg. I'll do it, Pavel. Huh? I can find that detonator if the tree is still standing. Yes. Yes, I think you could find it all right. But the dam is heavily guarded. How could you get through? By the same trick the Nazis played on us. Remember? Didn't we take the uniforms off that German detail you surprised last week? Ah, good luck to you, son. I will find the uniform to fit you. Put up your hands. Don't reach for your rifle or I'll shoot. I've had you covered ever since you sat down to eat. Mm, I should have known better. So you've been trailing me, and I never heard you. Oh, I ought to be shot. Now you needn't be ashamed. I'm a pretty good tracker. Used to do a lot of hunting back home in Bulgaria. You ought to be ashamed. A Bulgarian fighting with the Germans against Russian, your own race. I'm not fighting against the Russians. You're wearing a Nazi uniform? Yes. I joined the Nazis so I could desert to the Russians. And so did a lot of Bulgarians. It's the only way you can get into the fight. On the right side. So you Bulgarians are with us. In your hearts. Every man who loves freedom is with you. Maybe you think you're just fighting for Russia. But you're not. You're fighting for the freedom of the world. 
And so are the British and the Americans and the free French. But I thought the Nazis had you fooled, you Bulgarians. We know what their promises are worth. They'd make slaves of us, too. I want to fight with the Russians. And I want you to guide me to the Russian lines. I'm sorry I had to point a gun at you, but uh, I was afraid you'd shoot me before I had the chance to explain. Well, if you really mean what you're saying, there's something you can do right now, maybe. Where did you come from? A detail guarding the Amsov Dam. Good. Look, then. You see, I, I'm wearing a Nazi uniform, too, under these clothes. Can you take me through the lines with you? Yes, I think so. A lot of soldiers get separated from the regiments and nobody asks questions. But why? You'll see when we get there. Come. Well, we made it. Yes. And, and here's that uh, tree I was looking for. Uh, help me dig with your bayonet. Here. Uh, there ought to be a, a metal box buried just about here. Uh, go easy. We don't want to make a noise. Uh, not yet. I've struck something hard. Oh, good. Good. That's it. it. It must be. Yes. Yes, it is. Wait. Wait till I open it. Yes. The... Yes. 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 There's the plunger. What is it? What are you going to do? I'm going to blow up the Amsoft Dam. This story, Struggle is Our Brother, by Gregor Felsen, was brought to you by permission of the publisher, E.P. Dutton and Company. The radio adaptation was by Helen Platt. Claude Morris directed the story for Books Bring Adventure. The American Broadcasting Company presents I Love Adventure. Incident number eight, The Man with the Third Green Eye, a new Carlton E. Morse production featuring Jack, Doc, and Reggie. Four o'clock in the afternoon in the A-1 Detective Agency just off Hollywood Boulevard. The cutest secretary in Hollywood, Mary Kay Jones, was down at the corner drugstore having a Coke. Doc was still out on the firebug case and Reggie was someplace around. Jack alone was in the office when a well-dressed man came in, laid credentials on his desk and made the following proposition. I'm representing a certain branch of the Federation of Free Nations which will pay you $1,000 now and 4000 more later if you will undertake the job of recovering a stolen four-cent centennial stamp. Federation of Free Nations. Uh, didn't you do some work for a group of uh, 21 old men at 10 Gramercy Park, London? What about it? You didn't know they were an arm of the Federation of Free Nations? 21 old men sent you out here to Hollywood to see me? No. But if you will cooperate, you'll be doing an important job for them. Uh, let's hear more. About my connection with the 21 old men? No, about this four-cent stamp. Along the back of the stamp is a map showing the location of a priceless outcropping of contact, ore of uranium, somewhere in the Philippines. The man who found the ore and drew the map has been murdered. The stamp, which had been put on a letter directed to the Federation's Department of Science, has vanished. If the map on the back of the stamp falls into the hands of the wrong people... We can forget about peace, security, international harmony. Uh, personally, I'm taking myself and my family to the high hills before civilization blows up. Oh, that important, huh? That important. Why do you come to me if the 21 old men didn't send you? I have two clues. 
one of which concerns you. Oh? The first bit of information says the stamp is right now someplace on the Pacific coast. It'll be offered for sale in San Francisco. Oh, how so? Well, that's not definite. Uh, right away, we think. The stamp seems to be in possession of someone identified only as the man with the third green eye. Well, it shouldn't be hard to pick up the trail of a three-eyed man. Anything else? You ever see a man with three eyes? No. Do you ever hear of a man with three eyes? No. <laughs> Neither have I. You think it's a gag? Mm, I don't know. Hmm. What else you got? Uh, one thing more. I received a phone call early today. The voice said he had some important uh, information that I could use, but he didn't trust me. Yeah? He said if I put you and either Mr. York or Mr. Long in the case and give you $500 to be paid to him aboard the lock out of Los Angeles tonight, he'd come out with the information. I see. Here's the $500 for him, and here's the $1,000 down payment for you. Check. We'll be on the lock headed for San Francisco. My favorite city, San Francisco. Say, Dick, where is that belly compartment of ours, anyway? Must be in one of these cars, Reggie. We'd have had plenty of time to find it before the train pulled out of Los Angeles if you hadn't been so late. I know, Jack, but she looks so beautiful. That isn't until she took that ruddy veil off her face. Yeah, they usually do. Maybe this car coming up is the one. Hmm. What, huh? This is our car, isn't it? You have the tickets. This is it, all right. Compartment nine, eight. Here's ours, seven. Well, hello. Well, we have company. And a good deal of it, too. <laughs> come in, gentlemen, come in. <laughs> My bulk is considerable, I admit, but there is still room for all of us. <laughs> hey, uh, this is a private compartment, mister, or didn't you know? Oh, yes. Yes, I was quite aware of that, uh, Mr. Packard. Say, Jack, your identification must be showing. Uh, allow me to explain, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dimitro Torres, but that is not important. Uh, what is important, Torres? The fact, Mr. Packard, that I am a um, philatelist. I say, bloody old stamp collector. <laughs> Precisely, Mr. York. <laughs> a ruddy old stamp collector. <laughs> So you see, gentlemen, our interests are the same. Then you're the chap we were to meet. All right, save it, Reggie. He can tell us who he is. No, oh, quite. Sorry, Jay. <laughs> no harm done, Mr. York. Uh, my identification is of minor import. Uh, the reason for my being here is, of course, the four-cent centennial stamp and the man with the third green eye. Yeah, just what and who is he, Taurus? Ah, then you do not know, Mr. Parker. Would I ask you if I did? <laughs> it would be conceivable, sir, if you still had doubts as to my identity. Oh, well, don't be shocked, Taurus, but I have. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Packard, <laughs> you delight me, sir, delight me. <laughs> it's refreshing to meet one with such candor. You know, you're having a great <laughs> deal of difficulty getting around that bush you're beating. Yeah. Ah, but I had no intention of getting around, Mr. York. At least not at this uh, first meeting. I uh, have here in my inside pocket a little... All right, hold it, Taurus. <laughs> you know, Mr. Parker, uh, that looks suspiciously like a gun you have in your hand. Yeah, doesn't it? Reggie. Yes, sir. Speaking of guns, you better reach inside our fat friend's coat and get the one he was about to pull. Right up. Hope you're not ticklish, old boy. I... What's the matter? I'm sorry to disappoint you, Jack, but no arsenal. No gun? Not even a cap pistol. Mr. Turos was either going to merely scratch himself or was reaching for this card case. <laughs> As a matter of fact, that is precisely what I was after. Uh, please help yourself to one of my cards. Take one, Reggie, and give him back the case. Right now. Here you are. Uh, thank you, sir. I trust you will visit me one day soon at my home in San Francisco. Uh, Oh, must you go? I'm afraid so. Thank you again, gentlemen, for a very interesting evening. <laughs> I am certain our next one will be equally so. <laughs> Good day. Good day. How about that? Well, say, what do you think his purpose was? Why make such an abrupt departure? That was an expensive suit he was wearing. 
Blood stains are hard to remove. Oh, I see. Now, you wouldn't really have shot him. He knew that. It was the blood seeping out from under that seat that bothered him. From under... Jove, you're right. Blood. There's luggage space under that seat, Reggie. Let's take a look. I say. Ah, that's what I thought. The poor beggar's crumpled up like a blinking pretzel. Wasn't a very sporting duffer who did him in. Knife in the back. What do you suppose it is? The man we were expecting to meet. What, the green-eyed chap? No, look at that tattoo on his forearm. What? I say, Jack, it's a replica of a four-cent stamp. A four-cent centennial stamp tattooed on his forearm. And he was our contact and not Turo's. And we let the fat boy go. Don't worry, he can't get off the train. But this means whoever we're after in San Francisco is onto us. We can't let anything hold us up now or that stamp will be gone. To... Hey, we come in, gentlemen. Hello, what's this? Jeff, looks like a blimmin' train robbery. That's not quite correct. I'm Lieutenant Hudson of the state police. The two men in the corridor with their weapons drawn are my deputies. Don't attempt any resistance, please. I wouldn't think of it, Lieutenant, but what's your interest in us? The corpse under that seat makes my answer superfluous. I'm placing you both under arrest for murder. Raise your hands, please. Oh, come now, that's a bit thick, old boy. Raise you... your hands, please. Oh, but look here. All right, raise them, Reggie. But, Jack... Don't I... argue with a gun shoved in your teeth. It's easier to give a man enough rope to pull and... He won't hang himself. All right, Jack, but you've not that twisted a bit, haven't you? It's not pulling a rope, it... Oh, quite. You mean like this one right here? That's emergency court, you fool. Don't pull it, don't pull it. Ah, Good work, Reggie. I'll lock out the other... Uh, hey. Hey. <laughs> that lieutenant banged his head. He's knocked out. Good. Let's hope he stays that way. Yeah. You know, emergency courts are wonderful things at times. We haven't got time to fool around with a murder charge now. Then might I advise leaving hurriedly via the windows? The lieutenant's men are still out in the corridor, you know. <laughs> Listen to the beggars. You'd almost think they were upset about something. Okay, Reggie. Let's go. Right up. <clears throat> Imagine all this trouble for a four-cent stamp. Ah, lovely city, San Francisco, despite the trouble we had getting here. But I must confess I don't feel a jot closer to that stamp, nor the blighter with the extraneous green orb. That's why we're paying a little visit to our fat friend, Taurus. He's the only lead we got. Mm. Uh, this to address? Yeah, it looks like it. There you are. Keep the change. Thanks a lot, pal. Mm, give it a thought. Let's see. A plump partridge does himself well in living abodes. Looks like a miniature Taj Mahal. Being a stamp collector seems to pay off, huh? Mm. Let's ask him how he does it. Try again. Hmm. Sorry, Jack. He's either extremely bashful or not at home. Now what? Well, we still go in. Uh-oh, we bought our skeleton keys, didn't we? Yeah. Standard A1 Detective Agency equipment. Yeah, one of these should do it. Oh, wonderful invention keys. Not nearly as messy as a crowbar. Huh? Nowhere. Uh, looks like a den or a library there on the right. Let's try it. Joe, the place is darker than Lieutenant Hudson's heart. Could be a lamp somewhere. Yeah, here's one. I say, a bit of all right. Egyptian palace sort of thing. Didn't know San Francisco sported a mansion like this. Here yeah, in that painting over there, well... Yeah, he looked like the type who'd go in for dancing, girls. <laughs> With one like that around, who wouldn't? I say, you don't suppose the original would be around anywhere on the desk? Uh, let's concentrate on stamps right now, Reggie. Mm. Starting with that desk, looks like an album on it. Yeah, what an album. Tooled Moroccan leather inlaid with gems. You'd hardly think these colored bits of paper inside were worth that kind of setting. There's one four-cent stamp I can think of. It's worth a few million. It would... Hold it, Reggie. Look at that page. Say nothing on it but four-cent stamps. But you don't suppose that... Let's check them carefully, Reggie. You never can tell. Right, Jack. We'll check them. Carefully, all right. Never fear. Watch the... the backs. That's where the map's supposed to be. Say, a cut. I can't see the belly things too, too clearly. Hey, what's wrong, Reggie? You're, you're weaving on your feet. You're, you're heavy, heavy eyed, sleepy eyed. Look, look, there's the lamp. Smoke. Smoke's coming up from it. Hey, Reggie. Reggie, we gotta get out of here. 
We're being... We're being drugged. Yeah. Sure, sure, Jack. We'll get out. All right. We'll get... Oh. Oh. Hey, what... Reggie. Get up, Reggie. Get up. That lamp. Drugs coming from the lamp. Got it. Got to turn it out. Turn it out. Oh. Oh, Mr. Packard, you are regaining consciousness at last. Yeah, yeah, it looks as though... Hey, wait a minute, who are you? My name is Erdre. Does it mean anything to you? Erdre? No, but your face does. That picture on the wall, the dancing girl. <laughs> I am flattered that you recognize me, senor. It wasn't too tough. Reggie, where is he? Still sleeping comfortably in the cabin next to this one. So we are aboard ship. Yes. The Abdullah Bay, anchored well out in San Francisco Harbor. How about that? Uh, you mind briefing me on the fast switch of locale? The answer is simple. You were drugged by a form of hashish that was spread on the bulb of that lamp. So that's it. When the lamp was turned on, the heat activated the drug and we went out cold under its fumes. When you were unconscious, I had you removed and brought here. To my husband's yacht. Husband? You have already met him. The Metro Todo. But you're a Spanish girl. Tourists is... You know, you don't make much sense, baby. How about a few answers to why? Is it so difficult to fathom, senor? We are all after the same thing. The four penny stamp. Yeah, but something about all this doesn't gel. Are you working with your husband or against him? The Metro is a pig. Does that answer you? It gives me a general idea, yeah. Then I will give you some particular ones. On the San Francisco waterfront, near the Embarcadero, is a nightclub called the Rusty Sword. Uh Uh-oh. You have heard of it. Once, it was called the Curved Sword of Heaven. Now it's the Rusty Sword. Yeah, I know it. A real dive in the worst sense of the word. That is right. I know. I dance there. For a guy who can afford his own yacht, Demetrius got funny ideas about his wife's occupation. He has many funny ideas. But what I wish to tell you is this. Tonight, in the Rusty Sword, you may find the man with the third green eye. You're being pretty generous with information. Again, I'm asking why. I am giving you an opportunity to get that stamp. In return, I ask only your words. That if you succeed, you will come back here to the yacht with it. So I may be certain that it has not fallen into the metro's hands. You know, Edra, that sounds like a setup for a great big juicy double cross. You are quite right. It could be one. Then why should I go for it? I have heard that there are two men wanted for a murder committed aboard the night train from Los Angeles. A certain Lieutenant Hudson might be interested as to their present whereabouts? Yeah, come to think of it, he might be. Well, Senor Packard, would you care to borrow a speedboat? You better keep the riding lights burning tonight, Edra. You may have visitors with a four-cent stamp. If that isn't just my blasted luck, I mean to say, I didn't even get a single gander at the beauteous damsel. Now don't feel too bad about it, Reggie. I got a hunch you might see her later. Maybe dancing at the rusty sword. Now you realize, of course, that all this might turn out to be a deliciously baited trap. Could be. But just be a good fellow, will you? Mean what, Reggie? Well, at least be decent enough to introduce me to the fair lady before we get our throats cut. <laughs> Say, Jack, looks as though every cutthroat from the four corners of the globe's here tonight. You high class ones, too. I've been watching them trickle through that rear door behind stage. What do you suppose goes on back there? Well, if something doesn't break pretty soon, we'll wander back and have a look. Huh? Colorful. Bit of dress and decoration right out of Arabian Nights. Hey, pardon, Effendi, your order. <laughs> for you, our best coffee. Black, thick, and hot. And for you, Effendi, Khalid. Milk. 
Pure and sweet from the cow. Well, congratulations, old chap. Getting that milk must have been a minor miracle in this place. What do we owe you? Nothing, Effendi. It is with the compliments of the management. Ah, that's hmm. mighty nice of them. Who arranged it? The proprietor, Effendi. Abdul Hafiz Ben. Hey, that is he standing over there, near the stage door. Well, we'll have to thank him. We... Well, I said, Zach. Oh, yeah. Here, waiter. Thank you, Effendi. May the blessings of Allah descend upon you, even unto the tenth generation. Check. That Tavi's been bloke. Do you see what I see? You mean that brilliant green emerald in his turban? Well, it must be 50 carats. Look where that stone is, sitting almost in the center of his forehead. Yeah, a guy with an extra drink or two under his belt might almost think it was a third green eye. <laughs> Your surmise is quite correct, Mr. Parker. Hello there. <laughs> Abdul Hafiz Ben is the man with the third green eye. Well, our philatelist friend, Dimitro Turos. Where'd you pop from, Turos? Where well, does it matter, sir, as long as I am here? Well, I wasn't even wait for an invitation to sit down. It's so nice of you to allow me to join you. That napkin on the table in front of you says we didn't have much choice. <laughs> sure. Is that an ugly little snub-nosed gadget you have hidden beneath it? Be quiet. Uh, only uh, 32 caliber, Mr. York, but uh, it would be quite deadly at this distance. <laughs> well, 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 well. Well, gentlemen, shall we indulge in some friendly conversation? Uh, what's the topic tonight, Taurus? As though I didn't know. <laughs> you have a fine sense of humor, Mr. Packard. <laughs> a fine sense of humor. <laughs> You are quite right, of course. I, um, I do wish to speak of the four penny stamp. Oh, we don't mind, old boy. Excellent. Uh, you realize, of course, that I want it, sir. I want it very badly. Yeah, you proved that with your knife work on the train. As yes, a matter of fact, Mr. Packard, the uh, poor fellow under the seat was already dead when I uh, entered your compartment. I said, would you mind informing Lieutenant Hudson of that? would take us off a rather awkward spot, huh? Yeah, no, 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 no. I do not think I shall bother. You see, I suddenly find myself academically uninterested in the two of you. Meaning you found the stamp? <laughs> Let us say I know where it is, Mr. Packard. And before this evening is out, I shall possess it. Well, bully for you. But why waste your time then with us? Uh-oh. Lights are going down to the stage show. Oh, yes, yes. The darkened cafe will be my cover as I remove the last obstacles in my pathway. You know, Taurus, I think you mean something nasty by that remark. <laughs> you really, sir? Well, please allow me to clarify then. Within 60 seconds, you shall be both dead. <laughs> sir, that's an unhappy thought. Yeah, it doesn't even give us time to catch the floor show. Hmm. By the way, how's this going to happen? You will know this, gentlemen, that the music grows louder. It will shortly reach a pitch where the sound of two shots will go entirely unnoticed. Two dead men at this table will seem to be merely two sleeping drunks. Well, I see. A devilishly clever idea, man, Jack. <laughs> Very. Too bad we can't even enjoy this coffee. Yes. Look out, you idiots. That coffee skull. Oh, sorry, Torres. Let me wipe it up with your napkin. Uh, tore up that gun. Uh, I'll kill you, Packard. I'll kill you. Uh, Here, keep him propped uh, against the table. Use this other chair. Okay, Jack. Pull Dimitro. Shoot himself while his wife does. Well, I'll better him than us. Okay, let's go. Right up. Where? Backstage, through that door. The way Abdul Haviz bin went with his third green eye. So we can keep our promise to Demetro Turis's new widow. You say, are we going to hide in this backstage dressing room forever? Can you see? Yeah, the two guards made up and dressed in Arab costume just admitted to Chinese and a fez-wearing Turk. So that's a half dozen we've seen enter that room the past five minutes. Looks like a belly meeting of the United Nations. That's just what it is, Reggie. Only these are international gangsters from all over the globe. What's it all about, do you suppose? I'd say Havisbin's holding an international auction sale. You mean selling that stamp to the highest bidder? Right. We've got to get in on the bidding. Well, suits me just fine. 
Any suggestions as to how? What's wrong with just leaving this dressing room, walking up to those guards, and taking them? Jove, the direct approach. I love it. Let's go. They'd like to check the cord. All clear, Reggie. Let's move. Uh, make it clean. No noise. You can depend on it. Good evening, sir. And a good evening to you, too, my friend. Uh, what the hell? Right over my... Uh, nice work, Reggie. Now into the dressing room with them, quick. We'll put on their cafe costumes, borrow a bit of makeup, and two gentlemen from Araby will enter that auction. I have heard a bid offer of two hundred thousand dollars. It is regrettable that the bidding should have started so low on such a fabulous deposit of conatite. However, the bid is in. Who will be the next offer for the stamp? Hmm, Sir so Jack, they've already started. Yeah, move to the right, those two feet apart there. What's on me? Now three hundred thousand dollars have been offered. Who else wishes to enter the bidding for the stamp? He's one thousand. Say, these chaps mean business, all right. Yeah, looks like there's only one chance for us. We got to win the bid. Look here, Jack. We have no authorization to buy that stamp, even if we have the money. I know, I know, but we have to outbid them just the same. Look, you see where Hubby's been standing? Right on the dais, right uh, in front of those drawn curtains. Check. That's where we go to pay off and collect the stamp. It's in that little box on the pedestal. Only we pay off a bisman with a gun butt instead of cash. <laughs> Say, Jack, keep talking. You please me no end. I'll take care of her bisman. You grab the stamp box. Where do we go from there? Through those closed curtains. Must be a passageway behind them. And if not, oh boy. Oh, well. Why dwell on that? It is but a paltry sum to offer for great wealth and fortune. Who among you wishes to raise that figure? Why, head? Mal you in. Oh, One million dollars have been offered for the stamp. Who will be the next? Ein a million, ein a hundred thousand. Oh. If neon, mal you in. Hit him over the head when he comes around. It would seem that the sons of the prophet have a close appreciation of the stamp's worth. Two million dollars have been bid. Who was there among you to surpass it? Jeremy, yo, sell me. Two million one hundred thousand. And you, O oh noble cheek. Oh, come on, Jack, don't be a piker. Salazar Maluan, oh, three million dollars. Oh, the noble son of the prophet has offered three million dollars. Who among you will surpass it? Is there anyone else with the foresight to bid? Then, gentlemen, the auction is over. Advance to the dais, O oh noble cheek. Here we go, ready. Let's make it short, sharp, and simple. You are to be congratulated, noble ones. The stamp will be yours upon payment of the agreed upon sum in American dollars. A token payment now is to be desired. Ah, thanks, Abdul Haviz Ben. And here is the payment you request. The stamp, Richie. Got a check. Then let's go. Oh, I say, there is a passageway. Well, then take it. Don't spare the horses. Oh, it is. Robes weren't designed for speed. There's a door ahead. If we can make it. So, those beggars are really nasty. I mean, to say, I should return their calling card. Here. Is there a bolt on it, Jack? No, honey. A bar and a catch. Yeah. Phew. Well, that should hold the biggest for a while. Now we're only two blocks from where we tied up the speedboat. Come on. Joe, uh, we've got away with it. Not yet, Reggie. Oh, missed something? You're forgetting a little rendezvous aboard a yacht with a dancing girl named Erdra and the chance of a great big final luscious double cross. <laughs> Oh, Jack Sackers. You did return as you said you would. That's right, Edra. And there's the stamp you wanted to see. The fourth penny stamp with its priceless information on the back. Say, it's not priceless now. It's been paid for in bloodshed. Besides that, we put a nice round figure of three million on it. Bloodshed? Did you say bloodshed? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Packard, whose blood? The agent whose body we found under our seat on the train, for one... That's not who Mr. York meant. Your husband? 
be Metro is dead. Oh, look here. You can assure me that my husband... We were fighting over his gun in the cafe. I don't care how. All I want to know is, is it true? It's true, all right. So, the Metro not only did not get the stamp with which to blow up the world, but he paid for his plotting with his life. You seem happy about that. Yes. I did not like the Metro for very long after I was so foolish as to marry him. But when I found out that he was plotting things more evil than the world has yet known... So you really were working against him? Not only him, but all like him. My father and my two brothers died at Tobruk, fighting on the side of three people against another gang of international gangsters. Take this stamp with its map to the Federation. To your 21 old men. Maybe it will work for happiness. Good girl. If there's anything we can do for you... Uh... Yes. There is one thing. Oh? Do not leave San Francisco too soon. Spend some time with me here on, on this yacht. Uh-oh. Picture of Reggie York retiring on tiptoe. <laughs> he is a nice one, that Senor York. You understand, Senor Packard. I would like to forget so much of my past. Help me to forget. That would be good for me. And not too bad for you, no? Not too bad at all. Ah, yes. I have helped you to recover the stamp. Now I receive my reward. Oh, you are most generous, senor. You have just heard I Love Adventure, a new Carlton E. Morse production featuring Michael Rossetto as Jack Packard and Tom Collins as Reggie York. Next week, incident number nine, entitled The Girl in the Street. Lady of the Press. ...of Sandra Martin, radio's newest romantic mystery serial. Friends, do you ever come to the end of a hard day's work saying to yourself, what a day. I never thought I'd get through this one. Well, I guess most of us have days like that every once in a while. And haven't you noticed that when you go through one, it frequently leaves you feeling headachy and upset? Well, why feel that way for long? Why ruin the pleasure of the few hours of relaxation you get on a glass of sparkling, refreshing Alka-Seltzer can help set you right with the world again in a hurry? You see, Alka-Seltzer contains the analgesic you need to ease a dull headache and the alkalizing properties necessary to settle an upset acid stomach. Try it the very next time a busy day leaves you feeling pretty down in the mouth. Your druggist has Alka-Seltzer by the glass of his soda fountain and also sells it by the 60 and 30 cent size package for home and work use. Get wise to Alka-Seltzer, folks. You'll be glad you did. And now, Lady of the Press, in episode 17 in The Picture of Death. After going with a strange man who seems to plague her every move to see Albert Hogan, Sandra Martin has returned to her apartment. In order to assure her safe return, she had insisted upon the man surrendering his driver's license together with a duplicate thumbprint. This guarantee served its purpose, but after the license was returned to him, the man drew a gun and tried to force Sandra into giving her newspaper a story absolving the black market ring in the murder of Francis Evers. However, Skip Williams, hiding in a closet, interrupted the proceedings and foiled the man's attempt. But neither he nor Sandra were able to prevent the strange man's escape. And now, Lieutenant Hack Taggart has arrived, and Sandra has asked Skip to leave them alone. You must know how badly I want to believe you, Hack. Well, there's nothing stopping you. But there is. The way you've acted in connection with this whole case. I told you once, Sandra, that I was handling things in the way I thought would prove best for everyone concerned. Well, I'm concerned. More than I care to be, thanks to you. Is casting suspicion on innocent people the best way of handling it? Possibly. I can't understand you, Hack. I don't expect you to. Don't you care whether I do or not? 
Yes. Then what is it? Is there something else more important to you? Right now, there is. Can you tell me what it is? No, I can't. I'd like to think you had faith in me. I've told you that I have a reason for doing this the way I have. It's a good reason. But it's a reason that can't be discussed just yet. And in the meantime, you're asking me to have pure, blind faith. I'm not asking you. You're the one who brought it up. You want proof of my honesty. I can't give you that. So, if my word isn't good enough, I'm afraid you're out of luck. But, Hack, your word... It's up against some pretty strong facts. You've done everything in your power to cast suspicion on Skip and me. Every possible bit of evidence you've presented in the most incriminating light. Put that against the fact that you say you're helping me and... It just doesn't add up. Sometimes you get the right answer by division rather than addition. I don't follow you. You will. In the meantime, don't be so sorry for yourself. I'm not sorry for myself, Hack. I'm sorry for us. Us? Yes, for us. For the thing we've lost. There's an acute shortage in the world of the kind of love and beauty we once had. There isn't enough to waste the way we're wasting it. Beauty isn't very high on the world market at present. Oh, the more reason we should have held on to what we had. Sandra, you should learn to face things the way they are, not the way you'd like them to be. What do you think I'm doing? Do you suppose my heart is breaking because I've turned my back on the way things are? Don't you know that all the pain and anguish in my soul is there because I'm facing the cold bitter fact that our love is gone? Sandra, please. Don't you think it would be easier if I said to myself, well, that's what war does to a man. He's through. We're through. Nothing can be done about it. Forget it and try something new. Wouldn't that be easier than trying to bring it back? Sometimes it's better to leave the lights off when there isn't anything left to see. But I don't believe there's nothing but darkness. I remember a glowing beauty, Hack. And somehow I can't accept the premise that there isn't still a tiny flicker left. A flicker that might be fanned into a bright burning fire again. Sandra, listen to me a moment. I love you. Hack. I've never stopped loving you. I love you so much that I can't let you go on loving me. That's a strange kind of love. I know. But it's because you're still in love with a memory. And unfortunately, the house that that memory lived in isn't the same. You're in love with what I was before I went away. I know that I could still have you on that basis. But I can't be unfair. Until, if ever, I can become again the man you're really in love with. Things will have to stay the way they are. Why, Hack? Why? Because I like the pre-war Hack Taggart a lot better than I like this one. And I don't intend becoming an imposter in your memory. That leaves me nothing but ashes, doesn't it? All I can say is that I hope you won't mistrust me too much until you've seen the end of the play. I know there isn't much solid ground on which to place your trust, but I'm hoping it's enough. Believe me, Sandra. for a minute, will you? Okay, coming. Now, what's up? Something I want to talk over with you. Alone. Come in. Well, what is it? Skip, we've got a job on our hands. And we've got to go to work on it right now. Yes, yeah, something new come up? No, it's just that I've gotten straightened out a little. What do you mean? Well, the hearing is over and the case doesn't go to trial for several weeks. In the meantime, we've got to devote every minute to building up evidence against the black market. Uh-huh. What brought about this sudden recurrence of enthusiasm? Well, for one thing, I... I think we'll be able to rely a little more on help from Hack. No, oh, I need help from him like I need a hole in my head. It may seem strange to you, but... I really believe Hack has our interest at heart. After all he's done, I knew he'd talk into it. Oh, he hasn't really talked me into anything. But I just have a hunch, Skip. 
we've got to play along with him anyway. Now, here's where we start. I can tell where we'll finish if we trust him. We'll have to take a chance. First thing, we're going to check up on those license numbers you got at that service station. Uh, look, Sandra, I'm in this thing pretty deep with you, right? Well, sure, Skip. Why? Then don't you think I ought to know where we stand? Hmm? You mean you think you don't? Not about one thing I don't. What's that? Well, you know I overheard the conversation between you and that gunman in your apartment. Yes. And I heard you admit you'd seen Hogan. Yes, I saw him. Well, then... Don't you think I ought to know about it? Oh, sure, Skip. I forgot. You see, the fellow told me they intended holding Hogan until I took the heat off. Yeah. I pretended not to believe they had Hogan. So in order to persuade me, he agreed to let me see him. Mm-hmm. And he went through with it? Yes. Then you know where he is? No, I don't. This man took me out to Smuggler's Cove. Smuggler's Cove? Oh, you mean the spot where the rum runners used to land back in the Prohibition days? Mm-hmm. We waited there for several hours... Finally, another car drove up and parked beside us. Uh-huh. They had Hogan tied up in the back seat. Oh, and you talked to him? Mm-hmm. Well, what'd he say? He pleaded with me to follow their advice. He insisted that they had nothing to do with his killing Francis Evers. What do you know? He said he wanted to be free, to give himself up and confess. Confess? But why? I don't know. Unless they've tortured him so much, he's willing to say anything they want him to say. Uh-huh. Well, what happened then? Nothing. They took Hogan away, and the man brought me back. So I didn't really learn anything. I was hoping I'd find out where they were keeping him, but they're too slick for that. So, that's the whole story, Skip. Ah, okay. Long as I know where we stand, I'm with you all the way. Good. Now, we've got to start checking the evidence on this ring by beginning with the customers. Mm -hmm. Unless I miss my guess, they'll lead us to the operators, and the operators will lead us to the big shops. And when we find the big shops, we'll know who it is that's holding Hogan. (laughs) That's a long way around. I know, but it's the only way. Now, what's the first name we have on the list? Oh, well, let me see. Uh, J. Tully Whitley. Address? 7765 Portland Drive. Hmm. Good neighborhood. Yeah. Well, come on, Skip. Let's get out there and have a little talk with J. Tully. <laughs> Slow down, Skip. This is the 7700 block. Yeah, won't be long now. Should be right along here. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? There it is. That big white one, see? 7765. Okay. Uh, A park just beyond the driveway. All right. All right. Come on. Let's have a look. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What are you going to tell this guy, Whitley? Can't just bust up there and tell him you suspect him of patronizing a black market. I know that, silly. But I think I know a way to get what we want. Yeah, we keep messing with this kind of stuff, and we're going to get something we don't want. Maybe. But we won't get either if we don't take a chance. Come on. You know, someday I'm going to buy myself a chicken ranch and settle down to a life of ease. If you ever owned a chicken, it would lay flash bulbs instead of eggs. Uh, 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 Very funny, Miss Martin. (laughs) Okay, let's stop the foolishness and concentrate on the task ahead of us. Wait a minute. What are we going to tell this guy? We'll tell him we're from the gas station, and we've come to pick up his car. Oh, fine, fine. I suppose he'll just up and hand it right over to us, huh? We'll tell him that we've had to change the code, that we'll bring him back a new one. Yeah. You know, I think we're skating on pretty thin ice. Possibly. But do you know a better way to get a hold of one of those cards? No. Okay. You want me to ring? Yes, go ahead. I don't mind telling you this gives me the jitters. How do we know what kind of a trap we might be walking into? We don't. Ring again, will you? There don't seem to be anyone here. There's bound to be. An estate like this wouldn't be left empty. Ah! Duck, Sam, duck! Somebody's shooting at us! In these busy times, there are few of us who get to enjoy as many evenings of recreation with friends as we used to, right? But if you're looking forward to a good time tonight or some night soon, a movie, a game of cards, or just a good old gab fest with friends, 
We hope you won't forget to have a package of Alka-Seltzer tablets handy in your home. Then if you happen to have too good a time, stay up late and eat too much of a midnight snack, you'll be prepared with sparkling, refreshing Alka-Seltzer to help yourself to quick relief for the headache or the acid, upset stomach which may result. So now is the time to check up on your supply of Alka-Seltzer. And if it's running low, get another 60 or 30 cent package from your druggist right away. Because it's far better to be safe than sorry. Sandra and Skip seem to have walked into a trap. Could it be that they have been followed once more by the strange man who has caused them so much trouble before? And as the bullets whined past Skip, did they miss Sandra? Listen tomorrow as our Lady of the Press faces new and increasing danger in episode 18 of The Picture of Death. Lady of the Press is written by Dwight Hauser and produced by Gordon T. Hughes and is brought to you each day, Monday through Friday, at this same time by the makers of Alka-Seltzer. Dick Cutting speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. AMX Los Angeles, the voice of Hollywood. You're twice as sure with two great names, Frigidaire and General Motors. Frigidaire presents Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, romance, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. Frigidaire presents Herbert Marshall as Ken Thurston, the man called X. Oh, good morning, Ken. i try to locate you. Yeah, that's what Miss Brooks said, Chief. I told him to go ahead and put that call through. Oh, good. Any idea what it's all about? No, he wouldn't talk to anybody but you. And he sounded pretty excited. Who is he, Ken? I never heard of him. Dr. Kupczynski? A scientist, Chief. Meteorologist. I met him a number of years ago. He's been up to the... Arctic for the last 18 months or so in charge of an expedition. Well, he's back now. He phoned from up the coast at Plymouth. Plymouth, eh? I can't figure any reason he'd have for calling us. Nor can I, Chief, but I do know it takes something out of the ordinary to get Kopchinsky excited. Wondering if this ties in with some of his theories. What theories, Ken? Well, he's thought for a long time that the Arctic region had possibilities of being kind of overlooked. You mean as a strategic area? No, more than that. He's always claimed that this frozen north idea is all wet. That actually the country up there has enough natural resources to support big industry. Colonization. Mm. Matter of fact, that's the reason it... Uh, Oh, just a second, Ken. Yes, Miss Brooks? I have Mr. Thurston's call to Plymouth now. Oh, fine, fine. Here he is, Ken. Thanks. Ken Thurston speaking. This is Dr. Kopchinsky, Mr. Thurston. How are you, Doctor? Mr. Thurston, you must come up here immediately. Oh, what's the trouble? Well, uh, as you may know, we arrived back here from the Arctic this morning. Uh Uh-huh. When I prepared to disembark, I discovered that all of our reports, all the data from a year and a half's work had disappeared. Uh Furthermore, my geologist, Dr. Roberts, was found dead in his cabin. Mr. Thurston, I have not been able to determine the cause. No. All right, Doctor. Where will I find you? I'm on board the Argonaut, berthed at the Old North Dock in Plymouth Harbor. Okay. See you in about uh, four hours. So long, Doctor. Well, what's the story, Ken? I'll know better after I've seen him. Well, now wait. Uh, maybe we don't even figure in this. Nobody kills a man and steals scientific reports just because of the paper shortage. Yes, but Ken, uh... So long, Chief. Oh, Miss Brooks. Uh, yes, Mr. Thurston. Uh, get me a plane reservation to Boston right away. I'll pick it up at the field. And uh, have a car waiting the other end. Yes, sir. In case you want me later this evening, I'll be on board the Argonaut at Plymouth Harbor. Plane to Boston, car there, Plymouth this evening. 
All right, Mr. Thurston. All right. See you later. But, I mean, you're not going to be out of town over Thanksgiving, are you? I don't know. Why? Well, I... I just wondered. Oh. You're, um... You're wearing your hair different, aren't you? Well, yes, I am. I didn't think you'd notice. Nice. I'll, um... I'll call you from Plymouth. So long. Goodbye, Kent. Mr. Thurston. Hey! Wait for me, Mr. Thurston. Hey, gone Zelsman. How many times have I told well, you... Well, don't say it, Mr. Thurston. You'll only be sorry if you do. I will, will no, I? Because, after all, I only came here to invite you to lunch. To what? Oh, sure. I found a new place. Ah, luscious food. Wonderful martinis. No, no. I've got to catch a plane. Some other time, maybe. I would, uh... uh thanks anyway, Pagan. But in this case, uh, maybe you could loan me five dollars so I... Mr. Thurston, wait! Oh, well. Uh... Hmm, wait a minute. Miss Brooks, what did you say was the name of that boat? Hello? Anybody aboard? Hmm. Uh, laboratory C. Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, never mind. Come on in. Thanks. I was looking for Dr. Kuklinski. Well, I'm not he. Well, no. You're Miss, um... Caldwell. Dr. Caldwell. Oh, well, my name's Ken Thurston. Miss Caldwell? <laughs> Apparently, you're one of those men who objects to a woman becoming a scientist. Oh, no, no. I never object to any becoming woman. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm sorry I was rude, Mr. Thurston. Dr. Kupchinsky's ashore somewhere. He's due back any time now. Thanks. Don't let me interrupt what you're doing there. The microscope? Oh, no, it doesn't matter. I was running a flow gene count. I'll have to start over again anyway. You've got a nice laboratory here. Yes, it is. I'm a little tired of looking at it, though, after 18 months. Oh, you one of the members of the expedition? Official bacteriologist. I've worked with the Stedman Institute for the last five years. Well, Stedman, that's the layout that financed this trip, isn't it? Yes. It's located here in Plymouth, a few blocks up on Water Street. I think that's where Dr. Kupchinsky went. Anybody else on board? Oh, just the photographer, I believe, George Smith. Most of the scientists and the crew live here. They were anxious to get ashore. Yes, except, of course, Dr. Roberts. Yes. His death was most unfortunate. Any idea what caused it? I think you'd better discuss that with Dr. Kupchinsky, Mr. Thurston. Oh, I intend to. By the way, did Roberts have a laboratory of his own? Yes, it's on the other side of the deck. I see. Well, I'd better not bother any longer, Miss Caldwell. Maybe Dr. Kupinski can come back by now. Mr. Thurston, is there any special reason why you refuse to call me Dr. Caldwell? Oh, sure. A very special reason. Anybody can be a doctor, but only one person out of every two can be a woman. See you later, Miss Caldwell. Hey, Mr. Thurston. Oh, pig on no. Well, I've decided you will most likely need me up here, so I won't take no for an answer. Yeah. Never have yet. Now, of course, I didn't want to intrude while you were making boo with that luscious little damsel. Pagan, that luscious little damsel is a learned scientist. Oh, she is? Yes. In fact, mm. the only one I've ever known learned enough to be able to use a microscope without attaching the eyepiece. Shelves full of all kinds of bottles. Little hammers, steel plates. Hey, this is a very funny looking joint, Mr. X. It's a geology lab, Pagon. Dr. Roberts used these hammers and plates to break up rock, rock samples so he could look at them under the microscope here, you see? But why would the doctor want to break up rocks? A different kind of doctor. Oh. Roberts was a geologist. Oh. Move over, you're standing in the light. Oh. Hey, hey, can you see anything yet uh, through that little microphone? Oh. I wonder if that... Uh, maybe we ought to blow out of here, Mr. X, before this Roberts guy comes in and catches us. Wait a minute now. Sure, so that's it. What's it? Coal dust. You mean like they burn in furnaces? Is that all? That's all. But it may be enough. Good. Well, then, why don't we scram before... Hey, no, you can forget about Dr. Roberts. He was found dead in this room this morning. Oh, well, in that case, we don't... Dead in this room... Now, I know I'm going to get out of here, but... Hey, 
All right, you're both covered. Don't move. It's a fish. It's a ghost. No, no, Payton. I think it's just a photographer. You George Smith? Yeah, that's right. Suppose you give me a good reason for breaking into Robert's lab? Oh, I've got a good reason, Mr. Smith, but I think I'd rather tell Dr. Kupchinsky. Then why don't you tell him in the first place he's up forward in his cabin? Good. Let's go make sure he's alive. Huh? Any reason why he shouldn't be alive? No, but then when you come right down to it, there's no reason why Dr. Roberts shouldn't be alive. <laughs> must apologize again for the way Smith acted, Mr. Thurston, but you can understand how overwrought all of us are. Oh, sure, Dr. Kupinski. Forget it. Thank you, Mr. Thurston. I've just talked with Dr. Stedman at the Institute. He has the results of the autopsy. What did he find out? Dr. Roberts was poisoned with cancidine. Cancidine? Pretty unusual poison for an amateur to know about. Well, this whole thing is unusual, Mr. Thurston. Do you know of anything specially valuable that Roberts may have discovered on the trip? I couldn't say. We each worked separately, took notes and data in our own branch of science. Dr. Roberts was not a very talkative man. Uh, he collected rock samples, specimens, didn't he? Oh, yes. They're stored in canvas sacks in the hold. They're useless without aerial maps, notes, data sheets. Those were all stolen with the rest of the report. Mm, would you say the expedition itself was a success? Oh, beyond my wildest hopes, Mr. Thurston. Why, there's a whole new frontier up there. Well, well, this overcrowded world could use a new frontier. Uh, yes, indeed. There are vast areas for agriculture, fishing grounds, water power, all kinds of possibilities. Uh, and it's ours, our country's. Or was until these reports disappeared. I know. Whoever has them could get a pretty fancy price for them from some other country, eh? Yes. And with Dr. Roberts' poison. That is what has been uppermost in my mind. What's that? Let me in quick, Mr. Thurston. Somebody's shooting at somebody out there in the deck. See anybody, Pagan? That's shooting with someone on board. My Dr. Caldwell. That woman, Mr. Thurston. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Quiet, everybody. Mr. Thurston, somebody's coming. Quiet, will you? All right. Come on in. You're covered. Well, Thurston, I say we both have guns now. Smith. Mr. Smith. What's all the shooting about, Smith? Stop shaking, man. You're as nervous as a cat. I... I saw somebody coming out of my photo lab. The poisoner. I fired a couple of shots, but he got away. The lab's been turned inside out. You, you didn't see who it was? I'm not sure. He looked an awful lot like... Like Dr. Stedman. What? Oh, no. Stedman, huh? The head of the Institute. <laughs> Everybody around here is doctor. Dr. This and Dr. Dad, but, but nobody's a real one. If you mean a medical doctor, Mr. Zellschmidt, then Dr. Stedman does happen to be a real one. He's quite a well-known toxicologist. Taxi what? Pagan. A toxicologist is a man who specializes in the study of poison. Continue with Frigidaire's Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall. Returning this morning from a year and a half's work in the Arctic, the scientists aboard the Argonaut found ill fortune awaiting them in Plymouth Harbor. The geologist of the expedition, Dr. Roberts, was found dead from poisoning. And all of the expedition's reports have disappeared. Now Ken and Pagan and Dr. Chukchinsky are on an expedition of their own down in the dark hole of the vessel. That makes 14 sacks we've opened already, Mr. Thurston. And what do we find? <laughs> Rocks. Okay, you gone. That's exactly what I expected to find, huh? Drag the next one over. It's just as I feared, Mr. Thurston. These sample sacks are identified only by code numbers. They're useless without Dr. Roberts' report. Maybe not entirely useless, Dr. Kupinski. View of what I found in Roberts' laboratory. Hey, this one is uh, not as heavy as the rest of them. Huh? Let's have a look. Hold the flashlight, Pagan. Mr. Thurston, now we've got black rock. But it, that looks like... Yeah. Looks like anthracite coal. Right. That's the most valuable discovery of the whole expedition. Coal. Available for heat, power, smelting. As it is now, we know nothing of its location. A little hard to understand why you didn't know about this sooner, Doctor. Weren't you in charge of the expedition? Yes, but each of us worked individually, and each was to make his separate report to Dr. Stedman here at the Institute. My own particular field is meteorology. 
Dr. Caldwell's bacteriology, mm-hmm. and so on. And Roberts worked by himself. Exactly. He flew one of the helicopters, took his own notes and samples, made his own maps. None of us had wait, any wait, idea. Wait, 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 quiet. Yes? I don't hear anything, Mr. Thurston. Just water dripping. You be quiet. Hmm? Behind these boxes, somewhere about here. <laughs> Sounds like a little clock. Here. Grab the other side of that box. Now. Right. Mr. Thurston, look. Yeah. An electric circuit and a timer. It's connected to that drum of gasoline. Oh. Those briefcases beside it. The reports. Just a second. Wait till I disconnect this. Is the Roberts report there, Doctor? No, just a minute. No, no, it isn't. I see. Well, at least we know now what it's all about. Well, this timing gadget's pretty unusual. Any idea what it is? Well, let me see. Yes. Yes, I know what it is, Mr. Thurston. It's an automatic control used in meteorology. Mr. Thurston. Hope we didn't get tired waiting, Peg, huh? A whole hour you leave me alone in this dead man's laboratory. I was starting to get me bejeebies. Here, unwrap that other package. Where'd you get those bundles, Mr. Egg? From Dr. Stedman. Over at the Institute. Stedman? Oh, you mean the taxi, taxi, taxi... Uh... Quiet, you're not in Times Square. Huh? I mean the poisonous guy. Well, did, did you make him confess, maybe? No, not quite. Matter of fact, he says he didn't kill Roberts. <laughs> He's lying. Maybe. But it's true that any one of this bunch could have taken the cancer dean from the storeroom. Hey, it's a brush and a can of paint. Phosphorescent paint. Shines in the dark. I want you to paint this with it. Oh, sure. Just leave it to... Mr. X, take it away. Yeah, it's not going to bite you. Hurry up and get it painted. I'll see you later. Mr. Thurston, you're not going to leave me here alone with the... With the thing? Sure. What reason do you have to be scared of it? You didn't kill anybody this morning? So long, Peg, huh? I don't get it, Mr. X. Already we've looked in three of these lifeboats, and all we find is the same thing. Nothing. Well, what did you expect to find? What well, I don't know, but not just nothing. Here, Pagan, let's have a look inside this one. Besides, don't even know where we're looking for. We are not looking for anything now. We found it. Huh? Found what? Dr. Roberts' report. Hold the light while I get a hold of the briefcase. But, Mr. Thurston... Why would anybody stick it out here in one of those life Why not? As long as they haven't had a chance yet to sneak it ashore. Ah, okay, I got it. Turn off the light. Good. The next crime. I- I'm getting the creeps. Not so fast, Pagan. We've still got to substitute this thing for the briefcase. Mr. X, do not rub that thing out here in the dark. Be quiet. There. Doesn't look so bad when you know what it is. <laughs> I know what it is, and it still scares me. Hold the canvas a second while I put it in the bottom of the boat. So, well, that's that. Now I think it's about time we made a little social call. Oh, on that Dr. Caldwell dame, I suppose. Oh, no, I got a date with her later. Come on, Pagan. Let's go talk to Dr. Dupchinsky. <laughs> As you can see, Robert's discovery would have given the final boost to any plan for colonization. So the loss is tragic. And the thief is not only clever, but utterly without scruple. Oh, I'd say more ruthless than clever, Doctor. Ruthless enough to put a personal greed above the chance for thousands of people to open a new frontier, build a new land. Wait, I think somebody's coming. Yes, but how can a, such a person be exposed? What do you plan to do, Mr. Thurston? Why, well, nothing at all, Doctor. And you're going to sit back and wait till the guilty person decides to confess. Come on in, Miss Caldwell. You mean her. Mr. Thurston, her. Here's your coffee, Doctor. Sorry, I didn't know anyone else was here. I only brought one cup. Oh, thank you, Dr. Caldwell. Well, I can make more if you'd like a cup, Mr. Thurston. Oh, no, no, no. Perhaps, uh, Pagan might like some, though. Oh, no, no, not me. I never touch the stuff. Oh. Well, I hope... I hope you won't mind if I drink it in front of you. Coffee's one of my worst vices. Stop! Stop! Don't touch it! Well, why not? 
Mr. Thurston, you're not going to sit there and, and let her poison him right in front of our eyes? What? Pagan's got the goods on him, Miss Corwin. She may as well confess. Sure, stop talking, babe. Confess? Confess to what? I haven't anything to confess to. I know, but it'll make Pagan happy. Huh? But, but, but... No, but... no stay away from uh, me. That's what we've been waiting no. for. It can't be you, Robert. You're dead. I didn't mean to kill you. Yeah, who is it? No, please. Your high school photographer, George please, Smith. Robert. The man who Wait killed Dr. Roberts. Roberts! Mr. Thurston, he jumped overboard. He's going to get away. No, oh no, Pagan. I've had the police guarding the wharf for the last three hours. Well, that's that. But what was the matter? What scared him that way? <laughs> you should have seen it. It was mainly a guilty conscience, helped along quite a bit by a... Past the death mask of Dr. Roberts. Death mask? Yeah, I got it from Stedman earlier this evening. Put it in the lifeboat where Smith had hidden the stolen report. Oh, then you found it? But why were you certain George Smith was guilty? I wasn't certain. But since he did all the photographic work, he was the most likely person to have found out what Roberts was doing. Well, I think I could use that coffee now, Miss Colwell. Thank heaven the reports were saved. There'll be a new land, Mr. Thurston. A new frontier up there in the Arctic. Yes, Dr. Kuczynski. And let's hope the pioneers who go there will carry the same vision. A sailing ship brought to Plymouth Harbor over 300 years ago. A belief in the courage of human freedom. And in the dignity of the human spirit. Belief in the right of a man to dream. And to sow. And to reap what he's sown. And in the right of free choice in the God to whom he offers thanksgiving. Frigidaire star, Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. Next week is a... <coughs> pardon me. Is a special occasion for us because it will mark the 100th broadcast of our sponsor. The 100th consecutive week the Frigidaire has enjoyed bringing radio entertainment into your home. Our story will be Checkmate in Tahiti. And I feel sure you'll enjoy it. As usual, Leon Belasque will be along as Pagan Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, for our 100th broadcast next week when I return as the man called X. Good night. Bridget Air's Man Called X is directed by Jack Johnstone, with music composed by Johnny Green and conducted tonight by Al Sendry. The story was written by Les Crutchfield. So until next week, same time, same station... This is Wendell Niles speaking for Frigid Air, made only by General Motors. All characters and incidents used on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual persons or incidents is purely coincidental. Remember, every Sunday night brings you two popular dramatic shows on CBS, The Man Called X and The Adventures of Sam Spade. Yes, for the best in entertainment... Tune in and stay tuned in to CBS, the biggest show in town. Friends, have you ever wished that you could send food or clothing to help some family in Europe live through the winter? CARE will do it for you. That's C-A-R-E, the cooperative relief organization endorsed by President Truman, Herbert Hoover, and General Eisenhower. Ask about CARE at your local Western Union or Railway Express office. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.